The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. These laws offended every class, even the Puritans, who complained that the right of three children dangerously emancipated the mother from male authority. Others excused their celibacy on the score that the modern woman was too independent, imperious, capricious, and extravagant. The exclusion of bachelors from public shows was considered too severe and impossible to enforce. Augustus had the clause rescinded in 12 B.C. In A.D. 9, the Lex Papia Popia further softened the Julian laws by easing the conditions under which celibates might inherit, doubling the period in which widows and divorcees must remarry to inherit, and increasing the amount that childless heirs could receive. Mothers of three children were freed from those limits which the Lex Voconia of 169 B.C. had placed upon bequests to women. The age at which a citizen might stand for the various offices was lowered in proportion to the size of his family. After the law was passed, men noted that the consuls who had framed it and given it their names were childless celibates. Gossip added that the reform laws had been suggested to Augustus, who had only one child, by Messinus, who had none and that while the laws were being enacted, Messenus was living in sybaritic luxury, and Augustus was seducing Messenus's wife. It is difficult to estimate the effectiveness of this, the most important social legislation in antiquity. The laws were loosely drawn, and recalcitrants found many loopholes. Some men married to obey the law and divorced their wives soon afterwards. Others adopted children to secure offices or legacies, then emancipated, that is, dismissed them. Tacitus, a century later, pronounced the laws a failure— Marriages and the rearing of children did not become frequent, so powerful are the attractions of a childless state. Immorality continued, but was more polite than before. In Ovid we see it becoming a fine art, the subject of careful instructions from experts to apprentices. Augustus himself doubted the efficacy of his laws, and agreed with Horace that laws are vain when hearts are unchanged. He struggled heroically to reach people's hearts. In his box at the games he displayed the numerous children of the exemplary Germanicus, gave a thousand sesterces to parents of large families, raised a monument to a slave girl who, doubtless without patriotic premeditation, had borne quintuplets, and rejoiced when a peasant marched into Rome with eight children, thirty-six grandchildren, and nineteen great-grandchildren in his train. Dio Cassius pictures him making public addresses denouncing race suicide. He enjoyed, perhaps inspired, the moral preface of Livy's history— under his influence, the literature of the age became didactic and practical. Through Messenus or in person, he persuaded Virgil and Horace to lend their muses to the propaganda of moral and religious reform. Virgil tried to sing the Romans back to the farm in the Georgics and to the old gods in the Aeneid. And Horace, after a large sampling of the world's pleasures, turned his lyre to Stoic themes. In 17 BC, Augustus presented the Ludi Seculares, three days of ceremonies, contests, and spectacles, celebrating the return of Saturn's golden age. And Horace was commissioned to write the Carmen Seculare to be chanted in procession by twenty-seven boys and as many girls. Even art was used to point a moral. The lovely Arapaches showed in relief the life and government of Rome. Magnificent public buildings rose to represent the strength and glory of the empire. Scores of temples were erected to stir again a faith that had almost died. In the end, Augustus, skeptic and realist, became convinced that moral reform awaited a religious renaissance. The agnostic generation of Lucretius, Catullus, and Caesar had run its course, and its children had discovered that the fear of the gods is the youth of wisdom. Even the cynical Ovid would soon write, Voltairianly, Expedit esse deos, et ut expedit esse putemus. It is convenient that there should be gods, and that we should think they exist. Conservative minds traced the civil war and the sufferings it had brought to neglect of religion and the consequent anger of heaven. Everywhere in Italy a chastened people was ready to turn back to its ancient altars and thank the deities who, it felt, had spared it for this happy restoration. When in 12 BC Augustus, having waited patiently for the tepid Lepidus to die, succeeded him as Pontifex Maximus, such a multitude from all Italy assembled for my election, the emperor tells us, as is never recorded to have been in Rome before. He both led and followed the revival of religion, hoping that his political and moral reconstruction would win readier acceptance if he could entwine it with the gods. He raised the four priestly colleges to unprecedented dignity and wealth, 
chose himself to each of them, took upon himself the appointment of new members, attended their meetings faithfully, and took part in their solemn pageantry. He banned Egyptian and Asiatic cults from Rome, but he made an exception in favor of the Jews and permitted religious freedom in the provinces. He lavished gifts upon the temples and renewed old religious ceremonies, processions, and festivals. The Ludi Seculares were not secular. Every day of them was marked with religious ritual and song. Their chief significance was the return of a happy friendship with the gods. Nourished with such sovereign aid, the ancient cult took on fresh life and touched again the dramatic impulses and supernatural hopes of the people. Amid the chaos of competing faiths that flowed in upon Rome after Augustus, it held its own for three centuries more, and when it died it was at once reborn under new symbols and new names. Augustus himself became one of the chief competitors of his gods. His great-uncle had set the example. Two years after being murdered, Caesar had been recognized by the Senate as a deity, and his worship spread throughout the empire. As early as 36 BC, some Italian cities had given Octavian a place in their pantheon. By 27 BC, his name was added to those of the gods in official hymns at Rome. His birthday became a holy day as well as a holiday. And after his death, the Senate decreed that his genius, or soul, was thereafter to be worshipped as one of the official divinities. All this seemed quite natural to antiquity. It had never recognized an impassable difference between gods and men. The gods had often taken human form, and the creative genius of a Heracles, a Lycurgus, an Alexander, a Caesar, or an Augustus, seemed, especially to the religious East, miraculous and divine. The Egyptians had thought of the pharaohs, of the Ptolemies, even of Antony as deities. They could hardly think less of Augustus. The ancients were not in these cases such simpletons as their modern counterparts would like to believe. They knew well enough that Augustus was human. In deifying his genius or that of others, they used deus or theos as equivalent to our canonized saint. Indeed, canonization is a descendant of Roman deification, and to pray to such a deified human being seemed no more absurd then than prayer to a saint seems now. In Italian homes, the worship of the emperor's genius became associated with the adoration given to the lares of the household and the genius of the paterfamilias. There was nothing difficult in this for a people which through centuries had deified their dead parents, built altars to them, and given the name of temples to the ancestral tombs. When Augustus visited Greek Asia in 21 BC, he found that his cult had made rapid headway there. Dedications and orations hailed him as Savior, bringer of glad tidings, God the Son of God. Some men argued that in him the long-awaited Messiah had come, bringing peace and happiness to mankind. The great provincial councils made his worship the center of their ceremonies. A new priesthood, the Augustales, was appointed by provinces and municipalities for the service of the new divinity. Augustus frowned upon all this, but finally accepted it as a spiritual enhancement of the Principate, a valuable cementing of church and state, a uniting common worship amid diverse and dividing creeds. The moneylender's grandson consented to become a god. 5. Augustus himself What sort of man was this who was heir to Caesar at eighteen, master of the world at thirty-one, ruler of Rome for half a century, and architect of the greatest empire in ancient history? He was at once dull and fascinating, no one more prosaic, yet half the world adored him, a physical weakling not particularly brave but able to overcome all enemies, regulate kingdoms, and fashion a government that would give the vast realm an unexampled prosperity for two hundred years. Sculptors spent much marble and bronze in making images of him, some showing him in the timid pride of a refined and serious youth, some in the somber pose of a priest, some half covered with the insignia of power some in military garb, the philosopher unwillingly and uneasily playing the general. These effigies do not reveal, though sometimes they suggest, the ailments that made his war against chaos depend precariously at every step upon his fight for health. He was unprepossessing. He had sandy hair, a strangely triangular head, merging eyebrows, clear and penetrating eyes. Yet his expression was so calm and mild, says Suetonius, that a Gaul who came to kill him changed his mind. His skin was sensitive and intermittently itched with a kind of ringworm. Rheumatism weakened his left leg and made him limp a bit. A stiffness akin to arthritis occasionally incapacitated his right hand. He was one of many Romans attacked in 23 BC by a plague resembling typhus. He suffered from stones in the bladder and found it hard to sleep. He was troubled each spring by 
an enlargement of the diaphragm, and when the wind was in the south he had catarrh. He bore cold so poorly that in winter he wore a woolen chest protector, wraps for his thighs and shins, an undershirt, four tunics or blouses, and a heavy toga. He dared not expose his head to the sun. Horseback riding tired him, and he was sometimes carried in a litter to the battlefield. At thirty-five, having lived through one of the most intense dramas in history, he was already old, nervous, sickly, easily tired. No one dreamed that he would live another forty years. He tried a variety of doctors, and richly rewarded one, Antonius Musa, for curing an uncertain illness, abscess of the liver, with cold fomentations and baths. In Musa's honor he exempted all Roman physicians from taxation. But for the most part he doctored himself. He used hot salt water and sulfur baths for his rheumatism. He ate lightly and only the plainest food, coarse bread, cheese, fish, and fruit. He was so careful of his diet that sometimes he ate alone either before a dinner party or after it, taking nothing during its course. In him, as in some medieval saints, the soul bore its body like a cross. His essence was nervous vitality, inflexible resolution, a penetrating, calculating, resourceful mind. He accepted an unheard-of number of offices and took upon himself responsibility only less than Caesar's. He fulfilled the duties of these positions conscientiously, presided regularly over the Senate, attended innumerable conferences, judged hundreds of trials, suffered ceremonies and banquets, planned distant campaigns, governed legions and provinces, visited nearly every one of them, and attended to infinite administrative detail. He made hundreds of speeches and prepared them with proud attention to clarity, simplicity, and style. He read them instead of speaking extemporaneously, lest he should utter regrettable words. Suetonius would have us believe that for the same reason he wrote out in advance and read important conversations with individuals, even with his wife. Like most skeptics of his time, he retained superstitions long after losing his faith. He carried a sealskin about him to protect against lightning. He respected omens and auspices and sometimes obeyed warnings derived from dreams. He refused to begin a journey on what he reckoned to be unlucky days. At the same time, he was remarkable for the objectivity of his judgment and the practicality of his thought. He advised young men to enter soon upon an active career, so that the ideas they had learned from books might be tempered by the experience and necessities of life. He kept to the end his bourgeois good sense, conservatism, parsimony, and caution. Festina lente, make haste slowly, was his favorite saw. Far more than most men of such power, he could take advice and bear reproof humbly. Athenodorus, a philosopher who was returning to Athens after living with him for years, gave him some parting counsel. Whenever you get angry, do not say or do anything before repeating to yourself the twenty-four letters of the alphabet. Augustus was so grateful for the caution that he begged Athenodorus to stay another year, saying, No risk attends the reward that silence brings. Even more surprising than Caesar's development from a roistering politician into a great general and statesman was the transformation of the merciless and self-centered Octavian into the modest and magnanimous Augustus. He grew. The man who had allowed Antony to hang Cicero's head in the forum, who had moved without scruple from one faction to another, who had run the gamut of sexual indulgence, who had pursued Antony and Cleopatra to the death unmoved by friendship or chivalry, this tenacious and unlovable youth, instead of being poisoned by power, became in his last forty years a model of justice, moderation, fidelity, magnanimity, and toleration. He laughed at the lampoons that wits and poets wrote about him. He advised Tiberius to be content with preventing or prosecuting hostile actions and not seek to suppress hostile words. He did not insist upon others living as simply as himself. When he invited guests to dinner, he would retire early to leave their appetite and merriment unrestrained. He had no pretentiousness. He buttonholed voters to ask their suffrages. He substituted for his lawyer friends in court. He left or entered Rome secretly, abhorring pomp. In the reliefs of the Ara Pacis, he is not set apart from the other citizens by any mark of distinction. His morning receptions were open to all citizens, and all were affably received. When one man hesitated to present a petition, he jokingly chided him for offering the document as if he were giving a penny to an elephant. In his senile years, when disappointments had embittered him, and he had grown accustomed to omnipotence, even to being a god, he lapsed into intolerance, prosecuted hostile writers, suppressed histories of too critical a stamp, and gave no ear to Ovid's penitent verse. 
Once, it is said, he had the legs of his secretary Thallus broken for taking 500 denarii to reveal the contents of an official letter. And he forced one of his freedmen to kill himself when found guilty of adultery with a Roman matron. All in all, it is hard to love him. We must picture the frailty of his body and the sorrows of his old age before our hearts can go out to him as to the murdered Caesar or the beaten Antony. 6. The Last Days of a God His failures and his tragedies were almost all within his home. By his three wives, Claudia, Scribonia, Livia, he had but one child. Scribonia unwittingly avenged her divorce by giving him Julia. He had hoped that Livia would bear him a son whom he might train and educate for government, but though she rewarded her first husband with two splendid children, Tiberius and Drusus, her marriage with Augustus proved disappointingly sterile. Otherwise, their union was a happy one. She was a woman of stately beauty, firm character, and fine understanding. Augustus rehearsed his most vital measures with her and valued her advice as highly as that of his maturest friends. Asked how she had acquired such influence over him, she replied, by being scrupulously chaste, never meddling with his affairs and pretending neither to hear of nor to notice the favorites with whom he had amours. She was a model of the old virtues and perhaps expounded them too persistently. In her leisure, she devoted herself to charity, helping parents of large families, providing dowries for poor brides, and maintaining many orphans at her own expense. Her palace itself was almost an orphanage. For there, in the home of his sister Octavia, Augustus supervised the education of his grandsons, nephews, nieces, and even the six surviving children of Antony. He sent the boys off to early war, saw to it that the girls should learn to spin and weave, and forbade them to do or say anything except without concealment, and such as might be recorded in the household diary. Augustus learned to love Livia's son Drusus, adopted and reared him, and would gladly have left him his wealth and power. The youth's early death was one of the emperor's first bereavements. Tiberius he respected but could not love, for his future successor was a positive and imperious character, inclined to sullenness and secrecy. But the comeliness and vivacity of his daughter Julia must have given Augustus many happy moments in her childhood. When she had reached the age of fourteen, he persuaded Octavia to allow the divorce of her son Marcellus and induced the youth to marry Julia. Two years later, Marcellus died, and Julia, after brief mourning, set out to enjoy a freedom she had long coveted. But soon the matchmaking emperor, craving a grandson as heir, coaxed the reluctant Agrippa to divorce his wife and marry the Mary Widow, this in 21 BC. Julia was eighteen, Agrippa forty-two, but he was a good and great man and agreeably rich. She made his townhouse a salon of pleasure and wit, and became the soul of the younger and gayer set in the capital, as against the Puritans who took their lead from Livia. Rumor accused Julia of deceiving her new husband, and ascribed to her an incredible reply to the incredible question why, despite her adulteries, all the five children she gave Agrippa resembled him. Numquam nisi nave plena tolo vectorum. When Agrippa died in 12 BC, Augustus turned his hopes to Julia's oldest sons, Gaius and Lucius, overwhelmed them with affection and education, and had them promoted to office far sooner than was legally warranted by their years. Again a widow, Julia, richer and lovelier than ever, entered with saucy abandon upon a succession of amours which became at once the scandal and joy of a Rome that fretted under the Julian laws. To quiet this gossip, and perhaps to reconcile his daughter with his wife, Augustus made a third match for Julia. Livia's son Tiberius was compelled to divorce his pregnant wife, Vipsania Agrippina, daughter of Agrippa, and to marry the equally reluctant Julia, this in 9 BC. The young old Roman did his best to be a good husband, but Julia soon gave up the effort to adjust her Epicurean to his stoic ways and resumed her illicit loves. Tiberius bore the infamy for a time in furious silence. The Lex Julia de Adulteriis required the husband of an adulteress to denounce her to the courts. Tiberius disobeyed the law to protect its author, and perhaps himself, for he and Livia had hoped that Augustus would adopt him as his son and transmit to him the leadership of the empire. When it became clear that the emperor favored instead Julia's children by Agrippa, Tiberius resigned his official posts and retired to Rhodes. There for seven years he lived as a simple private citizen, devoting himself to solitude, philosophy, and astrology. Freer than ever, Julia passed from one lover to another, and the revels of her set filled the forum with turmoil at night. Augustus, now, in 2 BC, an invalid of sixty, suffered all that a father and ruler could bear from the simultaneous collapse of his family, his honor, and his laws. By these laws, the father of an adulteress was bound to indict her publicly if her husband had failed to do so. 
Proofs of her misconduct were laid before him, and the friends of Tiberius let it be known that unless Augustus acted, they would accuse Julia before the court. Augustus decided to anticipate them. While the merrymaking was at its height, he issued a decree banishing his daughter to the island of Pandateria, a barren rock off the Campanian coast. One of her lovers, a son of Antony, was forced to kill himself, and several others were exiled. Julia's freedwoman Phoebe hanged herself rather than testify against her. The distraught emperor, hearing of the act, said, I would rather have been Phoebe's father than Julia's. The people of Rome begged him to forgive his daughter. Tiberius added his request to theirs, but pardon never came. Tiberius, enthroned, merely changed her place of residence to a less narrow confinement at Regium. There, broken and forgotten after sixteen years of imprisonment, Julia died. Her sons Gaius and Lucius had long preceded her in death. Lucius of an illness in Marseille in A.D. 2, Gaius of a wound received in Armenia in A.D. 4. Left without aid or successor at a time when Germany, Pannonia, and Gaul were threatening revolt, Augustus reluctantly recalled Tiberius in A.D. 2, adopted him as son and co-regent, and sent him off to put down the rebellions. When he returned in A.D. 9, after five years of arduous and successful campaigning, all Rome, which hated him for his stern Puritanism, resigned itself to the fact that, though Augustus was still prince, Tiberius had begun to rule. Life's final tragedy is unwilling continuance, to outlive one's self and be forbidden to die. When Julia went into exile, Augustus was not in years an old man, others were still vigorous at sixty. But he had lived too many lives and died too many deaths since he had come to Rome, a boy of eighteen, to avenge Caesar's murder and execute his will. How many wars and battles and near defeats, how many pains and illnesses, how many conspiracies and perils and bitter miscarriages of noble aims had befallen him in those crowded forty-two years, and the snatching away of one hope and helper after another, until at last only this doer Tiberius remained. Perhaps it had been wiser to die like Antony at the peak of life and in the arms of love. How sadly pleasant must have seemed in retrospect the days when Julia and Agrippa were happy and grandchildren frolicked on the palace floor. Now another Julia, daughter of his daughter, had grown up and was following her mother's morals as if resolved to illustrate all the amatory arts of her friend Ovid's verse. In A.D. 8, having received proofs of her adultery, Augustus exiled her to an isle in the Adriatic and at the same time banished Ovid to Tomi on the Black Sea. Would that I had never married mourned the feeble and shrunken emperor, or that I had died without offspring. Sometimes he thought of starving himself to death. All the great structure that he had built seemed to be in ruins. The powers that he had assumed for order's sake had weakened into degeneration the Senate and the assemblies from which he had taken them. Tired of ratifications and adulations, the senators no longer came to their sessions, and a mere handful of citizens gathered in the comitia. Offices that had once stirred creative ambition by the power they brought were now shunned by the able as empty and expensive vanities. The very peace that Augustus had organized and the security that he had won for Rome had loosened the fiber of the people. No one wanted to enlist in the army or recognize the inexorable periodicity of war. Luxury had taken the place of simplicity, sexual license was replacing parentage. By its own exhausted will, the great race was beginning to die." All these things the old emperor keenly saw and sadly felt. No one then could tell him that despite a hundred defects and a half a dozen idiots on the throne, the strange and subtle principle that he had established would give the empire the longest period of prosperity ever known to mankind, and that the Pax Romana, which had begun as the Pax Augusta, would in the perspective of time be accounted the supreme achievement in the history of statesmanship. Like Leonardo, he thought that he had failed. Death came to him quietly at Nola, in the seventy-sixth year of his age, A.D. 14. To the friends at his bedside he uttered the words often used to conclude a Roman comedy. Since well I've played my part, clap now your hands, and with applause dismiss me from the stage. He embraced his wife, saying, Remember our long union, Livia, farewell. And with this simple parting he passed away. Some days later his corpse was borne through Rome on the shoulders of senators to the field of Mars, and there cremated while children of high degree chanted the lament for the dead. Chapter 12. The Golden Age, 30 B.C. to A.D. 18. 1. The Augustan Stimulus 
If peace and security are more favorable than war to the production of literature and art, yet war and profound social disturbances turn up the earth about the plants of thought and nourish the seeds that mature in peace. A quiet life does not make great ideas or great men, but the compulsions of crisis, the imperatives of survival, weed out dead things by the roots and quicken the growth of new ideas and ways. Peace after successful war has all the stimulus of a rapid convalescence. Men then rejoice at mere being— and sometimes break into song. The Romans were grateful to Augustus because he had cured, even if by a major operation, the cancer of chaos that had been consuming their civic life. They were astonished to find themselves rich so soon after devastation, and they were elated to note that despite their recent defenseless disorder, they were still masters of what seemed to them the world. They looked back upon their history, from the first to this second Romulus, from creator to restorer, and judged it epically wonderful. They were hardly surprised when Virgil and Horace put their gratitude, their glory, and their pride into verse, and Livy into prose. Better still, the region they had conquered was only partly barbarous. A large area of it was the realm of Hellenistic culture, of refined speech, subtle literature, enlightening science, mature philosophy, and noble art. This spiritual wealth was now pouring into Rome, stirring imitation and rivalry, compelling language and letters to spruce up and grow. Ten thousand Greek words slipped into the Latin vocabulary, ten thousand Greek statues or paintings entered Roman forums, temples, streets, and homes. Money was passing down, even to poets and artists, from the captors of Egypt's treasury, the absentee owners of Italy's soil, and the exploiters of the empire's resources and trade. Writers dedicated their works to rich men in the hope of receiving gifts that would finance their further toil. So Horace addressed his odes to Sallust, Ilius Lamia, Manlius Torquatus, and Munatius Plancus. Messala Corvinus gathered about him a coterie of authors whose star was Tibullus, and Messenus redeemed his wealth and poetry by presence to Virgil, Horace, and Propertius. Until his final irascible years, Augustus followed a liberal policy toward literature— he was glad to have letters and art take up the energies that had disturbed politics. He would pay men to write books if they would let him govern the state. His generosity to poets became so renowned that a swarm of them buzzed around him wherever he went. When a Greek persisted day after day in pressing verses into his hand as he left his palace, Augustus retaliated by stopping, composing some lines of his own, and having an attendant give them to the Greek. The latter offered the emperor a few denarii and expressed his regret that he could not give more. Augustus rewarded his wit, not his poetry, with one hundred thousand sesterces. The stream of books swelled now to proportions unknown before. Everyone from fool to philosopher wrote poetry. Since all poetry and most literary prose were designed to be read aloud, gatherings were formed at which authors read their productions to invited or general audiences or, in rare moments of tolerance, to one another. Juvenal thought that a compelling reason for living in the country was to escape the poets who infested Rome. In the bookshops that crowded a district called the Argelitum, writers assembled to compute literary genius, while impecunious bibliophiles furtively read snatches of the books they could not buy. Placards on the walls announced new titles and their cost. Small volumes sold for four or five sesterces, average volumes for ten, or a dollar fifty, Elegant editions like Marshall's epigrams, usually illustrated with a portrait of the author, brought some five denarii, or three dollars. Books were exported to all parts of the empire, or were published simultaneously in Rome, Lyon, Athens, and Alexandria. Marshall was pleased to learn that he was bought and sold in Britain. Even poets now had private libraries. Ovid affectionately describes his. We gather from Marshall that there were already book fanciers who collected deluxe editions or rare manuscripts. Augustus established two public libraries, Tiberius, Vespasian, Domitian, Trajan, and Hadrian built others. By the fourth century there were twenty-eight in Rome. Foreign students and writers came to study in these libraries and in public archives. So Dionysius came from Halicarnassus, and Diodorus from Sicily. Rome was now the rival of Alexandria, as the literary center of the Western world. This efflorescence transformed both literature and society. Letters and the arts took on new dignity. Grammarians lectured on living authors. People sang snatches from them in the streets. Writers mingled with statesmen and high-born ladies in luxurious salons, such as history would never know again until the flowering of France. The aristocracy became literary. Literature became aristocratic. 
The lusty vigor of Aeneas and Plautus, Lucretius and Catullus was exchanged for a delicate beauty or a teasing complexity in expression and thought. Writers ceased to mingle with the people, ceased therefore to describe their ways or speak their language. A divorce set in between literature and life that finally sucked the sap and spirit out of Latin letters. Forms were set by Greek models, themes by Greek tradition or Augustus's court. Poetry, when it could spare time from theocrity and shepherds or anacreontic love, was to sing didactically the joys of agriculture, the morality of ancestors, the glory of Rome, and the splendor of its gods. Literature became a handmaiden of statesmanship, a polyphonic sermon calling the nation to Augustan ideas. Two forces opposed this conscription of letters by the state. One was Horace's hated and profane crowd, which liked the salty tang and independence of the old satires and plays rather than the curled and perfumed beauty of the new. The other was that demimond of jollity and sin to which Clodia and Julia belonged. This younger set was in full rebellion against the Julian laws, wanted no moral reform, had its own poets, circles, and norms. In letters, as in life, the two forces fought each other, crossing in Tibullus and Propertius, matching the chaste piety of Virgil with the obscene audacities of Ovid, crushing two Julias and one poet with exile, and at last exhausting each other in the Silver Age. But the ferment of great events, the releasing leisure of wealth and peace, the majesty of a world acknowledging Rome's sway, overcame the corrosion of state subsidies and produced a golden age whose literature was the most perfect in form and utterance in all the memory of men. 2. Virgil the most lovable of Romans was born in 70 B.C. on a farm near Mantua, where the river Mincio wanders slowly toward the Po. The capital would henceforth give birth to very few great Romans. They would come from Italy in the century that was divided by the birth of Christ, and thereafter from the provinces. Perhaps Virgil's veins contained some Celtic blood, for Mantua had long been peopled by Gauls. Technically, he was a Gaul by birth, for it was only twenty-one years later that Cisalpine Gaul received the Roman franchise from Caesar. The man who most eloquently sang the majesty and destiny of Rome would never show the hard masculinity of the Roman stock, but would touch Celtic strings of mysticism, tenderness, and grace rare in the Roman breed. His father saved enough as a court clerk to buy a farm and raise bees. In that murmurous quietude the poet spent his boyhood. The full foliage of the well-watered north lingered in his later memory, and he was never really happy away from those fields and streams. At twelve he was sent to school at Cremona, at fourteen to Milan, at sixteen to Rome. There he studied rhetoric and allied subjects under the same man who was to teach Octavian. Probably after this he attended the lectures of Ciro the Epicurean at Naples. Virgil tried hard to accept the philosophy of pleasure, but his rural background had ill-equipped him. He seems to have returned north after his education, for in 41 BC we find him swimming for life to escape a soldier who seized by force his father's farm. Octavian and Antony had confiscated it because the region had favored their enemies. Asinius Polio, the learned governor of Cisalpine Gaul, tried to have the farm returned but failed. He atoned by giving his patronage to the young man and encouraging him to continue the eclogues he was composing. By the year 37 Virgil was drinking in the wine of fame in Rome. The eclogues, or selections, had just been published and had been well received. Some verses had been recited on the stage by an actress and had been enthusiastically applauded. The poems were pastoral sketches in the manner, sometimes the phrases, of Theocritus, beautiful in style and rhythm, the most melodious hexameters that Rome had yet heard, full of pensive tenderness and romantic love. The youth of the capital had been long enough detached from the soil to idealize country life. Everyone was pleased to imagine himself a shepherd moving with his flocks up and down the Apennine slopes, and breaking his heart with love unreturned. Realer than these Theocritan ghosts were the rural scenes. Here, too, Virgil idealized, but he did not have to imitate. He had heard the woodman's lusty song and the hovering restlessness of bees, and he had known the empty-hearted despair of the farmer who, like thousands then, had lost his land. Above all, he felt intensely the hopes of the age for an end to faction and war. The Sibylline books had predicted that after the Age of Iron— the golden age of Saturn would return. When in 40 BC a son was born to Virgil's patron, Asinius Polio, the poet announced in his fourth eclogue that this birth would usher in utopia. Now comes the final age announced in the Cumean Sibyl's chant. The great succession of epochs is born anew. 
Now the Virgin returns, the reign of Saturn returns. Now a new race descends from heaven on high. O chaste Lucina, goddess of births, smile upon the boy just born, in whose time the race of iron shall first cease, and a race of gold shall arise throughout the world. Thine own Apollo is now king. Ten years later these prophecies were fulfilled. The iron tools of war were laid aside. A new generation took charge, armed and infatuated with gold. Through the brief remainder of Virgil's life, Rome would know no further turmoil. Prosperity and happiness increased, and Augustus was hailed as a savior, though not an Apollo. The quasi-royal court welcomed the optimism of the poet's verse. Messenus invited him, liked him, and saw in him a popular instrument of Octavian's reforms. This judgment showed insight, for to all appearances Virgil, now thirty-three, was an awkward rustic, shy to the point of stammering, shunning any public place where he might be recognized and pointed out, ill at ease in the voluble and aggressive fashionable society of Rome. Besides, even more than Octavian, he was an invalid, suffering from headaches, throat ailments, stomach disorders, and frequent spitting of blood. Virgil never married and seems to have felt no more than his Aeneas the full abandon of love. Apparently he consoled himself for a time with the affection of a boy slave. For the rest he was known at Naples as the Virgin. Messenus treated the youth generously, had Octavian restore his farm, and suggested to him some poems glorifying agricultural life. At that moment, 37 BC, Italy was paying a penalty for letting so much of her soil go to pasturage, orchards, and vines. Sextus Pompey was blocking the import of food from Sicily and Africa, and a shortage of grain threatened another revolution. City life was enervating the young manhood of Italy. From every standpoint, the health of the nation seemed to require the restoration of farming. Virgil readily agreed. He knew rural life, and though too frail now to bear its hardships, he was just the man to paint its attractive features with affectionate memory. He hid himself in Naples, and after seven years of file work emerged with his most perfect poems, the Georgics, literally the labor of the land. Messenus was delighted and brought Virgil south with him to meet Octavian, then in 29 BC returning from his victory over Cleopatra. At the little town of Attila the weary general rested and listened for four enchanted days to the two thousand lines. They fell in with his policies more completely than even Messenus had foreseen. For he proposed now to disband the larger part of the immense armies that had won the world for him, to settle his veterans on the land, and at once to quiet them, feed the cities, and preserve the state through rural toil. From that moment Virgil was free to think only of poetry. In the Georgics a great artist deals with the noblest of the arts, the cultivation of the earth. Virgil borrows from Hesiod, Eratus, Cato, Varro, but he transforms their rough prose or limping lines into finely chiseled verse. He covers dutifully the diverse branches of husbandry, the variety and treatment of soils, the seasons for sowing and reaping, the culture of the olive and the vine, the raising of cattle, horses, and sheep, and the care of bees. Every aspect of farming interests and beguiles him. He has to caution himself to get on. But meanwhile time flies, flies irreparably, while we, charmed with love of our theme, linger around each single detail. He has a word about the diseases of animals and how to treat them. He describes the common farm animals with understanding and sympathy. He is never through admiring the simplicity of their instincts, the power of their passions, the perfection of their forms. He idealizes rural life, but he does not ignore the hardships and vicissitudes, the crippling toil, the endless struggle against insects, the torturing pendulum of drought and storm. Nevertheless, labor omnia vincit. There is in such toil a purpose and result that give it dignity. No Roman need feel ashamed to guide a plow. Moral character, says Virgil, grows on the farm. All the old virtues that made Rome great were planted and nourished there, and hardly any process of seed-sowing, protection, cultivation, weeding, and harvesting but has its counterpart in the development of the soul. And out of the fields where the miracle of growth and the whims of the sky bespeak a thousand mystic forces, the soul, more readily than in the city, perceives the presence of creative life and is deepened with religious intuition, humility, and reverence. Here Virgil breaks into his most famous lines, beginning with a noble echo of Lucretius, but passing into a pure Virgilian strain. Happy the man who has been able to learn the causes of things, and has put underfoot all fear and inexorable fate, and the noise of a greedy hell. But happy too he who knows the rural deities, Pan, and old Sylvanus, and the sister nymphs. The peasant is right in seeking to propitiate the gods with sacrifice, and enlist their goodwill. 
These exercises of piety brighten the round of toil with festivals and clothe earth and life with meaning, drama, and poetry. Dryden considered the Georgics the best poem of the best poet. It shares with the De Rerum Natura the rare distinction of being at once didactic and beautiful. Rome did not take it seriously as a handbook of agriculture. We do not hear that anyone, having read it, exchanged the forum for a farm. Indeed, as Seneca thought, Virgil may have written these rural ecstasies precisely to please an urban taste. In any case, Augustus felt that Virgil had performed Messenus' assignment marvelously well. He called the poet to his palace and suggested a harder task, a vastly larger theme. 3. The Aeneid At first the plan was to sing the battles of Octavian, but the supposed descent of his adoptive father from Venus and Aeneas led the poet, perhaps the emperor, to conceive an epic on the founding of Rome. As the theme developed, it came to include, by preview through prophecy, the expansion of Rome into the Augustan Empire and peace. It would also show the role of Roman character in these achievements and seek to make the ancient virtues popular. It would picture its hero as reverent of the gods and guided by them, and would fall in with the Augustan reformation of morals and faith. Virgil retired to various lairs in Italy and spent the next ten years, from twenty-nine to nineteen, on the Aeneid. He wrote slowly with the devotion of a Flaubert, dictating a few lines in the fresh morning and rewriting them in the afternoon. Augustus waited impatiently for the poem's completion, repeatedly inquired about its progress, and importuned Virgil to bring him any finished fragment. Virgil put him off as long as he could, but finally read to him the second, fourth, and sixth books. Octavia, Antony's widow, fainted at the passage describing her son Marcellus, but lately dead. The epic was never completed and never finally revised. In 19 BC, Virgil visited Greece, met Augustus in Athens, was sunstruck in Megara, started home, and died soon after reaching Brundisium. On his deathbed, he begged his friends to destroy the manuscript of his poem, saying that at least three years more would have been necessary to give it finished form. Augustus forbade them to carry out the request. Every schoolboy knows the story of the Aeneid. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 8, Side 2 Every schoolboy knows the story of the Aeneid. As Troy burns, the ghost of the slain Hector appears to the leader of his Dardanian allies, the pious Aeneas, and bids him resume from the Greeks the holy things and household gods of Troy. Above all, the Palladium, or image of Pallas Athene, on the retention of which the preservation of the Trojans was believed to depend. Seek for these sacred symbols, says Hector, the city which, when you have wandered over the sea, you shall at last establish. Aeneas escapes with his old father, Anchises, and his son, Ascanius. They set sail and stop at divers places, but always the voices of the gods command them to go on. Winds drive them ashore near Carthage, where a Phoenician princess, Dido, is founding a city. When Virgil wrote this, Augustus was carrying out Caesar's plan for rebuilding Carthage. Aeneas falls in love with her. A convenient storm enables them to take refuge in the same cave and to consummate what Dido considers their marriage. For a time, Aeneas accepts her interpretation and shares with her and his willing men the tasks of construction. But the relentless gods, who in classic myth never cared much for marriage, warn him to depart. This is not the capital that he must make. Aeneas obeys and leaves the mourning queen with a theme song in his words. I will never deny, O queen, that thou hast deserved of me the utmost thou canst set forth in speech. I never held out the bridegroom's torch, nor took the marriage vow. But now Apollo has bidden me sail. Cease then to consume thyself and me with these complaints. Not of my own will do I seek Italy. Italium non sponte sequor. This is the secret of the tale. We who, after eight centuries of sentimental literature, judge Virgil and his hero in its terms, attach far more significance to romantic love and to extramarital relations than did either Greece or Rome. Marriage was to the ancients a union of families rather than of bodies or souls, and the demands of religion or fatherland were placed above the rights or whim of the individual. Virgil treats Dido sympathetically and rises to one of his finest passages in telling how she flings herself upon a funeral pyre and is burned alive. Then he follows Aeneas to Italy. Landing at Cumae, the Trojans march into Latium and are welcomed by its king, Latinus. 
His daughter Lavinia is betrothed to Turnus, the handsome chief of the neighboring Rutuli. Aeneas alienates her affection and her father. Turnus declares war upon him and Latium, and mighty battles ensue. To refresh and encourage Aeneas, the Cumean Sibyl takes him through the grotto of Lake Avernus into Tartarus. As Virgil writes an odyssey of Aeneas's wanderings and a short Iliad of his wars, so now he takes a lead from Odysseus's tour of Hades, and becomes in turn an exemplar and guide for Dante. Facilis decensus Averni, easy is the descent to hell, says Virgil. But his hero finds the way tortuous, and the lower world confusingly complex. There he meets Dido, who scorns his protestations of love. There he sees the varied torments with which earthly sin is punished, and the prison house where suffer Lucifer-like rebellious demigods. Then the Sibyl takes him through mystic passages to the blissful groves, where those who led good lives bask in green valleys and endless joys. His father, Anchises, who has died en route, expounds to him here the Orphic doctrine of heaven, purgatory, and hell, and reveals to him in panoramic vision the future glory and heroes of Rome. In a later vision, Venus shows him the battle of Actium and the triumphs of Augustus. His spirits revived, Aeneas returns to the living world, kills Turnus, and scatters death about him with epic hand. He marries the shadowy Lavinia, and when her father dies, he inherits the throne of Latium. Soon afterwards, he falls in battle and is transported to the Elysian fields. His son, Ascanius, or Eulus, builds Alba Longa as the new capital of the Latin tribes, and thence his descendants Romulus and Remus go forth to establish Rome. It seems unmannerly to criticize so gentle a soul as Virgil for all these grateful flatteries to his country and his emperor, or to find flaws in a work that perhaps he had never wished to write and never lived to complete. Of course it imitates Greek models, so does practically all Roman literature except the satire and the essay. The battle scenes are weak echoes of the Iliad's clanging phrase, and Aurora rises as often as Homer's rosy-fingered dawn. Nevius, Ennius, and Lucretius lend the poet episodes and phrases, sometimes whole lines, and Apollonius of Rhodes, through his Argonautica, provides a model for Dido's tragic love. Such borrowings were judged legitimate in Virgil's as in Shakespeare's days. All Mediterranean literature was viewed as the heritage and storehouse of every Mediterranean mind. The mythological background tires us now that we are making our own, but these divine allusions and interpositions were familiar and pleasant even to skeptical readers of Roman poetry. We miss in the smooth epic of the ailing Virgil the torrential narrative of Homer, the life and blood reality that moves the giants of the Iliad or the homely folk of Ithaca. Virgil's story often lags, and his characters are almost all anemic except those whom Aeneas abandons or destroys. Dido is a living woman, gracious, subtle, passionate. Turnus is a simple and honest warrior, betrayed by Latinus and doomed to an unmerited death by ridiculous gods. After ten cantos of Kant, we resent the piety of Aeneas, which leaves him no will of his own, excuses his treachery, and brings him success only by supernatural intervention. We do not enjoy the windy speeches with which he kills good men, adding a rhetorical boredom to that competitive perforation which is humanity's final test of truth. To understand and appreciate the Aeneid, we must at every turn remind ourselves that Virgil was writing not a romance, but a sacred scripture for Rome, not that he offers any clear theology. The gods who pull the strings of his drama are as vicious as Homer's and not as humorously human. Indeed, all the mischief and suffering in the story are caused not by men and women, but by deities. Probably Virgil conceived these divinities as poetical machinery, symbols of tyrannous circumstance and disruptive chance. In general, he oscillates between Jove and an impersonal fate as the ruler of all things. He likes the gods of the village and the field better than those of Olympus. He loses no opportunity to commemorate them and describe their rights, and he wishes that his fellow men could recapture the pietas, the reverence toward parents, fatherland, and gods, which was nourished by that primeval rural creed. Eu pietas, eu prisca fides, he mourns, alas for the old piety and faith. But he rejects the traditional conception of a Hades, in which all the dead bear alike a gloomy fate. He plays with Orphic and Pythagorean ideas of reincarnation and a future life, and makes as vivid as he can the notion of a rewarding heaven, a cleansing purgatory, and a punishing hell. The real religion of the Aeneid is patriotism, and its greatest god is Rome. The destiny of Rome moves the plot, and all the tribulations of the tale find meaning in the heavy task of establishing the Roman race. Tantae molis erat Romanam condere gentem. The poet is so proud of the empire that he looks with no envy upon the superior culture of the Greeks. 
Let other peoples transform into living figures marble and bronze, and chart the courses of the stars. But thou, O Roman, must the peoples rule. Thine arts shall be to teach the ways of peace, to spare the humbled and throw down the proud. Nor does Virgil resent the death of the Republic. He knows that class war, not Caesar, killed it. At every stage of his poem he foreshadows the restorative rule of Augustus, hails it as Saturn's reign returned, and promises him as reward admission to the company of the gods. No man ever fulfilled a literary commission more perfectly. Why do we retain a warm affection for this pietistic, moralistic, chauvinistic, imperialistic propagandist? Partly because the gentleness of his spirit is on every page, because we feel that his sympathies have spread from his own fair Italy to all men, even to all life. He knows the sufferings of the lowly and the great, the obscene ghastliness of war, the brief mortality that stalks the noblest men, the griefs and pains, the lacrimae rerum, or tears in things, that mar and accentuate the sunshine of our days. He is not merely imitating Lucretius when he writes of the nightingale mourning beneath the poplar's shade the loss of her young ones, whom some hard plowman has seen and torn unfledged from their nest. All night long she cries, and perched on a spray, renews her pitiful song, filling the woods with her sad lament. But what draws us back to Virgil again and again is the persistent loveliness of his speech. It is not in vain that he poured over every line, licking it into shape as the she-bear does her cubs. And only the reader who has tried to write can guess the toil that made this narrative so smooth, and adorned it with so many passages of sonorous melody that every second page cries out for quotation and tempts the tongue. Perhaps the poem is too uniformly beautiful. Even beauty palls upon us if its eloquence is prolonged. There is a delicate feminine charm in Virgil, but seldom the masculine power and thought of Lucretius, or the surging tide of that many-billowed sea called Homer. We begin to understand the melancholy ascribed to Virgil when we picture him preaching beliefs that he could never recapture, writing for ten years an epic whose every episode and line required the effort of artificial art, then dying with the haunting thought that he had failed— that no spark of spontaneity had set his imagination on fire or spurred his figures into life. But over his medium, if not over his subject, the poet won a complete victory. Artifice has seldom achieved a brighter miracle. Two years after his death, his executors gave the poem to the world. There were some detractors. One critic published an anthology of his defects, another listed his pilferings, another printed eight volumes of resemblances between lines in Virgil and in earlier poetry. But Rome soon forgave this literary communism. Horace ranked Virgil fondly with Homer, and schools inaugurated nineteen hundred years of memorizing the Aeneid. Plebeian and aristocrat mouthed him, artisans and shopkeepers, tombstones and scribbled walls quoted him. Temple oracles gave responses through ambiguous verses of his epic. The custom began, and lasted till the Renaissance, of opening Virgil at random and finding some counsel or prophecy in the first passage that struck the eye. His fame grew until in the Middle Ages he was considered a magician and a saint. Had he not, in the fourth eclogue, predicted the coming of the Savior, and in the Aeneid described Rome as the holy city from which the power of religion would uplift the world? Had he not, in that terrible Book Six, pictured the last judgment, the sufferings of the wicked, the cleansing fire of purgatory, the happiness of the blessed in paradise? Virgil, too, like Plato, was anima naturaliter Christiana, despite his pagan gods. Dante loved the elegance of his verse and took him as guide not only through hell and purgatory, but also in the art of flowing narrative and beautiful speech. Milton thought of him when writing Paradise Lost and the pompous orations of devils and men. And Voltaire, of whom we should have expected a harsher judgment, ranked the Aeneid as the finest literary monument left us by antiquity. 4. Horace one of the pleasantest pictures in the world of letters, where jealousy is only less rife than in love, is Virgil introducing Horace to Maecenas. The two poets had met in 40 B.C. when Virgil was 30 and Horace 25. Virgil opened the doors of Maecenas to him a year later, and all three remained fast friends till death. In 1935, Italy celebrated the 2,000th birthday of Quintus Horatius Flaxus. He was born in the little town of Venusia, in Apulia. His father was an ex-slave who had risen to the dignity of a tax collector, or some say a fishmonger. Flaxus meant flap-eared. Horatius was probably the name of the master whom the father had served. Somehow the freedman prospered, sent Quintus to Rome for rhetoric, and to Athens for philosophy. There the youth joined the army of Brutus and received command of a legion. 
It was duce et decorum pro patria mori, sweet and honorable to die for one's country. But Horace, who often imitated Archilochus, dropped his shield in the midst of battle and took to his heels. After the war was over, he found himself shorn of all property and patrimony, and barefaced poverty drove me to writing verses. Actually, however, he buttered his bread by being a quester's clerk. He was short and stout, proud and shy, disliking the common crowd, and yet not having the garb or means to move in circles whose education might equal his own. Too cautious to marry, he contented himself with courtesans who may have been real, or may have been forms of poetic license invented to demonstrate maturity. He wrote of prostitutes with scholarly restraint and intricate prosody, and thought he deserved much for not seducing married women. Too poor to ruin himself sexually, he took to books and composed Greek and Latin lyrics in the most recondite of Greek meters. Virgil saw one of these poems and praised it to Messenus. The kindly epicure was complimented by Horace's stammering timidity and found a sly relish in his sophisticated thought. In 37, Messenus took Virgil, Horace, and some others on a jaunt by canal boat, stagecoach, litter, and foot across Italy to Brundisium. Shortly afterward, he introduced Horace to Octavian, who proposed that Horace should become his secretary. The poet excused himself, having no passion for work. In 37, Messenus gave him a house and income-producing farm in the Sabine Valley of Eustica, some forty-five miles from Rome. Horace was now free to live in the city or the country, and to write as authors dream of writing, with lazy leisure and laborious care. For a while he stayed in Rome, enjoying the life of an amused spectator of the hurrying world. He mingled with all ranks, studying the types that made up Rome, contemplating with clinical pleasure the follies and vices of the capital. He pictured some of these types in two books of satires, from 34 and 30 B.C., modeled at first on Lucilius and later in a milder and more tolerant strain. He called these poems sermones, not by any means sermons, but informal conversations, sometimes intimate dialogues, in almost colloquial hexameters. He confessed that they were prose and everything but meter, for you would not call one a poet who writes as I do lines more akin to prose. In these racy verses we meet the living men and women of Rome and hear them talking as Romans talked, not the shepherds, peasants, and heroes of Virgil, nor the legendary lechers and heroines of Ovid, but the saucy slave, the vain poet, the pompous lecturer, the greedy philosopher, the gabbing boar, the eager Semite, the businessman, the statesman, the streetwalker. This at last, we feel, is Rome. With homicidal playfulness, Horace lays down for the hunter of legacies the rules for success in that ghoulish game. He laughs at the gourmets who feast on delicacies and limp with gout. He reminds the laudator temporis acti, the praiser of times past, that if some god were for taking you back to those days, you would refuse every time. The chief charm of the past is that we know we need not live it again. He wonders like Lucretius at the restless souls who in the city long for the country, and there long for the city, who can never enjoy what they have because there is someone who has more, who, not content with their wives, hanker with too great and yet too little imagination for the charms of other women who have in turn become prose to other men. Money madness, he concludes, is the basic disease of Rome. He asks the itching gold-seeker, why do you laugh at Tantalus, from whose thirsty lips the water always moves away? Change the name, and the story is about you. Mutato nomine de te fabula narratur. He satirizes himself, too. He represents his slave, telling him to his face that he, the moralist, is hot-tempered, never knows his own mind or purpose, and is the menial of his passions like anybody else. It is doubtless to himself, as well as to others, that he recommends the golden mean, aurea mediocritas. Est modus in rebus, he says. There's a limit, a measure in things which the intelligent man will neither fall short of nor exceed. In opening his second series of satires, he complains to a friend that the first group were criticized as too savage and too weak. He asks advice and is told, take a rest. What? the poet objects. Not write verses at all? Yes, but I can't sleep. He would have done well to take the advice for a time. His next publication, The Epodes, or Refrains, from 29 B.C., is the least worthy of his works, harsh and coarse, ungenerous, tastelessly and bisexually obscene, forgivable only as an experiment in the iambic meters of Archilochus. Perhaps his disgust with the smoke and wealth and noise of Rome had mounted to bitterness. He could not bear the pressure of the ignorant and evil-thinking crowd. 
He pictures himself jostled and jostling in the human flotsam of the capital and cries out, O rural home, when shall I behold you? When shall I be able, now with the books of the ancients, now with sleep and idle hours, to quaff sweet forgetfulness of life's cares? When will beans, the very brethren of Pythagoras, be served to me, and greens well larded with fat bacon? O nights and feasts divine! His stays in Rome become shorter. He spent so much time in his Sabine villa that his friends, even Messinus, complained that he had cut them out of his life. After the heat and dust of the city he found the pure air, the peaceful routine, and the simple workman on his farm a cleansing delight. His health was poor, and like Augustus he lived for the most part on a vegetarian diet. My stream of pure water, my few acres of woodland, my sure trust in a crop of corn bring me more blessing than the lot of the dazzling lord of fertile Africa. In him, as in the other Augustan poets, the love of country life finds a warm expression rare in the literature of Greece. Beatus ile qui procul negotiis. Happy is he who far from business cares, even as the oldest race of men, tills with his own oxen his patrimonial fields, freed from every debt. How sweet it is to lie under the ancient ilex tree, or on the matted grass, while the stream flows on between high banks, and the woodland birds sing, and springs with leaping waters plash, inviting to soft sleep. It should be added, however, that these lines are put with Horatian irony into the mouth of a city moneylender, who, having uttered them, at once forgets them, and loses himself in his coins. Probably it was in those quiet haunts that he labored with painstaking happiness, curiosa felicitas, over those odes by which he knew that his name would live or die. He was tired of hexameters, the endless march of their measured feet, the sharp cejura cleaving the line like some inexorable guillotine. He had enjoyed in his youth the subtle and vivacious meters of Sappho, Alcaeus, Archilochus, and Anacreon. He proposed now to transplant these sapphics and alcaics, these iambics and hendecasyllabics, into Roman lyric form, to express his thoughts on love and wine, religion and the state, life and death, in stanzas refreshingly new, epigrammatically compact, modeled for music, and teasing the mind with the complex skein of their weaving. He did not intend them for simple or hurried souls. Indeed, he warned such a way by the blue-nosed opening of the third group. I hate and shun the profane crowd. Be silent. I, priest of the muses, sing for maidens and youths songs never heard before. The maidens, if they had cared to tread and skip their way through Horace's playful inversions of speech and desire, might have been pleasantly shocked by the chiseled epicureanism of these odes. The poet pictures the pleasures of friendship, eating and drinking, and making love. One would hardly surmise from such lords that their author was a recluse who ate little and drank less. Why disturb ourselves with Roman politics and distant wars, he asks, anticipating the reader of these pages. Why plan so carefully a future whose shape will laugh at our plans? Youth and beauty touch us and flit away. Let us enjoy them now, reclining under the pine trees, our grey locks garlanded with roses and perfumed with Syrian nard. Even as we speak, envious time runs out, seize the occasion, carpe diem, snatch the day. He intones a litany of loose ladies whom he claims to have loved. Lilligi, Glycera, Niera, Inica, Cinera, Candia, Lysi, Pyrrha, Lydia, Tyndarus, Chloe, Phyllis, Myrtle. We need not believe all his protestations of guilt. These were literary exercises almost compulsory among the poets of the day. The same ladies or names had served other pens. The now virtuous Augustus was not deceived by these iambic fornications. He was pleased to find among them stately praises of his reign, his victories, his aids, his moral reforms, and the Augustan peace. Horace's famous drinking song, Nunc est bibendum, was composed on receipt of the news that Cleopatra was dead and Egypt taken. Even his sophisticated soul thrilled at the thought of the empire victorious and expanding as never before. He warned his readers that new laws could not take the place of old morals, mourned the spread of luxury and adultery, of frivolity and cynical unbelief. Alas, he says, referring to the latest war, the shame of our scars and crimes, and of brothers slain. What have we of this hard generation shrunk from? What iniquity have we left untouched? Nothing could save Rome but a return to the simplicity and steadfastness of ancient ways. The skeptic who found it difficult to believe anything bent his hoary head before the ancient altars, acknowledged that without a myth the people perish, and lent his pen graciously to the ailing gods. There is nothing in the world's literature quite like these poems, 
delicate and yet powerful, exquisite and masculine, subtle and intricate, hiding their art with perfect art, and their toil with seeming ease. This is music in another scale than Virgil's, less melodious and more intellectual, meant not for youths and maidens, but for artists and philosophers. There is rarely any passion here, or enthusiasm, or fine writing. The diction is simple even where the sentence stands on its head. But in the greater odes there is a pride and majesty of thought, as if an emperor were speaking, and not in letters but in bronze. I have raised a monument more lasting than bronze, loftier than the royal peaks of pyramids. No biting storm can bring it down, no impotent north wind, nor the unnumbered series of the years, nor the swift course of time. I shall not wholly die. The slandered crowd ignored the odes, the critics denounced them as tiresome artifice, the Puritans declaimed against the songs of love. Augustus pronounced the poems immortal, asked for a fourth group that would celebrate the exploits of Drusus and Tiberius in Germany, and chose Horace to write the Carmen Seculare for the secular games. Horace complied, but without inspiration. The effort of the odes had exhausted him. In his final work he relaxed into the conversational hexameters of the satires, and wrote his epistles as from an easy chair. He had always wanted to be a philosopher. Now he abandoned himself to wisdom, even while remaining a causeur. Since a philosopher is a dead poet and a dying theologian, Horace, old at forty-five, was ripe to discuss God and man, morals and literature and art. The most famous of these letters, named by later critics the Art of Poetry, was addressed ad pisones, to some uncertain members of the Piso clan. It was no formal treatise, but a bit of friendly advice on how to write. Choose a subject suited to your powers, Horace says. Beware of laboring like a mountain and producing a mouse. The ideal book is that which at the same time instructs and entertains. He who has mingled the useful with the pleasant wins every vote. Omne tulit punctum qui misquit utile dulci. Avoid words that are new, obsolete, or sesquipedalian, foot-and-a-half words. Be as brief as clarity allows. Go straight to the heart of the matter, in medias res. In writing poetry, do not imagine that emotion is everything. It is true that you must feel an emotion yourself if you wish the reader to feel it. Civis me flere, dolendum est primum ipsi tibi. But art is not feeling, it is form. Here again is the challenge of the classic to the romantic style. To achieve form, study the Greeks day and night. Erase almost as much as you write. Delete every purple patch. Purpureus panus. Submit your work to a competent critic, and beware of your friends. If it survives all this, put it away for eight years. If then you do not perceive the uses of oblivion, publish it, but remember that it can never be recalled except by time. Verba volant, scripta manent. If you write drama, let the action, not your words, tell the story and delineate the characters. Do not represent horror on the stage. Obey the unities of action, time, and place. Let the story be one and occur within a brief time in one place. Study life and philosophy, for without observation and understanding, even a perfect style is an empty thing. Sapere aude, dare to know. Horace himself had obeyed all these precepts, but one, he had not learned to weep. Because his feelings were too thin or had been stifled into silence, he seldom rose to the high art that gives form to sincere sympathy, or to emotion remembered in tranquility. He was too urbane. Nil admirari. To marvel at nothing was poor advice. To the poet everything should be a miracle, even when, like the sunrise or a tree, it greets him every day. Horace observed life, but not too deeply. He studied philosophy, but kept so persistently an even mind that only his odes rise above a golden mediocrity. He honored virtue like a Stoic and respected pleasure like an Epicurean. Who then is free, he asks, and answers, like Zeno, the wise man who is lord over himself, whom neither poverty nor death nor bonds affright, who defies his passion, scorns ambition, and is in himself a whole. One of his noblest poems sings a Stoic strain. If man is just and resolute, the whole world may break and fall upon him and find him in the ruins undismayed. But despite all this, he calls himself with engaging honesty a pig from Epicurus's sty. Like Epicurus, he placed more store on friendship than on love. Like Virgil, he lauded the reforms of Augustus and remained a bachelor. He did his best to preach religion, but he had none. Death, he felt, ends all. His last days were clouded with this thought. He had his share of pains— 
stomach trouble, rheumatism, and much else. The years as they pass, he mourned, rob us of all joys, one by one. And to another friend, alas, O oh, posthumous, the fleeting years slip by, nor shall piety hold back our wrinkles or pressing age or indomitable death. He recalled how in his first satire he had hoped, when his time came, to quit life contentedly, like a guest who has had his fill. Now, he told himself, you have played enough, eaten enough, drunk enough. It is time for you to go. Fifteen years have passed since he had told Messinus that he would not long survive the financier. In 8 BC, Messinus died, and a few months later Horus followed him. He left his property to the emperor and was laid to rest near Messinus's tomb. 5. Livy Augustan prose achieved no triumphs equal to those of Augustan verse. Oratory subsided as the making of laws and decisions passed in reality, if not in form, from senate and assemblies to the secret chambers of the prince. Scholarship continued its quiet course, sheltered from present storms by its ghostly interests. It was only in the writing of history that the age achieved a masterpiece in prose. Born in Patavium, now Padua, in 59, Titus Livius came to the capital, devoted himself to rhetoric and philosophy, and gave the last forty years of his life, from 23 B.C. to A.D. 17, to writing a history of Rome. That is all we know of him. Rome's historian has no history. Like Virgil, he came from the region of the Po, retained the old virtues of simplicity and piety, and, perhaps through the pathos of distance, developed a passionate reverence for the Eternal City. His work was planned on a majestic scale and was completed. Of its 142 books, only 35 have come down to us. As these fill six volumes, we may judge the magnitude of the whole. Apparently it was published in parts, each with a separate title, and all under the general heading Ab Urbe Condita, from the city's foundation. Augustus could forgive its republican sentiments and heroes, since its religious, moral, and patriotic tone accorded well with the emperor's policies. He took Livy into his friendship and encouraged him as a prose Virgil who was beginning where the poet had left off. Halfway on his long journey from 753 to 9 BC, Livy thought of stopping on the ground that he had already won lasting fame. He went on, he says, because he found himself restless when he ceased to write. Roman historians looked upon history as a hybrid child of rhetoric and philosophy. If we may believe them, they wrote to illustrate ethical precepts with eloquent narrative, to adorn a moral with a tale. Livy was trained as an orator. Finding oratory censured and dangerous, he took to history, says Ten, so that he could still be an orator. He began with a stern preface denouncing the immorality, luxury, and effeminacy of the age. He buried himself in the past, he tells us, to forget the evils of his time, when we can bear neither our diseases nor their remedies. He would set forth, through history, the virtues that had made Rome great, the unity and holiness of family life, the pietas of children, the sacred relation of men with the gods at every step, the sanctity of the solemnly pledged word, the Stoic self-control and gravitas. He would make that Stoic Rome so noble that its conquest of the Mediterranean would appear as a moral imperative, a divine order and law cast over the chaos of the East and the barbarism of the West. Polybius had ascribed Rome's triumph to its form of government. Livy would make it a corollary of the Roman character. The chief faults of his work derive from this moral intent. He gives many signs of being privately a rationalist, but his respect for religion is so great that he accepts almost any superstition and litters his pages with omens, portents, and oracles, until we feel that here too, as in Virgil, the real actors are the gods. He expresses his doubts concerning the myths of early Rome, he gives the less credible ones with a smile, but as he goes on he ceases to distinguish legend from history, follows his predecessors with scant discrimination, and accepts at their face value the laudatory romances that earlier historians had composed to ennoble their ancestry. He read of his greatness. It gave him an enduring happiness in his long toil. Seldom has any writer executed so vast a plan so faithfully. It gave his readers, and still gives us, a sense of Rome's grandeur and destiny. This imperial consciousness contributed to the energy of Livy's style, the vigor of his characterizations, the brilliance and power of his descriptions, the majestic march of his prose. The invented speeches in which his history abounds are masterpieces of oratory and became models for the schools. The charm of good manners pervades the work, 
Livy never shouts, never severely condemns. His sympathy is broader than his scholarship and deeper than his thought. It fails him forgivably when he comes to Hannibal, but he atones with a sweep and splendor of narrative that reaches its zenith in describing the Second Punic War. His readers did not mind his inaccuracies or his bias. They liked his style and story, and gloried in the vivid picture that he had drawn of their past. They took the Ab Urbe Condita as a prose epic, one of the noblest monuments of the Augustan age and mood. From that time onward, it was Livy's book that would color for eighteen centuries men's conception of Rome's history and character. Even readers in subject lands were impressed by this massive record of unprecedented conquests and titanic deeds. The younger Pliny tells of a Spaniard who was so moved by Livy's work that he traveled from far Cadiz to Rome in the hope of seeing him. Having accomplished his purpose and tendered his worship, he neglected other sites and returned content to his Atlantic home. 6. The Amorous Revolt Meanwhile, poetry continued to flourish, but not quite on the lines of Augustus's desire. Only supreme artists like Virgil or Horace can produce good verse to governmental specifications. Greater men would refuse, lesser men are unable to comply. Of the three major sources of poetry, religion, nature, love, two had been brought under imperial sway. The third remained lawless, even in Horace's odes. Now, mildly in Tabalus and Propertius, recklessly in Ovid, poetry escaped from the Bureau of Propaganda and staged a rebellion that proceeded with mounting gaiety to a tragic end. Albius Tabalus, from 59 to 19, like Virgil, lost his ancestral lands when the civil war reached the little town of Pedum, near Tiber, that had seen his birth. Messala rescued him from poverty and took him in his train to the east, but Tibullus fell ill on the way and returned to Rome. He was happy to be free from war and politics. Now he could give himself to genderless love and the polishing of elegiac verse in the manner of the Alexandrian Greeks. To Delia, otherwise unknown and perhaps one name for many, he addressed the usual supplications, sitting like a gatekeeper, Yanitor, before her stubborn doors, and reminding her, as so many maids have been reminded, that youth comes but once and soon steals away. It did not disturb him that Delia was married, he put the husband to sleep with undiluted wine, but fumed when her new lover played the same trick upon him. These ancient themes might not have harassed Augustus. What made Tibullus, Propertius, and Ovid really disagreeable to a government that was finding it hard to enlist recruits for the army was the persuasive anti-militarism of this love-loose set. Tibullus laughs at warriors who forage for death when they might have been seducing women. He mourns for the age of Saturn when he imagines... There were no armies, no hatred, no war. There was no war when men drank from wooden cups. Give me but love and let others go to war. The hero is he whom, when his children have been begotten, old age overtakes in his humble cottage. He follows his sheep, his son follows the lambs, while the good wife heats the water for his weary limbs. So let me live till the white hairs glisten on my head, and I tell in my old man's fashion of the days gone by." Sextus Propertius, 49 to 15, sang less simply and tenderly and with more learned ornaments the same idol of peaceful lechery. Born in Umbria, educated in Rome, he soon lapsed into verse, and though few readers could fetch his thought from the wells of his pedantry, Messinus took him into his circle on the Esquiline. He describes with pride and pleasure the dinners there on the banks of the Tiber, when he would drink the wine of Lesbos in cups chiseled by great artists, and, seated as on a throne amid merry women, would watch the vessels gliding by on the river below. To please his patron and his prince, Propertius now and then plucked his lyre in praise of war, but to his mistress, Cynthia, he sang another tune. Why should I raise sons for Parthian triumphs? No child of ours shall be a soldier. Not all the martial glory in the world, he assured her, could equal one night with Cynthia. Of all these Epicureans, light of heart and head, who spent their lives climbing and descending the Mount of Venus, Publius Ovidius Naso was the happy model and poet laureate. Sulmo, now Saloma, saw his birth in 43 BC in a pleasant valley of the Apennines, some ninety miles east of Rome. How beautiful from the cold exile of his later years would seem Sulmo's vineyards, olive groves, cornfields, and streams. His rich middle-class father sent him to Rome to study law and was shocked to hear that the boy wished to be a poet. He held up to the lad the awful fate of Homer, who, according to the best authorities, had died blind and poor. So warned, Ovid managed to rise to the post of a judge in the praetorial courts. 
Then, to his father's dismay, he refused to run for the questorship, from which he would have emerged a senator, and returned to the cultivation of literature and love. He pleaded that he could not help being a poet. I lisped in numbers, and the numbers came. Arvid travelled leisurely to Athens, the Near East, and Sicily, and, returning, joined the loosest circles in the capital. Possessed of charm, wit, education, and money, he was able to open all doors. He married twice in early manhood, was twice divorced, and then grazed for a time in public pastures. Let the past please others, he sang. I congratulate myself on being born into this age, whose morals are so congenial to my own. He laughed at the Aeneid, and merely concluded from it that since the son of Venus had founded Rome, it should, if only out of piety, become the city of love. He lost his head to a pretty courtesan, whose anonymity or multiplicity he hides under the name of Corinna. His racy couplets about her had no trouble in finding a publisher. Under the title of Amores, they were soon, in 14 B.C., on the lips and lyres of youthful Rome. On every hand, people want to know who is this Corinna that I sing about. He mystified them, in a second series of Amores, by writing a pronunciamento of promiscuity. It is no fixed beauty that calls my passion forth. There are a hundred causes to keep me always in love. If it is some fair one with modest eyes downcast upon her lap, I am aflame, and her innocence is my ensnaring. If it is some saucy jade, I am smitten because she is not rustic simple, and gives me hope of enjoying her supple embrace on the soft couch. If she seems austere, and affects the rigid Sabine dame, I judge she would yield, but is deep in her conceit. If you are versed in books, you win me by your rare accomplishments. One treads softly, and I fall in love with her step. Another is hard, but can be softened by the touch of love. Because this one sings sweetly, I would snatch kisses as she sings. This other runs with nimble fingers over the complaining strings. Who could but fall in love with such cunning hands? Another takes me by her movement, swaying her arms in rhythm and curving her tender side with supple art. To say naught of myself, who take fire from every cause. Put Hippolytus in my place, and he will be Priapus. Tall and short are after the wish of my heart. I am undone by both. My love is candidate for the favors of them all. Ovid apologizes for not chanting the glory of war. Cupid came and stole a foot from his verse and left it lame. He wrote a lost play, Medea, which was well received, but for the most part he preferred the slothful shade of Venus and was content to be called the well-known singer of his worthless ways. Here are the lays of the troubadours a thousand years before time, addressed like them to married ladies and making flirtation the main business of life. Ovid instructs Corinna how to communicate with him by signs as she lies on her husband's couch. He assures her of his eternal fidelity, his strictly monogamous adultery. I am no fickle philanderer, not one of those who love a hundred women at a time. At last he wins her and intones a paean of victory. He commends her for having denied him so long and advises her to deny him again now and then so that he may love her forever. He quarrels with her, strikes her, repents, laments, and loves her more madly than before. Romeo-like he begs the dawn to delay and hopes some blessed wind will break the axle of Aurora's car. Corinna deceives him in his turn, and he is furious on finding that she holds her favors insufficiently rewarded by the homage of his verse. This book is continued on Cassette 9, Side 1. The Story of Civilization Volume 3 Caesar and Christ Part 1 by Will Durant Continued Cassette 9, Side 1 Corinna deceives him in his turn, and he is furious on finding that she holds her favors insufficiently rewarded by the homage of his verse. She kisses him into forgiveness, but he cannot pardon the new skill of her loving. Some other master has been teaching her. A few pages later, he is in love with two maids at once, each beautiful, each tasteful in dress and accomplishment. Soon, he fears, his simultaneous duties will undo him, but he will be happy to die on the field of love. These poems were tolerantly received by Roman society four years after the passing of the Julian reform laws. Great senatorial families like the Fabii, the Corvini, the Pomponii continued to entertain Ovid in their homes. Buoyant with success, the poet issued a manual of seduction called Ars Amatoria, this in 2 BC. I have been appointed by Venus, he says, as tutor to tender love. He chastely warns readers that his precepts must be applied only to courtesans and slaves. 
but his pictures of whispered confidences, secret assignations, billet doux, raillery and wit, deceived husbands and resourceful handmaids, suggest the middle and upper classes of Rome. Lest his lessons should prove too apt, he added another treatise, Remedia Amoris, on curing love. The best remedy is hard work, next, hunting, third, absence. It is also useful to surprise your lady in the morning before she has completed her toilette. Finally, to make the balance even, he wrote De Medicamina Faciei Femininiae, a metrical manual of cosmetics pilfered from the Greeks. These little volumes sold so well that Ovid soared to heights of insolent fame. So long as I am celebrated all the world over, it matters not to me what one or two pettifoggers say about me. He did not know that one of these pettifoggers was Augustus, that the prince resented his poems as an insult to the Julian laws, and would not forget the insult when imperial scandal should touch the poet's careless head. About the third year of our era, Ovid married a third time. His new wife belonged to one of the most distinguished families in Rome. Now forty-six, the poet settled down to domestic life and seems to have lived in mutual faith and happiness with Fabia. Age did to him what law could not. It cooled his fires and made his poetry respectable. In the Heroides, he told again the love stories of famous women, Penelope, Phaedra, Dido, Ariadne, Sappho, Helen, Hero. Told them perhaps at too great length, for repetition can make even love a bore. Startling, however, is a sentence in which Phaedra expresses Ovid's philosophy. Jove decreed that virtue is whatever brings us pleasure. About A.D. 7, the poet published his greatest work, The Metamorphoses. These fifteen books recounted in engaging hexameters the renowned transformations of inanimate objects, animals, mortals, and gods. Since almost everything in Greek and Roman legend changed its form, the scheme permitted Ovid to range through the whole realm of classical mythology, from the creation of the world to the deification of Caesar. These are the old tales that until a generation ago were de rigueur in every college, and whose memory has not yet been erased by the revolution of our time. Phaethon's chariot, Pyramus and Thisbe, Perseus and Andromeda, the rape of Proserpine, Arethusa, Medea, Daedalus and Icarus, Baucis and Philemon, Orpheus and Eurydice, Atalanta, Venus and Adonis, and many more. Here is the treasury from which a hundred thousand poems, paintings, and statues have taken their themes. If one must still learn the old myths, there is no more painless way than by reading this kaleidoscope of men and gods, stories told with skeptical humor and amorous bent, and worked up with such patient art as no mere trifler could ever have achieved. Little wonder that at the end the confident poet announced his own immortality. Per secula omnia vivam, I shall live forever. He had hardly written the words when news came that Augustus had banished him to cold and barbarous Tomai on the Black Sea, even today unalluring as Constanta. It was a blow for which the poet, rounding fifty-one, was wholly unprepared. He had just composed, toward the close of the Metamorphoses, an elegant tribute to the emperor, whose statesmanship he now recognized as the source of that peace, security, and luxury which Ovid's generation had enjoyed. He had half completed, under the title of Fasti, an almost pious poem celebrating the religious feasts of the Roman year. In these verses he was on the way to make an epic out of a calendar, for he applied to the tales of the old religion, and to the honoring of its shrines and gods, the same lucid facility, delicacy of word and phrase, and even flow of racy narrative that he had devoted to Greek mythology and Roman love. He had hoped to dedicate the work to Augustus as a contribution to the religious restoration, and as an apologetic palinode to the faith he had once scorned. The emperor gave no reason for his edict, and no one today can fathom its causes confidently. He offered some hint, however, by at the same time banishing his granddaughter Julia, and ordering that Ovid's works should be removed from the public libraries. The poet had apparently played some role in Julia's misconduct, whether as witness, accomplice, or principal. He himself declared that he was punished for an error and his poems, and implied that he had been the unwilling observer of some indecent scene. He was given the remaining months of the year, that of A.D. 8, to arrange his affairs, the decree was relegatio, softer than exile in allowing him to retain his property, harsher in commanding him to stay in one city. He burned his manuscripts of the Metamorphoses, but some readers had made copies and preserved them. 
Most of his friends avoided him. A few dared the lightning by staying with him till his departure. And his wife, who remained behind at his bidding, supported him with affection and loyalty. Otherwise, Rome took no notice as the bard of its joys sailed out of Ostia on the long voyage from everything that he had loved. The sea was rough nearly all the days of that trip, and the poet thought once that the waves would engulf the vessel. When he saw Tomai, he regretted that he had survived and gave himself over to grief. On the voyage he had begun those verses which we know as Tristia, sorrows. Now he continued them and sent them to his wife, his daughter, his stepdaughter, and his friends. Probably the sensitive Roman exaggerated the horrors of his new home, a treeless rock where nothing would grow, and yet shut out from the sun by the yuke she holds her favors insufficiently rewarded that in some years the snow remained all summer long, the black sea stiff with ice through gloomy winters, and the Danube so frozen that it offered no bar to the raids of hinterland barbarians upon the city's mixture of knife-wearing Giti and half-breed Greeks. When he thought of Roman skies and Solmo's fields, his heart broke, and his poetry, still beautiful in form and phrase, took on a depth of feeling that it had never fathomed before. These Tristia, and the poetic letters to his friends Ex Ponto, from the Pontus or Black Sea, have nearly all the charms of his greater works. A simple vocabulary that made him a pleasure even in school, scenes vividly realized by insight and imagery, characters brought to life by touches of psychological subtlety, phrases compact with experience or thought, an unfailing grace of speech and flowing ease of line. All these stayed with him in his exile, attended by a seriousness and tenderness whose absence makes the earlier poems unworthy of a man. Strength of character never came to him. As once he had spoiled his verse with superficial sensuality, so now he flooded his lines with tears and suppliant adulation of the prince. He envied these poems which could go to Rome. Go, my book, and in my name greet the places I love. And the dear soil of my native land. Perhaps, he tells it, some brave friend will hand it to a relenting emperor. In every letter he still hopes for pardon, or pleads for at least some milder home. He thinks each day of his wife and calls her name in the night. He prays that he may kiss her whitened hairs before he dies. But no pardon came. After nine years of exile, the broken man of sixty welcomed death. His bones, as he had begged, were brought to Italy and buried near the capital. His prediction of lasting fame was justified by time. His hold on the Middle Ages rivaled Virgil's. His metamorphoses and heroides became rich sources of medieval romance. Boccaccio and Tasso, Chaucer and Spencer drew upon him without stint, and the painters of the Renaissance had a treasure trove of subjects in his sensuous verse. He was the great romanticist of a classic age. With his passing ended one of the great flowering epochs in the history of letters— the Augustan was not a supreme literary age, like the Periclean or Elizabethan. Even at its best, there is in its prose a pompous rhetoric, and in its verse a formal perfection that seldom come from soul to soul. We find no Aeschylus here, no Euripides, no Socrates, not even a Lucretius or a Cicero. Imperial patronage inspired and nourished, repressed and narrowed the literature of Rome. An aristocratic age, like that of Augustus or Louis the Fourteenth or 18th century England, exalts moderation and good taste and tends in letters to a classic style in which reason and form dominate feeling and life. Such literature is more finished and less powerful, more mature and less influential than the literature of passionately creative periods or minds. But within the classic range, this age deserved the compliment of its name. Never had sober judgment found expression in such perfect art. Even the madcap revelry of Ovid was cooled into a classic mold. In him, and Virgil, and Horace, the Latin language as a poetic medium reached its zenith. It would never be so rich and resonant, so subtle and compact, so pliant and melodious again. Chapter 13 The Other Side of Monarchy A.D. 14-96 to 96. Note, all further dates will be A.D., unless otherwise noted. 1. Tiberius. When great men stoop to sentiment, the world grows fonder of them, but when sentiment governs policy, empires totter. Augustus had chosen Tiberius wisely, but too late. When Tiberius was saving the state with patient generalship, the emperor had almost loved him. Farewell, one of his letters ended, most agreeable of men, most valiant of men, 
most conscientious of commanders. Then the pathos of propinquity blinded Augustus, as later Aurelius. He set Tiberius aside for his pretty grandsons, compelled him to renounce a fortunate marriage to become the cuckold of Julia, resented his resentment, and let him grow old with philosophy in Rhodes. When at last Tiberius reached the Principate, he was already fifty-five, a disillusioned misanthrope who found no happiness in power. To understand him, we must remember that he was a Claudian. With him began the Claudian branch of that Julio-Claudian dynasty, which ended with Nero. Through both parents, he inherited the proudest blood in Italy, the narrowest prejudices, the strongest will. He was tall, powerful, and well-featured, but acne accentuated his shyness, his awkward manners, his moody diffidence, and his love of seclusion. The fine head of Tiberius in the Boston Museum shows him as a young priest, with broad forehead, large deep eyes, and pensive countenance. He was so serious in youth that wags called him the old man. He received all the education that Rome, Greece, environment, and responsibility could afford. He learned the two classic languages and literatures well, wrote lyrics, dabbled in astrology, and neglected the gods. He loved his brother Drusus, despite the young man's superior popularity. He was a devoted husband to Vipsania, and so generous to his friends that they could safely give him presents in the expectation of a fourfold return. The severest as well as the ablest general of his time, he gained the admiration and affection of his soldiers, because he watched over every detail of their welfare and won his battles by strategy rather than by blood. His virtues ruined him. He believed the stories told about the Mos Maiorum and wished to see the stern qualities of old Rome reborn in the new Babylon. He approved the moral reforms of Augustus and made clear his intention to enforce them. He had no liking for the ethnic farrago that steamed in the cauldron of Rome. He gave it bread but no circuses, and defended it by not attending the games presented by rich men. He was convinced that Rome could be saved from a vulgar degeneration only by an aristocracy stoic in conduct and refined in taste. But the aristocracy could no more than the people bear his stiff neck and sober countenance, his long silences and slow speech, his visible awareness of his own excellence, and, worst of all, his grim husbanding of the public funds. He had been misborn a Stoic in an Epicurean age, and he was too coldly honest to learn Seneca's art of preaching the one doctrine in beautiful language and practicing the other with graceful constancy. Four weeks after the death of Augustus, Tiberius appeared before the Senate and asked it to restore the Republic. He was unfit, he told them, to rule so vast a state. In a city so well provided with men of illustrious character— the several departments of public business could be better filled by a coalition of the best and ablest citizens. Not daring to take him at his word, the Senate exchanged bows with him until at last he accepted power as a wretched and burdensome slavery, and in the hope that some day the Senate would permit him to retire to privacy and freedom. The play was well acted on both sides. Tiberius wanted the Principate, or he would have found some way to evade it. The Senate feared and hated him, but shrank from re-establishing a republic based like the old, upon theoretically sovereign assemblies. It wanted less democracy, not more, and it was pleased when Tiberius, in A.D. 14, persuaded it to take over from the Comitia Centuriata the power of choosing the public officials. The citizens complained for a time, mourning the loss of the sums they had received for their votes. The only political power now left to the common man was the right of electing the emperor by assassination. After Tiberius, democracy passed from the assemblies to the army, and voted with the sword. He seems to have sincerely disliked monarchy and to have considered himself the administrative head and arm of the Senate. He refused all titles that savored of royalty, contented himself with that of Princeps Senatus, stopped all efforts to deify or offer worship to his genius, and made evident his distaste for flattery. When the Senate wished to name a month after him, as it had done for Caesar and Augustus, he turned the compliment aside with dry humor. What will you do if there should be thirteen Caesars? He rejected a proposal that he should revise the senatorial list. Nothing could surpass his courtesy to this ancient assembly of kings. He attended its meetings, referred even the smallest matters to its judgment, sat and spoke as merely a member, was often in the minority, and made no protest when decrees were passed contrary to his expressed opinion. He was self-contained and patient, according to Suetonius, in the face of abuse, slander, and lampoons against himself and his family. In a free country, he said, there should be freedom of speech and thought. 
His nominations, the hostile Tacitus admits, were made with judgment. The consuls and the praetors enjoyed the ancient honors of their rank. The subordinate officials exercised their functions free from imperial control. The laws, if we accept those of violated majesty, flowed in their regular channel. The revenues were administered by men of distinguished probity. In the provinces no new burdens were imposed, and the old duties were collected without cruelty or extortion. Good order prevailed among his slaves. In all questions of right between the emperor and individuals, the courts of justice were open, and the law decided. This Tiberian honeymoon lasted nine years, during which Rome, Italy, and the provinces enjoyed government as good as any in their history. Without additional taxes, despite many benefactions to stricken families and cities, the careful repair of all public property, the absence of booty-yielding wars, and the rejection of bequests made to the prince by persons with children or near relatives, Tiberius, who had found one hundred million sesterces in the treasury on his accession, left two billion seven hundred million there at his death. He tried to check extravagance by example rather than by law. He labored carefully on every aspect of domestic and foreign affairs. To provincial governors anxious to collect more revenues, he wrote that it was the part of a good shepherd to shear his flock, not fleece it. Though skilled in the art of war, he denied himself, as prince, the glories of the battlefield, and after the third year of his long reign he kept the empire at peace. It was this pacific policy that marred the progress of his rule. His handsome and popular nephew, Germanicus, whom he had adopted as his son at Drusus's death, had won some victories in Germany and wished to go on to its conquest. Tiberius advised against it to the disgust of the imperialistic populace. Because Germanicus was a grandson of Mark Antony, those who still dreamed of restoring the Republic used him as a symbol for their cause. When Tiberius transferred him to the east, half of Rome called the young commander a martyr to the prince's jealousy— and when Germanicus suddenly took sick and died in 19, nearly all Rome suspected that Tiberius had had him poisoned. Nius Piso, an appointee of Tiberius in Asia Minor, was accused of the crime and was tried by the Senate. Foreseeing condemnation, he killed himself to save his property for his family. No facts appeared to indicate Tiberius's innocence or guilt. We know only that he asked the Senate to give Piso a fair trial, and that Germanicus's mother, Antonia, remained to the end of her life the most faithful friend of Tiberius. The excited participation of the public in the celebrated case, the scurrilous tales circulated about the emperor, and the agitation now aroused against him by Germanicus's widow Agrippina, induced Tiberius to avail himself of that Lex Julia de Majestate, or Law of Treason, which Caesar had passed to define crimes against the state. Since Rome had no public prosecutor or attorney general, and, before Augustus, no police, Every citizen was empowered and requested to accuse before the courts any person whom he knew to have violated a law. If the accused was condemned, the delator or informer was awarded a fourth of the convicted man's goods, while the state confiscated the rest. Augustus had used this dangerous procedure to enforce his marriage laws. Now, as plots multiplied against Tiberius, delatores sprang up to profit from denouncing them, and the supporters of the prince in the Senate were ready to prosecute such accusations vigorously the emperor sought to restrain them. He interpreted the law strictly in the case of persons charged with defaming the memory or statues of Augustus. But personalities leveled against himself, says Tacitus, were to be let pass unpunished. He assured the Senate that his mother Livia wished a similar leniency shown to assailants of her good name. Livia herself was now a major problem of state. Tiberius's failure to remarry left him with no protection, against a strong-minded woman accustomed to exercise authority over him. She felt that her maneuvers had cleared his way to the throne, and she gave him to understand that he held it only as her representative. During the earlier years of Tiberius's reign, though he was approaching sixty, his official letters were signed by her as well as by himself. But not satisfied to rule on equal terms with him, says Dio, she wished to assert a superiority over him, and undertook to manage everything like a sole ruler. Tiberius long bore this situation patiently, but as Livia survived Augustus fifteen years, he at last built himself a separate palace and left his mother in undisputed possession of that which Augustus had raised. Gossip accused him of cruelty to her and of having starved his exiled wife. Meanwhile, Agrippina was pushing her son Nero to succeed, if possible, to replace Tiberius. This, too, he bore with hot patience, merely chiding her with a Greek quotation— do you think a wrong is done you, dear daughter, if you are not empress? 
Hardest of all for him to bear was the realization that his only son, Drusus, born to him by his first wife, was a worthless rake, cruel, ill-mannered, and lecherous. The self-control with which Tiberius supported these tribulations left his nerves on edge. He retired more and more into himself, and developed a gloom of countenance and severity of speech that scattered all but his most hopeful friends. One man seemed unfailingly loyal to him, Lucius Elius Sejanus. As prefect of the Praetorian Guard, Sejanus professed his duty to protect the prince. Soon no one was admitted to the emperor's presence except through the hands and under the watch of the crafty vizier. Gradually Tiberius entrusted to him more and more of the government. Sejanus persuaded him that the imperial safety required the closer presence of the Praetorian Guard. Augustus had stationed six of its nine cohorts outside the city limits. Tiberius now allowed all nine to pitch their camp at the Viminal Gate, only a few miles from the Palatine and the capital. There they became first the protectors, then the masters of the emperors. So supported, Sejanus exercised his powers with increasing boldness and venality. He began by recommending men for office, he advanced his fortune by selling offices to the highest bidders, he ended by aspiring to the Principate. A senate of real Romans would soon have overthrown him, but the senate had, with many exceptions, become an epicure's club, too listless to wield competently even the authority that Tiberius had urged it to retain. Instead of unseating Sejanus, it crowded Rome with statues voted by it in his image and honor, and at his suggestion it banished one after another of Agrippina's followers. When Tiberius's son Drusus died, Rome whispered that Sejanus had poisoned him. Overcome with disappointment and bitterness, Tiberius, now a lonely and melancholy man of sixty-seven, left the hectic capital and removed to the inaccessible privacy of Capri. But gossip followed him without impediment. People said that he wished to conceal his emaciated figure and scrofulous face, and to indulge himself in drink and unnatural vice. Tiberius drank considerably, but was no drunkard. The story of his vices was probably calumny. Most of his companions on Capri, says Tacitus, were Greeks distinguished in nothing but literature. He continued to administer carefully the affairs of the empire, except that he communicated his views and desires to officials and the Senate through Sejanus. Since the Senate increasingly feared him, or Sejanus, or the hovering guard, it accepted the wishes of the emperor as commands. And without any change in the constitution, and with no clear insincerity on Tiberius's part, the Principate became a monarchy under the man who had proposed to restore the Republic. Sejanus took advantage of his position to exile more of his enemies by having them accused under the law of majesty, and the weary emperor no longer interfered. If we may believe Suetonius, Tiberius was now often guilty of cruelty, and we have the word of the unreliable Tacitus that he asked and obtained the death penalty for Papius Sabinus on the ground that spies had overheard him plot against the government. A year later, in twenty-seven, Livia died, sad and lonely in the home of her former husband. Tiberius, who had seen her but once since leaving Rome, did not attend her funeral. Freed from the restraint that the mother of her country might have exercised, Sejanus now persuaded Tiberius that Agrippina and her son Nero had been involved in the conspiracy of Sabinus. The mother was banished to Pandateria and the son to the island of Pontia, where shortly afterward he killed himself. Having won everything else, Sejanus now reached for the throne. Irked by a letter which Tiberius had written to the Senate recommending Gaius, son of Agrippina, as successor to the Principate, Sejanus formed a plot to kill the emperor in 31. Tiberius was saved by Germanicus's mother, Antonia, who risked her life to send him a warning. The old prince, not yet destitute of resolution, secretly placed a new prefect over the Praetorians, had Sejanus arrested and accused him to the Senate. Never had that body so gladly complied with the imperial wishes. It condemned Sejanus with expedition and had him strangled that very night. A reign of terror followed, led partly by senators whose interests, relatives, or friends had been injured by Sejanus, and partly by Tiberius, whom fear and anger, topping an accumulation of disillusionments, had plunged into a fury of revenge. Every important agent or supporter of Sejanus was put to death. Even his young daughter was condemned and since the law forbade the execution of a virgin, she was first deflowered and then strangled. Apicata, his divorced wife, committed suicide, but only after she had sent Tiberius a letter assuring him that Antonia's daughter Livilla had joined with Sejanus in poisoning her husband Drusus, the emperor's son. Tiberius ordered Livilla tried, but she refused food until she died. 
Two years later, in 33, Agrippina killed herself in exile, and another of her sons, having been imprisoned, starved himself to death. Tiberius lingered for six years after the fall of Sejanus. Probably his mind was now disordered. Only on this supposition can we explain the incredible cruelties attributed to him. We are told that he now supported instead of checked accusations for maestas. All in all, sixty-three persons were indicted on this charge during his reign. He begged the Senate to provide protection for an old and lonely man. In thirty-seven, he left Capri after nine years of self-imprisonment and visited some cities in Campania. While stopping at Lucullus's villa in Mycenaeum, he fell in a fainting fit and seemed dead. The courtiers at once flocked about Gaius, soon to be emperor, and then were shocked to learn that Tiberius was recovering. A friend of all concerned ended the embarrassment by smothering Tiberius with a pillow. This in 37. He was, said Momsen, the ablest ruler the empire ever had. Almost every misfortune had come to him during his life, and after his death he fell upon the pen of Tacitus. 2. Gaius the populace celebrated the old emperor's passing with cries of Tiberius to the Tiber and hailed the Senate's ratification of Gaius Caesar Germanicus as his successor. Born to Agrippina as she was accompanying Germanicus on his northern campaigns, Gaius had been brought up among soldiers, had imitated their dress, and had been affectionately named Caligula, or Little Boot, from the half-boot, or Caliga, worn in the army. He now announced that he would follow the principles of Augustus in his policy, and would cooperate respectfully with the Senate in everything. He distributed among the citizens the ninety million sesterces that Livia and Tiberius had bequeathed them, and added a gift of three hundred sesterces to each of the two hundred thousand recipients of state corn. He restored to the Comitia the power to choose the magistrates, promised low taxes and rich games, recalled the banished victims of Tiberius, and brought his mother's ashes piously to Rome. He seemed to be in all ways the opposite of his predecessor, prodigal, cheerful, humane. Within three months of his accession, the people had sacrificed 160,000 victims to the gods in gratitude for so charming and beneficent a prince. They had forgotten his lineage. His father's mother was the daughter of Antony, his mother's mother was the daughter of Augustus. In his blood, the war between Antony and Octavian was renewed, and Antony won. Caligula was proud of his skill as a dueler, a gladiator, and a charioteer but he was troubled with the falling sickness, and at times he was hardly able to walk or collect his thoughts. He hid under the bed when it thundered and fled in terror from the sight of Etna's flames. He found it hard to sleep and would wander through his enormous palace at night, crying for the dawn. He was tall, huge, hairy, except for a bald crown. His hollow eyes and temples made him look forbidding, to his delight. He practiced all kinds of fearsome expressions before a mirror— he had received a good schooling, was an eloquent orator, had a keen wit, and a sense of humor that knew no scruple and no law. Infatuated with the theater, he subsidized many performers and himself privately acted and danced. Desiring an audience, he summoned the leaders of the Senate, as if to some vital conference, and then displayed his steps before them. A quiet life of responsible labor might have steadied him, but the poison of power made him mad. Sanity, like government, needs checks and balances— no mortal can be omnipotent and sane. When Caligula's grandmother Antonia gave him some advice, he rebuked her with the remark, Remember that I have the right to do anything to anybody. In the midst of a banquet, he reminded his guests that he could have them all killed where they reclined, and while embracing his wife or mistress, he would say pleasantly, Off comes this beautiful head whenever I give the word. Soon, therefore, the young prince who had been so respectful of the Senate began to give it orders and exact an oriental subservience. He let the senators kiss his feet in homage, and senators thanked him for the honor. He admired Egypt and its ways, introduced many of these to Rome, and longed to be worshipped pharaoh-like as a god. He made the religion of Isis one of the official cults of the Roman state. He did not forget that his great-grandfather had planned to unite the Mediterranean region under an oriental monarchy— he too thought of making his capital of Alexandria, but distrusted the wit of its people. Suetonius describes him as living in habitual incest with all his sisters. It seemed to him an excellent Egyptian custom. Ill, he made his sister Drusilla heir to his throne. When she married, he made her divorce her husband and treated her as his lawful wife. To other desired women, he sent letters of divorce in their husbands' names and invited them to his embraces. 
there was scarcely one woman of rank whom he did not approach. Amid these and some homosexual amours he found time for four marriages. Attending the wedding of Livia Oristilla and Gaius Piso, he took the bride to his own house, married her, and in a few days divorced her. Hearing that Lalia Paulina was very beautiful, he sent for her, divorced her from her husband, married her, divorced her, and forbade her to have relations with any man thereafter. His fourth wife, Sisonia, was pregnant by her husband when he married her. She was neither young nor fair, but he loved her faithfully. In this imperial frolic, government was an aside and could usually be left to inferior minds. Caligula ably revised the roster of the business class and promoted its best members to the Senate. But his extravagance soon exhausted the full treasuries left him by Tiberius. He took his baths not in water but in perfumes. On one banquet he spent ten million sesterces. He built great pleasure barges with colonnades, banquet halls, baths, gardens, fruit trees, and gem-set sterns. He had his engineers span by his bay with a bridge resting on so many boats that Rome suffered famine for lack of ships to import corn. When the bridge was completed, a great celebration took place, illuminated by floodlights in the modern manner. The people drank merrily, boats overturned, and many were drowned. From the roof of the Basilica Julia he would scatter gold and silver coins among the people below and watch with glee their fatal scrambling. He was so devoted to the green faction at the races that he gave a charioteer two million sesterces. He built a marble stall and an ivory manger for the racehorse Incidatus, invited it to dinner, and proposed to make it consul. To raise funds for his lifelong Saturnalia, Caligula restored the custom of presenting gifts to the emperor. He accepted these in person on his palace terrace from all who came to give. He encouraged citizens to name him heir in their wills. He levied taxes upon everything. A sales tax on all food, a tax on all legal processes, a twelve and a half percent tax on the wages of porters. On the earnings of prostitutes, Suetonius avers, he laid a tax of as much as each received for one embrace— and the law provided that those who had ever been prostitutes should remain subject to this tax even after they married. He had rich men accused of treason and condemned to death as an aid to the treasury. He personally auctioned off gladiators and slaves, and forced aristocrats to attend and bid. When one of these slept, Caligula interpreted his nods as bids, so that the sleeper waking found himself richer by thirteen gladiators and poorer by nine million sesterces. He compelled senators and knights to fight as gladiators in the arena. After three years a conspiracy was formed to end this humiliating buffoonery. Caligula detected it and revenged himself by a reign of terror enhanced by his manic joy in inflicting pain. The executioners were instructed to kill his victims by numerous slight wounds, so that they may feel that they are dying. If we may believe Dio Cassius, he forced his saintly grandmother Antonia to kill herself. Suetonius recounts that when meat ran short for feeding the beasts kept for gladiatorial games, Caligula ordered all bald-headed prisoners to be fed to the animals for the public good, that he had men of high rank branded with irons, condemned to mines, thrown to beasts, or shut up in caves, and then sawn in two. These are stories that we have no means of disproving and must record as the tradition. But Suetonius loved gossip, the senator Tacitus hated the emperors, and Dio Cassius wrote two centuries after the event. More credible is the report that Caligula began the war between the Principate and philosophy by exiling Corinus Secundus and sentencing two other teachers to death. The young Seneca was marked for execution but was spared because he was sickly and might be relied upon to die without prodding. Claudius, uncle of Caligula, escaped because he was, or pretended to be, an insignificant book-ridden dolt. Caligula's final pleasantry was to announce himself as a god, equal to Jupiter himself. Famous statues of Jove and other deities were decapitated and crowned with heads of the emperor. He enjoyed sitting on a throne in the temple of Castor and Pollux and receiving divine worship. At times he would converse with an image of Jupiter, often in terms of reproof and he had a contrivance made by which he could reply to Jove's thunder and lightning peal for peal and stroke for stroke. He set up a temple to his godhead, with a corps of priests and a supply of select victims, and he appointed his favorite horse as one of the priests. He pretended that the moon goddess had come down to embrace him, and asked Vitellius could he not see her. No, answered that wise courtier, only you gods can see one another."
The people were not deceived. When a Gallic cobbler saw Caligula masquerading as Jupiter and was asked what he thought of the emperor, he said simply, a big humbug. Caligula heard but did not punish such refreshing courage. At twenty-nine this god was an old man, worn out by excesses, probably venereally diseased, with a small and half-bald head upon a fat body, with a livid complexion, hollow eyes, and a sinister glance. His fate came suddenly, and from that Praetorian guard whose support he had long purchased with gifts. A tribune of the guard, Cassius Chirea, insulted by the obscenities that Caligula gave him as passwords day after day, killed him in a secret passage of the palace in 41. When the news went out, the city hesitated to believe it. Men feared that this was a trick of the imperial prankster to find out who would rejoice at his death. To clarify the issue, the assassins killed Caligula's final wife and dashed out his daughter's brains against a wall. On that day, says Dio, Caligula learned that he was not a god. 3. Claudius Caligula had left the empire in a dangerous condition the treasury empty, the senate decimated, the people alienated. Mauritania in rebellion, Judea in arms at his insistence on placing his cult statue in the temple of Jerusalem. No one knew where to find a ruler fit to face these problems. The praetorians, coming upon the apparently imbecile Claudius hiding in a corner, proclaimed him imperator. The senate, in terror of the army and perhaps relieved by the prospect of dealing with a harmless pedant instead of a reckless lunatic, confirmed the choice of the guard, and Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus hesitantly mounted the throne. He was the son of Antonia and Drusus, the brother of Germanicus and Livilla, the grandson of Octavia and Antony, of Livia and Tiberius Claudius Nero. He had been born at Lugdunum, or Lyon, in the year 10 BC, and was now fifty years old. He was tall and stout, with white hair and an amiable face, but infantile paralysis and other diseases had weakened his frame. His legs were precariously thin and gave him a shambling gait. His head wobbled as he walked. He loved good wines and rich food and suffered from gout. He stuttered a bit and his laughter seemed too boisterous for an emperor. In anger, says the merciless gossiper, he would foam at the mouth and trickle at the nose. He had been brought up by women and freedmen, had developed a timidity and sensitivity hardly advantageous to a ruler, and had had few opportunities to practice government. His relatives had looked upon him as a feeble-minded invalid. His mother, who had inherited Octavius' gentleness, called him an unfinished monster, and when she wished to stress a man's dullness, she would term him a bigger fool than my Claudius. Scorned by all, he lived in safe obscurity, absorbed in gambling, books, and drink. He became a philologist and antiquarian, learned in ancient art, religion, science, philosophy, and law. He wrote histories of Etruria, Carthage, and Rome, treatises on dice and the alphabet, a Greek comedy, and an autobiography. Scientists and savants corresponded with him and dedicated their tomes to him. Pliny the Elder cites him four times as an authority. As emperor, he told his people how to cure snake bite, and forestalled superstitious fears by predicting a solar eclipse on his birthday and explaining its cause. He spoke Greek well and wrote several of his works in that language. He had a good mind. Perhaps he was sincere when he told the Senate that he had pretended stupidity in order to save his head. His first act as emperor was to reward with a donative of 15,000 sesterces every soldier of that guard which had raised him to the throne. Caligula had given such gifts, but not so clearly in payment for the empire. Now Claudius acknowledged the sovereignty of the army while cancelling again the power of the assembly to choose the magistrates. With wiser generosity, he ended accusations de maestate, released persons imprisoned on such charges, recalled all exiles, restored confiscated property, returned to Greece the statues that Gaius had stolen, and abolished the taxes that Gaius had introduced. But he put to death Caligula's assassins on the theory that it was unsafe to condone the murder of an emperor. He ended the practice of prostration and announced simply that he was not to be worshipped as a god. Like Augustus, he repaired the temples and with antiquarian fervor sought to reanimate the old religion. He applied himself personally and conscientiously to public affairs. He even made the rounds of those who sold goods and let buildings, and corrected whatever he deemed to be abuses. But in truth, though he emulated the moderation of Augustus, his actual policies went beyond that cautious conservatism to the bold and varied plans of Caesar. The reform of government and law, the construction of public works and services, 
the elevation of the provinces, the enfranchisement of Gaul, and the conquest and Romanization of Britain. He surprised everyone by showing will and character as well as learning and intellect. Like Caesar and Augustus, he was convinced that the local magistrates were too few and untrained, the Senate too proud and impatient to do the complex work of municipal and imperial administration. He bowed to the Senate and left it many powers and more dignities, but the real labor of government was performed by himself, a cabinet of his appointees, and a civil service gradually organized, as under Caesar, Augustus, and Tiberius, out of the freedmen of the emperor's household, and using public slaves for clerical and minor tasks. Four cabinet members headed this bureaucracy, a secretary of state, Ab Epistulus, for communications, a treasurer, a rationibus, for accounts, another secretary, a libellus, for petitions, and an attorney general, a cognitionibus, for actions at law. Able freedmen, Narcissus, Pallas, and Callistus, held the first three posts. Their rise to power and wealth was the symbol of a wide elevation of the freedmen class, which had been going on for centuries and reached a new height in Claudius's reign. When the aristocracy protested against the empowerment of these parvenus, Claudius revived the office of censor, had himself chosen to it, revised the list of persons eligible to the Senate, eliminated the chief opponents of his policies, and added new members from the knights in the provinces. Equipped with these administrative organs, he set himself an ambitious program of construction and reform. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 9, Side 2. Equipped with these administrative organs, he set himself an ambitious program of construction and reform. He improved the procedure of the courts, decreed penalties for the law's delays, sat patiently as judge many hours every week, and forbade the application of torture to any citizen. To prevent the floods that endangered Rome all the more frequently as the Apennines were being denuded of timber, he had an additional channel dug for the lower course of the Tiber. To expedite the import of grain, he had a new harbor, Portus, built near Ostia, with commodious warehouses and docks, two great moles to break the fury of the sea, and a channel connecting the harbor with the Tiber above the river's silted mouth. He finished the Claudian aqueduct begun by Caligula, and constructed another, the Anionovus, both immense works and notable for the beauty of their lofty arches. Observing that the lands of the Martians were periodically swamped by the overflow of Lake Fusinus, he provided state funds for the labor of thirty thousand men during eleven years, digging a three-mile tunnel from the lake through a mountain to the river Cirrus. Before releasing the waters of the lake, he staged on it a sham naval battle between two fleets manned by nineteen thousand condemned criminals, before spectators gathered from all Italy upon the slopes of the surrounding hills. The combatants saluted the emperor with a historic phrase, Ave Caesar, morituri salutamus te. Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute you. The provinces prospered under him as in Augustan days. He punished decisively the malfeasance of officials, except in the case of Felix, procurator of Judea, whose misrule was concealed from him by Pallas, brother of St. Paul's inquisitor. He busied himself with every phase of provincial affairs. His edicts and inscriptions, found throughout the empire, are marked by his characteristic fussiness and prolixity, but they show a mind and will intelligently devoted to the public good. He labored to improve communication and transport, to protect travelers from brigandage, and to reduce the cost of the official post to the communities it served. Like Caesar, he wished to raise the provinces to the level of Italy in a Roman commonwealth. He carried out Caesar's design in granting full citizenship to Transalpine Gaul. If he had had his way, he would have enfranchised all freemen in the empire. A bronze tablet unearthed at Lyon in 1524 has preserved for us part of the rambling speech in which he persuaded the Senate to admit to its membership and to imperial office those Gauls who held the Roman franchise. Meanwhile, he did not allow the army to deteriorate or the frontiers to be infringed. His legions were kept busy and fit, and great generals like Corbulo, Vespasian, and Paulinus developed under his choice and encouragement. Again deciding to complete Caesar's plans, he invaded Britain in 43, conquered it, and was back in Rome within six months of setting out. 
In the triumph accorded him, he violated precedent by pardoning the captured British king, Caractacus. The people of Rome laughed at their strange emperor, but loved him, and when, on one of his absences from the capital, a false rumor spread that he had been killed, so great a turmoil of sorrow swept the city that the Senate had to issue official assurances that Claudius was safe and would soon be in Rome. From that great height he fell because he had built a government too complex for his personal supervision, and because his amiable spirit was too easily deceived by his freedmen and his family. The bureaucracy had improved administration and had made a thousand new openings for corruption. Narcissus and Pallas were excellent executives who considered their salaries unequal to their merits. To make up the difference, they sold offices, extorted bribes by threats, and brought charges against men whose estates they wished to confiscate. They ended by being the richest individuals in all antiquity. Narcissus had four hundred million sesterces, or sixty million dollars. Pallas was miserable because he had only three hundred million. When Claudius complained of a deficit in the imperial treasury, Roman wags remarked that he would have enough and to spare if he would take his two freedmen into partnership. The old aristocratic families, now comparatively poor, looked with horror upon these accumulations and powers, and burned with anger when they had to court ex-slaves to obtain a word with the emperor. Claudius was busy writing to appointees and scholars, preparing edicts and speeches, and attending to the needs of his wife. Such a man should have lived like a monk and barricaded himself against love. His wives proved a ruinous distraction, and his domestic policy was not as successful as his foreign. Like Caligula, he married four times. His first wife died on her wedding day. The next two he divorced. Then, aged forty-eight, he married Valeria Messalina, sixteen. She was not unusually pretty. Her head was flat, her face florid, her chest malformed. But a woman need not be beautiful to commit adultery. When Claudius became emperor, she assumed the rights and manners of a queen, rode in his triumph, and had her birthday celebrated throughout the empire. She fell in love with the dancer Menester. When he rejected her advances, she begged her husband to bid him to be more obedient to her requests. Claudius complied, whereupon the dancer yielded to her patriotically. Messalina rejoiced at the simplicity of her formula, and adopted it with other men. Those who still refused her were accused of invented crimes by officials pliant to her influence, and found themselves deprived of their property and their liberty, sometimes of their lives. Perhaps the emperor tolerated these irregularities to secure indulgence for his own. He was immoderate in his passion for women, says Suetonius, who adds, as a startling distinction, that Claudius was wholly free from unnatural vice. Messalina, says Dio, gave him attractive housemaids for bedfellows. Needing funds for her escapades, the empress sold offices, recommendations, and contracts. Juvenal has handed down the story that she would disguise herself, enter a brothel, receive all comers, and gladly pocket their fees. The tale was probably taken from the lost memoirs of Messalina's successor and foe, the younger Agrippina. While Claudius, says Tacitus, devoted all his time to the duties of his censorial office, including the supervision and improvement of Roman morals, Messalina gave a loose to love, and at last, while her husband was in Ostia, formally married a handsome youth, Caius Silius, with pomp and all accustomed rites. Narcissus informed the emperor through the latter's concubines, and told him that an uprising was being planned to kill him and put Silius on the throne. Claudius rushed back to Rome, summoned the Praetorian Guard, had Silius and other lovers of Messalina slain, and then retired in nervous exhaustion to his rooms. The empress hid herself in those gardens of Lucullus, which she had confiscated for her pleasure. Claudius sent her a message inviting her to come and plead her cause. Fearing that the emperor would forgive her and turn against him, Narcissus dispatched some soldiers with instructions to kill her. They found her alone with her mother, slew her with one blow, and left her corpse in her mother's arms, this in forty-eight. Claudius told the Praetorian guard that if he should ever marry again, they would be justified in killing him. He never mentioned Messalina again. Within a year he was hesitating whether to marry Lalia Paulina or the younger Agrippina. Lalia, ex-wife of Caligula, was rich. Sometimes, we are told, she wore jewelry worth forty million sesterces. Perhaps Claudius admired her money more than her taste. Agrippina was the daughter of the elder Agrippina and Germanicus. She, too, had in her the unreconciled blood of Octavian and Antony, and had succeeded to the beauty, ability, resolution, and unscrupulous vindictiveness of her mother. She was already twice a widow. By her first husband, Nius Domitius Ahinobarbus, she had a son Nero, whose enthronement became the ruling passion of her life. 
and from her second husband, Caius Crispus, whom rumor accused her of poisoning, she inherited the wealth that sinewed her aims. Her problem was to become the wife of Claudius, to get rid of his son Britannicus, and make Nero by adoption heir to the empire. The fact that she was Claudius's niece did not deter her, but gave her opportunities for fond intimacies that stirred the aging ruler in no avuncular way. Suddenly he appeared before the Senate and asked it to bid him marry again for the good of the state. The Senate complied, the Praetorians laughed, and Agrippina reached the throne in 48. She was 32, Claudius 57. His energies were failing, hers were at their height. Playing upon him with all her charms, she persuaded him to adopt Nero as his son and to give his thirteen-year-old daughter Octavia to the sixteen-year-old youth in marriage, this in fifty-three. She assumed more and more political power with each year and finally sat beside him on the imperial dais. She recalled the philosopher Seneca from the exile to which Claudius had condemned him and made him the tutor of her son in forty-nine, and she had her friend Burrus appointed prefect of the Praetorian Guard. So poised, she ruled with a virile hand and established order and economy in the imperial household. Her ascendancy might have been a boon to Rome had she not indulged her avarice and her revenge. She had Lalia Paulina put to death because Claudius, in a careless moment which no wife forgives, remarked on the elegance of Lalia's figure. She had Marcus Silanus poisoned because she feared that Claudius might name him his heir. She conspired with Pallas to overthrow Narcissus, and this moneyed potentate, as faithful as he was corrupt, ended his career in a dungeon. The emperor, weakened by ill health, many labors, and sexual enterprise, allowed Pallas and Agrippina to establish another reign of terror. Men were accused, exiled, or killed because the treasury was exhausted by public works and games and needed replenishment by confiscated wealth. Thirty-five senators and three hundred knights were condemned to death in the thirteen years of Claudius's reign. Some of these executions may have been justified by actual conspiracy or crime, we do not know. Nero later claimed that he had examined all the papers of Claudius, and that from these it appeared that not one prosecution had been set on foot by the emperor's order. After five years of his fifth marriage, Claudius awakened to what Agrippina was doing. He resolved to put an end to her power and circumvent her plans for Nero by naming Britannicus his heir. But Agrippina had more determination and less scruple. Perceiving the emperor's intentions, she risked everything. She fed Claudius poisonous mushrooms, and he died after twelve hours of agony, without being able to utter a word, this in fifty-four. When the Senate deified him, Nero, already enthroned, remarked that mushrooms must be the food of the gods, since by eating them Claudius had become divine. 4. Nero On his father's side, Nero belonged to the Domitii Ahinobarbi, so named from the bronze-like beards that ran in the family. For five hundred years they had been famous in Rome for ability, recklessness, haughtiness, courage, and cruelty. Nero's paternal grandfather had a passion for games and the stage, drove a chariot in the races, spent money with open hand on wild beasts and gladiatorial shows, and had to be reproved by Augustus for barbarous treatment of his employees and slaves. He married Antonia, daughter of Antony and Octavia. Their son, Nius Domitius, enhanced the reputation of the family by adultery, incest, brutality, and treason. In AD 28 he married the second Agrippina, then thirteen years old. Knowing his wife's ancestry and his own, he concluded that no good man can possibly be born from us. They named their only child Lucius, added the cognomen Nero, meaning, in the Sabine tongue, valiant and strong. The chief authors of his education were Chiremen the Stoic, who taught him Greek, and Seneca, who taught him literature and morals but not philosophy. Agrippina forbade the last on the ground that it would unfit Nero for government. The result was creditable to philosophy— like many a teacher, Seneca complained that his labors were thwarted by the mother. The boy would run to her when reproved and was sure to be comforted. Seneca sought to train him in modesty and courtesy, simplicity and stoicism. If he could not retail to him the doctrines and disputes of the philosophers, he could at least dedicate to him the eloquent philosophical treatises that he was composing and hope that some day his pupil might read them. The young prince was a good student, wrote forgivable poetry, and addressed the Senate in the graceful manner of his master. When Claudius died, Agrippina had no great difficulty in securing the confirmation of her son on the throne, especially since her friend Burrus brought to him the full support of the guard. Nero rewarded the soldiers with a donative and gave four hundred sesterces to every citizen. 
He pronounced over his predecessor a eulogy composed by the same Seneca who would soon publish, anonymously, a pitiless satire, Apocalocentosis, or pumpkinification, on the late emperor's ejection from Olympus. Nero made the usual obeisance to the Senate, modestly excused his youth, and announced that of the powers heretofore taken by the prince he would keep only the command of the armies, a highly practical choice for the pupil of a philosopher. The promise was probably sincere, since Nero kept it faithfully for five years. That quinquennium Neronis, which Trajan later accounted the best period in the history of the imperial government. When the Senate proposed that statues of gold and silver should be raised in his honor, the seventeen-year-old emperor rejected the offer. When two men were indicted for favoring Britannicus, he had the accusations withdrawn and in a speech to the Senate he pledged himself to observe throughout his reign that virtue of mercy which Seneca was then extolling in an essay, De Clementia. Asked to sign a death warrant for a condemned criminal, he sighed, Would that I had never learned to write. He abolished or reduced oppressive taxes, and gave annuities to distinguished but impoverished senators. Recognizing his immaturity, he allowed Agrippina to administer his affairs. She received embassies, and had her image engraved beside his own on the imperial coins. Alarmed by this matriarchate, Seneca and Burrus conspired by playing upon Nero's pride to win from her the administration of his powers. The infuriated mother announced that Britannicus was the true heir to the throne, and threatened to unmake her son as decisively as she had made him. Nero countered by having Britannicus poisoned. Agrippina retired to her villas and wrote her memoirs as a last vindictive stroke blackening all the enemies of herself and her mother, and providing Tacitus and Suetonius with that museum of horrors from which they drew the darker colors for their portraits of Tiberius, Claudius, and Nero. Under the guidance of the philosopher Premier, and on the impetus of the administrative organization already devised, the empire prospered within and without. The frontiers were well guarded, the Black Sea was cleared of pirates, Corbulo brought Armenia back under Rome's protectorate, and Parthia signed a peace that endured for fifty years. Corruption was reduced in the courts and the provinces, bureaucratic personnel was improved, the treasury was managed with economy and wisdom. Probably at Seneca's suggestion, Nero made the far-reaching proposal to abolish all indirect taxes, especially the customs duties collected at frontiers and ports, and so established free trade throughout the empire. The measure was defeated in the Senate through the influence of the tax-gathering corporations, a defeat which indicates that the Principate was still recognizing its constitutional limits. To divert Nero from interference with state affairs, Seneca and Burrus allowed him to indulge his sensuality unrestrained. At a time when vice had charms for all orders of men, says Tacitus, it was not expected that the sovereign should lead a life of austerity and self-denial. Nor could religious belief encourage Nero to morality— a smattering of philosophy had liberated his intellect without maturing his judgment. He despised all cults, says Suetonius, and voided his bladder upon an image of the goddess whom he most respected, Sibylle. His instincts inclined him to excessive eating, exotic desires, extravagant banquets where the flowers alone cost four million sesterces. Only misers, he said, counted what they spent. He admired and envied Caius Petronius, for that rich aristocrat taught him new ways of combining vice with taste. Petronius, says Tacitus in a classic description of the Epicurean's ideal, passed his days in sleep and his nights in business, joy, and revelry. Indolence was at once his passion and his road to fame. What others did by vigor and industry, he accomplished by his love of pleasure and luxurious ease. Unlike the men who profess to understand social enjoyment and ruin their fortunes, he led a life of expense without profusion an epicure yet not a prodigal, addicted to his appetites but with refinement and judgment, an educated and elegant voluptuary. Gay and airy in his conversation, he charmed by a certain graceful negligence, the more engaging as it flowed from the natural frankness of his disposition. With all his delicacy and careless ease, he showed, when he was governor of Bithynia, and again when consul, that vigor of mind and softness of manners may unite in the same person." From his public offices he returned to his usual gratifications, fond of vice or of pleasures that bordered on it. Cherished by Nero and his companions, he was allowed to be the arbiter of taste and elegance. Without his sanction nothing was exquisite, nothing delightful or rare. Nero was not subtle enough to achieve this artistic epicureanism. He disguised himself and visited brothels. 
He roamed the streets and frequented taverns at night with the comrades of his mood, robbing shops, insulting women, practicing lewdness on boys, stripping those whom they encountered, striking, wounding, murdering. A senator who defended himself vigorously against the disguised emperor was soon afterward forced to kill himself. Seneca sought to divert the royal lust by condoning Nero's relations with an ex-slave, Claudia Acti. But Acti was too faithful to him to keep his affections. He soon exchanged her for a woman of superlative refinement in all the ways of love. Papia Sabina was of high family and great wealth. She had everything, says Tacitus, except an honest mind. She was one of those women who spend all the day in adorning their persons, and exist only when they are desired. Her husband, Salvius Otho, boasted of her beauty to Nero. The emperor at once commissioned him to govern Lusitania, now Portugal, and laid siege to Papia. She refused to be his mistress, but agreed to be his wife if he would divorce Octavia. Octavia had borne the transgressions of Nero silently, and had preserved her own modesty and chastity amid the stream of sexual license in which she had been forced to live from her birth. It is to the honor of Agrippina that she lost her life in defending Octavia against Papia. She used every plea against the proposed divorce, even, says Tacitus, to offering her own charms to her son. Papia fought back with hers and won. Youth was served. She taunted Nero with being afraid of his mother, and led him to believe that Agrippina was plotting his fall. Finally, in the madness of his infatuation, he consented to kill the woman who had borne him and given him half the world. He thought of poisoning her, but she had guarded against this by the habitual use of antidotes. He tried to have her drowned, but she swam to safety from the shipwreck he had arranged. His men pursued her to her villa. When they seized her, she bared her body and said, Plunge your sword into my womb. It took many blows to kill her. The emperor, viewing the uncovered corpse, remarked, I did not know I had so beautiful a mother. Seneca, it is said, had no share in the plot, but the saddest lines in the history of philosophy tell how he penned a letter in which Nero explained to the Senate how Agrippina had plotted against the prince and, being detected, had killed herself. The Senate gracefully accepted the explanation, came in a body to greet Nero returning to Rome, and offered thanks to the gods for having kept him safe. It is hard to believe that this matricide was a youth of twenty-two with a passion for poetry, music, art, drama, and athletic games. He admired the Greeks for their varied contests of physical and artistic ability, and sought to introduce like competitions to Rome. In 59 he instituted the Ludi Juvenales, or Youth Games, and a year later he inaugurated the Neronia on the model of the quadrennial festival at Olympia, with contests in horse racing, athletics, and music, which included oratory and poetry. He built an amphitheater, a gymnasium, and a magnificent public bath. He practiced gymnastics with skill, became an enthusiastic charioteer, and finally decided to compete in the games. To his Philhellenic mind, this seemed not only proper, but in the best tradition of Greek antiquity. Seneca thought it ridiculous and tried to confine the imperial exhibitions to a private stadium. Nero overruled him and invited the public to witness his performance. It came and applauded lustily. But what this uninhibited satyr really wanted was to be a great artist. Having every power, he longed also for every accomplishment. It is to his credit that he applied himself with painstaking seriousness to engraving, painting, sculpture, music, and poetry. To improve his singing, he used to lie upon his back with a leaden plate upon his chest, purge himself by a syringe or by vomiting, and deny himself fruits and all foods injurious to the voice. On certain days, for the same purpose, he ate nothing but garlic and olive oil. One evening he summoned the foremost senators to his palace— showed them a new water organ, and lectured to them on its theory and construction. He was so fascinated by the music which Terpnos drew from the harp that he spent entire nights with him in practicing on that instrument. He gathered artists and poets about him, competed with them in his palace, compared his paintings with theirs, listened to their poetry, and read his own. He was deceived by their praise, and when an astrologer predicted that he would lose his throne, he replied cheerfully that he would then make a living by his art, at Rome in 65. In these recitals he sang poems apparently composed by himself. Some fragments have survived and show a moderate talent. Suetonius claims to have seen the royal manuscripts with text and corrections in Nero's hand. Besides many lyrics, he wrote a long epic on Troy, with Paris as hero, and began a still longer one on Rome. To complete his versatility, he came upon the boards as an actor, playing the roles of Oedipus, Heracles, Alcmean, even the matricide Orestes. 
The populace was delighted to have an emperor entertain it and kneel on the stage, as custom required, to ask for its applause. It took up the songs that Nero sang and repeated them in the taverns and the streets. His enthusiasm for music spread through all ranks. His popularity, instead of waning, grew. The Senate was more horrified by these displays than by all the gossip of sexual license and perversion that ran about the palace. Nero replied that the Greek custom of confining athletic and artistic competitions to the citizen class was better than the Roman custom of leaving these to the slaves. Certainly the contests should not take the form of slowly executing criminals. The young murderer decreed that so long as he ruled, no combat in the arenas should be carried to the death. To restore the Greek tradition and dignify his own performances, he persuaded or compelled certain senators to compete in public as actors, musicians, athletes, gladiators, and charioteers. Some patricians, like Thracia Petus, showed their disapproval of his ways by absenting themselves from the Senate when Nero came to address it. Some others, like Helvidius Priscus, denounced him violently in those aristocratic salons that had become the last refuge of free speech. And the Stoic philosophers in Rome spoke ever more openly against this impish Epicurean on the throne. Plots were laid to depose him. His spies discovered them, and like his predecessors, he countered with a reign of terror. The law of Maestas was revived in 62, and accusations were brought against men whose opposition or wealth made their deaths culturally or financially desirable. For Nero, like Caligula, had now exhausted the treasury with his extravagance, his gifts, and his games. He announced his intention to confiscate completely the estates of citizens whose wills left insufficient sums to the emperor. He stripped many temples of their votive offerings and melted down their images of silver or gold. When Seneca protested and privately criticized his conduct, worse, his poetry, Nero dismissed him from the court in 62, and the old philosopher spent the remaining three years of his life in the seclusion of his villas. Burrus had died some months before. Nero now surrounded himself with new aides, mostly of coarser strain. Tigellinus, urban prefect, became his chief adviser and smoothed the prince's path to every indulgence. In 62, Nero divorced and dismissed Octavia on the ground of barrenness, and twelve days later married Papia. The people protested mutely by throwing down the statues that Nero had raised to Papia and crowning those of Octavia with flowers. The angry Papia convinced her lover that Octavia was planning to remarry and that a revolution was being organized to replace him in power with Octavia's new mate. If we may follow Tacitus, Nero invited Anicetus, who had killed Agrippina, to confess adultery with Octavia and implicate her in a plot to overthrow the prince. Anicetus played his part as commanded, was banished to Sardinia, and lived out his life in ease and wealth. Octavia was exiled to Pandateria. There, a few days after her arrival, imperial agents came to murder her. She was still but twenty-two and could not believe that life must end so soon for one so guiltless. She pleaded with her slayers, saying that she was now only Nero's sister and could do him no harm. They cut off her head and brought it to Papia for their reward. The Senate, informed that Octavia was dead, thanked the gods for having again preserved the emperor. Nero himself was now a god. After the death of Agrippina, a consul-elect had proposed a temple to the deified Nero. When in 63 Papia bore him a daughter who died soon afterward, the child was voted a divinity. When Tiridates came to receive the crown of Armenia, he knelt and worshipped the emperor as Mithras. When Nero built his golden house, he prefaced it with a colossus 120 feet high, bearing the likeness of his head haloed with solar rays that identified him as Phoebus Apollo. Actually, he was now at 25, a degenerate with swollen paunch, weak and slender limbs, fat face, blotched skin, curly yellow hair, and dull gray eyes. As a god and an artist, he fretted over the flaws of the palaces he had inherited and planned to build his own. But the Palatine was crowded, and at its base were on one side the Circus Maximus, on another the Forum, and on the others slums. He mourned that Rome had grown so haphazardly instead of being scientifically designed like Alexandria or Antioch. He dreamed of rebuilding Rome, of being its second founder, and renaming it Neropolis. On July 18, 64, a fire broke out in the Circus Maximus, spread rapidly, burned for nine days, and razed two-thirds of the city. Nero was at Antium when the conflagration started. He hurried to Rome and arrived in time to see the Palatine palaces consumed. The Domus Transitoria, which he had just built to connect his palace with the gardens of Messinus, was one of the first structures to fall. The Forum and the Capitol escaped, 
and the region west of the Tiber. Throughout the remainder of the city, countless homes, temples, precious manuscripts, and works of art were destroyed. Thousands of people lost their lives amid falling tenements in the crowded streets. Hundreds of thousands wandered shelterless through the nights, crazed with horror, and listening to rumors that Nero had ordered the fire, was scattering incendiaries to renew it, and was watching it from the Tower of Messinus while singing his lines on the sack of Troy and accompanying himself on the lyre. Tacitus, Suetonius, and Dio Cassius all agree in accusing Nero of starting and renewing the fire in order to rebuild Rome. There is no proof of his guilt or innocence. He energetically guided attempts to control or localize the flames and to provide relief. He ordered all public buildings and the imperial gardens to be thrown open to the destitute. He raised a city of tents on the field of Mars, requisitioned food from the surrounding country, and arranged for the feeding of the people. He bore without remonstrance the accusatory lampoons and inscriptions of the infuriated populace. According to Tacitus, whose senatorial prejudice must always be remembered, he cast about for some scapegoat and found one in a race of men detested for their evil practices and commonly called Crestiani. The name was derived from Crestus, who in the region of Tiberius suffered under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea. By that event the sect of which he was the founder received a blow which for a time checked the growth of a dangerous superstition. But it revived soon after and spread with recruited vigor not only in Judea, but even in the city of Rome, the common sink into which everything infamous and abominable flows like a torrent from all quarters of the world. Nero proceeded with his usual artifice. He found a set of profligate and abandoned wretches who were induced to confess themselves guilty, and on the evidence of such men a number of Christians were convicted, not indeed on clear evidence of having set the city on fire, but rather on account of their sullen hatred of the whole human race. They were put to death with exquisite cruelty, and to their sufferings Nero added mockery and derision. Some were covered with skins of wild beasts and left to be devoured by dogs. Others were nailed to crosses, numbers of them were burned alive, many covered with inflammable matter were set on fire to serve as torches during the night. At length the brutality of these measures filled every breast with pity. Humanity relented in favor of the Christians. When the debris had been cleared away, Nero undertook with visible pleasure the restoration of the city along the lines of his dream. Contributions for this purpose were solicited or elicited from every city in the empire, and those whose homes had been destroyed were enabled to rebuild out of these funds. The new streets were made wide and straight, the new houses were required to have their facades and first stories of stone, and had to be sufficiently separated from other buildings to oppose a protective gap to the spread of fire. The springs that flowed beneath the city were channeled into a reserve water supply in case of future conflagrations. Out of the imperial treasury, Nero built porticos along the main thoroughfares, providing a shaded porch for thousands of homes. Antiquarians and old men missed the picturesque, time-hallowed sights of the old city, but soon all agreed that a healthier, safer, and fairer Rome had risen from the fire. Nero might have earned forgiveness for his crimes had he now molded his life as he had remade his capital. But Papia died in sixty-five in advanced pregnancy, allegedly from a kick in the stomach. Rumor said this had been Nero's answer to her reproaches for having come home late from the races. He grieved bitterly over her passing, for he had eagerly awaited an heir. He had her body embalmed with rare spices, gave her a pompous funeral, and delivered a eulogy over the corpse. Having found a youth, Sporus, who closely resembled Papia, he had him castrated, married him by a formal ceremony, and used him in every way like a woman, whereupon a wit expressed the wish that Nero's father had had such a wife. In the same year he began the building of his golden house, and its extravagant decoration, cost, and extent, covering an area that once had sheltered many thousands of the poor, renewed the resentment of the aristocracy and the suspicions of the plebs. Suddenly Nero's spies brought him word of a widespread conspiracy to put Calpurnius Piso on the throne in 65. His agents seized some minor personages in the plot, and by torture or threat drew from them confessions implicating, among others, Lucan the poet and Seneca. Bit by bit the whole plan was laid bare. Nero's revenge was so savage that Rome credited the rumor that he had vowed to wipe out the whole senatorial class. When Seneca received the command to kill himself, he argued for a while and then complied. Lucan, likewise, opened his veins and died reciting his poetry. Tigellinus, jealous of Petronius's popularity with Nero, bribed one of the Epicure's slaves to testify against his master and induced Nero to order Petronius's death. 
Petronius died leisurely, opening his veins and then closing them, conversing in his usual like manner with his friends and reading poetry to them. After a walk and a nap, he opened his veins again and passed away quietly. Thracia Petus, the leading exponent of the Stoic philosophy in the Senate, was condemned not for taking part in the plot, but on the general ground of deficient enthusiasm for the emperor, for not enjoying Nero's singing, and for composing a laudatory life of Cato. His son-in-law Helvidius Priscus was merely banished, but two others were put to death for writing in their praise. Musonius Rufus, Stoic philosopher, and Cassius Longinus, a great jurist, were exiled. Two brothers of Seneca, Aeneas Mila, father of Lucan, and Aeneas Novatus, the Gallio who in Corinth had freed St. Paul, were ordered to commit suicide. Having cleared the lines in his rear, Nero left in 66 to compete in the Olympic Games and make a concert tour of Greece. The Greeks, he remarked, are the only ones who have an ear for music. At Olympia, he drove a quadriga in the races, was thrown from the car and was nearly crushed to death. Restored to his chariot, he continued the contest for a while but gave up before the end of the course. The judges, however, knew an emperor from an athlete and awarded him the crown of victory. Overcome with happiness when the crowd applauded him, he announced that thereafter not only Athens and Sparta but all Greece should be free, that is, exempt from any tribute to Rome. The Greek cities accommodated him by running the Olympian, Pythian, Nemean, and Isthmian games in one year. He responded by taking part in all of them as singer, harpist, actor, or athlete. He obeyed the rules of the various competitions carefully, was all courtesy to his opponents, and gave them Roman citizenship as consolation for his invariable victories. Amid his tour, he received news that Judea was in revolt and that all the West was hot with rebellion. He sighed and continued his itinerary. When he sang in a theater, says Suetonius, no one was allowed to leave, even for the most urgent reasons. And so it was that some women gave birth there, while some feigned death to be carried out. At Corinth, he ordered work started on a canal to cut the isthmus as Caesar had planned. The task was begun but was laid aside during the turmoil of the following year. Alarmed by further reports of uprisings and plots, Nero returned to Italy in 67, entered Rome in a formal triumph, and showed as trophies the 1808 prizes he had won in Greece. Tragedy was rapidly catching up with his comedy. In March 68, the Gallic governor of Lyon, Julius Vindix, announced the independence of Gaul, and when Nero offered 2,500,000 sesterces for his head, Vindex retorted, He who brings me Nero's head may have mine in return. Preparing to take the field against this virile antagonist, Nero's first care was to choose wagons to carry along with him his musical instruments and theatrical effects. But in April word came that Galba, commander of the Roman army in Spain, had joined fortunes with Vindex and was marching toward Rome. Hearing that the Praetorian Guard was ready to abandon Nero for proper remuneration, the Senate proclaimed Galba emperor. Nero put some poison into a small box and, so armed, fled from his golden house to the Servilian gardens on the road to Ostia. He asked such officers of the guard as were in the palace to accompany him. All refused, and one quoted to him a line of Virgil, Is it then so hard to die? He could not believe that the omnipotence which had ruined him had suddenly ceased. He sent appeals for help to various friends, but none replied. He went down to the Tiber to drown himself, but his courage failed him. Phaon, one of his freedmen, offered to conceal him in his villa on the Via Salaria. Nero grasped at the proposal and rode through the dark four miles out from the center of Rome. He spent that night in Phaon's cellar, clad in a soiled tunic, sleepless and hungry, and trembling at every sound. Phaon's courier brought word that the Senate had declared Nero a public enemy, had ordered his arrest, and had decreed that he should be punished after the ancient manner. Nero asked what this was. The condemned man, he was told, is stripped, is fastened to a post by a fork passing through his neck, and is then beaten to death. Terrified, he tried to stab himself, but he made the mistake of testing the poniard's point first, and found it disconcertingly sharp. Qualis artifex perio, he mourned, what an artist dies in me. As a new day dawned, he heard the clatter of horses. The Senate's soldiers had tracked him down. Quoting a verse of poetry, Hark, now strikes upon my ear the trampling of swift couriers, he drove a dagger into his throat. His hand faltered, and his freedman, Epaphroditus, helped him to press the blade home. He had begged his companions to keep his corpse from being mutilated, and Galba's agents granted the wish. His old nurses and Acti, his former mistress, buried him in the vaults of the Domitii in 68. Many of the populace rejoiced at his death and ran about Rome with liberty caps on their heads. 
but many more mourned him, for he had been as generous to the poor as he had been recklessly cruel to the great. They lent eager hearing to the rumor that he was not really dead, but was fighting his way back to Rome. And when they had reconciled themselves to his passing, they came for many months to strew flowers before his tomb. 5. The Three Emperors Servius Sulpicius Galba reached Rome in June of 68. He was of noble birth, for he traced his lineage on his father's side to Jupiter, and on his mother's to Pasiphae, wife of Minos and the Bull. In this year of his exaltation he was already bald, and his hands and feet were so crooked with gout that he could not wear a shoe or hold a book. He had the usual vices, normal and abnormal, but it was not these that made his reign so brief. What shocked army and populace were his economy of the public funds and his strict administration of justice. When he ruled that those who had received gifts or pensions from Nero must return nine-tenths to the treasury, a thousand new enemies arose, and Galba's days ran out. A bankrupt senator, Marcus Otho, announced that he would pay his debts only by becoming emperor. The guards declared for him, marched into the forum, and met Galba riding in a litter. Galba offered his neck unresisting to their swords. They cut off his head, his arms, his lips. One of them carried the head to Otho, but as he could not hold it well by the sparse and blood-wet hair, he thrust his thumb into the mouth. The Senate hastened to accept Otho, just as Roman armies in Germany and Egypt were hailing as emperors their respective generals, Aulus Vitellius and Titus Flavius Vespasianus. Vitellius invaded Italy with his hardy legions and swept away the weak resistance of the northern garrisons and the Praetorian Guard. Otho killed himself after a reign of ninety-five days, and Vitellius mounted the throne. It does not speak well for the Roman military system that so senile a man as Galba should have commanded in Spain, or so slothful an Epicurean as Vitellius in Germany. He was a gourmand who thought of the Principate chiefly as a feast and made a banquet of every meal. He governed in the intervals, and as these grew shorter he left state affairs to his freedman Asiaticus, who in four months became one of the richest men in Rome. When Vitellius learned that Vespasian's general Antonius was leading an army into Italy to dethrone him, he delegated his defense to subordinates and continued to feast. In October of 69 the troops of Antonius defeated the defenders of Vitellius at Cremona in one of the bloodiest battles of ancient times. They marched into Rome, where the remnants of Vitellius's legions fought bravely for him while he took refuge in his palace. The populace, says Tacitus, flocked in crowds to behold the conflict, as if a scene of carnage were no more than a public spectacle exhibited for their amusement. While the battle raged, some of them plundered shops and homes, and prostitutes plied their trade. The soldiers of Antonius triumphed, killed without quarter and pillaged without stint, and the mob, as ready as history to applaud the victors, helped them to ferret out their enemies. Vitellius, dragged from his concealment, was led half-naked through the city with a noose around his neck, was pelted with dung, was tortured without haste, and at last, in a moment of mercy, was slain, this in December 69. The corpse was drawn through the streets with a hook and flung into the Tiber. 6. Vespasian What a relief to meet a man of sense, ability, and honor. This book is continued on Cassette 10, Side 1. The Story of Civilization Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 10, Side 1. What a relief to meet a man of sense, ability, and honor. Vespasian, busy directing the war against Judea, took his time in coming to occupy the dangerous eminence that his soldiers had won for him, and which the Senate hurriedly confirmed. When he arrived in October of 70, he set himself with inspiring energy to restore order to a society disturbed in every aspect of its life. Perceiving that he would have to repeat the labors of Augustus, he modeled his behavior and policy upon those of that prince. He made his peace with the Senate and re-established constitutional government. He freed or recalled those who had been convicted of les majeste under Nero, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. He reorganized the army, limited the number and power of the Praetorian Guard, appointed competent generals to suppress revolts in the provinces, and was soon able to close the temple of Janus as a sign and pledge of peace. He was sixty, but in the unimpaired vigor of his powerful frame. He was built foursquare in body and character, with a broad, bald, and massive head, coarse but commanding features, and small sharp eyes that pierced every sham. He had none of the stigmata of genius. He was merely a man of firm will and practical intelligence. He had been born in a Sabine village near Rieti, of purely plebeian stock. His accession was a fourfold revolution. A commoner had reached the throne, 
a provincial army had overcome the Praetorians and crowned its candidate, the Flavians had succeeded the Julio-Claudians, and the simple habits and virtues of the Italian bourgeois replaced at the court of the emperor the Epicurean wastefulness of the city-bred descendants of Augustus and Livia. Vespasian never forgot or sought to conceal his modest ancestry. When expectant genealogists traced his family back to a companion of Hercules, he laughed them into silence. Periodically he returned to the home of his birth to enjoy its rustic ways and fare, and he would not allow anything there to be changed. He scorned luxury and laziness, ate the food of peasants, fasted one day in each month, and declared war upon extravagance. When a Roman whom he had nominated for office came to him smelling of perfume, he said, I would rather you smelled of garlic, and withdrew the nomination. He made himself easily accessible, talked and lived on a footing of equality with the people, enjoyed jokes at his own expense, and allowed everyone great freedom in criticizing his conduct and his character. Having discovered a conspiracy against him, he forgave the plotters, saying that they were fools not to realize what a burden of cares a ruler wore. He lost his good temper in one case only. Helvidius Priscus, restored to the Senate from the exile into which Nero had sent him, demanded the restoration of the Republic, and reviled Vespasian without concealment or restraint. Vespasian asked him not to attend the Senate if he proposed to continue such abuse. Helvidius refused. Vespasian banished him and tarnished an excellent reign by ordering him put to death. He regretted the action later, and for the rest, says Suetonius, showed the greatest patience under the frank language of his friends and the impudence of philosophers. These latter were not so much Stoics as Cynics, philosophical anarchists who felt that all government was an imposition and attacked every emperor. To get fresh blood into a senate depleted by family limitation and civil war, Vespasian secured appointment as censor, brought to Rome a thousand distinguished families from Italy and the western provinces, enrolled them in the patrician or equestrian orders, and over many bitter protests filled out the senate from their ranks. The new aristocracy, under the stimulus of his example, improved Roman morals and society. It was not spoiled yet by idle wealth, nor yet so removed from labor and the soil as to disdain the routine tasks of life and administration. It had something of the emperor's order and decency of life. Out of it came those rulers who, after Domitian, gave Rome good government for a century. Conscious of the evils that had flowed from the use of freedmen as imperial executives, Vespasian replaced most of them with men from this provincial infiltration and from Rome's expanding business class. With their help, he accomplished in nine years a miracle of rehabilitation. He calculated that forty billion sesterces were needed to transform bankruptcy into solvency. The figure given by Suetonius is often rejected as incredible, but probably it was reckoned in a depreciated currency. To raise this sum, he taxed almost everything, raised the provincial tribute, reimposed it upon Greece, recaptured and let public lands, sold royal palaces and estates, and insisted upon such economy that the citizens denounced him as a miserly peasant. A tax was placed upon even the use of the public urinals that adorned ancient, like modern Rome. His son Titus protested against such undignified revenue, but the old emperor held some coins of it to the youth's nose and said, See, my child, if they smell. Suetonius accuses him of adding to the imperial income by selling offices and by promoting the most rapacious of his provincial appointees so that they might be swollen with spoils when he suddenly summoned them, examined their transactions, and confiscated their gains. The crafty financier, however, used none of the proceeds for himself, but poured them all into the economic recovery, architectural adornment, and cultural advancement of Rome. It remained for this blunt soldier to establish the first system of state education in classical antiquity. He ordered that certain qualified teachers of Latin and Greek literature and rhetoric should thereafter be paid out of public funds and should receive a pension after twenty years of service. Perhaps the old skeptic felt that teachers had some share in forming public opinion and would speak better of a government that paid their way. Probably for like reasons he restored many of the ancient temples, even in rural districts. He rebuilt the temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, which had been burned down by the Vitellians over his soldiers' heads, raised a majestic shrine to Pax, the goddess of peace, and began the most renowned of Roman buildings, the Colosseum. The upper classes mourned as they saw their fortunes taxed to provide public works for the state and wages for proletaires, and the workers were not particularly grateful. He roused the people to an energetic campaign of clearing away the debris left by the recent war, and he himself carried the first load. 
when an inventor showed him plans for a hoisting machine that would greatly reduce the need for human labor in these enterprises of removal and construction, he refused to use it, saying, I must feed my poor. In this moratorium on invention, Vespasian recognized the problem of technological unemployment and decided against an industrial revolution. The provinces prospered as never before. Their wealth was now twice as great, at least in monetary terms, as under Augustus, and they bore the increased tribute without injury. Vespasian sent the able Agricola to govern Britain and delegated to Titus the task of ending the revolt of the Jews. Titus captured Jerusalem and returned to Rome with all the honors that usually crown superior killing. A spectacular triumph led a long procession of captives and spoils through the streets, and a famous arch was raised to commemorate the victory. Vespasian was proud of his son's success, but disturbed by the fact that Titus had brought home a pretty Jewish princess, Berenice, as his mistress, and wished to marry her. Again, Capta Ferum Victorem Cepit. The emperor could not see why one should marry a mistress. He himself, after the death of his wife, lived with a freedwoman without troubling to wed her. And when this Cenus died, he distributed his love among several concubines. He was convinced that the succession to his power must be settled before his death, as the alternative to anarchy. The senate agreed, but demanded that he should name and adopt the best of the best, presumably a senator. Vespasian answered that he reckoned that Titus was the best. To ease the situation, the young conqueror dismissed Berenice and sought consolation in promiscuity. The emperor thereupon associated Titus with himself on the throne and delegated to him an increasing share in the government. In 79, Vespasian again visited Rieti. While in the Sabine country, he drank copiously the purgative waters of Lake Utilia and was seized with severe diarrhea. Though confined to his bed, he continued to receive embassies and perform the other duties of his office. Feeling the hand of death upon him, he nevertheless kept his bluff humor. Vai, puto Deus fio, he remarked. Alas, I think I am becoming a god. Almost fainting, he struggled to his feet with the help of attendants, saying, An emperor should die standing. With these words, he concluded a full life of sixty-nine years and a beneficent reign of ten. 7. Titus His older son, named like himself Titus Flavius Vespasianus, was the most fortunate of emperors. Titus died in the second year of his rule and the forty-second of his age, while still the darling of mankind. Time did not suffice him for the corruptions of power or the disillusionment of desire. As a youth, he had distinguished himself in ruthless war and tarnished his name with loose living. Now, instead of letting omnipotence intoxicate him, he reformed his morals and made his government a model of wisdom and honor. His greatest fault was uncontrollable generosity. He counted that day lost on which he had not made someone happy with a gift. He spent too much on shows and games, and he left the replenished treasury almost as low as his father had found it. He completed the Colosseum and built another municipal bath. No one suffered capital punishment during his brief reign. On the contrary, he had informers flogged and banished. He swore that he would rather be killed than kill. When two patricians were detected in a conspiracy to depose him, he contented himself with sending them a warning. Then he dispatched a courier to relieve the anxiety of a conspirator's mother by telling her that her son was safe. His misfortunes were disasters over which he could have little control. A three-day fire in the year 79 destroyed many important buildings, including again the Temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. In the same year, Vesuvius buried Pompeii and thousands of Italians, and a year later Rome was stricken with a plague more deadly than any her history had yet recorded. Titus did all he could to lessen the sufferings caused by these calamities. He showed not merely the concern of an emperor, but a father's surpassing love. He died of a fever in 81 in the same farmhouse in which his father had recently passed away. All Rome mourned him, except the brother who succeeded to his throne. 8. Domitian Of Domitian it is harder to paint an objective portrait than even of Nero. Our chief sources for his reign are Tacitus and the younger Pliny. They prospered under him, but belonged to the senatorial party that engaged with him in a war almost of mutual extermination. To set against these hostile witnesses, we have the poets Statius and Marshall, who ate or sought Domitian's bread and literally praised him to the skies. Perhaps all four were right, for the last of the Flavians, like many of the Julio-Claudians, began like Gabriel and ended like Lucifer. In this respect, Domitian's soul walked with his body. In youth he was modest, graceful, handsome, tall. In later years he had a protruding belly, spindly legs, and a bald head. 
though he had written a book on the care of the hair. In adolescence he composed poetry, in obsolescence he distrusted his own prose and let others write his speeches and proclamations. He might have been happier had not Titus been his brother, but only the noblest spirits can bear with equanimity the success of their friends. Domitian's jealousy soured into a taciturn gloom, then into secret machinations against his brother. Titus had to beg his father to forgive the younger son. When Vespasian died, Domitian claimed that he had been left partner in the imperial power, but that the emperor's will had been tampered with. Titus replied by asking him to be his partner and successor. Domitian refused and continued the plot. When Titus fell ill, says Dio Cassius, Domitian hastened his death by packing him about with snow. We cannot assess the truth of these stories, nor of those tales of sexual license that have come down to us, that Domitian swam with prostitutes, made the daughter of Titus one of his concubines, and was most profligate and lewd toward women and boys alike. All Latin historiography is present politics, a partisan blow struck for contemporary ends. When we come to the actual policies of Domitian, we find him, in his first decade, surprisingly Puritan and competent. As Vespasian had modeled himself on Augustus, so Domitian seemed to take over the policies and manners of Tiberius. Having made himself censor for life, he stopped the publication of scurrilous lampoons, though he winked at the epigrams of Marshall, enforced the Julian laws against adultery, tried to end child prostitution and reduce unnatural vice, forbade the performance of pantomimes because of their indecency, ordered the execution of a vestal virgin convicted of incest or adultery, and put an end to the practice of castration, which had spread with the rising price of eunuch slaves. He shrank from any form of bloodshed, even the ritual sacrifice of oxen. He was honorable, liberal, and free from avarice. He refused legacies from those who had children, canceled all tax arrears more than five years old, and discountenanced delation. He was a strict but impartial judge. He had freedmen secretaries, but kept them on their good behavior. His reign was one of the great ages of Roman building. The fires of 79 and 82 having caused much destruction and destitution, Domitian organized a program of public works to provide employment and distribute wealth. He too hoped to reanimate the old faith by beautifying or multiplying its shrines. He raised the temple of Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva once more and spent $22 million on its gold-plated doors and gilded roof. Rome admired the result and mourned the extravagance. When Domitian built for himself and his administrative staff an enormous palace, the Domus Flavia, the citizens reasonably complained of the cost, but they raised no voice against the expensive games with which he sought to moderate his Tiberian unpopularity. He dedicated a temple to his father and his brother. He restored the baths and pantheon of Agrippa, the portico of Octavia, the temples of Isis and Serapis. He added to the Colosseum, finished the baths of Titus, and began those that were completed by Trajan. At the same time, he did his doer best to encourage arts and letters. Flavian portrait sculpture reached its zenith in his Principate. His coins are of outstanding excellence. To stimulate poetry, he established in 86 the Capitoline Games, which included contests in literature and music, and for these he built a stadium and a music hall in the field of Mars. He gave modest help to the modest talent of Statius and the immodest talent of Marshall. He rebuilt the public libraries which had been destroyed by fire and had their contents renewed by sending scribes to copy the manuscripts in Alexandria, another proof that the great library there had lost only a small part of its treasures in the fire started by Caesar. He managed the empire well. He had Tiberius's grim resolution as an administrator, pounced upon peculation, and kept strict watch on all appointees and developments. As Tiberius had restrained Germanicus, so Domitian withdrew Agricola from Britain after that enterprising general had led his armies and pushed the frontier to Scotland. Apparently Agricola wished to go farther, and Domitian demurred. The recall was attributed to jealousy, and the emperor paid a heavy price for it when the history of his reign was written by Agricola's son-in-law. He was equally unfortunate in war. In 86 the Dacians crossed the Danube, invaded the Roman province of Mesia, and defeated Domitian's generals. The prince took command, planned his campaign well, and was about to enter Dacia when Antoninus Saturninus, Roman governor of Upper Germany, persuaded two legions at Mainz to proclaim him emperor. The revolt was suppressed by Domitian's aides, but it disconcerted his strategy by allowing the enemy time to prepare. He crossed the Danube, met the Dacians, and apparently suffered a reverse. He made peace with Decebalus, the Dacian king, sent him an annual douceur, and returned to Rome to celebrate a double triumph over the Chatti and the Dacians. 
He contented himself thereafter with the building of a limes, or fortified road, between the Rhine and the Danube, and another between the northward turn of the Danube and the Black Sea. The revolt of Saturninus was the turning point in Domitian's reign, the dividing line between his better and worse selves. He had always been coldly severe, now he slipped into cruelty. He was capable of good government, but only as an autocrat. The Senate rapidly lost power under him, and his tenacious authority as censor made that body at once subservient and vengeful. Vanity, which flourishes even in the humble, had no check in Domitian's status. He filled the capital with statues of himself, announced the divinity of his father, brother, wife, and sisters, as well as his own, organized a new order of priests, the Flaviales, to attend the worship of these new deities, and required officials to speak of him in their documents as Dominus et Deus Noster, our Lord and God. He sat on a throne, encouraged visitors to embrace his knees, and established in his ornate palace the etiquette of an oriental court. The principate had become, through the power of the army and the decay of the Senate, an unconstitutional monarchy. Against this new development, rebellion rose not only in the aristocracy, but among the philosophers and in the religions that were flowing into Rome from the east. The Jews and the Christians refused to adore the godhead of Domitian, the cynics decried all government, and the Stoics, though they accepted kings, were pledged to oppose despots and honor tyrannicides. In 89, Domitian expelled the philosophers from Rome. In 95, he banished them from Italy. The earlier edict applied also to the astrologers, whose predictions of the emperor's death had brought new terrors to a mind empty of faith and open to superstition. In 93, Domitian executed some Christians for refusing to offer sacrifice before his image. According to tradition, these included his nephew, Flavius Clemens. In the last years of his reign, the emperor's fear of conspiracy became almost a madness. He lined with shining stone the walls of the porticos under which he walked, so that he might see mirrored in them whatever went on behind him. He complained that the lot of rulers was miserable, since no man believed them when they alleged conspiracy, unless the conspiracy succeeded. Like Tiberius, he listened more readily to informers as he grew older, and as the delatores multiplied, no citizen of any prominence could feel safe from spies, even in his home. After Saturninus's revolt, indictments and convictions rapidly increased. Aristocrats were exiled or killed, suspected men were tortured even by having fire inserted into their private parts. The terrified Senate, including the Tacitus, who recounts these events most bitterly, was the agent of trial and condemnation, and at each execution it thanked the gods for the salvation of the prince. Domitian made the mistake of frightening his own household. In 96 he ordered the death of his secretary Epaphroditus because, twenty-seven years before, he had helped Nero to commit suicide. The other freedmen of the imperial household felt themselves threatened. To protect themselves they resolved to kill Domitian, and the emperor's wife Domitia joined in the plot. On the night before his last he leaped from his bed in fright. When the appointed moment came, Domitia's servant struck the first blow. Four others took part in the assault, and Domitian, struggling madly, met death in the forty-fifth year of his age and the fifteenth of his reign, this in ninety-six. When the news reached the senators, they tore down and shattered all images of him in their chamber, and ordered that all statues of him and all inscriptions mentioning his name should be destroyed throughout the realm. History has been unfair to this age of despots, because it has spoken here chiefly through the most brilliant and most prejudiced of historians. It is true that the gossip of Suetonius often confirms or follows the invective of Tacitus, but the study of literature and inscriptions has condemned them both as mistaking the vices of ten emperors for the record of an empire and a century. There was something good in the worst of these rulers, devoted statesmanship in Tiberius, a charming gaiety in Caligula, a plodding wisdom in Claudius, an exuberant aestheticism in Nero, a stern competence in Domitian. Behind the adulteries and the murders, an administrative organization had formed which provided, through all this period, a high order of provincial government. The emperors themselves were the chief victims of their power. Some disease in the blood, fired by the heat of loosed desire, had pursued the Julio-Claudians as fatally as the children of Atreus, and some flaw in the system had debased the Flavians in one generation from patient statesmanship to terrified cruelty. Seven of these ten men met a violent end. Nearly all of them were unhappy, surrounded by conspiracy, dishonesty, and intrigue, trying to govern a world from the anarchy of a home. They indulged their appetites because they knew how brief was their omnipotence. They lived in the daily horror of men condemned to an early and sudden death. They went under because they were above the law. They became less than men because power had made them gods. 
But we must not absolve the age or the principate of its ignominy and its crimes. It had given peace to the empire but terror to Rome. It had injured morals by the high example of cruelty and lust. It had torn Italy with a civil war more ferocious than that of Caesar and Pompey. It had filled the islands with exiles and had killed off the best and bravest men. It had suborned the treachery of relatives and friends by rewarding avaricious spies. It had in Rome replaced a government of laws with the tyranny of men. It had raised gigantic edifices by accumulating tribute, but it had dwarfed the soul by frightening talented or creative minds into servility or silence. Above all, it had made the army supreme. The power of the prince over the senate lay not in his superior genius, nor in custom, nor in prestige. It rested upon the pikes of the guard. When provincial armies saw how emperors were made, how rich were the donatives and spoils of the capital, they deposed the praetorians and themselves entered upon the business of making kings. For a century yet the wisdom of great rulers chosen by adoption rather than by heredity, violence, or wealth would hold the legions in check and keep the frontiers safe. But when, through a philosopher's love, idiocy would again reach the throne, the armies would run riot, chaos would break through the fragile film of order, and civil war would join hands with the waiting barbarians to topple down the noble and precarious structure of government that the genius of Augustus had built. Chapter 14. The Silver Age, A.D. 14 to 96. 1. The Dilettantes. Tradition has given to Latin letters from A.D. 14 to 117 the name of Silver Age, implying a fall from the cultural excellence of the Augustan Age. Tradition is the voice of time, and time is the medium of selection. A cautious mind will respect their verdict, for only youth knows better than twenty centuries. We may be permitted, however, to suspend judgment, to give Lucan, Petronius, Seneca, the elder Pliny, Celsus, Statius, Marshall, Quintilian, and in later chapters, Tacitus, Juvenal, Pliny the Younger, and Epictetus, an unbiased hearing, and enjoy them as if we had never heard that they belonged to a decadent period. In every epoch something is decaying and something is growing. In epigram, satire, the novel, history, and philosophy, the Silver Age marks the zenith of Roman literature, as it represents in realistic sculpture and mass architecture the climax of Roman art. The speech of the common man re-entered literature, diminishing inflections, relaxing syntax, and dropping final continents with Gallic impertinence. About the middle of the first century, the Latin V, which had been pronounced like our W, and B, between vowels, were both softened into a sound like the English V. So, habere, to have, became in sound havere, and prepared for Latin avere and French avoir, while vinum, wine, began to approximate by lazy slurring of the changing final consonant, the Italian vino, and the French vin, the Latin language was preparing to mother Italian, Spanish, and French. It must be admitted that rhetoric had now grown at the expense of eloquence, grammar at the expense of poetry. Able men devoted themselves beyond precedent to studying the form, evolution, and niceties of the language, editing already classical texts, formulating the august rules of literary composition, forensic oratory, poetic meter, and prose rhythm. Claudius tried to reform the alphabet. Nero made poetry fashionable by his almost Japanese example, and the elder Seneca wrote manuals of rhetoric on the ground that eloquence gives to every power a double power. Without eloquence, only generals could rise in Rome, and even generals had to be orators. The mania for rhetoric seized all forms of literature. Poetry became rhetorical, prose became poetical, and Pliny himself wrote an eloquent page in the six volumes of his natural history. Men began to worry about the balance of their phrases and the melody of their clauses. Historians wrote declamations, philosophers itched for epigrams, and everyone wrote sententiae, concentrated pills of wisdom. All the polite world was writing poetry and reading it to friends in hired halls or theaters, at table, even, Marshall complained, in the bath. Poets engaged in public competitions, won prizes, were fated by municipalities and crowned by emperors. Aristocrats and princes welcomed dedications or tributes and paid for them with dinners or denarii. The passion for poetry gave a pleasant aspect of amateur authorship to an age and city darkened with sexual license and periodic terror. Terror and poetry met in the life of Lucan. The older Seneca was his grandfather, the philosopher Seneca his uncle. 
Born in Cordoba in 39 and named Marcus Aeneas Lucanus, he was brought up in infancy to Rome and grew up in aristocratic circles where poetry and philosophy rivaled amorous and political intrigues as the foci of life. At 21, he competed in the Neronian Games with a poem in praise of Nero and won a prize. Seneca introduced him at court, and soon the poet and the emperor were bandying epics. Lucan made the mistake of winning first prize in a poetic contest with the prince. Nero ordered him to publish no more, and Lucan withdrew to avenge himself in private with a vigorous but rhetorical epic, Pharsalia, which viewed the civil war from the standpoint of the Pompeian aristocracy. Lucan is fair to Caesar and writes of him an illuminating phrase, Nil actum credens cum quid superesset agendum, thinking nothing done while anything remained to do. But the real hero of the book is the younger Cato, whom Lucan equals with the gods in a famous line, Victrix causa deis placuit, said Victa Catoni. The winning cause pleased the gods, but the lost one pleased Cato. Lucan too loved a lost cause and died for it. He joined in the conspiracy to replace Nero with Piso, was arrested, broke down, he was only twenty-six, and revealed the names of other conspirators, even we are told of his mother. When Nero confirmed his death sentence, he recovered his courage, summoned his friends to a feast, ate with them heartily, opened his veins, and recited his lines against despotism as he bled to death. This in sixty-five. 2. Petronius we are not certain, it is only the general opinion, that the Petronius whose Satyricon still finds many readers was the Caius Petronius who died by Nero's orders a year after Lucan. The book itself contains not a word to serve as a clue, and Tacitus, who describes the Arbiter Elegantiarum with pithy eloquence, makes no mention of the disreputable masterpiece. Some forty epigrams are ascribed to a Petronius, including a line that almost sums up Lucretius, Primus in orbe deas feci timor. It was fear that first in the world made gods. But these fragments, too, are silent about the author's identity. The Satyricon was a collection of satires, probably in sixteen books, of which only the last two remain, themselves incomplete. They are saturi in the Latin sense of medleys, here of prose and verse, adventure and philosophy, gastronomy and venery. The form owes something to the satires of Menippus, a Syrian cynic who wrote in Gadara about 60 B.C., and to the Milesian tales or love romances that had become popular in the Hellenistic world. As all extant examples of these are later than Petronius, the Satyricon has the distinction of being the oldest known novel. It is hardly credible that an aristocratic lord of luxury and master of fine taste should have fathered a book so profusely vulgar as the Satyricon. All its active characters are plebeians, ex-slaves or slaves, and all the scenes are of low life. Here the Augustan preoccupation of literature with the upper classes is violently ended. Enculpius, who tells the tale, is an adulterer, a homosexual, a liar, and a thief, and takes it for granted that all sensible men are the same. We had it understood between ourselves, he says of himself and his friend, that whenever opportunity came we would pilfer whatever we could lay our hands upon for the improvement of our common treasury. The story begins in a brothel where Enculpius meets Ascyltus, who has taken refuge there from a lecture on philosophy. Their escapades among the towns and trolls of southern Italy form the thread of the wandering narrative. Their rivalry for the handsome slave boy Gaetan unites and divides them in picaresque romance. At last they come to the house of the merchant Trimalchio, and the rest of the extant work is given over to describing the Cena Trimalchionis, the most astounding dinner in literature. Trimalchio is an ex-slave who has made a fortune, has bought enormous latifundia, and lives in parvenu luxury with the appointments of a palace and the atmosphere of a stew. His estates are so vast that a daily gazette must be written to keep him abreast of his earnings. He begs his guests to drink. If the wine don't please you, I'll change it. I don't have to buy it, thank the gods. Everything here that makes your mouth water was produced on one of my country places, which I've never yet seen, but they tell me it's down Terracina and Tarentum way. I've got a notion to add Sicily to my other little holdings, so in case I want to go to Africa, I'll be able to sail along my own coasts. When it comes to silver, I'm a connoisseur. I have goblets as big as wine jars. I own a thousand bowls that Mummius left to my patron. I buy cheap and sell dear. Others may have different ideas. He is a kindly fellow withal. He shouts at his slaves, but he pardons them readily. He has so many that only a tenth of them know him by sight. Slaves are men, he says, generously remembering his origin. They suck the same milk that we did, and mine will drink the water of freedom if they live. To prove his intentions, he has his will brought in and reads it to his guests. It includes specifications for his epitaph, 
which is to end with the proud claim that he grew rich from little, left thirty million sesterces, and never heard a philosopher. Forty pages describe the dinner. A few sentences will convey its aroma. There was a circular tray around which were displayed the signs of the zodiac, and upon each sign the caterer had placed the food best in keeping with it. Ram's vetches on Aries, beef on Taurus, the womb of an unfarrowed sow on Virgo, on Libra, a balance holding a tart in one pan and a cake in the other. Four dancers ran into music and removed the upper part of the tray. Beneath it, stuffed capons and sow's bellies, and in the middle, a hare. At the corners, four figures of Marcius spouted from their bladders a highly spiced sauce upon fish which were swimming about. A tray followed on which was served a wild boar. From its tusks hung baskets loaded with dates. Around it were little suckling pigs made of pastry. When the carver plunged his knife into the boar's side, thrushes flew out, one for each guest. Three white hogs walk into the room, and the guests choose which one they will have cooked for them. While they eat, the winning hog is roasted. Soon it re-enters. When it is carved, sausages and meat puddings emerge from its belly. When the dessert arrives, Enculpius has no stomach for it, but Trimalchio urges his guests onward by assuring them that the dessert has been made entirely out of a hog. A hoop is lowered from the ceiling, bringing to each diner an alabaster jar filled with perfume, while slaves replenish empty glasses with ancient wines. Trimalchio gets drunk and makes love to a boy. His fat wife protests, and he throws a cup at her head. This Syrian dancing whore, he says of her, has a poor memory. I took her off the auction block and made her a woman, and now she puffs herself up like a frog. But that's the way it is. If you're born in an attic, you can't sleep in a palace. And he bids his major domo keep her statue off his tomb, else I'll be nagged even after I'm dead. It is a powerful and savage satire, realistic only in its details, and probably true of only a small segment of Roman life. If Nero's Petronius wrote it, we must count it the merciless caricature of the nouveau riche freedman by a patrician who had never earned his keep. There is no mercy in the book, no tenderness, no ideal. Immorality and corruption are taken for granted, and the life of the underworld is presented with gusto, without indignation and without comment. Here the gutter flows directly into classic literature, bringing its own judgments and taste, its own lusty vocabulary and hilarious vitality. Sometimes the story rises to those sublime heights of nonsense, obscenity, and vituperation which crown the epic of Gargantua and Pantagruel. Apuleius's golden ass would follow in its steps. Gilles Blas, seventeen centuries later, would rival it. Tristram Shandy and Tom Jones would continue its meandering tradition. It is the strangest book in the literature of Rome. 3. The Philosophers in this loose and complex age, when freedom was so limited and life was so free, philosophy flourished alongside of sensuality, and the two were not above joining hands. The decay of the native religion had left a moral vacuum which philosophy sought to fill. Parents sent their sons, and themselves often went to hear the lectures of men who offered to provide a rational code of civilized conduct, or a formal dress for naked desire. Those who could afford it paid philosophers to live with them, partly as educators, partly as spiritual counselors, partly as learned company. So Augustus had Arius, consulted him on almost everything, and for his sake, if we may believe a ruler, was lenient to Alexandria. When Drusus died, Livia called in her husband's philosopher, so Seneca phrases it, to help her bear her grief. Nero, Trajan, and of course Aurelius had philosophers residing with them at court, as kings have chaplains now. In their last moments, men would summon philosophers to chart their passing, as centuries later they would ask for a priest. The public never forgave these teachers of wisdom for taking salaries or fees. Philosophy was esteemed a sufficient substitute for food and drink, and philosophers who had a less exalted opinion of their profession were the butt of popular jokes, of Quintilian's criticism, of Lucian's satire, and of imperial hostility. Many of them deserved it, for they put on the philosopher's coarse cloak and grew a profound beard to give a learned front to gluttony, avarice, and vanity. A short survey of life, says a character in Lucian, had convinced me of the absurdity and meanness that pervade all worldly purposes. In this state of mind, the best I could think of was to get at the truth of it all from the philosophers. So I selected the best of them, if solemnity of visage, pallor of complexion, and length of beard are a criterion. I placed myself in their hands. For a considerable sum down, and more to be paid when they had perfected me in wisdom, I was to be instructed in the order of the universe." Unfortunately, so far from dispelling my previous ignorance, they perplexed me more and more with their daily drenches of beginnings and ends, atoms and voids, matters and forms. My greatest difficulty was that, though they differed among themselves and all they said was full of contradictions, they expected me to believe them, each pulling me in his own direction. 
Often one of them could not tell you correctly the number of miles from Megara to Athens, but had no hesitation about the distance in feet from the sun to the moon. Most of the Roman philosophers followed the Stoic creed. The Epicureans were too busy pursuing wine, woman, and food to have much time for theory. Here and there in Rome were mendicant preachers of the Cynic philosophy, ignoring speculation and calling men to a simple and soapless life. They acceded to the popular demand that philosophers should be poor and were in consequence the least respected of the schools. Seneca, however, made one of them his intimate friend. Why should I not hold Demetrius in high esteem, he asked. I have found that he lacks nothing. And the millionaire sage marveled when the nearly naked cynic refused a gift of two hundred thousand sesterces from Caligula. Since the Roman Stoic was a man of action rather than of contemplation, he eschewed metaphysics as a hopeless quest and sought in Stoicism a philosophy of conduct that would support human decency, family unity, and social order independently of supernatural surveillance and command. The essence of his code was self-control. He would subordinate passion to reason and train his will to desire nothing that would make his peace of soul contingent upon external goods. In politics, he would recognize the universal brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. At the same time, he would love his country and hold himself ready to die at any time to avert its disgrace or his own. Life itself was always to remain within his choice. He was free to leave it whenever it should become an evil rather than a boon. A man's conscience was to be higher than any law. Monarchy was a sad necessity for the rule of wide and diverse realms, but to kill a despot was an excellent thing. Roman Stoicism had at first profited from the Principate. The limitations on political freedom had driven men from the Forum to the study, and had inclined the finest of them to a philosophy that made the self-controlled subject more sovereign than the impassioned king. The government did not check freedom of thought or speech so long as these made no public attack upon the emperor, his family, or the official gods. But when the professors and their senatorial patrons began to denounce tyranny, there arose between philosophy and autocracy a war that lasted till the adoptive emperors united them on the throne. When Nero ordered Thracia to die in 65, he at the same time exiled Thracia's friend, Masonius Rufus, the most sincere and consistent of the Stoic philosophers in first-century Rome. Rufus had defined philosophy as inquiry into right conduct and had taken his quest seriously. He denounced concubinage despite its legality and demanded of men the same standard of sexual morality that they required of women. Sexual relations, said this ancient Tolstoyan, were permissible only in marriage and for procreation. He believed in equal educational opportunities for both sexes and welcomed women to his lectures, but he bade them seek from education and philosophy the means of perfecting themselves as women. Slaves, too, attended his classes. One of them, Epictetus, honored his teacher by surpassing him. When civil war flared in Rome after Nero's death, Musonius went out to the attacking army and lectured it on the blessings of peace and the horrors of war. Antonius's troops laughed at him and resumed the ultimate arbitrament. Vespasian, in expelling the philosophers from Rome, accepted Rufus, but he kept his concubines. 4. Seneca The Stoic philosophy found its most doubtful expression in the life, its most perfect expression in the writings, of Lucius Aeneas Seneca. Born at Cordoba about 4 BC, he was soon taken to Rome and received all the education available there. He imbibed rhetoric from his father, Stoicism from Attalus, Pythagoreanism from Socian, and practical politics from his aunt's husband, the Roman governor of Egypt. He tried vegetarianism for a year, then gave it up, but remained always abstemious in food and drink. He was a millionaire in his surroundings rather than in his habits. He suffered so much from asthma and weak lungs that he often contemplated suicide. He practiced law and was chosen quester about A.D. 33. Two years later he married Pompeia Paulina, with whom he lived in remarkable continuity until his death. On inheriting his father's fortune, he abandoned the law and indulged himself in writing. When Cremutius Cordus was forced by Caligula to kill himself in 40, Seneca addressed to Cordus's daughter Marcia a consolatio, an essay of condolence which was a regularly practiced form in the schools of rhetoric and philosophy. Caligula wished to have him executed for his impertinence, but Seneca's friends saved his life by arguing that he would presently die of consumption in any case. Soon afterward, Claudius accused him of improper relations with Julia, daughter of Germanicus. The Senate condemned him to death, but Claudius commuted this to exile in Corsica. On that rugged isle, amid a population as primitive as in Ovid's Tomai, the philosopher spent eight lonely years, from forty-one to forty-nine. At first he took his misfortune with true stoic calm, and comforted his mother with a touching consolatio ad helvium. But as the bitter years crawled on, his spirit broke, 
and he addressed to Claudius' secretary a consolatio ad polybium in a humble appeal for pardon. When this failed, he tried to dull his sufferings by composing tragedies. These strange productions, in which almost every character is an orator, were probably intended for the study rather than the stage. We do not hear of any of them being played. At most, some brilliant episodes or resounding speeches were put to music and acted by a mime. The gentle philosopher incarnadines the stage with violence, as if he would rival in the theatre the blood feasts of the games. Despite these heroic efforts, he is too much of a thinker to be a good dramatist. He prefers ideas to men and loses no chance for reflection, sentiment, or epigram. His plays contain some fine lines, but for the rest they may be forgotten with impunity. It should be added, however, that many good judges have not agreed with this verdict. Scaliger, lord of Renaissance critics, preferred Seneca to Euripides. When ancient literature came back to life, it was Seneca who served as model for the first dramas in modern speech. From him came the classic form and unities that marked the plays of Corneille and Racine and dominated the French stage till the 19th century. In England, which felt his influence less, the translation of Seneca's dramas by Haywood in 1559 gave an exemplar to the first English tragedy, Gorboduc, and left its mark on Shakespeare. In 48, the younger Agrippina replaced Messalina in power over Claudius and Rome. Anxious to turn her eleven-year-old son Nero into an Alexander, she looked about for an Aristotle and found him in Corsica. She had Seneca recalled and restored to his seat in the Senate. For five years he tutored the youth, and for five more he guided the emperor and the state. During this decade he wrote for the edification of Nero and Sundry some genial expositions of the Stoic philosophy— on anger, on the brevity of life, on the tranquility of the soul, on clemency, on the happy life, on the constancy of the sage, on benefits, on providence. These formal treatises do not show him at his best. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 10, Side 2. These formal treatises do not show him at his best. Like his plays, they gleam with epigrams, but these, sent forth page after page in a staccato jet, at last weary the mind and lose their charm. Seneca's public, however, read these essays at intervals and did not resent the gay wit that displeased the austere Quintilian, or the sugar plums and glaring patches that would offend Fronto's archaic taste. It was pleased that their rich premier spoke so amiably, and, like his pupil, tried so hard to win its applause. For many years Seneca was the leading author, statesman, and vine-grower of Italy. He multiplied his patrimony by investments that apparently took full advantage of his official position and knowledge. If we may believe Dio, he lent money to provincials at such high interest that panic and insurrection broke out in Britain when he suddenly called in his loans there in the sum of forty million sesterces. His fortune, we are told, rose to three hundred million, or thirty million dollars. In fifty-eight, an old delator friend of Messalina, Publius Swilius, publicly attacked the premier as a hypocrite, an adulterer, and a wanton, a man who denounces courtiers and never leaves the palace, who denounces luxury and displays five hundred dining tables of cedar and ivory, who denounces wealth and sucks the provinces dry by usury. Like Caesar, Seneca contented himself with a rebuttal when he might have arranged an execution. In his essay On the Happy Life, he repeated the charges and replied that the sage is not bound to poverty. If wealth comes to him honestly, he may take it, but he must be capable of abandoning it at any time without serious regret. Meanwhile, he lived ascetically amid his fine furniture, slept on a hard mattress, drank only water, and ate so sparingly that when he died his body was emaciated through undernourishment. Abundance of food, he wrote, dulls the wits. Excess of food strangles the soul. The charges of sexual irregularity were probably true of his youth, but he was noted for his unfailing tenderness to his wife. In truth, he never made up his mind which he loved better, philosophy or power, wisdom or pleasure, and he was never convinced of their incompatibility. He admitted that he was a very imperfect sage. I persist in praising not the life that I lead, but that which I ought to lead. I follow it at a mighty distance, crawling, of which of us is this not true? If he is not sincere in saying that mercy becomes no man so well as the king or the prince, he at least phrases the sentiment almost as well as Portia. He condemned gladiatorial combats to the death, and Nero forbade them. He disarmed much criticism by what Tacitus calls the grace with which he imparted wisdom. 
He did not demand any more than he practiced perfection. We have seen that he ruled the empire well and that he tarnished his record by condoning the worst of Nero's crimes, letting much evil pass in order to have the power of doing a little good. He felt disgraced and longed to free himself from his imperial servitude. He described the emperor's palace as Triste Ergastulum, an unhappy prison for slaves. He began to wish that he had devoted all his life to the study of wisdom and had shunned the dark labyrinths of power. With pleasure he would put aside now and then the cares of politics, and at sixty attended like an eager youth the lectures of Metronax on philosophy. In the year sixty-two, aged sixty-six, he begged leave to resign his reduced place in the government, but Nero would not let him go. After the great fire of sixty-four, when Nero asked all the empire to send contributions for the rebuilding of Rome, Seneca donated the greater part of his fortune. Gradually he succeeded in withdrawing from the court. More and more he lived in his Campanian villas, hoping by an almost monastic seclusion to escape the attentions and spies of the emperor. For a time he lived on wild apples and running water for fear of poison in his food. It was in this atmosphere of leisurely terror that he wrote, from 63 to 65, his studies in natural science, Questiones Naturales, and the most lovable of his works, the Epistolae Morales. They were casual intimate causeries addressed to his friend Lucilius, rich governor of Sicily, poet, philosopher, and frank Epicurean. There are few books in Roman literature more pleasant than these urbane attempts to adapt Stoicism to the needs of a millionaire. Here begins the informal essay, which would be the favorite medium of Plutarch and Lucian, Montaigne and Voltaire, Bacon and Addison and Steele. To read these letters is to be in correspondence with an enlightened, humane, and tolerant Roman who has reached the heights and known the depths of literature, statesmanship, and philosophy. They are Zeno, speaking with Epicurus's lenience and Plato's charm. Seneca apologizes to Lucilius for the carelessness of his style. It is nevertheless delectable Latin. I want my letters to you to be just what my conversation would be if you and I were sitting or walking together. I write this, he adds, not for the many, but for you. Each of us is sufficient audience to the other. Satis magnum alter alteri theatrum sumus. Though the old diplomat doubtless hoped that posterity would eavesdrop on his talk. He describes his asthma vividly, but without self-pity. He cheerfully calls it practicing how to die by taking last gasps for an hour. He is sixty-seven now, but only in body. My mind is strong and alert. It takes issue with me on the subject of old age. It declares that old age is its period of bloom. He rejoices that he has time at last to read the good books he has had so long to put aside. Apparently he now reread Epicurus, for he quotes him with a frequency and an enthusiasm scandalous in a Stoic. He is frightened by the excesses of individualism and self-indulgence in Caligula, Nero, and thousands more. He wishes to offer some counterweight to the temptations that beset minds liberated before moral maturity, and he seems resolved to confute the Epicureans out of the mouth of the master whose name they abused and whose doctrine they dared not understand. The first lesson of philosophy is that we cannot be wise about everything. We are fragments in infinity and moments in eternity. For such forked atoms to describe the universe or the supreme being must make the planets tremble with mirth. Therefore Seneca has little use for metaphysics or theology. One may prove out of his writings that he was a monotheist, a polytheist, a pantheist, a materialist, a platonist, a monist, a dualist. Sometimes God is to him a personal providence who watches over all, loves good men, answers their prayers, and helps them by divine grace. In other passages God is the first cause in an unbroken chain of causes and effects, and the ultimate force is fate, an irrevocable cause which carries along human and divine affairs equally, leading the willing and dragging the unwilling along. A like indecision obscures his conception of the soul. It is a finely material breath animating the body, but it is also a god dwelling as a guest in the human frame. He speaks hopefully of a life beyond death where knowledge and virtue will be perfected, and again he calls immortality a beautiful dream. In truth, Seneca has never thought these matters out to a consistent or public conclusion. He talks of them with the cautious inconsistency of a politician who agrees with everybody. He has followed too successfully his father's oratorical lessons and expresses every point of view with irresistible eloquence. The same hesitations mar and grace his moral philosophy. He is too stoic to be practical and too lenient to be stoic. He sees about him an immorality that exhausts the body and debases the soul, never satisfying either. Avarice and luxury have destroyed peace and health, and power has made man only an abler brute. How shall one free himself from this ignominious agitation? 
I read in Epicurus today, if you would enjoy real freedom, you must be the slave of philosophy. The man who submits to her is emancipated there and then. The body, once cured, often ails again, but the mind, once healed, is healed for good and all. I shall tell you what I mean by health. If the mind is content and confident, if it understands that those things for which all men pray, all the benefits that are sought or bestowed, are of no importance in relation to a life of happiness, I shall give you a rule by which to measure yourself and your development. In that day you will come into your own when you realize that the successful are of all men most miserable. Philosophy is the science of wisdom, and wisdom is the art of living. Happiness is the goal, but virtue, not pleasure, is the road. The old ridiculed maxims are correct and are perpetually verified by experience. In the long run, honesty, justice, forbearance, kindliness bring us more happiness than ever comes from the pursuit of pleasure. Pleasure is good, but only when consistent with virtue. It cannot be a wise man's goal. Those who make it their end in life are like the dog that snaps at every piece of meat thrown to it, swallows it whole, and then instead of enjoying it, stands with jaws agape anxiously awaiting more. But how does one acquire wisdom? By practicing it daily, in however modest a degree, by examining your conduct of each day at its close, by being harsh to your own faults and lenient to those of others, by associating with those who excel you in wisdom and virtue, by taking some acknowledged sage as your invisible counselor and judge. You will be helped by reading the philosophers, not outlined stories of philosophy, but the original works. Give over hoping that you can skim by means of epitomes the wisdom of distinguished men. Every one of these men will send you away happier and more devoted. No one of them will allow you to depart empty-handed. What happiness and what a noble old age await him who has given himself into their patronage. Read good books many times rather than many books. Travel slowly and not too much. The spirit cannot mature into unity unless it has checked its curiosity and its wanderings. The primary sign of a well-ordered mind is a man's ability to remain in one place and linger in his own company. Avoid crowds. Men are more wicked together than separately. If you are forced to be in a crowd, then most of all you should withdraw into yourself. The final lesson of the Stoic is contempt and choice of death. Life is not always so joyful as to merit continuance. After life's fitful fever it is well to sleep. What is baser than to fret at the threshold of peace? If a man finds life grievous and can leave it without serious injury to others, he should feel free to choose his own time and way. Seneca preaches suicide to Lucilius as if he were Lucilius's heir. This is one reason why we cannot complain of life. It keeps no one against his will. You have had veins cut for the purpose of reducing your weight. If you would pierce your heart, a gaping wound is not necessary. A lancet will open the way to freedom, and tranquility can be purchased at the cost of a pinprick. Wherever you look, there is an end to troubles. Do you see that precipice? It is a descent to liberty. Do you see that river, that cistern, that sea? Freedom is in their depths. But I am running on too long. How can a man end his life if he cannot end a letter? As for me, my dear Lucilius, I have lived long enough. I have had my fill. I await death. Farewell. Life took him at his word. Nero sent a tribune to seek his answer to the charge that he had plotted to make Piso emperor. Seneca replied that he was no longer interested in politics and sought nothing but peace and the opportunity to attend to a weak and crazy constitution. He showed no symptom of fear, reported the tribune, no sign of sorrow. His words and looks bespoke a mind serene, erect, and firm. Return, said Nero, and tell him to die. Seneca heard the message, says Tacitus, with calm composure. He embraced his wife and bade her be comforted by the honorableness of his life and the lessons of philosophy. But Paulina refused to outlive him. When his veins were opened, she had hers opened, too. He called for a secretary and dictated a letter of farewell to the Roman people. He asked and received a drink of hemlock, as if resolved to die like Socrates. As the physician placed him in a warm bath to ease his pain, he sprinkled the nearest servants with the water, saying, A libation to Jove the Deliverer, and after much suffering he passed away, this in sixty-five. At Nero's command, the physician forcibly bound Paulina's wrists and stopped the flow of her blood. She survived her husband a few years, but her perpetual pallor recalled her stoic resolution. Death glorified Seneca and made one generation forget his poses and his inconsistencies. Like all Stoics, he underestimated the power and value of feeling and passion, exaggerated the worth and reliability of reason, and trusted too much to a nature in whose soil grew all the flowers of evil as well as of good. But he made Stoicism human, brought it down livably within the scope of men, and formed it into a spacious vestibule to Christianity. His pessimism, his condemnation of the immorality of his time, his counsel to return anger with kindness, and his preoccupation with death made Tertullian call him ours, 
and led Augustine to exclaim, What more could a Christian say than this pagan has said? He was not a Christian, but at least he asked for an end to slaughter and lechery, called men to a simple and decent life, and reduced the distinctions between freeman, freedman, and slave to mere titles born of ambition or of wrong. It was a slave in Nero's court, Epictetus, who profited most from his teaching. Nerva and Trajan were in some measure molded by his writings and inspired by his example to conscientiousness and humanitarian statesmanship. To the end of antiquity and through the Middle Ages he remained popular, and when the rebirth came, Petrarch placed him next to Virgil and upon Seneca's prose devotedly modeled his own. Montaigne's brother-in-law translated him into French, and Montaigne quoted him as fondly as Seneca quoted Epicurus. Emerson read him again and again and became an American Seneca. There are few original ideas in him, but that may be forgiven, for in philosophy all truth is old and only error is original. With all his faults he was the greatest of Rome's philosophers, and, at least in his books, one of the wisest and kindliest of men. Next to Cicero, he was the most lovable hypocrite in history. 5. Roman Science Therefore we have given him too much space. Nevertheless we have not finished with him yet, for he was also a scientist. In those fertile years between his retirement and his death he amused himself with questiones naturales, and sought natural explanations of rain, hail, snow, wind, comets, rainbows, earthquakes, rivers, springs. In his drama Medea he had suggested the existence of another continent beyond the Atlantic. With similar intuition, contemplating the overwhelming multitude of stars, he wrote, How many an orb, moving in the depths of space, has never yet reached the eyes of men? And he adds, clairvoyantly, How many things our sons will learn that we cannot now suspect? What others await centuries when our names will be forgotten? Our descendants will marvel at our ignorance. We do. Seneca, though always eloquent, adds little to Aristotle and Eratus, and borrows abundantly from Posidonius. He believes in divination despite Cicero, lapses into ludicrous teleology despite Lucretius, and interrupts his science at every turn to inculcate morality. He passes skillfully from muscles to luxury, and from comets to degeneration. The fathers of the Church liked this mixture of meteorology and morals, and made the Questiones Naturales the most popular textbook of science in the Middle Ages. There were a few men of scientific mind and interest in Rome, like Varro, Agrippa, Pomponius Mila, and Celsus, but they were scarce outside of geography, horticulture, and medicine. For the rest, science had not yet detached itself from magic, superstition, theology, and philosophy. It consisted of collected observations and traditions, seldom of fresh inquiry into facts, and rarely of experiment. Astronomy remained as Babylonia and Greece had left it. Time was still told by water clocks and sundials, and by the great obelisk that Augustus had stolen from Egypt and set up in the field of Mars. Its shadow, falling upon a pavement marked off in brass, indicated both the hour and the season. Day and night were variably defined by the rising and setting of the sun. Each had twelve hours, so that an hour of the day was longer, and an hour of the night shorter in summer than in winter. Astrology was almost universally accepted. Pliny noted that in his time, A.D. 70, both learned and simple believed that a man's destiny was determined by the star under which he was born. They argued plausibly that vegetation and perhaps the mating season in animals depended upon the sun, that the physical and moral qualities of people are affected by climatic factors themselves determined by the sun, and that individual character and fate, like these general phenomena, are the result of celestial conditions inadequately known. Astrology was rejected only by the skeptics of the later academy, who denied its pretended knowledge, and by the Christians, who scorned it as idolatry. Geography was studied more realistically for navigation's sake. Pomponius Mila, in A.D. 43, published maps on which the surface of the globe was divided into a central torrid zone and north and south temperate zones. Roman geographers knew Europe, southwestern and southern Asia, and northern Africa. Of the remainder they had vague ideas and fantastic legends. Spanish and African skippers reached Madeira and the Canary Islands, but no Columbus rose to test Seneca's dream. The most extensive, industrious, and unscientific product of Italian science was the Historia Naturalis, in 77, of Caius Plinius Secundus. Though busy nearly all his life as soldier, lawyer, traveler, administrator, and head of the Western Roman fleet, he wrote treatises on oratory, grammar, and the javelin, a history of Rome, another of Rome's wars in Germany, and, sole survivor of this flood, thirty-seven books of natural history. How he managed all this in fifty-five years is explained in a letter of his nephews. He had a quick apprehension, incredible zeal, and an unequaled capacity to go without sleep. 
He would rise at midnight or at one, and never later than two in the morning, and begin his literary work. Before daybreak he used to wait upon Vespasian, who likewise chose that season to transact business. When he had finished the affairs which the emperor committed to his charge, he returned home to his studies. After a short light repast at noon, he would frequently in the summer repose in the sun. But during that time some author was read to him, from whom he made extracts and notes, as was his method with whatever he read. Thereafter he generally went into a cold bath, took a light refreshment, and rested for a while. Then, as if it were a new day, he resumed his studies till dinner, when again a book was read to him, and he made notes. Such was his manner of life amid the noise and hurry of the town. But in the country his whole time was devoted to study, except when he was actually bathing. All the while he was being rubbed and wiped, he was employed in hearing some book read to him or in dictating. In his journeys his stenographer constantly attended him in his chariot or sedan chair. He once reproved me for walking. You need not have lost those hours, he said, for he counted all time lost that was not given to study. His book, so sheared and sewn, was a one-man encyclopedia summarizing the science and errors of his age. My purpose, he says, is to give a general description of everything that is known to exist throughout the earth. He deals with twenty thousand topics and apologizes for omitting others. He refers to two thousand volumes by four hundred seventy-three authors, and admits his indebtedness by name with a candor exceptional in ancient literature. He notes in passing that he found many authors transcribing their predecessors word for word without acknowledgment. His style is dull, though sometimes purple, but we must not expect encyclopedias to be fascinating. Pliny begins by rejecting the gods. They are, he thinks, merely natural phenomena, or planets, or services, personified and deified. The sole god is nature, that is, the sum of natural forces. And this god apparently pays no special attention to mundane affairs. Pliny modestly refuses to measure the universe. His astronomy is a galaxy of absurdities. For example, in the war of Octavian against Antony, the sun remained dim for almost a year. But he notes the aurora borealis, states with approximate modernity the orbital period of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn as respectively two, twelve, and thirty years, and argues for the spherical form of the Earth. He tells of islands rising from the Mediterranean in his time, and surmises that Sicily and Italy, Boeotia and Euboea, Cyprus and Syria were gradually sundered by the patience of the sea. He treats of the laborious and servile mining of precious metals, and regrets that many hands are worn down that one little joint may be adorned. He wishes that iron had never been found, since it has made war more terrible. As if to bring death upon man more swiftly, we have given wings to iron and told it to fly, referring to iron missiles equipped with leather feathers to help them keep their course. Following Theophrastus, he mentions under the name of Anthracitus a stone that burns, but says no more about coal. He speaks of an incombustible linen, called by the Greeks asbestinon, which is used to embalm the cadavers of kings. He describes or lists many animals, lauds their sagacity, and tells how to predetermine their sex. If you wish to have females, let the dams face north while being covered. He has twelve wondrous books on medicine, i.e. on the curative value of various minerals and plants. Books twenty through twenty-five are a Roman herbal, which the Middle Ages passed down to form the initial plant lore of modern medicine. He offers cures for everything from intoxication and halitosis to a pain in the neck. He provides stimulants for the sexual passion, and warns women against sneezing after coitus, lest they abort there and then. He recommends coitus for physical weariness, hoarseness, pains in the loins, dim eyesight, melancholy, and alienation of the mental faculties. Here is a panacea rivaling Bishop Berkeley's tar water. Amid such nonsense occurs much useful information, especially about ancient industry, manners, or drugs with interesting references to atavism, petroleum, and change of sex after birth. Eusianus informs us that he once saw at Argos a person whose name was then Ariscon, but had formerly been Ariscusa, that this person had been married to a man, but that shortly afterward he developed a beard and other male characteristics upon which he took a wife. Here and there valuable hints occur. For example, Himley, in 1800, was led to investigate the action of Jusquiamus and Belladonna on the pupil, by reading in Pliny a passage about the use of anagallus juice before operations for cataract. There are precious chapters on painting and sculpture, which constitute our oldest and principal account of ancient art. Pliny was not content with natural history. He wished also to be a philosopher, and throughout his pages he scatters comments on mankind. The life of animals, he thinks, is preferable to man's, for they never think about glory, money, ambition, or death. They can learn without being taught and never have to dress, 
and they do not make war upon their own species. The invention of money was fatal to human happiness. It made interest possible, by which some could live in idleness while others worked. Hence the rise of great estates owned by absentee landlords and the ruinous replacement of tillage with pasturage. Life in Pliny's estimate gives us much more grief and pain than happiness, and death is our supreme boon. After death, there is nothing. The natural history is a lasting monument to Roman ignorance. Pliny gathers superstitions, portents, love charms, and magic cures as assiduously as anything else, and apparently believes in most of them. He thinks that a man, especially if fasting, can kill a snake by spitting into its mouth. It is well known that in Lusitania the mares become impregnated by the west wind, a point missed in Shelley's Ode. Pliny condemns magic, but on the approach of a menstruating woman, he informs us, must will sour and seeds touched by her will become sterile, and fruit will fall from the tree under which she sits. Her look will blunt the edge of steel and take the polish from ivory. If it falls upon a swarm of bees, they will die at once. Pliny rejects astrology and then fills pages with prognostics, derived from the behavior of the sun and the moon. In the consulship of Emma Silius, and frequently at other times, it rained milk and blood. When we reflect that this book and Seneca's Questiones were the chief legacy of Roman natural science to the Middle Ages, and compare them with the corresponding works and temper of Aristotle and Theophrastus four hundred years earlier, we begin to feel the slow tragedy of a dying culture. The Romans had conquered the Greek world, but they had already lost the most precious part of its heritage. 6. Roman Medicine They did better in medicine. Medical science, too, they borrowed from the Greeks, but they formulated it well and applied it ably to personal and public hygiene. Rome, almost surrounded by marshes and subject to mephitic floods, had particular need of public sanitation. About the 2nd century B.C. we hear of malaria in Rome. The Anopheles mosquito had settled down in the Pontine swamps. Gout spread as luxury increased. The younger Pliny tells us how his friend Corellius Rufus suffered its pains from his thirty-third to his sixty-seventh year before committing suicide, just to have the pleasure of outliving by one day that brigand Domitian. Some passages in the Roman satirists suggest the appearance of syphilis in the first century A.D., Great epidemics swept central Italy in 23 B.C., A.D. 65, 79, and 166. The people had of old tried to meet disease and plague with magic and prayer. Even now they begged the skeptical but complacent Vespasian to heal their blindness with his spittle and their lameness with the touch of his foot. They brought their illnesses and votive offerings to the temples of Aesculapius and Minerva, and many left gifts in gratitude for cures. But in the first century B.C. they turned more and more to secular medicine— there was as yet no state regulation of medical practice. Shoemakers, barbers, carpenters added it to their operations as they pleased, called in magic to their aid, and compounded, touted, and sold their own drugs. There were the usual satires and complaints. Pliny repeated old Cato's imprecations upon Greek physicians who seduce our wives, grow rich by feeding us poisons, learn by our suffering, and experiment by putting us to death. Petronius, Marshall, and Juvenal joined in the assault, and a century later Lucian would score incompetent practitioners who hide their incapacity under the elegance of their apparatus. Nevertheless, medicine, as we shall see, made great progress in Alexandria, Kos, Trales, Miletus, Ephesus, and Pergamum. And from these centers came Greek physicians who so raised the level of Roman practice that Caesar enfranchised the profession in Rome and Augustus exempted it from taxation. Asclepiades of Prusa won the friendship of Caesar, Crassus, and Antony. He declared that the heart pumps blood and air through the body, rarely prescribed drugs or drastic purges, and accomplished impressive cures by hydrotherapy, baths, fomentations, enemas, massage, sunshine, exercise, walking, horseback riding, diet, fasting, and abstinence from meat. He was distinguished for his treatment of malaria, his operations on the throat, and his humane handling of the insane— he gathered pupils about him and took some of them with him on his rounds. After his death, they and similar students formed themselves into collegia and built for themselves a meeting place on the Esquiline called Scola Medicorum. Under Vespasian, auditoria were opened for the teaching of medicine, and recognized professors were paid by the state. Greek was the language of instruction, as Latin is now the language of prescription, and for a like reason, its intelligibility to persons of diverse tongues. Graduates of these state schools received the title of Medicus a Republica, and after Vespasian they alone could legally practice medicine in Rome. The Lex Aquilia provided for state supervision of physicians and held them responsible for negligence, and the Lex Cornelia 
severely punished practitioners whose carelessness or culpable ignorance caused the death of a patient. Quacks continued, but sound practice increased. Midwives saw most Romans into the world, but many of these women were well trained. About A.D. 100, military medicine reached its ancient zenith. Every legion had twenty-four surgeons, first aid and field ambulance service were well organized, and hospitals were maintained near every important encampment. Private hospitals, valetudinaria, were opened by physicians. From these evolved the public hospitals of the Middle Ages. Doctors were appointed and paid by the state to give free treatment to the poor. Rich men kept their own physicians and well-paid archaeotry, or chief healers, took care of the emperor, his family, his servants, and his aides. Sometimes families would contract with a doctor to attend to their health and illnesses for a period of time. In this way, Quintus Stertinius made 600,000 sesterces a year. The surgeon Alcon fined 10 million sesterces by Claudius, paid it with a few years' fees. The profession now reached a high degree of specialization. There were urologists, gynecologists, obstetricians, ophthalmologists, eye and ear specialists, veterinarians, dentists. Romans could have gold teeth, wired teeth, false teeth, bridge work, and plates. There were many women physicians. Some of them wrote manuals of abortion, which were popular among great ladies and prostitutes. Surgeons were divided into further specialties and seldom engaged in general practice. Mandragora juice or atropin was used as an anesthetic. Over two hundred different surgical instruments have been found in the ruins of Pompeii. Dissection was illegal, but the examination of wounded or dying gladiators offered a frequent substitute. Hydrotherapy was popular. In a measure, the great thermi were hydrotherapeutic institutes. Carmus of Marseille made a fortune by administering cold baths. Consumptives were sent to Egypt or North Africa. Sulfur was used as a skin-specific and to fumigate rooms after an infectious disease. Drugs were a final but frequent resort. Physicians made them by processes kept secret from the public and charged for them all that patients could be persuaded to pay. Repulsive drugs were held in high honor. The offal of lizards was used as a purgative, human entrails were sometimes prescribed, Antonius Musa recommended the excreta of dogs for angina, Galen applied a boy's dung to the swellings of the throat. In compensation for all this, a cheerful quack offered to cure almost any ailment with wine. Of the known medical writers in this age, only one was a Roman, and he was not a physician. Aurelius Cornelius Celsus was an aristocrat who about A.D. 30 gathered into an encyclopedia de artibus his studies in agriculture, war, oratory, law, philosophy, and medicine. Only the section de medicina survives. It is the greatest work on medicine that has come down to us from the six centuries between Hippocrates and Galen. It has also the distinction of being written in such pure and classical Latin that Celsus was dubbed Cicero Medicorum. The Latin terms into which he translated the nomenclature of Greek medicine have ruled the science ever since. The sixth book shows considerable knowledge in antiquity of venereal disease. The seventh is an illuminating description of surgical methods. It contains the earliest known account of ligature and describes tonsillectomy, lateral lithotomy, plastic surgery, and operations for cataract. Altogether, this is the soundest achievement in Roman scientific literature, and suggests that we might have a better opinion of Roman science if Pliny had not been preserved. It is a pity that scholarship has concluded that Celsus's treatise is largely a compilation or paraphrase of Greek texts. Lost in the Middle Ages, it was rediscovered in the 15th century, was printed before Hippocrates or Galen, and took a leading part in stimulating the reconstruction of medicine in modern times. 7. Quintilian when Vespasian established a state professorship of rhetoric in Rome, he appointed to it a man who, like so many authors of this Silver Age, was of Spanish birth. Marcus Fabius Quintilianus was born at Caligurus in possibly A.D. 35, went to Rome to study oratory, and opened a school of rhetoric there which numbered Tacitus and the younger Pliny among its pupils. Juvenal describes him in his prime as handsome, noble, wise, well-bred, with a fine voice and delivery, and a senatorial dignity. In old age he retired to write for the guidance of his son the classic treatment of his subject, the Institutio Oratoria, this in 96. I thought that this work would be the most precious part of the inheritance of my son, whose ability was so remarkable that it called for the most anxious cultivation on the part of his father. Night and day I pursued this design and hastened its completion in the fear that death might cut me off with my task unfinished. Then misfortune overwhelmed me with such suddenness that the success of my labors now interests no one less than myself. 
I have lost him of whom I had formed the highest expectations, and in whom I reposed all the hopes that should solace my old age. His wife had died at nineteen, leaving him two sons. One of these had died at the age of five, robbing me, as it were, of one of my two eyes. Now the other went, leaving the old teacher to outlive all my nearest and dearest. He defines rhetoric as the science of speaking well. The training of the orator should begin before birth. It is desirable that he should come of educated parents, so that he may receive correct speech and good manners from the very air he breathes. It is impossible to become both educated and a gentleman in one generation. The future orator should study music to give him an ear for harmony, the dance to give him grace and rhythm, drama to animate his eloquence with gesture and action, gymnastics to keep him in health and strength, literature to form his style, train his memory, and arm him with a treasury of great thoughts, science to acquaint him with some understanding of nature, and philosophy to mold his character on the dictates of reason and the precepts of wise men. For all preparations will be of no avail unless integrity of conduct and nobility of spirit are present to generate an irresistible sincerity of speech. Then the student must write as much as possible and with the utmost care. It is a hard training, and I trust, says Quintilian, that no one among my readers will think of calculating its monetary value. The oration itself has five phases, conception, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Having chosen his subject and clearly conceived his purpose, let the orator gather his material from observation, inquiry, and books, and arrange it both logically and psychologically, so that each part will be in its proper place and lead as naturally to the next as in geometry. A well-organized address will consist of introduction, or exordium, proposition, proof, refutation, and peroration. The speech should be written out only if it is to be fully memorized. Otherwise, fragmentary memories of the written form will obstruct and confuse an extempore style. If it is written, it must be with care. Write quickly, and you will never write well. Write well, and you will soon write quickly. Shun the lazy luxury of dictation now so fashionable among writers. Clearness is the first essential, then brevity, beauty, and vigor. Correct repeatedly and stoically. Erasure is as important as writing. Prune what is turgid, elevate what is commonplace, arrange what is disorderly, introduce rhythm where the language is harsh, modify where it is too absolute. The best method of correction is to put aside for a time what we have written, so that when we come to it again we may have an aspect of novelty, as of being another man's work. In this way we may preserve ourselves from regarding our writings with the affection that we lavish upon a newborn child. Delivery, like composition, should touch the emotions, but avoid exuberant gesticulation. It is feeling and force of imagination that makes us eloquent, but shout and bellow with your uplifted hand, pant, wag your head, smite your hands together, slap your thigh, your breast, your forehead, and you will go straight to the heart of the dingier members of your audience. To all this excellent counsel, Quintilian adds in his twelfth book the best literary criticism that has survived from antiquity. He enters with zest into the ancient and modern war between the ancients and the moderns, and finds truth precariously in the middle. He does not, like Fronto, wish to return to the rude simplicity of Cato and Ennius, but still more he would shun the voluptuous and affected fluency of Seneca. He prefers, as a model for students, the virile yet polished speech of Cicero, the one Roman writer who had in his line surpassed the Greeks. Quintilian's own style is often that of a schoolmaster, moribund with definitions, classification, and distinctions, and rising to eloquence only in denouncing Seneca. But it is a vigorous style, whose dignity is lightened now and then with touches of humanity and wit. Behind the good sense of the words we feel always the quiet goodness of the man. It is a moral stimulus to read him. Perhaps the Romans, who had the privilege of his instruction, took from it some part of the moral renovation that, more than any brilliance of letters, ennobled the age of the younger Pliny and Tacitus. 8. Statius and Martial we have left to the last two poets who belonged to the same epoch, sought the favor of the same emperor and the same patrons, yet never mention each other, one the purest, the other the coarsest poet in the history of imperial Rome. Publius Papinius Statius was the son of a Neapolitan poet and grammarian. His environment and his education gave him everything but money and genius. He lisped in numbers, startled salons with poetical improvisations, and wrote an epic, the Thebiad, on the War of the Seven against Thebes. We cannot read it today, for its movement is obstructed with dead gods, and its smooth verses have an overpowering virtus dormitiva. But his contemporaries liked it. Crowds gathered to hear him recite it in a Naples theater. They understood his mythological machinery, welcomed the delicacy of his sentiment, and found that his lines ran trippingly on the tongue. The judges in the Alban poetry contest gave him the first prize. Rich men became his friends and helped him stave off penury. Domitian himself invited him to dinner in the Domus Flavia, 
and Statius repaid him by describing the palace as heaven and the emperor as God. To Domitian and other patrons, to his father and his friends, he addressed the most pleasing of his poems, the Silvi, modest idols and eulogies in light and happy verse. In the Capitoline games, however, another poet won the crown. Statius's star waned in fickle Rome, and he persuaded his reluctant wife to return with him to his boyhood home. In Naples he began another epic, the Achilleid. Then suddenly in ninety-six he died, a youth of thirty-five. He was not a great poet, but he struck a welcome note of kindliness and tenderness amid a literature too often sarcastic and bitter, and a society corrupt and coarse beyond any precedent. He would have been as famous as Marshall if he had been as obscene. Marcus Valerius Marshallus was born at Bilbalus in Spain in the fortieth year of our era. At twenty-four he came to Rome and won the friendship of Lucan and Seneca. Quintilian advised him to butter his bread by practicing law, but Marshall preferred to starve on poetry. His friends were suddenly swept away in the conspiracy of Piso, and he was reduced to addressing his poems to rich men who might give him a dinner for an epigram. He lived in a third-floor garret, probably alone, for though he indicts two poems to a woman whom he calls his wife, they are so foul that she must have been an invention or a bawd. His poems, he lets us know, were read throughout the empire, even among the Goths. He rejoices to learn that he was almost as famous as a racehorse, but he fretted to see his publisher enriched while he himself received nothing from the sale of his books. He descended to suggesting in an epigram that he badly needed a toga. The emperor's rich freedman Parthenius sent him one. He replied in two stanzas, one of which celebrated the newness of the garment, the other its cheap worthlessness. In time he found some more generous patrons. One gave him a little farm at Nomentum, and somehow he raised funds to buy a simple home on the Quirinal Hill. He became a client or retainer to one rich man after another, waited upon them in the morning and received an occasional gift, but he felt the shame of his situation and mourned that he did not have the courage to be contentedly poor and therefore free. He could not afford to be poor, for he had to mingle in the society of men who could reward his verse. He showered Domitian with lords and announced that if Jupiter and Domitian were to invite him to dinner on the same day, he would turn down the god. But the emperor preferred Statius. Marshall became jealous of the younger poet and suggested that a live epigram was worth more than a dead epic. The epigram had till now been a pretty conceit on any passing subject, sometimes a dedication, a compliment, an epitaph. Marshall molded it into a briefer, sharper form, barbed with satiric sting. We do him injustice when we read these 1561 epigrams in a few sittings. They were issued in twelve books at divers times, and the reader was expected to use them in small portions as hors d'oeuvres, not as a prolonged feast. Most of them seem trivial today. Their illusion was local and temporary, too well-timed to endure. Marshall does not take them very seriously. The bad ones, he agrees, outnumber the good, but he had to fill a volume. He is a master of versification, knows all the meters and all the tricks of the poetic trade, but he avoids rhetoric as proudly as his prose patrician analogue Petronius. He cares nothing for the mythological furniture that littered the literature of his age. He is interested in real men and women and their intimate life and describes them with relish and spite. My pages, he says, taste of men. He can take down some stiff aristocrat or stingy millionaire, some pompous lawyer or famous orator, but he likes better to tell of barbers, cobblers, hawkers, jockeys, acrobats, auctioneers, poisoners, perverts, and prostitutes. His scenes are laid not in ancient Greece, but in the baths, the theaters, the streets, the circus, the homes, and tenements of Rome. He is the poet laureate of worthless men. He is more interested in money than in love, and most often thinks of the latter in one gender. There is some sentiment in him, and he speaks very tenderly of a friend's child just dead, but there is no gallant line in his books, not even a noble wrath. He chants a litany of evil smells and adds, All these stenches I prefer to yours, Bassa. He describes one of his mistresses. Your tresses, Gala, are manufactured far away. You lay aside your teeth at night as you do your silk tresses. You lie stored away in a hundred caskets, and your face does not sleep with you. You wink with an eyebrow brought to you in the morning. No respect moves you for your outworn carcass, which you may now count as one of your ancestors. He writes with unmanly vengefulness of the women who have refused him, and flings his epigrammatic mud at them with the delicacy of a scavenger. His love lyrics are addressed to boys. He climbs to ecstasy over the fragrance of thy kisses, cruel lad. One of his love poems begot a famous English counterpart. I do not love you, Sibidius, the reason I cannot tell. This only I can say, I dislike you very well. Indeed, there are many whom Marshall does not like. He describes them under transparent pseudonyms and in language that can be found today only on the most private public walls. He is always libeling his enemies, as Statius is always celebrating his friends. Some of his victims retaliated by publishing under his name poems filthier than his own, or attacking the men whom Marshall was anxious to please. 
From these technically perfect epigrams, one could construct a full vocabulary of barroom urology. But Marshall's obscenity sits on him lightly. He shares it with his time and never doubts that even high-born maidens in palace bowers will like it. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1. The Story of Civilization Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant Continued, Cassette 11, Side 1 But Marshall's obscenity sits on him lightly. He shares it with his time and never doubts that even high-born maidens in palace bowers will like it. Lucretia blushed and laid down my volume, but Brutus was present. Brutus, go away. She will read it. The poetic license of the age allowed indecencies, provided the meter and diction were correct. Sometimes Marshall boasts of his lubricity. No page of mine is without wantonness. More often he is a bit ashamed of it, and begs us to believe that his life is cleaner than his verse. At last he tired of purveying compliments and insults as a source of food. He began to long for a quieter, wholesomer life and the haunts of his native Spain. He was now fifty-seven, with grey head and bushy beard, so swarthy that anyone, he tells us, could see at a glance that he had been born near the Tagus. He addressed a poetical bouquet to the younger Pliny and received in return a sum that paid his fare to Bilbilus. The little town welcomed him, forgiving his morals for his fame. He found simpler patrons there, but more open-handed than those at Rome. A kindly lady presented him with a modest villa, and there he spent his few remaining years. In 101, Pliny wrote, I have just heard of Marshall's death. The news has deeply grieved me. He was a man of wit, piquant and mordant, who mixed in his verse salt and honey, and not least of all candor. There must have been some secret virtue in the man if Pliny loved him. Chapter 15. Rome at Work, A.D. 14 to 96. 1. The Sowers. To the Silver Age belongs the classic Roman work on agriculture, the De Re Rustica, dated 65, of Junius Columella. Like Quintilian, Marshall, and the Senecas, he came from Spain. He farmed several estates in Italy and retired to a residence in Rome. The best lands he found were taken up by the villas and grounds of the rich, the next best by olive orchards and vineyards. Only inferior soils were left for tillage. We have abandoned the husbanding of our soil to our lowest slaves, and they treat it like barbarians. The freemen of Italy, he thought, were degenerating in cities when they should have been hardening themselves by working the earth. We ply our hands in circuses and theatres, rather than among crops and vines. Columella loved the soil, and felt that the physical culture of the earth is saner than the literary culture of the town. Farming is a blood relative of wisdom, consanguinea sapientiae. To lure men back to the fields, he adorned his subject with polished Latin, and when he came to speak of gardens and flowers, he fell into enthusiastic verse. It was in this period that Pliny the Naturalist pronounced a premature epitaph, Latifundia perdidere Italiam, the large farms have ruined Italy. Similar judgments occur in Seneca, Lucan, Petronius, Marshall, and Juvenal. Seneca described cattle ranches wider than kingdoms, cultivated by fettered slaves, some estates were so large, said Columella, that their masters could never ride around them. Pliny mentions an estate with 4,117 slaves, 7,200 oxen, and 257,000 other animals. Land distributions by the Gracchi, Caesar, and Augustus had raised the number of small holdings, but many of these had been abandoned during the wars and bought in by the rich. When imperial administration reduced plunder in the provinces, much patrician wealth went into large farms. The Latifundia spread because greater profits flowed from producing cattle, oil, and wine than from growing cereals and vegetables, and the discovery that ranching, to be most profitable, required the operation of large areas under one management. By the close of the first Christian century, these advantages were being offset by the rising cost of slaves and their slow and uninventive work. The long transition now began from slavery to serfdom. As peace diminished the flow of war captives into bondage, some owners of large estates, instead of operating them with slaves, divided them into small holdings and leased these to free tenants, colony, cultivators, who paid in rent and labor. Most of the agar publicus belonging to the government was now worked in this way. So were the extensive properties of the younger Pliny, who describes his tenants as healthy, sturdy, good-natured, talkative peasants, precisely such as one finds throughout Italy today, unchanged after all changes. The modes and tools of tillage were essentially as they had been for centuries. 
Plow, spade, hoe, pick, pitchfork, scythe, rake, have preserved their forms almost unaltered for three thousand years. Corn was ground in mills turned by water or by beasts. Screw pumps and water wheels raised water out of mines or into irrigation canals. Soils were protected by crop rotation and fertilized by manure, alfalfa, clover, rye, or beans. Seed selection was highly developed. Skillful care drew three, sometimes four harvests per year from the rich fields of the Campania and the Valley of the Po. From one planting of alfalfa, four to six crops could be cut yearly for ten years. All but the rarest European vegetables were grown, some of them in greenhouses for the winter trade. Fruit and nut trees of every sort abounded, for Roman generals and merchants and alien merchants and slaves had brought in many new species. The peach from Persia, the apricot from Armenia, the cherry from Pontic Ceresus, whence its name, the grape from Syria, the damson or pruna damascena from Damascus, the plum and filbert from Asia Minor, the walnut from Greece, the olive and fig from Africa. Clever arboriculturists had grafted the walnut upon the arbutus, the plum upon the plane tree, the cherry upon the elm. Pliny enumerates twenty-nine varieties of figs grown in Italy. Through the zeal of our farmers, said Calumella, Italy has learned to produce the fruits of almost the whole world. In turn, it transmitted these arts to Western and Northern Europe. Our rich dietary has a wide geography and a long history behind it, and the very food that we eat may be part of our Oriental and classical heritage. Olive orchards were numerous, but vineyards were everywhere, beautifully terraced on the slopes. Italy produced fifty famous kinds of wine, and Rome alone drank twenty-five million gallons per year, two quarts per week for each man, woman, and child, slave or free. Most wines were produced by capitalistic organization, by large-scale operations financed from Rome. Much of the product was exported and taught the graces of wine to beer-drinking countries like Germany and Gaul. During this first century, Spain, Africa, and Gaul began to grow their own grapes. Italian vintners lost one provincial outlet after another and glutted their domestic market in one of the few overproduction crises of Roman economy. The mission tried to ease the situation and restore cereal culture by prohibiting the further plantings of vines in Italy and ordering half of all vineyards in the provinces destroyed. These edicts aroused a fury of protest and could not be enforced. In the second century, the wines of Gaul and the oil of Spain, Africa, and the East began to crowd Italian products out of Mediterranean markets, and the economic decline of Italy began. A large part of the peninsula was given over to grazing. The cheapest soils and slaves could be used for the raising of cattle, sheep, and swine. Careful attention was paid to scientific breeding. Horses were bred chiefly for war, hunting, and sport, seldom as draft animals. Oxen drew the plow and the cart, mules bore burdens on their backs. Cows, sheep, and goats gave three kinds of milk, from which the Italian made delectable cheeses, then as now. Swine were herded in woods rich with acorns and nuts. Rome, said Strabo, lived chiefly on pork fattened in the oak forests of northern Italy. Poultry fertilized the farmyard and helped feed the family, while bees provided the ancient and honorable substitute for sugar. If we add some acres of flax and hemp, a little hunting, and much fishing, we get a picture of the Italian countryside as it was 1900 years ago, and is today. 2. The Artisans There was not in Roman life, and perhaps there would not be in a healthy economy, so geographical a division between agriculture and industry as in our modern states. The ancient rural home, cottage, villa, or estate, was literally a manufactory where the hands of men carried on a dozen vital industries, and the skill of women filled the house and its environs with a score of wholesome arts. There the woods were turned into shelter, fuel, and furniture. Cattle were slain and dressed, grain was milled and baked, oil and wine were pressed, food was prepared and preserved, wool and flax were cleaned and woven. Sometimes clay was fired into vessels, bricks and tiles, and metal was beaten into tools. Life there had an educative fullness and variety that come to few of us in our time of wider movement and narrowing specialties. Nor was this diversity of occupation the sign of a poor and primitive economy. The wealthiest households were the most self-sufficient and prided themselves on making the largest part of what they needed. A family was an organization of economic helpmates engaged in the united agriculture and industry of a home. When an artisan undertook to do a certain task for several families and set up his shop at some center within reach of them all, village economy supplemented but did not supersede domestic industry. So the miller took and ground the grain of many fields. Later he baked the bread, and finally he delivered it. Forty bakeries were unearthed at Pompeii, and at Rome the pastry makers were a separate guild. 
There were likewise contractors who bought an olive crop on the trees and gathered the fruit. Most estates, however, continued to process their own oil and bake their own bread. The clothing of peasants and philosophers was homespun, but the well-to-do wore garments that, though woven at home, were carded, cleaned, bleached, and cut in a fullery. Some delicate woolen fabrics were woven in factories, and such flax as was not made into sails or nets was turned by factories into linen garments for women and handkerchiefs for men. In its next stage, the cloth might be sent to a dyer who not only colored it, but impressed upon it such delicate designs as we find on the costumes in Pompeian murals. Tanning of leather had also reached the factory stage, but shoemakers were usually individual craftsmen, making shoes to order. Some were specialists who made only fancy slippers for feminine feet. The extractive industries were manned almost wholly by slaves or criminals. The gold and silver mines of Dacia, Gaul, and Spain, the lead and tin of Spain and Britain, the copper of Cyprus and Portugal, the sulfur of Sicily, the salt beds of Italy, the iron of Elba, the marble of Luna, Hymettus, and Peros, the porphyry of Egypt, and in general all subsoil natural resources were owned by the state, were operated by it or on lease from it, and provided a main source of the national revenue. The gold of Spain alone yielded Vespasian $44 million a year. The quest for minerals was a chief source of imperialist conquest. The mineral wealth of Britain, says Tacitus, was the prize of victory in Claudius's campaign. Wood and charcoal were the chief fuels. Petroleum was known in Commagene, Babylonia, and Parthia, and the defenders of Samosata threw it in flaming torches upon Lucullus's troops. But there is no sign of its commercial use as a fuel. Coal was found in the Peloponnesus in northern Italy, but was used chiefly by smiths. The art of carburizing iron into steel had now spread from Egypt throughout the empire. Most iron workers, coppersmiths, goldsmiths, and silversmiths had a single forge and worked with one or two apprentices. At Capua, Minterni, Putiali, Aquilaia, Como, and elsewhere, several forges and smelters were united in factories. Those at Capua were apparently large-scale capitalist enterprises externally financed. The building trades were well organized and specialized. Dendrophoroi, or tree bearers, cut and delivered the wood. Fabri lignarii, or woodworkers, made houses and furniture. Caimentarii mixed the cement. Structores laid the foundations. Arcuarii built the arches. Pariatarii raised the walls. Tectores applied plaster, Albarii whitewashed it, Artifices Plumbarii inserted the plumbing, usually with pipes of lead or plumbum, and Marmorii paved marble floors. We may imagine the jurisdictional disputes. Bricks and tiles were provided by potteries, many of which had reached the factory stage. Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius owned such factories and made fortunes from them. The kilns of Aretium, Utina, Putiri, Sorrentum, and Polentia supplied the ordinary tableware of all the European and African provinces as well as Italy. This wholesale production laid no claim to artistic excellence. The emphasis was now frankly on quantity, and the terra sigillata, or signed earthenware that now crowded the Italian market, was distinctly inferior to the earlier product of Aretium. Outstanding work, as we shall see, was done in glass. The factory production of glass, brick, tiles, pottery, and metalware does not warrant us in ascribing an industrial capitalism to ancient Italy. Rome itself had only two large factories, a paper mill and a dyeing establishment. Probably neither metals nor fuels were at hand in quantity, and the profits of politics seemed more honorable than the proceeds of industry. In the factories of central Italy, almost all the workers and some of the managers were slaves. In those of north Italy, there was a greater proportion of freemen. Slaves were still sufficiently available to discourage the development of machinery. Listless slave labor with small stake in the product was not likely to make inventions. Some labor-saving devices were rejected because they might have caused technological unemployment. And the purchasing power of the people was too low to stimulate or support mechanized production. There were, of course, many simple machines common to Italy, Egypt, and the Greek world. Screw presses, screw pumps... Water wheels, animal-driven grain mills, spinning wheels, looms, the crane and pulley, the revolving mold for pottery. But Italian life was now, in A.D. 96, as highly industrialized as life was ever to be until the 19th century. It would hardly go further on the basis of slavery and a high concentration of wealth. Roman law contracepted large organizations by requiring every sharer in an industrial undertaking to be a legally responsible partner. It forbade limited liability companies and allowed joint stock corporations only for the performance of governmental contracts. 
Since similar restrictions affected banks, these could seldom provide capital for large-scale enterprise. At no time would the industrial development of Rome or Italy equal that of Alexandria or the Hellenistic East. 3. The Carriers From Caesar to Commodus, wheeled vehicles were forbidden in Rome by day. People then walked or were carried in slave-borne chairs or litters. For longer distances, they traveled on horseback or in horse-drawn carriages or chariots. Travel by public stagecoach averaged some 60 miles a day. Caesar once rode by carriage 800 miles in eight days. Messengers bearing the news of Nero's death to Galba in Spain covered 332 miles in 36 hours. Tiberius, hurrying day and night, rode in three days 600 miles to stand beside his dying brother. The public post, by carriage or horse at all hours, averaged 100 miles a day. Augustus had modeled it on the Persian system as indispensable to imperial administration. It was called cursus publicus, as serving the res publica, or commonwealth, by carrying official correspondence. Private individuals could use it only by rare and special permission through a government diploma, double-folded, or passport entitling the bearer to certain privileges and introducing him en route to persons of diplomatic importance. A more rapid means of communication was sometimes arranged by semaphores flashing signals from point to point. By this primitive telegraph, the arrival of the grain ships at Putili was quickly made known to worried Rome. Non-official correspondence went by special courier or merchants or traveling friends. Some traces suggest the existence under the empire of private companies arranging to transmit private mail. Fewer letters were written than now and better. Nevertheless, the movement of intelligence over Western and Southern Europe was as rapid in Caesar's day as at any time before the railway. In 500 B.C., Caesar's letters from Britain reached Cicero at Rome in 29 days. In 1834, Sir Robert Peel, hurrying from Rome to London, required 30 days. Communication and transport were immensely aided by the consular roads. These were the tentacles of Roman law, the members by which the mind of Rome became the will of the realm. They achieved in the ancient world a commercial revolution comparable in kind with that which the railroads affected in the 19th century. Until steam transportation came, the roads of medieval and modern Europe were inferior to those of the empire under the Antonines. Italy alone had then 372 main routes and 12,000 miles of paved thoroughfares. The empire had 51,000 miles of paved highways and a pervasive network of secondary roads. Highways ran over the Alps to Lyon, Bordeaux, Paris, Reims, Rouen, and Boulogne. Others to Vienna, Mainz, Augsburg, Cologne, Utrecht, and Leiden. And from Aquileia, a road skirted the Adriatic to connect with the Via Ignatia to Thessalonica. Magnificent bridges replaced the ferries that had crept across a thousand impeding streams. At every mile on the consular roads, stone markers gave the distance to the next town. Four thousand of these survive. At intervals, seats were placed for tired travelers. At every tenth mile, a statio offered a stopping place where fresh horses could be hired. At every thirty miles was a mancio, an inn that was also a store, a saloon, and a brothel. The main halting points were the civitates, cities, usually equipped with fair hotels, which were in some cases owned and managed by the municipal government. Most innkeepers robbed their guests whenever convenient, and other thieves made the highways unsafe at night despite a garrison of soldiers at each statio. Itineraries could be bought, showing routes, stations, and intermediate distances. Rich men disdaining the inns brought their equipage and slaves with them and slept in their guarded carriages or in the homes of friends or officials on the way. Despite all difficulties, there was probably more traveling in Nero's day than at any time before our birth. Many people, says Seneca, make long voyages to see some remote site, and Plutarch speaks of globe-trotters who spent the best part of their lives in inns and on boats. Educated Romans flocked to Greece and Egypt and Greek Asia, scratched their names on historic monuments, sought healing waters or climates, ambled by art collections in the temples, studied under famous philosophers, readers, or physicians, and doubtless used Pausanias as their Baedeker. These grand tours usually involved a voyage on one or more of the merchant vessels that cut the Mediterranean with a hundred routes of trade. Look at the harbors and seas, exclaimed Juvenal, filled with great keels, more peopled than the land. Rome's rival ports, Putili, Portus, and Ostia, were alive with Fabri Navales building ships, Stupatores caulking them, Subararii loading sand into them as ballast, Sacrarii unloading grain in sacks, Mensores weighing it, Lenuncularii, 
operating tenders between large ships and the shore, and urinatores diving for goods fallen into the sea. Of corn barges alone, twenty-five were drawn up the Tiber every working day. If we add the transport of building stone, metals, oil, wine, and a thousand other articles, we picture a river teeming with commerce and noisy with loading and carrying machines, with dockmen, porters, stevedores, traders, brokers, and clerks. Ships were driven with sails, aided by one or more banks of oars. They were larger on the average than before. Athenaeus describes a grain cargo vessel as 420 feet long with a 57-foot beam. But this was highly exceptional. Some vessels had three decks, many took 250, several took a 1,000 tons of freight. Josephus tells of one that carried 600 persons, passengers and crew. Another carried an Egyptian obelisk as large as that in Central Park, New York, together with 200 sailors, 1,300 passengers, 93,000 bushels of wheat, and a load of linen, pepper, paper, and glass. Nevertheless, voyages except along the coasts were still dangerous, as St. Paul found. Between November and March, only a few vessels ventured across the open Mediterranean, and in midsummer, eastward voyages were made almost impossible by the Etesian winds. Night sailing was now frequent, and every harbor of any pretense had a good lighthouse. Danger of piracy had almost disappeared from the Mediterranean. To discourage it and to starve rebellion, Augustus had stationed two main war fleets at Ravenna on the Adriatic and at Mycenaeum on the Bay of Naples, besides minor squadrons at ten other points in the empire. We may judge what Pliny called the immense majesty of the Roman peace by the fact that for two centuries we hardly hear of these fleets. Passenger schedules were largely indefinite, as sailings were determined by weather and commercial convenience. Rates were low, for example, two drachmas, or a dollar twenty, from Athens to Alexandria. But passengers brought their own food, and probably most of them slept on deck. Speed was as moderate as the fares and varied with the winds, averaging six knots per hour. One might cross the Adriatic in a day, or like Cicero, take three weeks, from Patri to Brundisium. A swift cruiser might make 230 knots in 24 hours. With favorable winds, six days carried one from Sicily to Alexandria, or from Gades to Ostia, and four from Utica to Rome. The longest and most dangerous voyage was the six-month sail from Aden in Arabia to India, for monsoons forced vessels to hug the pirate-breeding coast all the way. At some time before A.D. 50, an Alexandrian Greek skipper, Hippolus, charted the periodicity of the monsoon winds and found that in certain seasons he could sail directly and safely across the Indian Ocean. The discovery was almost as important for that sea as the voyage of Columbus was for the Atlantic. From Egyptian ports on the Red Sea, ships thereafter sailed to India in forty days. About A.D. 80, another Alexandrian captain of unknown name wrote a Periplus of the Erythrean Sea as a handbook for merchants trading along the East African coast and with India. Meanwhile, other mariners had developed routes through the Atlantic to Gaul, Britain, Germany, even to Scandinavia and Russia. Never before in human memory had the seas borne so many vessels, products, and men. 4. The Engineers The ships and roads that carried goods, the bridges that bound the roads, the harbors and docks that received the ships, the aqueducts that brought clean water to Rome, the sewers that drained the rural marshes and the city's waste, were the work of Roman, Greek, and Syrian engineers operating with armies of free labor, legionaries, and slaves. They raised or drew heavy loads or stones by pulleys on cranes or vertical beams, worked by windlasses on treadmills turned by animals or men. They banked the treacherous Tiber with walls set back in three stages so that low water would not expose the muddy bed. They dredged a multiple harbor at Ostia for Claudius, Nero, and Trajan, opened lesser havens at Marseille, Puteoli, Mycenaeum, Carthage, Brundisium, and Ravenna, and renewed the greatest of all at Alexandria. They emptied the Fusine Lake and reclaimed its bed for cultivation by boring a tunnel through a mountain of rock. They lined the subsoil of Rome with sewers of concrete, brick, and tile which lasted for hundreds of years. They drained the swamps of Campania sufficiently to make it habitable, for many sumptuous palaces are indicated by the ruins there. They executed the astonishing public works by which Caesar and the emperors mitigated unemployment and beautified Rome. The consular roads were among their simpler achievements. How did these highways compare with those of today? They were from 16 to 24 feet wide, but near Rome part of this width was taken up with sidewalks, or margines, paved with rectangular stone slabs. They went straight to their goal in brave sacrifice of initial economy to permanent saving. 
They overleaped countless streams with costly bridges, crossed marshes with long, arched viaducts of brick and stone, climbed up and down steep hills with no use of cut and fill, and crept along mountainsides or high embankments secured by powerful retaining walls. Their pavement varied with locally available material. Usually the bottom layer, or pavimentum, was a four to six inch bed of sand, or one inch of mortar. Upon this were imposed four strata of masonry, the statumen, a foot deep, consisting of stones bound with cement or clay, the rudents, ten inches of rammed concrete, the nucleus, twelve to eighteen inches of successively laid and rolled layers of concrete, and the summa crusta of silex or lava polygonal slabs, one to three feet in diameter and eight to twelve inches thick. The upper surface of the slabs was smoothed, and the joints were so well fitted as to be hardly discernible. Occasionally the surface was of concrete. On less important roads it might be of gravel. In Britain it was composed of flint stones laid in cement upon a gravel bed. The substructure was so deep that little attention was given to drainage. All in all, these were the most durable roads in history. Many of them are still in use, but their steep gradients designed for pack mules and small vehicles have compelled their abandonment by modern traffic. The bridges that carried these roads were themselves high exemplars of wedded science and art. The Romans inherited from Ptolemaic Egypt the principles of hydraulic engineering. They employed them on an unprecedented scale, and the methods they transmitted remained unchanged till our time. They carried to its ancient limit the building of foundations and piers under water. They drove into the bed a double cylinder of piles, boarded each cylinder tight, drained the water from between them, covered the exposed bottom with rock or lime, and on this basis raised the pier. Eight bridges crossed the Tiber at Rome, some sacredly ancient like the Pons Sublicius, on which no metal might be used, some so well built that like the Pons Fabricius, they are functioning to this day. From these spans, the Roman arch would go forth to bridge a hundred thousand streams in the white man's world. Pliny thought that the aqueducts were Rome's greatest achievement. If one will note the abundance of water skillfully brought into the city for many public and private uses, if he will observe the lofty aqueducts required to maintain a proper elevation and grade, the mountains that had to be pierced, the depressions that had to be filled, he will conclude that the whole globe offers nothing more marvelous. From distant springs, fourteen aqueducts, totaling thirteen hundred miles, brought through tunnels and over majestic arches into Rome some three hundred million gallons of water daily, as large a quantity per capita as in any modern city. These structures had their faults. Leaks developed in the lead pipes and required frequent repair. By the end of the Western Empire, all the aqueducts had gone out of use. But when we consider that they fed ample water to homes, tenements, palaces, fountains, gardens, parks, and public baths, where thousands bathed at once, and that enough remained to create artificial lakes for naval battles, we begin to see that despite terror and corruption, Rome was the best-managed capital of antiquity and one of the best-equipped cities of all time. At the head of the water department at the close of the first century was Sextus Julius Frontinus, whose books have made him the most famous of Roman engineers. He had already served as a praetor, as governor of Britain, and several terms as consul. Like modern British statesmen, he found time to write books as well as to govern states. He published a work on military science, of which the concluding portion, Stratagemata, remains, and left us his personal account of the water system of Rome, De Aquis Urbis Romae. He describes the corruption and malfeasance that he found in his department on taking office, and how palaces and brothels secretly tapped the water mains and so greedily that once Rome ran out of water. He describes his resolute reforms, tells us in proud detail the sources, length, and function of each aqueduct, and concludes like Pliny, Who will venture to compare with these mighty conduits the idle pyramids or the famous but useless works of the Greeks? We sense here the frankly utilitarian Roman with little taste for beauty apart from use. We can understand him and admit that a city should have clean water before it has Parthenons. Through these artless books we perceive that even in the age of the despots there were Romans of the old type, men of ability and integrity, conscientious administrators who made the empire prosper under the lords of misrule and opened a way for monarchy's golden age. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. 5. The Traders 
The improvement of government and transport expanded Mediterranean trade to an unprecedented amplitude. At one end of the busy process of exchange were peddlers hawking through the countryside everything from sulfur matches to costly imported silks. Wandering auctioneers, who served also as town criers and advertised lost goods and runaway slaves, daily markets and periodical fairs, shopkeepers haggling with customers, cheating with false or tipped scales, and keeping a tangential eye for the ediles inspectors of weights and measures. A little higher in the commercial hierarchy were shops that manufactured their own merchandise. These were the backbone of both industry and trade. At or near the ports were wholesalers, or magnarii, who sold to retailers or customers goods recently brought in from abroad. Sometimes the owner or captain of a vessel would sell his cargo directly from the deck. For two centuries Italy enjoyed an unfavorable balance of trade, cheerfully bought more than she sold. She exported some maritime pottery, some wine and oil, some metalware, glass and perfumes from Campania. For the rest, her products were kept at home. Meanwhile, the wholesalers had agents buying goods for Italy in all parts of the empire, and foreign merchants had Greek or Syrian drummers touting and placing their goods in Italy. By this double process, the delicacies of half the planet came to please the palate, clothe the flesh, and adorn the home of the Roman optimate. Whoever wishes to see all the goods of the world, said Elias Aristides, must either journey throughout the world or stay in Rome. From Sicily came corn, cattle, hides, wine, wool, fine woodwork, statuary, jewelry. From North Africa, corn and oil. From Cyrenaica, silphium. From Central Africa, wild beasts for the arena. From Ethiopia and East Africa, ivory, apes, tortoise shell, rare marbles, obsidian, spices, and negro slaves. From West Africa, oil, beasts, citron, wood, pearls, dyes, copper. From Spain, fish, cattle, wool, gold, silver, lead, tin, copper, iron, cinnabar, wheat, linen, cork, horses, ham, bacon, and the finest olives and olive oil. From Gaul, clothing, wine, wheat, timber, vegetables, cattle, poultry, pottery, cheese. From Britain, tin, lead, silver, hides, wheat, cattle, slaves, oysters, dogs, pearls, and wooden goods. From Belgium, flocks of geese were driven all the way to Italy to supply goose livers for aristocratic bellies. From Germany came amber, slaves, and furs. From the Danube, wheat, cattle, iron, silver, and gold. From Greece and the Greek Isles, cheap silk, linen, wine, oil, honey, timber, marble, emeralds, drugs, artworks, perfumes, diamonds, and gold. From the Black Sea came corn, fish, furs, hides, slaves. From Asia Minor, fine linen and woolen fabrics, parchment, wine, Smyrna and other figs, honey, cheese, oysters, carpets, oil, wood. From Syria, wine, silk, linen, glass, oil, Apples, pears, plums, figs, dates, pomegranates, nuts, nard, balsam, Tyrian purple, and the cedar of Lebanon. From Palmyra, textiles, perfumes, drugs. From Arabia, incense, gums, aloes, myrrh, laudanum, ginger, cinnamon, and precious stones. From Egypt, corn, paper, linen, glass, jewelry, granite, basalt, alabaster, and porphyry. Finished products of a thousand kinds came to Rome and the West from Alexandria, Sidon, Tyre, Antioch, Tarsus, Rhodes, Miletus, Ephesus, and the other great cities of the East, while the East received raw materials and money from the West. In addition to all this, there was a substantial import trade from outside the empire. From Parthia and Persia came gems, rare essences, Morocco leather, rugs, wild beasts, and eunuchs. From China, through Parthia or India or the Caucasus, came silk, raw or manufactured. The Romans thought it a vegetable product combed from trees and valued it at its weight in gold. Much of this silk came to the island of Kos, where it was woven into dresses for the ladies of Rome and other cities. In AD 91, the relatively poor state of Messenia had to forbid its women to wear transparent silk dresses at religious initiations. It was with such garments that Cleopatra touched the hearts of Caesar and Antony. In return, the Chinese imported from the empire carpets, jewels, amber, metals, dyes, drugs, and glass. Chinese historians speak of an embassy coming by sea to the Emperor Huan Ti in 166 from the Emperor An Tun, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. More probably, it was a band of merchants posing as ambassadors. 
Sixteen Roman coins dating from Tiberius to Aurelius have been found in Shanxi. From India came pepper, spikenard, and other spices, the same that Columbus would seek, herbs, ivory, ebony, sandalwood, indigo, pearls, sardonyx, onyx, amethyst, carbuncle, diamonds, iron products, cosmetics, textiles, tigers, and elephants. We may judge the extent of this trade and the Roman hunger for luxuries by noting that Italy imported more from India than from any other country except Spain. From one Egyptian port alone, Strabo avers, 120 ships sailed every year for India and Ceylon. In exchange, India took a modest quantity of wine, metals, and purple, and the rest, over 100 million sesterces per year, in bullion or coin. A like amount went to Arabia and China, and probably to Spain. This immense trade produced prosperity for two centuries, but its unsound basis ruined Roman economy in the end. Italy made no attempt at equaling imports with exports. She appropriated the mines and taxed the people of half a hundred states to provide her with the money to meet her international balances. As the richer veins of the mines gave out and the zest for exotic luxuries continued, Rome tried to stave off the breakdown of her import system by conquering new mineral regions like Dacia and by debasing her once incorruptible currency, turning ever less bullion into ever more coin. When the costs of administration and war mounted nearer to the profits of empire, Rome had to pay for goods with goods, and could not. Italy's dependence upon imported food was her vital weakness. The moment she could not force other countries to send her food and soldiers, she was doomed. Meanwhile, the provinces recovered not only prosperity, but economic initiative. Italian merchants in this first century A.D. almost disappeared from eastern ports, while Syrian and Greek traders established themselves at Delos and Putili, and multiplied in Spain and Gaul. In the leisurely oscillation of history, the East was preparing once more to dominate the West. 6. The Bankers How were production and commerce financed? First, by the maintenance of a comparatively reliable currency internationally honored. All Roman coins had suffered gradual depreciation since the First Punic War, for the Treasury had found it convenient to pay off governmental war debts by permitting the inflation that naturally comes from the multiplication of money and the diminution of goods. The ass, originally a pound of copper, had been reduced to two ounces in 241, one ounce in 202, half an ounce in 87 BC, and a quarter ounce in AD 60. During the final century of the Republic, the generals had issued their own coinage, usually in arii, gold coins, normally worth 100 sesterces. From this military coinage, that of the emperors was descended, and the emperors followed Caesar's custom of stamping their effigies on their issues as symbols of the state's guarantee. The sesterce was now made from copper instead of silver, and was revalued at four asses. Nero lowered the silver content of the denarius to 90% of its former quantity, Trajan to 85%, Aurelius to 75, Commodus to 70, Septimius Severus to 50. Nero reduced the aureus from one-fourth of a pound of gold to one-forty-fifth, Caracalla to one-fiftieth. A general rise of prices accompanied these depreciations, but income seems to have risen commensurately until Aurelius. Perhaps this controlled inflation was a simple way of relieving debtors at the expense of creditors whose superior ability and opportunity, unchecked, would have concentrated wealth to the point of economic coagulation and political revolution. Despite these changes, we must consider the Roman fiscal system one of the most successful and stable in history. For two centuries, a single monetary standard was honored throughout the empire, and with this stable medium, investment and trade flourished as never before in the memory of men. Consequently, bankers were everywhere. They served as money changers, accepted checking accounts and interest-bearing deposits, issued travelers' checks and bills of exchange, managed, bought, and sold realty, placed investments and collected debts, and lent money to individuals and partnerships. This banking system had come from Greece and the Greek East, and was mostly in the hands of Greeks and Syrians, even in Italy and the West. In Gaul, the words for Syrian and banker were synonyms. Interest rates, which had sunk to 4% under the weight of Augustus's Egyptian spoils, rose to 6% after his death, and reached their legal maximum of 12% by the age of Constantine. The famous Panic of A.D. 33 illustrates the development and complex interdependence of banks and commerce in the empire. Augustus had coined and spent money lavishly on the theory that its increased circulation, low interest rates, and rising prices would stimulate business. They did, 
but as the process could not go on forever, a reaction set in as early as 10 BC when this flush minting ceased. Tiberius rebounded to the opposite theory, that the most economical economy is the best. He severely limited the governmental expenditures, sharply restricted new issues of currency, and hoarded 2,700,000,000 sesterces in the treasury. The resulting dearth of circulating medium was made worse by the drain of money eastward in exchange for luxuries. Prices fell, interest rates rose, creditors foreclosed on debtors, debtors sued usurers, and money lending almost ceased. The Senate tried to check the export of capital by requiring a high percentage of every senator's fortune to be invested in Italian land. Senators thereupon called in loans and foreclosed mortgages to raise cash, and the crisis rose. When the senator Publius Spinther notified the bank of Balbus and Alius that he must withdraw thirty million sesterces to comply with the new law, the firm announced its bankruptcy. At the same time, the failure of an Alexandrian firm, Sweethys and Son, due to their loss of three ships laden with costly spices, and the collapse of the great dying concern of Malchus at Tyre, led to rumors that the Roman banking house of Maximus and Vibo would be broken by their extensive loans to these firms. When its depositors began a run on this bank, it shut its doors, and later on that day a larger bank, of the brothers Petius, also suspended payment. Almost simultaneously came news that great banking establishments had failed in Lyon, Carthage, Corinth, and Byzantium. One after another the banks of Rome closed. Money could be borrowed only at rates far above the legal limit. Tiberius finally met the crisis by suspending the Land Investment Act and distributing a hundred million sesterces to the banks to be lent without interest for three years on the security of realty. Private lenders were thereby constrained to lower their interest rates, money came out of hiding, and confidence slowly returned. 7. The Classes Nearly everybody in Rome worshipped money with mad pursuit, and all but the bankers denounced it. How little you know the age you live in, says a god in Ovid, if you fancy that honey is sweeter than cash in hand. And a century later, Juvenal sarcastically hails the Sanctissima Divitiarum Maestas, the most holy majesty of wealth. To the end of the empire, Roman law forbade the senatorial class to invest in commerce or industry. And though they evaded the prohibition by letting their freedmen invest for them, they despised their proxies and upheld rule by birth as the sole alternative to rule by money or myths or the sword. After all the revolutions and the decimations, the old class divisions remained with brand new titles. Members of the senatorial and equestrian orders, magistrates and officials, were called honestiores, that is, men of honors or offices. All the rest were humiliores, lowly, or tenuiores, weak. A sense of honor often mingled with the proud gravity of the senator. He served in a succession of public posts without pay and at much personal expense. He administered important functions with a fair degree of competence and integrity. He provided for public games, helped his clients, freed some of his slaves, and shared a part of his fortune with the people through benefactions before or after his death. Because of the obligations his position entailed, he was required to have a million sesterces to enter or remain in the senatorial class. One senator, Nius Lentulus, had four hundred million sesterces, but with this exception the greatest fortunes in Rome were those of businessmen who did not disdain to handle money or trade. While reducing the powers of the Senate, the emperors had favored the business class with high office, had protected industry, commerce, and finance, and had based upon equestrian support the security of the principate against patrician intrigue. Membership in this second order required 400,000 sesterces and specific nomination by the prince. Consequently, many men of means belonged to the plebs. The plebs was now a motley receptacle of such innominate businessmen, freeborn workers, peasant proprietors, teachers, doctors, artists, and freedmen. The census defined the proletarii not by their occupation but by their offspring, or proles. An old Latin treatise called them plebeians who offer nothing to the state but children. Most of them found employment in the shops, factories, and commerce of the city at an average wage of a denarius, or forty cents a day. This rose in later centuries, but not faster than prices. Exploitation of the weak by the strong is as natural as eating and differs from it only in rapidity. We must expect to find it in every age and under every form of society and government. But rarely has it been so thorough and unsentimental as in ancient Rome. Once all men had been poor and had not known their poverty. Now penury rubbed elbows with wealth and suffered from consciousness. Absolute destitution, however, was prevented by the dole, the occasional gifts of patrons to clients, 
and the lordly legacies of rich men like Balbus, who left twenty-five denarii to every citizen of Rome. Class divisions verged upon caste, yet an able man might free himself from slavery, make a fortune, and rise to high office in the service of the prince. The freedman's son became a fully enfranchised freeman, and his grandson could become a senator. Soon a freedman's grandson, Pertinax, would be emperor. During the first century, many high offices were filled by freedmen. They often had charge of the imperial finances in the provinces, the waterways of Rome, the mines and quarries and estates of the emperor, and the provisioning of the army camps. Freedmen and slaves, nearly all of Greek or Syrian origin, managed the imperial palaces and held vital positions in the imperial cabinet. Petty industry and trade fell increasingly into the control of freedmen. Some of them became great capitalists or landowners. Some accumulated the largest fortunes of their time. Their past had seldom given them moral standards or elevated interests. After their liberation, money became the absorbing interest of their lives. They made it without scruple and spent it without taste. Petronius savagely excoriated them in Trimalchio, and Seneca, less bitter, smiled at the new rich who bought books in ornamental sets but never read them. Probably these satires were in part the jealous reactions of a caste that saw its ancient prerogatives of exploitation and luxury encroached upon, and could not forgive the men who were rising to share its perquisites and power. The success of the freedmen must have given some consoling hope to the class that did most of the manual work in Italy. Belloc estimated the slaves in Rome about 30 B.C. at some 400,000, or nearly half the population. In Italy, at 1,500,000. If we may believe the table gossipers of Athenaeus, some Romans had twenty thousand slaves. A proposal that slaves be required to wear a distinctive dress was voted down in the Senate lest they should realize their numerical strength. Galen reckoned the proportion of slaves to freemen at Pergamum, about A.D. 170, as one to three, that is twenty-five percent. Probably this proportion was not much different in other cities. Human prices varied from three hundred thirty sesterces for a farm slave to seven hundred thousand or $105,000, paid by Marcus Scarus for Daphnis the Grammarian. The average price was now 4,000 sesterces, or $400. 80% of the employees in industry and retail trade were slaves, and most of the manual or clerical work in government was performed by servi publici, public slaves. Domestic slaves were of every variety and condition. Personal servants, handicraftsmen, tutors, cooks, hairdressers, musicians, copyists— librarians, artists, physicians, philosophers, eunuchs, pretty boys to serve at least as cupbearers, and cripples to provide amusement by their deformities. There was a special market at Rome where one might buy legless, armless, or three-eyed men, giants, dwarfs, or hermaphrodites. Household slaves were sometimes beaten, occasionally killed. Nero's father killed his freedmen because they refused to drink as much as he wished. In an angry passage of his essay on anger, Seneca describes the wooden racks and other instruments of torture, the dungeons and other jails, the fires built around imprisoned bodies in a pit, the hook dragging up the corpses, the many kinds of chains, the varied punishments, the tearing of limbs, the branding of foreheads. All these apparently entered into the life of the agricultural slave. Juvenal describes a lady as having slave after slave thrashed while her hair was being curled. And Ovid pictures another mistress jabbing hairpins into her maidservant's arms. But these tales have the earmarks of literary concoctions, and must not be taken for history. We are in danger of exaggerating the cruelty of the past for the same reason that we magnify the crime and immorality of the present, because cruelty is interesting by its very rarity. By and large, the lot of a domestic slave under the empire was lightened by a growing acceptance into the family, by mutual loyalty, by the pretty custom of owners waiting on the slaves at certain feasts, and by a security and permanence of employment exceptional in modern times. The joys of family life were not denied them, and their tombstones reveal as much tenderness as those of the free. One reads, His parents have raised this monument to Eucopion, who lived six months and three days, the sweetest and most delightful babe who, though he could not yet speak, was our greatest happiness. Other epitaphs show the most affectionate relations between masters and slaves. One owner declares that a dead servant was as dear to him as his son. A young noble mourns the death of his nurse. A nurse expresses her grief over a dead charge. A learned lady raises an elegant memorial to her librarian. Statius writes a poem of consolation to Flavius Ursus on the death of a favorite slave. It was not unusual for slaves to risk their lives to protect their masters. Many voluntarily accompanied them into exile. Several gave their lives for them. Some owners freed their slaves and married them, some treated them as friends, 
Seneca ate with his. The refinement of manners and sensitivity, the absence of a color line between master and slave, the tenets of the Stoic philosophy, and the classless faiths coming in from the East had a share in the mitigation of slavery. But the basic factors were the economic advantage of the owner and the rising cost of slaves. Many slaves were respected as having high cultural abilities, stenographers, research aides, financial secretaries and managers, artists, physicians, grammarians, and philosophers. A slave could in many cases go into business for himself, giving a share of his earnings to his owner and keeping the rest as his peculium, or a little money peculiarly his own. With such earnings, or by faithful or exceptional service, or by personal attractiveness, a slave could usually achieve freedom in six years. The condition of the workers, and even of the slaves, was in some measure relieved by the collegia, or workers' organizations. By this period we hear of these in great number and in proud specialization. There were separate guilds of trumpeters, horn players, clarion blowers, tuba players, flutists, bagpipers, etc. Usually the collegia were modeled on the Italian municipality. They had a hierarchy of magistrates and one or more favorite deities whom they honored with a temple and an annual feast. Like the cities, they asked and found rich men and women to be their patrons, and to repay compliments by helping to finance their outings, their assembly halls, and their shrines. It would be an error to think of these associations as corresponding to the labor unions of our time. We can picture them better in terms of our fraternal orders, with their endless offices and titles of honor, their brotherly hilarity and jaunts, their simple mutual aid. Rich men often encouraged the formation of these guilds and remembered them in their wills. In the collegium all the men were brothers and all the women sisters, and in some of them the slave could sit at table or in council with freeborn men. Every member in good standing was guaranteed a fancy funeral. In the last century of the Republic, demagogues of all orders discovered that many collegia could be persuaded to vote almost to a man for any given candidate. In this way the associations became political instruments of patricians, plutocrats, and radicals and their competitive corruption helped to destroy Roman democracy. Caesar outlawed them, but they revived. Augustus dissolved all but a few useful ones. Trajan again forbade them. Aurelius tolerated them. Obviously, they persisted throughout, within or beyond the law. In the end, they became vehicles through which Christianity entered and pervaded the life of Rome. 8. The Economy and the State How far did the government under the empire attempt to control the economic life? It tried and largely failed to restore peasant proprietorship. Here the emperors were more enlightened than the Senate, which was dominated by the owners of the Latifundia. Domitian sought to encourage the planting of cereals in Italy, but without success. In consequence, Italy was always in fear of starvation. Vespasian forced the Senate to accept him as emperor by holding Egypt, then the chief source of Italy's wheat. Septimius Severus would do the same thing by seizing North Africa. The state had to assure and therefore supervise the importation and distribution of grain. It offered privileges to merchants bringing grain to Italy. Claudius guaranteed them against loss, and Nero freed their ships from the property tax. The delay or wrecking of the grain fleet was now the only cause that could stir the Roman populace to revolt. The Roman economy was a system of laissez-faire tempered with state ownership of natural resources, mines, quarries, fisheries, salt deposits, and considerable tracts of cultivated land. The legions made the bricks and tiles needed for their buildings and were often used on public construction, especially in the colonies. The manufacture of arms and machines of war was probably reserved for state arsenals. And there may have been, in the first century, such governmentally owned factories as we hear of in the third. Public works were normally let out to private contractors under such strict state supervision that they were usually well done and with a minimum of corruption. About A.D. 80, such enterprises were increasingly carried out by the emperor's freedmen with the labor of governmental slaves. At all times, apparently, the mitigation of unemployment was one purpose of these state undertakings. Trade was moderately burdened with a 1% sales tax, light custom dues, and occasional tolls for the passage of goods over bridges and through towns. The Ediles supervised retail trade under an excellent system of regulations, but if we may believe an irate character in Petronius, they were no better than similar officials in other times. They graft with the bakers and other such scoundrels, and the jaws of the capitalists are always open. Finance was subject to governmental manipulation of the currency and to the competition of the treasury, which appears to have been the largest banker in the empire. It lent money at interest to farmers on the pledge of their crops and to city dwellers on the security of their furniture. Commerce was aided by wars, which opened new resources and markets and won control of trade routes. So the expedition of Gallus into Arabia secured the passage to India against the competition of Arabs and Parthians. 
Pliny complained that campaigns had been undertaken that Roman ladies and dandies might have a wider choice of perfumes. We must not exaggerate the wealth of ancient Rome. The total annual revenue of the state under Vespasian was at most one billion five hundred million sesterces, or $150 million, less than a fifth of the budget of New York City today. The means of amassing great fortunes by large-scale production were unknown or ignored, and had not developed the immense and taxable industry and commerce of the modern world. The Roman government spent little on the navy and nothing on servicing a national debt. It lived on its income, not on its debts. Industry being largely domestic, its products passed to the consumer with less intervening trade and taxation than today. Men produced for their own localities rather than for the general market. They did more for themselves, less for unseen others, than we do. They used their bodies more, worked longer hours less intensely, and did not miss a thousand luxuries that lay outside their dreams. They could not begin to rival the wealth of even our less affluent years, but they enjoyed a degree of prosperity such as the Mediterranean nations had not known before, and as a whole, have never known again. It was the material zenith of the ancient world. This concludes the reading of Caesar and Christ, Part 1, by Will Durant. Part 2 continues the story and is available through the books on tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams. Additional titles by Will Durant in the Books on Tape Library include The Life of Greece and Our Oriental Heritage. For additional information about them or for help with topics of related interest, please call our customer service department or check our catalog index to find review material. Will you please wind or rewind the tape as appropriate so the book will be in order for the next person to enjoy? Thank you. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. Copyright 1944 by Will Durant. Copyright renewed 1971 by Will Durant. This recording of the full-length reading of Caesar and Christ was published by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mahel, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mahel, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1994 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. This book consists of 15 chapters and is 334 pages long. Chapter 16, Rome and its Art, 30 B.C. to A.D. 96. 1. The Debt to Greece. The Romans were not of themselves an artistic people. Before Augustus they were warriors, after him they were rulers. They counted the establishment of order and security through government a greater good and nobler task than the creation or enjoyment of beauty. They paid great sums for the works of dead masters, but looked down upon living artists as menials. While we adore images, said the kindly Seneca, we despise those who fashion them. Only law and politics, and of manual arts only agriculture, by proxy, seemed honorable ways of life. Barring the architects, most artists in Rome were Greek slaves or freedmen or hirelings. Nearly all worked with their hands and were classed as artisans. Latin authors seldom thought of recording their lives or their names. Hence, Roman art is almost wholly anonymous. No vivid personalities humanize its history as Myron, Phidias, Praxiteles, and Protogenes light up the aesthetic story of Greece. Here the historian is constrained to speak of things, not men, to catalog coins, vases, statues, reliefs, pictures, and buildings, in the desperate hope that their accumulation may laboriously convey the crowded majesty of Rome. The products of art appeal to the soul through eye or ear or hand rather than through the intellect. Their beauty fades when it is diluted into ideas and words. The universe of thought is only one of many worlds. Each sense has its own. Each art has therefore its own characteristic medium, which cannot be translated into speech. Even an artist writes about art in vain. A special misfortune clouds Roman art. We come to it from Greek art, which seems at first its model and master. As the art of India disturbs us by strange shapes, so that of Rome chills us by the monotonous repetition of familiar forms. We have seen long since these Doric, Ionic, Corinthian columns and capitals, these smooth idealized reliefs, these busts of poets, rulers, and gods. 
Even the astonishing frescoes of Pompeii, we are told, were copies of Greek originals. Only the composite order is indigenously Roman, and it offends our notions of classic unity, simplicity, and restraint. Certainly, the art of the Augustan age in Rome was overwhelmingly Greek. Through Sicily and Greek Italy, through Campania and Etruria, finally through Greece, Alexandria, and the Hellenic East, the aesthetic forms, methods, and ideals of Hellas passed into Roman art. When Rome became mistress of the Mediterranean, Greek artists poured into the new center of wealth and patronage and made countless copies of Greek masterpieces for Roman temples, palaces, and squares. Every conqueror brought home examples, every magnate scoured the cities for the surviving treasures of Greek workmanship. Gradually, Italy became a museum of bought or stolen paintings and statuary that set the tone of Roman art for a century. Artistically, Rome was swallowed up in the Hellenistic world. All this is half the truth. In one aspect, as we shall see, the history of Roman art is a conflict between the architrave and the arch. In another, it is the struggle of native Italian realism to recover from the invasion of the peninsula by a Greek art that had pictured gods rather than men, the type or platonic idea rather than the earthly individual, and had sought a noble perfection of form rather than truth of perception and utterance. That virile indigenous art which had helped to carve the figures on Etruscan tombs hibernated between the Greek conquest and Nero's Philhellenic ecstasy, but at last it broke the Hellenistic mold and revolutionized classic art with realistic sculpture, impressionistic painting, and an architecture of arch and vault. Through these, as well as by her borrowed beauty, Rome became for 18 centuries the art capital of the Western world. 2. The Toiler's Rome The ancient traveler bent on making a tour of Flavian Rome and coming northward up the Tiber from Ostia, would first of all have noted the swiftness of the muddy current, carrying along the soil of hills and valleys to the sea. In this simple fact lay the leisurely tragedy of erosion, the difficulty of two-way commerce on the river, the periodical silting of the Tiber's mouth, and the floods that almost every spring inundated the lower levels of Rome, confined the residents to upper stories reached by boats, and often destroyed the corn stored in granaries on the wharves. When the waters fell, they carried houses to ruin, and men and animals to death. As he neared the city, the visitor's eye would be caught by the Emporium, which ran for a thousand feet along the river's eastern edge and was noisy with workers, warehouses, markets, and moving goods. Beyond it rose that Aventine Hill on which the angry plebs had staged its sit-down strikes of 494 and 449 B.C. On the left bank at this point were the gardens that Caesar had bequeathed to the people, and behind them the Janiculum. Near the eastern shore at the beautiful Pons Emilius lay the Forum Boarium, or cattle market, with its still-standing temples to Fortune and Mater Matuta, the goddess of the dawn. Farther north on the right loomed the Palatine and Capitoline hills, thick with palaces and temples. On the left bank were Agrippa's gardens, and beyond them the Vatican Hill. North of the city's center, off the eastern shore, stretched the spacious lawns and decorative buildings of the Campus Martius, or Field of Mars. Here were the theaters of Balbus and Pompey, the Circus of Flaminius, the Baths of Agrippa, and Domitian's Stadium. Here the legions practiced, athletes competed, chariots raced, the people played ball, and the assembly gathered, under the emperors, to go through the motions of democracy's ghost. Disembarking at the city's northern limits, the visitor saw some remains of the wall ascribed to Servius Tullius. Rome had probably rebuilt it after the Gallic raid of 390 B.C., but the power of Roman arms and the apparent security of the capital allowed the rampart to lapse into ruins. Not till Aurelian, or A.D. 270, would another wall rise, a symbol of security gone. Gates had been cut in the wall, usually as single or triple archways, to permit the passage of the great roads from which they took their names. Touring the boundary of the city east and then south, the visitor would see the luxuriant gardens of Sallust, the dusty camp of the Praetorians, the arches of the Martian, Appian, and Claudian aqueducts, and on his right in turn the Pincian, Quirinal, Viminal, Esquiline, and Celian hills. Leaving the walls and walking northwest on the Appian Way, he would pass through the Porta Capena, along the southern slope of the Palatine to the Nova Via, or New Street, and then northward through a maze of arches and buildings to stand in the ancient forum, the head and heart of Rome. Originally, it had been a marketplace, some 600 by 200 feet. Now, in A.D. 96, the sellers had retired into the nearby streets or into other forums, 
but in the adjoining basilicas men sold shares in the publicans' corporations, made contracts with the government, defended themselves in the courts, or consulted lawyers on how to escape the law. Around the Forum had been built, as around New York's Wall Street, some modest temples to the gods, and some larger ones to mammon. A population of statues adorned it, and the colonnades of great edifices provided the shade that could hardly come from a few ancient trees. From 145 B.C. till Caesar it had been the meeting place of the assemblies. At either end stood a speaker's platform, named Rostrum, because an earlier stand had been decorated with the rostra, or prows, of ships captured from Antium in 338 B.C. At the western end was the Millenarium Aureum, or Golden Milestone, a column of gilded bronze set up by Augustus to mark the junction and origin of several consular roads. On it were inscribed the major towns reached and their distances from Rome. Along the southwest side ran the Sacra Via, or Sacred Way, which led up to the temples of Jupiter and Saturn on the Capitoline Hill. North of this forum the visitor would find a larger one, the Forum Iulium, built by Caesar to relieve the older area. Nearby were additional forums laid out for Augustus and Vespasian, and soon Trajan would clear and adorn the greatest of them all. Even in so hasty a circuit the ancient tourist would have felt the crowded diversity of the city's population, and the tortuous inadequacy of its haphazard streets. A few of these were from sixteen to nineteen feet wide. Most of them were meandering alleys in the Oriental style. Juvenal complained that carts rumbling over the uneven pavements at night made sleep impossible, while the jostling crowds made daytime walking a form of war. Hurry as we may, we are blocked by a surging host in front and by a dense mass of people pressing upon us from behind. One digs an elbow into me, another a sedan pole. One bangs a beam, another a wine cask against my head. My legs are beplastered with mud. Huge feet trample upon me from every side. A soldier plants his hobnail boot squarely upon my toes. The main thoroughfares were paved with large pentagonal blocks of lava stone, sometimes so firmly set in concrete that a few have remained in place till our time. There was no street lighting. Whoever ventured out after dark carried a lantern or followed a torch-bearing slave. In either case he ran the gauntlet of many thieves. Doors were fastened with locks and keys, windows were bolted at night, and those on the ground floor were guarded as now by iron bars. To these perils Juvenal adds the objects, solid or liquid, thrown from upper floor windows. All in all he thought only a fool would go out to dinner without making his will. Since there were no public vehicles to transport workers from their homes to their toil, most of the plebs lived in brick tenements near the heart of the town, or in rooms behind or above their shops. A tenement usually covered an entire square and was therefore called an insula, or island. Many of these buildings were six or seven stories high, and so flimsily built that several collapsed, killing hundreds of occupants. Augustus limited the frontal height of buildings to seventy Roman feet, but apparently the law permitted greater elevations in the rear, for Marshall tells of a poor devil whose attic is two hundred steps up. Many tenements had shops on the ground floor, some had balconies on the second. A few were connected at the top with tenements across the street by arched passages containing additional rooms, precarious penthouses for particular plebeians. Such insulae almost filled the Nova Via, the Clivus Victoriae, or Victory Hill, on the Palatine, and the Subara, a noisy brothel-ridden district between the Viminal and the Esquiline. In them dwelt the longshoremen of the Emporium, the butchers of the Macellum, the fishmongers of the Forum Piscatorium, the cattlemen of the Forum Boarium, the vegetable vendors of the Forum Holatorium, and the workers in Rome's factories, clerkships, and trades. The slums of Rome lapped the edges of the Forum. The streets off the Forum were lined with shops and resounded with labor and bargaining. Fruit sellers, book sellers, perfumers, milliners, dyers, florists, cutlers, locksmiths, apothecaries, and other caterers to the needs, foibles, and vanities of mankind blocked the thoroughfares with their projecting booths. Barbers plied their trade in the open air, where all could hear. Wine taverns were so numerous that Rome seemed to marshal one vast saloon. Each trade tended to center on some quarter or street, and often gave the locality a name. So the sandal makers were gathered in the Vicus Sandalarius, the harness makers in the Vicus Lorarius, the glass blowers in the Vicus Vitrarius, the jewelers in the Vicus Margaritarius. In such shops, the artists of Italy did their work, all but the greatest of them who drew high fees and lived in peripatetic luxury. 
Lucullus gave Arcesilaus a million sesterces to make a statue of the goddess Felicitas, and Zenodorus received 400,000 for a colossus of Mercury. Architects and sculptors were ranked with physicians, teachers, and chemists as pursuing artes liberales, arts of freemen. But the men who did most of the artwork of Rome were, or had been, slaves. Some owners had their bondsmen trained in carving, painting, and like skills, and sold their products in Italy and abroad. In such shops, labor was sharply divided. Some specialized in votive figures, others in decorative cornices. Some cut glass eyes for statues. Different painters made arabesques or flowers or landscapes or animals or men, and worked in turn on the same picture. Several artists were expert forgers, producing antiques of any marketable age. The Romans of the last century B.C. were easily deceived in these matters, for like most nouveau riches, they tended to value objects according to cost and rarity rather than by beauty and use. During the empire, when it was no longer a distinction to be wealthy, taste improved, and a sincere love of excellence brought to many thousands of families a refinement of utensils and ornaments such as only a very few had known in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Greece. Art was to antiquity what industry is to modernity. Men could not then enjoy the lavish abundance of useful products now poured forth by our machines, but they could, if they cared enough, gradually surround themselves with objects whose zealously finished form gave to all who lived with them the subtle and quiet happiness of beautiful things. 3. The Homes of the Great The visitor seeking to study the dwellings of the middle class would have found them away from the city's center on the main diverging roads. Their brick and stucco exteriors were still built as before in the plain and solid style dictated by insecurity and heat. The Roman bourgeois wasted no art on passers-by. Few houses rose to more than two stories. Cellars were rare, roofs sparkled with red tiles, windows were fitted with shutters or, occasionally, panes of glass. The entrance was usually a double door, each half turning on metal pivots. Floors were of concrete or tile, often of mosaic squares. There were no carpets. Around the central atrium were grouped the main rooms of the house. This is the architectural origin of the cloister and the college quadrangle. In the richer houses, one or more rooms would be used for bathing, usually in tubs much like our own. Plumbing was carried by the Romans to an excellence unmatched before the 20th century. Lead pipes brought water from the aqueducts and mains into most tenements and homes. Fittings and stopcocks were of bronze, and some were molded into highly ornamental designs. Leaders and gutters of lead carried rain from the roof. Most rooms were heated, if at all, by portable charcoal braziers. A few homes, many villas and palaces, and the public baths enjoyed central heating from wood or charcoal-burning furnaces, supplying hot air to various rooms through tile pipes or passages in floors and walls. In the early empire, a Hellenistic addition was made to the rich Roman's house. To provide a privacy not always possible in the atrium, he built behind it a peristylium, a court open to the sky, planted with flowers and shrubs, adorned by statues, surrounded by a portico, and centering about a fountain or a bathing pool. Around this court he raised a new set of rooms, a triclinium, or dining room, an ecus, or house, for the women, a pinacotica for his art collection, a biblioteca for his books, and a lararium for his household gods. There might also be extra bedrooms and little alcoves called exedrae, sitting-out nooks. Less expensive homes substituted a garden for the peristylium, and if even that could find no ground, the Romans placed flower boxes in the windows or grew flowers and shrubs on the roof. Some large roofs, says Seneca, had grape arbors, fruit trees, and shade trees planted in boxes of soil. Not a few had solaria for baking bellies in the sun. Many Romans wearied of the roar and rush of Rome and fled to the peace and boredom of the countryside. Rich and poor alike developed a feeling for nature beyond anything discernible in ancient Greece. Juvenal thought a man foolish to live in the capital when, for the annual rental of a dark garret in Rome, he might buy a pretty house in some quiet Italian town and surround it with a trim garden fit to feast a hundred Pythagoreans. The well-to-do moved out of Rome in early spring to villas in the foothills of the Apennines, or on the shores of lakes or the sea. The younger Pliny has left us a pleasant description of his country house at Laurentum, on the coast of Latium. He calls it large enough for my convenience without being expensive to maintain, but as he goes on we suspect a pose in his modesty. He describes a small porch sheltered by glazed windows and overhanging eaves, 
a handsome dining room gently washed by the edge of the last breakers, and so bright with spacious windows as to give a view in three directions, as if of three different seas. An atrium whence the prospect ends in woods and mountains, two drawing rooms, a semicircular library whose windows receive the sun all day long, a bedchamber, and several rooms for servants. In an opposite wing were an elegant parlor, a second dining room, and four small rooms, a bathroom suite consisting of a pleasant undressing room, a frigidarium or cold bath, a tepidarium with three pools heated to different degrees, and a calidarium or hot bath, all centrally heated by hot air pipes. Outside were a swimming pool, a ball court, a storehouse, a variegated garden, a private study and banquet hall, and an observation tower with two apartments and a dining room. Tell me now, Pliny concludes, have I not just cause to bestow my time and affection upon this agreeable retreat? If a senator could have such a villa on the sea and another on Como, we may begin to imagine the sprawling luxury of Tiberius's estate at Capri, or Domitian's at Alba Longa, not to speak of the one that Hadrian would soon build at Tiber. To match this cubicular extravagance, the visitor would have to find entry to the palaces of millionaires and emperors on the Palatine. In domestic architecture, the Romans did not care to imitate classic Greece, where homes were modest and only temples were great. They modeled their palaces upon the residences of the half-orientalized Hellenistic kings. Ptolemaic styles came to Rome with Cleopatra's gold, and royal architecture accompanied monarchical politics. The palace of Augustus, receiving the name from the hill it stood on, spread with extensions as the administrative functions of the imperial household increased. Most of his successors built additional palaces for themselves and their staffs. Tiberius, his Domus Tiberiana, Caligula, his Domus Guiana, Nero, his Domus Aurea. This golden house became the passing wonder of Rome. Its buildings alone covered 900,000 square feet, and yet were but a small part of a mile-square villa that overflowed from the Palatine upon the neighboring hills. A great park surrounded the palace, with gardens, meadows, fish ponds, game preserves, aviaries, vineyards, streams, fountains, waterfalls, lakes, imperial galleys, pleasure houses, summer houses, flower houses, and porticos 3,000 feet long. An angry wit scratched a representative comment on a wall. Rome has become the habitation of one man. It is time, citizens, to emigrate to Veii, unless, indeed, Veii itself is to be comprised in Nero's home. The interior of the palace gleamed with marble, bronze, and gold, with the gilded metal of countless Corinthian capitals, and with thousands of statues, reliefs, paintings, and objects of art, bought or looted from the classic world. Among them was the Laocoon. Some of the walls were inlaid with mother-of-pearl and various costly gems. The ceiling of the banquet hall was covered with ivory flowers, from which, at a nod of the emperor, a perfumed spray would fall upon his guests. The dining room had a spherical ceiling of ivory painted to represent the sky and the stars, which was kept in constant slow rotation by hidden machines. A suite of rooms provided hot baths, cold baths, tepid baths, salt water baths, and sulfur baths. When the Roman architects Sealer and Severus had nearly finished the immense structure and Nero moved in, he remarked, At last I am lodged. A generation later, this Roman Versailles, too costly and dangerous to maintain amid surrounding poverty, had fallen into neglect. Over its ruins, Vespasian built the Colosseum, Titus and Trajan, their enormous public baths. Domitian shared Nero's architectural madness. For him, Rabirius raised the Domus Flavia, not quite as elephantine as Nero's museum, but yielding little to it in gaudy splendor and decoration. One wing alone contained a vast basilica, probably the court where the emperor tried cases of final appeal. The same wing enclosed a peristylium covering 30,000 square feet. Adjoining this was a banquet hall whose pavement of red porphyry and green serpentine survives. Gone are the delicate marble screens and beautifully columned windows through which the diners might watch the waters splashing over the marble basins of the nymphia or fountains outside. It should be added that Domitian used this building only for receptions and administration. Usually he lived in the more modest quarters of Augustus's palace. Doubtless these royal edifices were part of the facade of empire, designed to impress natives, visitors, and embassies, while the emperors themselves, perhaps excepting Caligula and Nero, fled from the constraining formality of these ceremonial rooms to the ease and intimacy of their family quarters, and enjoyed, as Antoninus Pius would put it, the pleasure of being men.
4. The Arts of Decoration In these palaces, and in the homes of the rich, a hundred arts were employed to make everything, if not beautiful, at least expensive. The floors were often of polychrome marble, or mosaics, whose patient combination of tiny, vari-colored cubes, or tesserae, resulted in paintings of remarkable realism and permanence. Furniture was less abundant and comfortable than among ourselves, but of generally superior design and workmanship. Tables, chairs, benches, couches, beds, lamps, and utensils were made of lasting materials and lavishly adorned. The best wood, ivory, marble, bronze, silver, and gold were carefully turned and finished, decorated with plant or animal forms, or inlaid with ivory, tortoise shell, chased bronze, or precious stones. Tables were sometimes cut from costly cypress or citrus woods. Some were of gold or silver. Many were of marble or bronze. Chairs were of every sort, from folding stool to throne, but less calculated than ours to deform the spine. Beds were of wood or metal, with slim but sturdy legs often ending in an animal's head or foot. A bronze web, instead of a spring, supported a mattress filled with straw or wool. Bronze tripods of elegant form took the place of our end tables, and here and there were cabinets with pigeonholes for rolled books. Bronze braziers warmed the rooms, and bronze lamps lighted them. Mirrors, too, were of bronze, highly polished, embossed or engraved with floral or mythical designs. Some were made horizontally or vertically convex or concave to distort reflections into a humorous slenderness or rotundity. The factories of Campania, working with the rich output of Spanish mines, produced silverware on a large scale for a wide market. Silver services were now common in the middle and upper classes. In 1895, an excavator found in the cistern of a villa at Bosco Reale a remarkable collection of silver, apparently deposited there by its owner before his unsuccessful flight from the embers of Vesuvius in A.D. 79. One of the sixteen cups bears an almost perfect representation of simple foliage, Two depict skeletons in high relief. Another pictures Augustus enthroned between Venus and Mars, the rival deities of mankind. The slyest shows Zeno the Stoic pointing with scorn at Epicurus, who is helping himself to a huge piece of cake, while a pig with uplifted foreleg politely asks for a share. The coins and gems of the early empire prove the progress of the engraver's art. Those of Augustus show the same good taste sometimes the same designs as the altar of peace. Precious stones imported from Africa, Arabia, and India were cut and set into rings, brooches, necklaces, bracelets, cups, even into walls. A ring on at least one finger was a social necessity. A few fops wore rings on all fingers but one. The Roman sealed his signature with his ring and therefore liked to have the seal individually designed. Some of the best-paid artists in Rome were gem-cutters, like the Dioscurides who made Augustus's seal. In cutting cameos, the Golden Age reached a level never surpassed. The Gemma Augusta, in Vienna, is among the finest in existence. To collect gems and cameos became a hobby of rich Romans, Pompey, Caesar, Augustus. By inheritance, the imperial gem cabinet grew till Marcus Aurelius sold it to help pay for his war against the Marcomanni. From the official guardian of the imperial seals and gems, England derived her keeper of the great or privy seal. Meanwhile, the potters of Capua, Putiali, Cumi, and Aretium were filling Italian homes with every variety of ceramic art. Aretium had mixing vats with a capacity of 10,000 gallons. Its red-glazed tableware was for a century the most widely spread product of Italy. Specimens of it have been found almost everywhere. Iron stamps, hollowed out in relief, were used to impress upon each vase, lamp, or tile the name of the maker, sometimes also the names of the year's consuls, as a date. To this degree the ancients knew the art of printing. They left it undeveloped because slave copyists were cheap. From pottery the workers of Cumi, Liternum, and Aquilea turned to the production of artistic glass. The Portland vase is a famous example of its kind. Finer still is the blue glass vase found at Pompeii, depicting in lively and graceful action a vintage feast of Bacchus. In the reign of Tiberius, say Pliny and Strabo, the art of glass blowing was brought from Sidon or Alexandria to Rome and soon produced polychrome files, cups, bowls, and other forms of such delicate beauty that they became for a time the favorite prey of art collectors and millionaires. 
In Nero's reign, 6,000 sesterces were paid for two small cups of blown glass, now known as mille fiori, or thousand flowers, produced by fusing together different colored glass rods. Even more prized were the murine vases imported from Asia and Africa. They were made by placing white and purple glass filaments side by side to form a desired pattern, and then firing them. Or pieces of colored glass were embedded in a transparent white body. Pompey brought some to Rome after his victory over Mithridates. Augustus, though he melted down Cleopatra's gold plate, kept for himself her goblet of murine glass. Nero paid a million sesterces for one such cup. Petronius, dying, broke another lest it should fall into Nero's hands. All in all, the Romans have had no superior in making glass, and there are few art collections in the world more precious than those of Roman glass in the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 5. Sculpture Pottery passed into sculpture through baked clay, terracotta reliefs and statuettes, toys, imitations of fruit, grapes, fish, at last full-sized statues. Glazed terracotta, majolica, abounded in the ruins of Pompeii. Temple pediments and eaves were adorned with terracotta palmettes, acroteria, gargoyles, and reliefs. The Greeks laughed at these ornaments, and under the empire they went out of fashion. Augustus was no friend of clay. It was probably through his Attic taste that relief and sculpture attained in Rome an excellence comparable with the best Hellenistic work. For a generation the artists of Rome carved fountains, tombstones, arches, and altars with the refinement of feeling, a precision of execution, a quiet dignity of form, a measure of modeling and perspective that rank Roman reliefs among the masterpieces of the world's art. In 13 BC, the Senate celebrated the return of Augustus from the pacification of Spain and Gaul by decreeing that an Ara Pacis Augusti, or Altar of the Augustan Peace, should be erected in the field of Mars. This is the noblest of all the sculptural remains of Rome. Perhaps the monument owed its form to the altar at Pergamum and its processional motif to the Parthenon frieze. The altar was raised on a platform in an enclosure whose surrounding walls were partly carved in marble relief. The extant pieces are slabs from these walls. One slab represents Tellus, Mother Earth, with two children in her arms, corn and flowers growing beside her, and animals lying contentedly at her feet. These were the leading ideas of the Augustan Reformation, the family restored to parentage, the nation to agriculture, the empire to peace. The central figure is unsurpassed. Indeed, in its union of mature motherhood and womanly beauty, tenderness and grace, there is a soft perfection unmatched by the stately goddesses of the Parthenon. The frieze of the outer wall had a lower panel of acanthus scrolls, broad-petaled peonies and poppies, and rich clusters of ivy berries. This, too, is unequaled in its class. Another panel showed two processions moving in opposite directions to meet before the altar of the goddess of peace. In these groups are grave and quiet figures, probably of Augustus, Livia, and the imperial family, with nobles, priests, vestal virgins, and children. These last are engagingly real in their shy innocence. One is a baby toddling along with no taste for ceremony. Another is a boy already proud of his years. Another, a little girl with a nosegay. Another, after some mischief, is being gently admonished by his mother. Henceforth, children would play a rising role in Italian art. But never again would Roman sculpture show such mastery of drapery, such natural and effective grouping, such modulations of light and shade. Here, as in Virgil, propaganda had found a perfect medium. The only Roman rivals of these reliefs are the carvings on the arches raised for the entry of triumphing generals. The finest survivor is the Arch of Titus, begun by Vespasian and completed by Domitian to commemorate the capture of Jerusalem. One relief shows the burning city, its walls in ruins, its people wild with fear, its wealth looted by legionaries. Another pictures Titus riding into Rome in his chariot amid soldiers, animals, magistrates, priests, and prisoners, followed by the holy candelabra of the temple and varied spoils of war. The artists here experimented bravely. They cut different figures to different levels and distributed them on diverse planes. They chiseled the background to give an illusion of depth and they painted the whole to convey additional shades of fullness and distance. The action was shown not in separate episodes, but in continuity, as on the friezes of Mesopotamia and Egypt, and later on the columns of Trajan and Aurelius. So the sense of motion and life was better conveyed. The figures were not idealized and softened into a mood of Attic repose, as in the Hellenistic Ara Pacis. They were taken from the flesh and the dirt, and carved in the earthy tradition of Italian realism and vitality, 
The subject was not perfect gods, but living men. It is this vigorous realism that distinguishes Roman sculpture from the Greek, but for this recurrent fidelity to their own bent, the Romans would have added little to art. About 90 BC, a Greek from South Italy, Pasiteles, went to Rome, lived there for 60 years, did excellent work in silver, ivory, and gold, introduced silver mirrors, made skillful copies of Greek masterpieces, and wrote five volumes on the history of art. He was both the Vasari and the Cellini of his time. Another Greek, Arcesilaus, made for Caesar a famous statue of his distant relative, Venus Genetrix. Apollonius of Athens, probably in Rome, carved the powerful Torso Belvedere of the Vatican, a work conceived with moderation, proclaiming no bulging muscles, but showing a man in the fullness of health and strength. We can only say of it that it is perfect so far as it goes. For a time, the studios busied themselves giving Greek form to Italian gods, even to divine abstractions like chance and chastity. Presumably in this period and in Rome, Glycon of Athens carved the Farnese Hercules, we cannot tell to what age or country the Apollo Belvedere belongs. Perhaps it was a Roman copy of an original by Leocares of Athens. Every student knows how its calm beauty stirred Winkelmann to Uranian ecstasy. Juno received now two renowned embodiments, the Porphyry Farnese Juno of the Naples Museum and the Ludovisi Juno of the Terme, cold and stern, righteous and just. One begins to understand Jove's wanderings. All these, and the graceful Perseus and Andromeda of the Capitoline Museum, were in the Greek style, idealized and generalized, and tiresomely divine. More arresting are the portrait busts that constitute a bronze and marble dictionary of Roman physiognomy from Pompey to Constantine. Some of these, too, are idealized, particularly the Julio-Claudian heads, but the old Etruscan realism and the ever-present example of unflattering death masks reconciled the Romans to being represented as ugly, provided they were shown as strong. So many of them bequeathed their effigies to public places that at times Rome seemed to belong less to the quick than to the dead. Some worthies could not bide their end, but erected themselves as statues before their death, until the jealous emperors to make room for the living forbade such premature immortality. The greatest of the portrait busts is the so-named Head of Caesar, of black basalt, in Berlin. We do not know whom it represents, but the sparse hair and sharp chin, the thin and bony face, the heavy lines of weary thought, the resolution yielding to disillusionment, accord well with the traditional attribution. Only second to it is the colossal head of Caesar in Naples. Here the wrinkles have set almost into bitterness, as if the giant had at last discovered that no mind is broad enough to understand, much less to rule the world. Realistic to repulsiveness is the Pompey of the Nikalsberg Eglyptothek in Copenhagen all the brave triumphs of his youth forgotten in the dull obesity of a beaten man. Of Augustus we have half a hundred statues, many of them masterly. Augustus the boy, in the Vatican, serious, keen, noble, the finest portrait of an actual youth in any age. Augustus at thirty in the British Museum, a bronze figure of burning determination, reminding us of Suetonius's statement that the emperor could quell a mutiny with a glance. Augustus the priest, in the Terme, a profound and pensive face emerging from a prison of drapery, and Augustus Imperator, found in the ruins of Livia's villa at Prima Porta, and now in the Vatican. The breastplate of this famous figure is covered with esoteric and distracting reliefs. The pose is stiff, the legs are too mighty for such an invalid, but the head has a quiet and self-confident power that reveals the hand and soul of a great artist, who could not quite forget the Doriferos, of Polyclitus. Livia herself was fortunate in the artist who made the head now in Copenhagen. The hair is stately, the bent Roman nose smacks of character, the eyes are thoughtful and tender, the lips pretty but firm. This is the woman who stood quietly behind Augustus's throne, overthrew all her rivals and enemies, and mastered everybody but her son. Tiberius too fared well. Idealized though it is, the seated figure in the Lateran Museum is a chef d'oeuvre worthy of the hand that carved the diorite Kephron in Cairo. Claudius was not so lucky. Surely the sculptor was making fun of him, or illustrating Seneca's pumpkinification when he carved him up as a worried Jupiter, fat and amiable and dumb. Nero tried hard to develop a sense of beauty, but his real passion was for fame and size. He saw no better function for Xenodotus, the scopus of this age, 
than to consume his time in making a colossus of Nero as Apollo, 117 feet high. Hadrian had it removed to the foreground of the Flavian Amphitheater, which thence derived its name of Colosseum. With the honest Vespasian, sculpture returned to reality. He let himself be represented frankly as a veritable plebeian, with coarse features, wrinkled brow, bald head, and enormous ears. Kinder is the bust in the terme, showing a spirit harassed with affairs of state, or the business-like face of the massive head in Naples. Titus comes down to us with a like cubical cranium and homely countenance. It is hard to think of this stout street vendor as the darling of mankind. Domitian had the good sense in the realistic Flavian age to have himself so hated in life that all his images were ordered destroyed after his death. When the artist left the palace and roamed the streets, he could give free play to the italic imp of humorous truth. Some old man, surely less equipped with wisdom and denarii than the philosopher premier, posed for the disheveled scarecrow once labeled Seneca. Athletes had their muscles immortalized for a moment by famous artists, and gladiators, as statues, found entry into the best homes, from patrician villas to Farnese palaces. The Roman sculptors relented when they handled the figures of women. Now and then they carved an irascible shrew, but they also molded some vestal virgins of a graceful gravity, occasional incarnations of tenderness like the Clyte of the British Museum, and aristocratic ladies as fragilely charming as the dolls of Watteau or Fragonard. They were adept in the portrayal of children, as in the bronze boy of the Metropolitan Museum, or the Innocenza of the Capital Line. They could chisel or cast the forms of animals with startling vividness, as in the wolves' heads found at Nemi in 1929, or the prancing horses of St. Mark's. They seldom achieved the smooth perfection of the Periclean schools, but that was because they loved the individual more than the type and relished the life-giving imperfections of the real. With all their limitations, they stand supreme in the history of portrait art. 6. Painting The ancient visitor would have found painting even more popular than sculpture in Rome's temples and dwellings, porticos and squares. He would have come upon many works of old masters there, Polynotus, Zeuxis, Apelles, Protogenes, and others, as dear to the opulent empire as the paintings of the Renaissance are to rich America. And he would have seen in greater abundance, through their better preservation, the products of Alexandrian and Roman schools. The art was old in Italy, where every wall craved ornament. Once even Roman nobles had practiced it, but the Hellenistic invasion had made painting Greek and servile, and at last Valerius Maximus marveled that Fabius Pictor should have stooped to paint murals in the Temple of Health. There were exceptions. Toward the end of the Republic, Aurelius made a name for himself by hiring prostitutes to pose for his goddesses. In the time of Augustus, a dumb aristocrat, Quintus Pettius took up painting because his defect closed most professions to him. And Nero employed for the interior of his golden house one Amulius, who painted with the greatest gravity always in his toga. But such men were rari nantes in the crowd of Greeks who at Rome and Pompeii and throughout the peninsula made copies or variations of Greek paintings on Greek or Egyptian themes. The art was practically limited to fresco and tempera, in fresco, a freshly plastered wall was painted with water-moistened colors. In tempera, the pigments were mixed with an adhesive sizing and laid upon a dry surface. Portrait painters sometimes employed an encaustic process in which the tints were fused in hot wax. Nero had his picture painted on a canvas 120 feet high, the first known use of this material. Painting, as we have seen, was applied to statues, temples, stage scenery, and great linen pictures intended for exhibition in triumphs or in the forum but its favored receptacle was the external or internal wall. The Romans seldom placed furniture against a wall or hung pictures there. They preferred to use the entire space for one painting or for a group of related designs. In this way, the mural became a part of the house, an integral item in the architectural design. The caustic humor of Vesuvius has preserved for us some 3,500 frescoes, more paintings at Pompeii than can be found in all the rest of the classic world. Since Pompeii was a minor town, we may imagine how many such murals brightened the homes and shrines of classic Italy. The best survivors have been removed to the Naples Museum. Even there their lithe grace impresses us. But only the ancients knew them in the full depth of their color and in the architectural framework that gave each picture a function and a place. In the house of the Vettii, the murals have been left in situ. In a dining room, Dionysus surprises the sleeping Ariadne. 
On the opposite wall, Daedalus displays his wooden cow to Pasiphae. At the farther end, Hermes looks on calmly as Hephaestus fastens Ixion to the torturing wheel. And in another room, a succession of humorous frescoes shows carefree cupids parodying the industries of Pompeii, including the wine business of the Vettii. The bite of time has gnawed into these once brilliant surfaces, but enough remains to shock the visitor into modesty. The figures are almost perfectly drawn, and so colorful with the flesh of life that they can still make the blood stir lustily in living veins. It is by reference to these Pompeian paintings that connoisseurs have tried to understand the nature and classify the periods and styles of pictorial art in ancient Italy. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 1, Side 2. It is by reference to these Pompeian paintings that connoisseurs have tried to understand the nature and classify the periods and styles of pictorial art in ancient Italy. The method is precarious, for Pompeii was more Greek than Latin, but what remains of classic painting in Rome and its suburbs falls in tolerably well with the Pompeian development. In the first or incrustation style, 2nd century B.C., Walls were often colored to resemble inlaid marble slabs, or crustae, as in the house of Sallust at Pompeii. In the second, or architectural style, 1st century B.C., the wall was painted to simulate a building or facade or colonnade. Often the columns were represented as seen from within, and open country was pictured between them. In this way, the artist gave to a probably windowless room cool vistas of trees and flowers, fields and streams, peaceful or playful animals. The imprisoned dweller could fancy himself in Lucullus's gardens by merely looking at the wall. He might fish or row or hunt or indulge a fondness for birds without suffering their untimeliness. Nature was taken into the house. The third or ornate style, A.D. 1 to 50, employed architectural forms purely for ornament and subordinated landscape to figures. In the fourth or intricate style, A.D. 50 to 79, the artist let his fancy riot invented fantastic structures and shapes, placed them in positions gaily scornful of gravity, piled gardens and columns, villas and pavilions, upon one another in modernistic disarray, and occasionally achieved the impressionistic effect of a picture supplemented by unconscious memory and suffused with light. In all these kindred styles, architecture was handmade and mistress to painting, served it and used it, and gave body to a tradition that reawoke, after sixteen centuries, in Nicolas Poussin. It is a pity that the subjects of the major extant paintings so seldom venture beyond Greek myth. We tire of these same gods and satyrs, heroes and sinners, Zeus and Mars, Dionysus and Pan, Achilles and Odysseus, Iphigenia and Medea, though a like charge could be brought against the Renaissance. There are a few pictures of still life, and here and there a fuller, an innkeeper, or a butcher shines on Pompeian walls. Love often dominates the scene— a girl sits brooding over some secret longing not unrelated to the Eros who stands beside her. Young men and women gamble amorously on the grass. Psyches and cupids frolic as if the town had never known anything but love and wine. If we may judge from their representation in these murals, the women of Pompeii deserved to have life center about their comeliness. We see them engrossed in the game of knuckle-bones, or leaning gracefully over a lyre, or composing poetry with a meditative stylus at the lips. Their faces are quiet with maturity, their forms are healthily full, their robes fall about them with Phidian amplitude and rhythm, they walk like Helens, conscious of their divinity. One of them performs a Bacchic dance, apparently in thin air. Her right arm, hand, and foot are as lovely as anything in the history of painting. Some male characters must be included with these masterpieces. Theseus, victor over the Minotaur, Hercules rescuing Dianyra or adopting Telephus, Achilles angrily surrendering the reluctant Briseus, in this last picture, every figure nears perfection and Pompeian painting is at its best. Humor is represented, too. A disheveled pedagogue stumbles forward on his staff. A jolly satyr shakes his shanks in sardonic revelry. A bald, ribald Silenus is caught in the mood of musical ecstasy. Taverns and brothels came in for appropriate decoration, and no eager tourist need be told that Priapus still flaunts his precious powers on Pompeian walls. 
At the other end of the gamut, in the Villa Item, is a series of religious pictures suggesting the use of the place for celebrating the Dionysian mysteries. In one fresco, a little girl, palsied with piety, reads from an apparently sacred book. In another, a procession of damsels advances, blowing pipes and bringing sacrifice. In a third, a nude lady dances on tiptoe while a neophyte kneels exhausted by some ritualistic whipping. Finer than any of these is a mural found in the ruins of Stabii, presaging Botticelli, and called Spring. A woman walks slowly through a garden, gathering flowers. Only her back is seen, and the graceful turning of her head. But seldom has any art conveyed so movingly the poetry of this simple theme. The most powerful of all the pictures recovered from these ruins is the Medea found at Herculaneum, and preserved in the Naples Museum, a brooding woman, magnificently draped, meditating the murder of her children. Apparently, this is a copy of the painting for which Caesar paid the artist, Timomachus of Byzantium, forty talents, or a hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. Few pictures of such quality have been found in Rome, but in the suburban villa of Livia at Prima Porta, a supreme example was discovered of that landscape painting in which Italy so far excels Greece. The eye is lured as if across a court to a marble trellis, beyond which is a jungle of plants and flowers so accurately reproduced that botanists can now identify and catalogue them. Every leaf is carefully drawn and coloured. Birds perch here and there as if for a moment, and insects creep amid the foliage. Only less masterly is the Aldo Brandini wedding found on the Esquiline in 1606 and enthusiastically studied by Rubens, Van Dyck, and Goethe. Perhaps it is a copy of a Greek work. Perhaps it is an original by a Roman Greek or by a Roman. We can only say that these figures, the quiet and timid bride, the goddess who counsels her, the mother absorbed in preparations, the maidens waiting to play the lyre and sing, are all done with a delicacy and sensitivity that make this mural a distinguished relic of classic art. Roman painting laid no claim to originality. Greek artists carried with them everywhere the same traditions and methods, and even the vague impressionism of these pictures may be offshoots of Alexandrian skills. But there is in them a fineness of line and a richness of color that explain why painters like Apelles and Protogenes were held in as high repute as sculptors like Polycletus and Praxiteles. Sometimes the color is as full as if Giorgione had laid it on. Sometimes the subtle gradations of light and shade suggest Rembrandt. Sometimes a crude figure catches the ungainly realism of Van Gogh. Perspective here is often faulty, and hasty workmanship limps behind mature conception. But a fresh vitality redeems these faults. The rhythm of the drapery lures the eye, and the woodland scenes must have been a delight to dwellers in a crowded town. Our taste today is more restrained. We like to leave a wall its own significance, and have hesitated till yesterday to cover it with paint. But to the Italian a wall was a prison, seldom opening through a window upon the world. He wished to forget the barrier and be deluded by art into some verdant peace. Perhaps he was right. Better a pictured tree on a wall than a magic casement's prospect of a thousand unkempt rooftops blaspheming the sky and festering in the sun. 7. Architecture 1. Principles, Materials, and Forms we have reserved for the climactic edification of our forgotten visitor, the greatest of Rome's arts, that in which she most ably defended herself against the Greek invasion, and displayed all her originality, courage, and power. Originality, however, is not parthenogenesis. It is, like parentage, a novel combination of pre-existing elements. All cultures are eclectic in their youth, as education begins with imitation, but when the soul or nation comes of age it stamps its character, if it has any, upon all its works and words. Rome, like other Mediterranean cities, took the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders from Egypt and Greece, but also she took the arch, the vault, and the dome from Asia, and with them made such a city of palaces, basilicas, amphitheaters, and baths as the earth had not yet beheld. Roman architecture became the art expression of the Roman spirit and state. Boldness, organization, grandeur, and brutal strength raised these unparalleled structures upon the hills. They were the Roman soul in stone. Most of the leading architects in Rome were Romans, not Greeks. One of them, Marcus Vitruvius Polio, wrote a world classic on architecture, circa 27 BC. Having served as military engineer under Caesar in Africa and as an architect under Octavian, Vitruvius retired in old age to formulate the principles of Rome's most honored art. Nature has not given me stature, he confessed, 
My face is homely with years, and illness has stolen my strength. Therefore I hope to win favor by my knowledge and my book. As Cicero and Quintilian made philosophy a prerequisite for the orator, so Vitruvius required it of the architect. It would improve his purposes while science improved his means. It would make him high-minded, urbane, just, loyal, and without greed. For no true work can be done without good faith and clean hands. He described the materials of architecture, the orders and their elements, and the diverse types of building in Rome, and added discourses on machinery, water clocks, speedometers, more accurately odometers, a peg attached to the axle of the wheel advanced by a cog a smaller wheel whose much slower revolution caused a pebble to fall into a box, aqueducts, town planning, and public sanitation. As against the rectangular design established by Hippodamus in many Greek cities, Vitruvius recommended the radial arrangement used in Alexandria and modern Washington. The Romans, however, continued to lay out their towns on the rectangular plan of their camps. He warned Italy that in several localities its drinking water led to goiter and declared that poisoning could come from working with lead. He explained sound as a vibratory motion of the air and wrote our oldest extant discussion of architectural acoustics. His book, rediscovered in the Renaissance, deeply influenced Leonardo, Palladio, and Michelangelo. The Romans, says Vitruvius, built with wood, brick, stucco, concrete, stone, and marble. Bricks were the usual substance of walls, arches, and vaults, and served as a frequent facing for concrete. Stucco, too, was often used as a facing. It was made of sand, lime, marble dust, and water, took a high polish, and was laid on in several coats, often to a thickness of three inches. Hence it could keep its form for nineteen centuries, as in some parts of the Colosseum. In making and using concrete, the Romans were unrivaled until our time. They took the volcanic ash abounding near Naples, mixed it with lime and water, threw in fragments of brick, pottery, marble, and stone, and produced from the second century B.C. onward an opus caementicum, as hard as rock, and capable of being poured almost into any shape. They cast it, as we do, in troughs formed of boards, by its means they could cover large unsupported spaces with rigid domes free from the lateral thrust of an arched roof. In this way they topped the Parthenon and the great baths. Stone was employed for most temples and the more pretentious homes. One variety from Cappadocia was so translucent that a temple built with it was adequately lighted with all its openings closed. The conquest of Greece brought a taste for marble, which was satisfied first by importing columns, then marble, and finally by working the Carrara quarries near Luna. Before Augustus, marble was largely confined to columns and slabs. In his time it was used as a facing for brick and concrete. Only in this superficial sense did he leave Rome here and there a city of marble. Walls of solid marble were rare. The Romans liked to mingle in the same building the red and gray granite of Egypt, the green Cipollino of Euboea, the black and yellow marbles of Numidia, with their own white Carrara, and with basalt, alabaster, and porphyry. Never had architectural material been so complex or so colorful. To the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders, Rome added the Tuscan and composite styles, and certain modifications. Columns were often monoliths instead of superimposed drums. The Doric column received an Ionic base and took on a new, unfluted slenderness. The Ionic capital was sometimes given four volutes, to offer the same appearance from every side. The Corinthian column and capital were developed to a delicate beauty beyond any Greek example, but in later decades this style was spoiled by undue elaborations. A like excess poured flowers over the Ionic volutes to make the composite capital, as in the Arch of Titus. Sometimes the volutes ended in animal or human forms, suggestive of gargoyles and presaging medieval forms. The lavish Romans often mixed several orders in the same building, as in the theater of Marcellus. And then again, with perverse economy, they left the side columns attached to the cella, as in the Maison Carré at Nîmes. Even when the development of the arch had taken from columns their old supporting role, the Romans added them as functionless ornaments, a custom that has survived into our own uncertain age. 2. The Temples of Rome For nearly all her temples, Rome kept the Greek trabiat principle, architraves, that is, master beams, upheld by columns and carrying the roof. Augustus was conservative in art as in everything else, and most of the shrines built by his order clung to the orthodox tradition. From his time onward, the emperors multiplied homes for their Olympic rivals and clothed their lechery with an architectural piety that crowded the hills and blocked the streets with tiled and gilded fanes. Jupiter, of course, was their favorite recipient. 
Among many, he had one as Jupiter Tonans, the Thunderer, another as Jupiter Stator, who had stayed the flight of the Romans in battle, and he shared with Juno and Minerva the holiest of Rome's sanctuaries atop the Capitoline Hill. There, in the central cell, flanked by a three-storied Corinthian colonnade, was the gold and ivory colossus of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jove the best and greatest. Tradition ascribed the first form of this supreme house of Roman worship to Tarquinius Priscus. It was several times burned down and rebuilt. Stilicho, in A.D. 404, stole its gold-plated bronze doors to pay his soldiers, and the vandals carried off the gold-plated tiles of the roof. Some fragments of the pavement remain. On the northern summit of the same hill rose the temple of Juno Monita, Juno the Monitor or Guardian. Here was the Roman Mint, and from its name, of course, comes our word for the root of much ambition. On the south side of the hill was the Shrine of Saturn, the oldest god of the capital. The Romans dated its first dedication at 497 B.C. Eight Ionic columns and an architrave survive. In the Forum at the foot of the hill was the little Temple of Janus, god of all beginnings. Its doors were opened only in time of war and were closed but three times in Rome's ancient history. At the southeast corner of the Forum stood the Temple of Castor and Pollux, erected in 495 B.C. Three slender Corinthian columns have come down to us from the reconstruction by Tiberius, they are by common consent the finest columns in Rome. In his own forum, Augustus added a temple of Mars Altor, the Avenger, vowed before Philippi. Three of its majestic columns stand. One end of its cella was a semicircular apse, an architectural form destined to become the chancel of early Christian churches. On the Palatine, Augustus built entirely of marble a sumptuous temple to Apollo for the god's help at Actium. He adorned it with sculptures by Myron and Scopus, added a splendid library and an art gallery to its enclosure, and did all he could to make men feel that the god had left Greece for Rome and had brought with him the spiritual and cultural leadership of the world. It was even whispered by Augustus's friends, now that his mother was safely dead, that Apollo, disguised as an agile snake, had begotten the subtle prince. In the northwest part of the city was a great shrine to Isis, and on the Palatine a spacious sanctuary for Sibylle. Handsome shelters were provided for personified abstractions, health, honor, virtue, concord, faith, fortune, and many more. Nearly all of these contained galleries of statuary and painting. In his great temple of peace, Vespasian gathered for the general eye many of the art treasures of Nero's golden house and some of the relics of Jerusalem. The temple of Fortuna Virilis, in the Forum Boarium, has the distinction of being the most completely preserved of the pre-Augustan buildings in Rome. The ladies of the capital frequently worshipped there, for the goddess they believed would teach them how to conceal their defects from men. To these and a hundred other temples in the classic rectangular style, the architects of Rome added several circular temples, which revealed a new mastery of the problems presented by a dome. Tradition derived this type from the round hut of Romulus, religiously preserved on the Palatine for many centuries. Almost as old was the pretty Ides Vestae, or House of Vesta, near the temple of Castor and Pollux, its circular cella, faced with white marble, was enclosed by handsome Corinthian columns, and its roof was a dome of gilded brass. Adjoining it was the Palace of the Vestals, eighty-four rooms built cloister-wise around a peristyled court, the Atrium Vestae. The Pantheon was not yet a circular temple. As built by Agrippa, it was rectangular, but had a circular plaza before it. Hadrian's architects raised over this space the round temple and mighty dome, which are still among the bravest works of man. 3. The Arcuate Revolution Rome was greater in her secular than in her sacred architecture, for here she could escape the bondage of tradition and unite engineering with art, utility and power with beauty and form, in a manner all her own. The principle of Greek architecture had been the straight line, however delicately modulated as in the Parthenon, the vertical column, the horizontal architrave, the triangular pediment. The principle of specifically Roman architecture was to be the curve. Romans wanted grandeur, audacity, size, but they could not roof their vast buildings on rectilinear and trabeate principles except by a maze of impeding columns. They solved the problem with the arch, usually in its rounded form, with the vault, which is a prolonged arch, and with the dome, which is a rotated arch. Perhaps Roman generals and their aides had brought from Egypt and Asia a growing familiarity with arcuate shapes, and had reawakened early Roman and Etruscan traditions long overwhelmed by Orthodox Greek styles. 
Now Rome employed the arch on so great a scale that the whole art of building took from this form a new and lasting name. By laying a web of brick ribs along the lines of strain before pouring concrete into the wooden frame of the roof, the Romans developed the articulated vault. By crossing two cylindrical or barrel vaults at right angles, they produced a network of ribs and groins that could sustain a heavier superstructure and bear more lateral thrust. These were the principles of Rome's arcuate revolution. It was in the great baths and amphitheaters that the new style reached its completion. The baths of Agrippa, Nero, and Titus were the first of a long series that culminated in the baths of Diocletian. They were monumental buildings of concrete faced with stucco or brick and rising to majestic heights. The interiors were richly decorated with marble and mosaic pavements, vari-colored columns, coffered ceilings, paintings, and statuary. They were equipped with dressing rooms, hot and cold baths, an intermediate room of warm air, swimming pools, palestras, libraries, reading rooms, research rooms, lounges, and probably art galleries. Most of the chambers were centrally heated by large clay pipes running under floors and within the walls. These thermi were the most spacious and sumptuous public buildings ever erected, and they have never been equaled in their class. They were part of that socialism of recreation with which the Principate excused its growing monarchy. This same paternalism built the greatest theaters in history. Those of Rome were much fewer but larger than those of modern capitals. The smallest was that which Cornelius Balbus built in the field of Mars in 13 B.C., seating 7,700. Augustus rebuilt Pompey's theater, seating 17,500. He completed another, named for Marcellus, seating 20,500. Unlike Greek theaters, these were walled, and the stands were supported by arched and vaulted masonry instead of resting on the slope of a hill. Only the stage was roofed, but often the audience was sheltered from the sun by a linen awning, or velarium, which in Pompey's theater covered a space 550 feet wide. Over the entrances were boxes for dignitaries and magnates. Some stages had curtains, which, when the play began, were not raised aloft, but lowered into a groove. The stage was elevated some five feet. Its background usually took the form of an elaborate building, which, extending from wing to wing, helped the actors to throw their voices out over the immense audiences. Seneca speaks of stage mechanics who invent scaffolding that goes aloft of its own accord, or floors that rise silently into the air. A change of scene was effected by revolving prisms, or by moving a set into the wings or into the loft, thereby exposing the next. Acoustics were aided by sinking hollow jars into the floor and walls of the stage. The auditorium was cooled by rivulets of water running along the passages. Sometimes a mixture of water, wine, and crocus juice was conducted by pipes to the highest tiers and thence scattered over the audience as a perfumed spray. Statues adorned the interior, and large pictures were painted as scenery. Probably no theater or opera house in the world today could equal the size and splendor of Pompey's. More popular still were the circus, the stadium, and the amphitheater. Rome had several stadiums used chiefly for athletic contests. Horse or chariot races and some spectacles were presented at the Circus Flaminius in the field of Mars, or more usually at the Circus Maximus as rebuilt by Caesar between the Palatine and Aventine hills. This was an immense ellipse, 2,200 feet long and 705 feet wide, with wooden seats on three sides for 180,000 spectators. We may judge the wealth of Rome by noting that Trajan rebuilt these seats in marble. By comparison, the Colosseum was a modest structure, seating only 50,000. Its plan was not new. The cities of Greek Italy had long since had amphitheaters. Curio, as we have seen, composed one in 53 B.C. Caesar built another in 46, Statilius Taurus another in 29 B.C. The Flavian Amphitheater, as Rome called the Colosseum, was begun by Vespasian and finished by Titus in A.D. 80. The architect's name is unknown. Vespasian chose as its site the lake in the gardens of Nero's Golden House between the Celian and Palatine Hills. It was constructed of travertine stone in an ellipse 1,790 feet around. Its external wall rose 157 feet and was divided into three stories, the first partly supported by Tuscan Doric, the second by Ionic, the third by Corinthian columns, with an arch in each intercolumnar space. The main corridors were roofed with barrel vaults, sometimes crossed in the style of medieval cloisters. The interior was also divided into three tiers, each upheld by arches, divided into concentric rings of boxes or seats, and cut by stairways into cunei, or wedges. 
The aspect of the interior today is that of a mass of masonry into which some giant artisan has cut the arches, passages, and seats. Statues and other decorations adorned the whole, and many rows of seats were in marble. There were eighty entrances, two of them reserved for the emperor and his suite. These entrances and the exits, or vomitoria, could empty the gigantic bowl in a few minutes. The arena, 287 by 180 feet, was surrounded by a fifteen-foot wall topped with an iron grating to protect brutes from beasts. The Colosseum was not a beautiful building, and its very immensity reveals a certain coarseness as well as grandeur in the Roman character. It is only the most imposing of all the ruins left by the classic world. The Romans built like giants. It would have been too much to ask that they should finish like jewelers. Roman art had taken over in eclectic confusion the Attic, Asiatic, and Alexandrian styles, restraint, immensity, and elegance. It never quite combined them into that organic unity which is one requisite of beauty. There is something oriental in the crude strength of the typically Roman buildings. They are awe-inspiring rather than beautiful. Even Hadrian's Pantheon is a structural marvel rather than an artistic whole. Except in certain moments, as in the Augustan reliefs and the glass, we must not look here for delicacy of feeling or refinement of execution. We must expect an engineer's art that seeks the perfection of stability, economy, and use, a parvenu's infatuation with immensity and ornament, a soldier's insistence on realism, a warrior's art of overwhelming force. The Romans did not finish like jewelers because conquerors do not become jewelers. They finished like conquerors. Without doubt, they created the most influential and fascinating city in history. They made a plastic, pictorial, and structural art that every man could understand, and a city that every citizen could use. The free masses were poor, but in some measure they owned much of the wealth of Rome. They ate the corn of the state, they sat at almost no cost in the theaters, the circuses, the amphitheaters, and the stadiums. They exercised, refreshed, amused, and educated themselves in the baths. They enjoyed the shade of a hundred colonnades and walked under decorated porticos that covered many miles of street and three miles in the field of Mars alone. Never had the world seen such a metropolis. At its center, a tumultuous forum busy with business, resounding with oratory, alive with empire-shaking debates, then a ring of majestic temples, basilicas, palaces, theaters, and baths, in a profusion without parallel, then a ring of humming shops and teeming tenements, still another ring of homes and gardens, again with temples and public baths, and last of all a circle of villas and estates pushing the city into the countryside and binding the mountains with the sea. This was the Rome of the Caesars, proud, powerful, brilliant, materialistic, cruel, iniquitous, chaotic, and sublime. Chapter 17. Epicurean Rome, 30 B.C. to A.D. 96. 1. The People. Let us enter these dwellings, temples, theaters, and baths, and see how these Romans lived. We shall find them more interesting than their art. We must at the outset recall that by Nero's time they were only geographically Roman. The conditions that Augustus had failed to check, celibacy, childlessness, abortion, and infanticide among the older stocks, Manumission and comparative fertility among the new had transformed the racial character, the moral temper, even the physiognomy of the Roman people. Once the Romans had been precipitated into parentage by the impetus of sex and lured to it by anxiety for the post-mortem care of their graves, now the upper and middle classes had learned to separate sex from parentage and were skeptical about the afterworld. Once the rearing of children had been an obligation of honor to the state enforced by public opinion— now it seemed absurd to demand more births in a city crowded to the point of redolence. On the contrary, wealthy bachelors and childless husbands continued to be courted by sycophants longing for legacies. Nothing, said Juvenal, will so endear you to your friends as a barren wife. Cretona, says a character in Petronius, has only two classes of inhabitants, flatterers and flattered, and the sole crime there is to bring up children to inherit your money. It is like a battlefield at rest, nothing but corpses and the crows that pick them. Seneca consoled a mother who had lost her only child by reminding her how popular she would now be, for with us childlessness gives more power than it takes away. The Gracchi had been a family of twelve children. Probably not five families of such abundance could be found in Nero's age in patrician or equestrian Rome. Marriage, which had once been a lifelong economic union, was now, among a hundred thousand Romans, a passing adventure of no great spiritual significance— a loose contract for the mutual provision of physiological conveniences or political aid. To escape the testatory disabilities of the unmarried, some women took eunuchs as contraceptive husbands. 
Some entered into sham wedlock with poor men on the understanding that the wife need bear no children and might have as many lovers as she pleased. Contraception was practiced in both its mechanical and chemical forms. If these methods failed, there were many ways of procuring abortion. Philosophers and the law condemned it, but the finest families practiced it. Poor women, says Juvenal, endured the perils of childbirth and all the troubles of nursing, but how often does a gilded bed harbor a pregnant woman? So great is the skill, so powerful the drugs of the abortionist. Nevertheless, he tells the husband, Rejoice, give her the potion. For were she to bear the child, you might find yourself the father of an Ethiopian. In so enlightened a society, infanticide was rare. The infertility of the moneyed classes was so offset by immigration and the fecundity of the poor that the population of Rome and the empire continued to grow. Baloch estimated it at 800,000 for the Rome of the early empire, Gibbon at 1,200,000, Marquardt at 1,600,000. Baloch computed the population of the empire at 54 million, Gibbon at 120 million. The aristocracy was as numerous as before, but it was almost wholly altered in origin. We hear no more of the Emilii, Claudii, Fabii, Valerii. Only the Cornelii remained of the proud clans that, as late as Caesar, had strutted their Rome. Some had vanished through war or political execution, others had faded out through family limitation, physiological degeneration, or an impoverishment that had lowered them into the plebeian mass. Their places had been taken by Roman businessmen, Italian municipal dignitaries, and provincial nobles. In A.D. 56, a senator declared that most of the knights and many of the senators were descendants of slaves. After a generation or two, the new optimates adopted the ways of their predecessors, had fewer children and more luxuries, and surrendered to inundation from the east. First had come the Greeks, not so much from the mainland as from Cyrenaica, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor. They were eager, clever, facile semi-orientals, many of them small traders or import merchants, some of them scientists, writers, teachers, artists, physicians, musicians, actors, some sincerely, some venally devoted to philosophy, some of them able administrators and financiers, many of them without moral scruple, nearly all without religious belief. The majority had come as slaves and were not an ideal selection. Freed, they kept their external servility, their internal hatred and scorn of the rich Roman who lived intellectually on the cultural leavings of ancient Hellas. The streets of the capital were now noisy with restless and voluble Greeks. The Greek language was more often heard there than the Latin. If one wished to be read by all classes, he had to write in Greek. Nearly all the early Christians in Rome spoke Greek. So did the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Jews. A large colony of Egyptians, traders, artisans, artists, lived in the field of Mars. Syrians, thin, affable, shrewd, were everywhere in the capital, busy with trade, handicrafts, secretarial work, finance, and chicanery. The Jews were already in Caesar's time a substantial element in the population of the capital. A few had come as early as 140 B.C. Many had been brought to Rome as war captives after Pompey's campaign of 63 B.C. They were rapidly emancipated, partly by their industry and thrift, partly because their strict adherence to their religious customs was inconvenient for their masters. By 59 B.C. there were so many Jewish citizens in the assemblies that Cicero represented opposition to them as political temerity. In general, the Republican Party was hostile to the Jews, the populares and the emperors were friendly. By the end of the first century, they numbered some 20,000 in the capital. They lived mostly on the west side of the Tiber, where they suffered periodically from the floods. They worked on the nearby docks, engaged in handicrafts and retail business, and peddled goods through the city. There were some rich men among them, but only a few great merchants. Syrians and Greeks dominated international commerce. Synagogues were numerous in Rome, and each had its school, its scribes, and its gerousia, or senate of elders. The separatism of the Jews, their scorn of polytheism and image worship, the severity of their morals, their refusal to attend the theaters or the games, their strange customs and ceremonies, their poverty and resultant uncleanliness led to the usual racial antagonisms. Juvenal denounced their fertility, Tacitus their monotheism, Ammianus Marcellinus, their fondness for garlic. Bad feeling was heightened by the bloody capture of Jerusalem and the procession of Jewish captives and sacred spoils featured in the triumph of Titus and in the reliefs on his arch. Vespasian heaped insult upon injury by ordering that the half-shekel paid annually by the Jews of the dispersion for the upkeep of the temple at Jerusalem should henceforth be contributed yearly to the rebuilding of Rome. 
Nevertheless, many educated Romans admired Jewish monotheism. Some were converted to Judaism, and several, even of high family, observed the Jewish Sabbath as a day of worship and rest. If we add to the Greeks, the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Jews some Numidians, Nubians, and Ethiopians from Africa, a few Arabs, Parthians, Cappadocians, Armenians, Phrygians, and Bithynians from Asia, powerful barbarians from Dalmatia, Thrace, Dacia, and Germany, mustachioed nobles from Gaul, poets and peasants from Spain, and tattooed savages from Britain, we get an ethnic picture of a very heterogeneous and cosmopolitan Rome. Marshall marveled at the pliable facility with which the courtesans of Rome readjusted their language and their charms to so varied and polyglot a clientele. Juvenal complained that the Orontes, Syria's great river, was flowing into the Tiber, and Tacitus described the capital as the cesspool of the world. Oriental faces, ways, dress, words, gestures, quarrels, ideas, and faiths made up a great part of the city's seething life. By the third century, the government would be an Oriental monarchy. By the fourth, the religion of Rome would be an Oriental creed, and the masters of the world would kneel to the god of the slaves. There were elements of nobility in this motley crowd. It showed its contempt of Nero's mistress, Papia, when angry senators dared not speak, and it stormed the Senate House to protest the wholesale slaughter of Padanius Secundus's slaves. The simple virtues of the common man were not wanting in it, the family life of the Jews was exemplary, and the little Christian communities were troubling the pleasure-mad pagan world with their piety and their decency. But most of the inflowing peoples had literally been demoralized by uprootage from their native surroundings, cultures, and moral codes. Years of slavery had destroyed in them that self-respect which is the backbone of upright conduct, and daily friction with groups of different customs had worn away still more of their custom-made morality. If Rome had not engulfed so many men of alien blood in so brief a time, if she had passed all these newcomers through her schools instead of her slums, if she had treated them as men with a hundred potential excellences, if she had occasionally closed her gates to let assimilation catch up with infiltration, she might have gained a new racial and literary vitality from the infusion, and might have remained a Roman Rome, the voice and citadel of the West. The task was too great. The victorious city was doomed by the vastness and diversity of her conquests, her native blood was diluted in the ocean of her subjects, her educated classes were drawn down by the power of numbers to the culture of those who had been her slaves. Much breeding overcame good breeding. The fertile conquered became masters in the sterile master's house. 2. Education we do not know much of Roman childhood, but we can judge from Roman art and epitaphs that when children came they were loved not wisely but too well. Juvenal interrupts his wrath to write a tender passage on the good examples we must place before our children's eyes, the evil sights and sounds we must keep from them, the respect that we should show them even in the excesses of our love. Favorinus, in a discourse pre-mimicking Rousseau, begged mothers to nurse their babes. Seneca and Plutarch spoke to the same effect, which was slight indeed. Wet nursing was the rule in all families that could afford it, with no evident tragedies ensuing. Early education came from the nurse, who was usually Greek. There were fairy tales beginning, once upon a time a king and a queen. Primary schooling was still entrusted to private enterprise. Rich men often hired tutors for their children, but Quintilian, like Emerson, warned against this as depriving the child of formative friendships and stimulating rivalries. Ordinarily, the boy and girl of the free classes entered at the age of seven an elementary school, accompanied each way by a pedagogus, or child leader, to guard his safety and his morals. Such schools existed everywhere in the empire, even in small country towns. The wall scribblings at Pompeii suggested general literacy, and probably education was then as widespread in the Mediterranean world as at any time before or since. Both the pedagogus and the teacher, ludi magister, or schoolmaster, were usually Greek freedmen or slaves. In Horace's youth and native town, each pupil paid the teacher eight asses, or forty-eight cents, monthly. Three hundred fifty years later, Diocletian fixed the maximum fee for the elementary teacher at fifty denarii, or twenty dollars per month per pupil. We may judge from this the rise of the teacher and the fall of the ass. About the age of thirteen, the successful student of either sex was graduated into a secondary or high school. Rome had twenty of these in A.D. 130. Here the scholars studied more grammar, the Greek language, Latin and Greek literature, music, astronomy, history, mythology, and philosophy, generally through lecture commentaries on the classic poets. 
Up to this point, the girls seemed to have taken the same courses as the boys, but they often sought additional instruction in music and dancing. Since the secondary teachers, or grammatici, were nearly always Greek freedmen, they naturally emphasized Greek literature and history. Roman culture took on a Greek tint, until by the end of the second century almost all higher education was given in Greek, and Latin literature was swallowed up in the general Hellenic koine and culture of the age. The Roman equivalent of our college and university education was provided in the schools of the readers. The empire bristled with rhetoricians who spoke for their clients in court, or wrote speeches for them, or gave public lectures, or taught their art to pupils, or did all four. Many of them traveled from city to city, speaking on literature, philosophy, or politics, and giving exhibitions of how to handle any subject with oratorical skill. The younger Pliny tells of the Greek Isaeus, then sixty-three years old. He proposes several questions for discussion, gives his audience liberty to call for any they please, and sometimes even to say what side of it he should defend. Whereupon he rises, dons his gown, and begins. He introduces his theme with great propriety, his narrative is clear, his controversy ingenious, his logic forcible, and his rhetoric sublime. Such men might open a school, employ assistants, and gather a large student body. Pupils entered about their sixteenth year and paid fees as high as two thousand sesterces per course. The chief subjects were oratory, geometry, astronomy, and philosophy, which included much that is now termed science. These constituted a liberal education, that is, one designed for a well-to-do freeman, or homo liber, who would presumably have no physical work to perform. Petronius complained, as every generation does, that education unfitted youth for the problems of maturity. The schools are to blame for the gross foolishness of our young men, since in them they see or hear nothing at all of the affairs of everyday life. We can only say that they gave the assiduous student that clarity and quickness of thought which have distinguished the legal profession in all ages, and that capacity for unscrupulous eloquence which marked the orators of Rome. Apparently no degrees were granted in these schools. The student might stay as long and take as many courses as he liked. Aulus Gellius remained till he was twenty-five. Women also attended, some after marriage. Those who wished further instruction went to Athens for philosophy at its bubbling source, to Alexandria for medicine, or to Rhodes for the last subtleties of rhetoric. Cicero spent four thousand dollars a year maintaining his son in the University of Athens. By Vespasian's time, the schools of rhetoric had so grown in number and influence that the wily emperor thought it advisable to bring the more important ones in the capital under governmental control by paying their head professors a state salary, the highest being one hundred thousand sesterces, or ten thousand dollars a year. We do not know to how many teachers or cities Vespasian extended this subsidy. We hear of private endowments for higher education, such as the younger Pliny established at Comum. Trajan provided scholarships for five thousand boys who had less money than brains. By the reign of Hadrian, governmental financing of secondary schools had been adopted in many municipalities throughout the empire, and a pension fund had been set aside for retired teachers. Hadrian and Antoninus exempted the leading professors of each city from taxation and other civic burdens. Education reached its height while superstition grew, morals declined, and literature decayed. 3. The Sexes The moral life of youth was carefully guarded in the girl, leniently supervised in the young man. The Roman, like the Greek, readily condoned the resort of men to prostitutes. The profession was legalized and restricted. Brothels, or lupinaria, were kept by law outside the city walls and could open only at night. Prostitutes, or meretrices, were registered by the ediles and were required to wear the toga instead of the stola. Some women enrolled as prostitutes to avoid the legal penalties of detected adultery. Fees were adjusted to bring promiscuity within the reach of every pocketbook. We have heard of the quarter of an ass woman. But there was now a rising number of educated courtesans who sought to win patrons by poetry, singing, music, dancing, and cultured conversation. One did not have to go outside the walls to find these or other ladies of easy persuasion. Ovid assures us that they could be met under the porticos, at the circus, in the theater, as numerous as stars in the sky. And Juvenal found them in the precincts of temples, particularly that of Isis, a goddess lenient to love. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. The Story of Civilization Volume 3 Caesar and Christ Part 2 by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 2, Side 1. 
One did not have to go outside the walls to find these or other ladies of easy persuasion. Ovid assures us that they could be met under the porticos, at the circus, in the theater, as numerous as stars in the sky, and Juvenal found them in the precincts of temples, particularly that of Isis, a goddess lenient to love. Christian authors charged that prostitution was practiced within the cellars and between the altars of Roman temples. Male prostitutes were also available. Condemned by law, tolerated by custom, homosexualism flourished with oriental abandon. I am stricken with the heavy dart of love, sings Horace, and for whom? For Lysiscus, who claims in tenderness to outdo any woman. From this passion he can be freed only by another flame for some fair maid or slender youth. Marshall's choicest epigrams turn upon pederasty, and one of Juvenal's least publishable satires represents the complaint of a woman against this outrageous competition. Erotic poetry of indifferent worth and gender, the Priapia, circulated freely among sophisticated youths and immature adults. Marriage contended bravely with these rival outlets and, helped by anxious parents and matrimonial brokers, managed to find at least temporary husbands for nearly every girl. Unmarried women above nineteen were considered old maids, but they were rare. The betrothed couple seldom saw each other. There was no courtship, not even a word for it. Seneca complained that everything else was tested before purchase, but not the bride by the groom. Sentimental attachment before marriage was uncommon. Love poetry was addressed to married women or to women whom the poet never thought of marrying. And women's escapades came after marriage, as under similar conditions in medieval and modern France. The elder Seneca assumed widespread adultery among Roman women, and his philosopher's son thought that a married woman content with two lovers was a paragon of fidelity. Pure women, sang the cynical Ovid, are only those who have not been asked, and a man who is angry at his wife's amours is a mere rustic. These may be literary conceits. More reliable is the simple epitaph of Quintus Vespillo to his wife. Seldom do marriages last without divorce until death, but ours continued happily for forty-one years. Juvenal tells of a woman who married eight times in five years. Having been wed for property or politics rather than for love, some women considered their duty fulfilled if they surrendered their dowries to their husbands and their persons to their lovers. Did we not agree, an adulteress and juvenile explained to her unexpected husband, that we should both do as we liked? The emancipation of women was as complete then as now, barring the formalities of the franchise and the letter of dead laws. Legislation kept women subject. Custom made them free. In a number of cases, emancipation, as in our time, meant industrialization. Some women worked in shops or factories, especially in the textile trades. Some became lawyers and doctors. Some became politically powerful. The wives of provincial governors reviewed and addressed troops. The Vestal Virgins secured political appointments for their friends, and the women of Pompeii announced their political preferences on the walls. Conservatives moaned and gloated over the apparent fulfillment of Cato's warning that if women achieved equality, they would turn it into mastery. Juvenal was horrified to find women actresses, athletes, gladiators, poets. Marshall described Juvenal found them in the precincts of temples, particularly that of Isis, a goddess lenient to love. The streets in sedan chairs, exposing themselves on every side to the view. They conversed with men in porticos, parks, gardens, and temple courts. They accompanied them to private or public banquets, to the amphitheater and the theater, where their bare shoulders, said Ovid, give you something charming to contemplate. It was a gay, colorful, multisexual society that would have astonished the Periclean Greeks. In the spring, fashionable women filled the boats, shores, and villas of Baiae and other resorts with their laughter, their proud beauty, their amorous audacities, and political intrigue. Old men denounced them longingly. Frivolous or immoral women were then, as now, a conspicuous minority. Quite as numerous, though not always distinct, were the ladies who fell in love with art, religion, or literature. Sulpicia's verses were thought worthy of being handed down with those of Tibullus. They were highly erotic, but as they were addressed to her husband, they were almost virtuous. Marshall's friend Theophila was a philosopher, a real expert on the Stoic and Epicurean systems. Some women busied themselves in philanthropy and social service, gave temples, theaters, and porticos to their towns, and contributed as patronesses to collegia. An inscription at Lanuvium speaks of a curia mulierum, an assembly of women. Rome had a conventus matronarum, perhaps Italy had a national federation of women's clubs. 
In any case, after reading Martial and Juvenal, we are disconcerted to find so many good women in Rome. Octavia, faithful to Antony through every betrayal, and rearing devotedly his exotic children. Antonia, her loving daughter, the chaste widow of Drusus, and the perfect mother of Germanicus. Melonia, who publicly reproved Tiberius for his wickedness and then killed herself. Aria Pita, who, when Cecina Petus was ordered by Claudius to die, plunged a dagger into her breast and, dying, handed the weapon to her husband with the assuring words, It does not hurt. Paulina, who tried to die with Seneca. Polita, who, when Nero had her husband executed, began to starve herself, and when the same sentence came to her father, joined him in suicide. Epicarus, the freedwoman who suffered every torture rather than betray the conspiracy of Piso. The unnumbered women who concealed and protected their husbands in the proscriptions, went with them into exile, or like Fania, wife of Helvidius, defended them at great risk and cost. These alone would tip the scale against all the trollops of Marshall's epigrams and Juvenal's stings. Behind such heroines were the nameless wives whose marital fidelity and maternal sacrifices sustained the whole structure of Roman life. The old Roman virtues, pietas, gravitas, simplicitas, the mutual devotion of parents and children, a sober sense of responsibility, an avoidance of extravagance or display, still survived in Roman homes. The refined and wholesome families described in Pliny's letters did not suddenly begin with Nerva and Trajan. They had existed quietly through the age of the despots. They had survived the espionage of emperors, the debasement of a helpless populace, the vulgarity of the demimonde. We catch glimpses of such homes in the epitaphs of mate to mate and of parents to children. Here, reads one, lie the bones of Erbilia, wife of Primus. She was dearer to me than life. She died at twenty-three, beloved of all. Farewell, my consolation. And another, to my dear wife with whom I passed eighteen happy years, for love of her I have sworn never to remarry. We can picture these women in their homes, spinning wool, scolding and educating their children, directing servants, carefully administering their modest funds, and sharing with their husbands in the immemorial worship of the household gods. Despite her immorality, it was Rome, not Greece, that raised the family to new heights in the ancient world. 4. Dress If we may judge from a few hundred statues, the Roman males of Nero's day were stouter and softer in figure and features than the men of the young republic. World rule kept many of them characteristically hard and stern, fearful rather than lovable. But food and wine and sloth had rounded many others into shapes that would have scandalized the Scipios. They still shaved, or more usually were shaved by barbers, or tonsores. A youth's first shave was a holy day in his life. Often he piously dedicated his original whiskers to a god. Common Romans continued the Republican tradition and had their hair cut close or even cropped, but an increasing number of dandies had theirs curled. Mark Antony and Domitian are so represented. Many men wore wigs. Some had the semblance of hair painted on their pates. All classes, indoors and out, now dressed in a simple tunic or blouse. The toga was donned only for formal occasions, by clients at receptions, and by patricians in the Senate or at the games. Caesar wore a purple toga as a sign of office. Many dignitaries imitated him, but soon the purple robe became a prerogative of the emperors. There were no irksome trousers, no elusive buttons, no drooping hose— but in the second century men began to wrap their legs with fasciae, or bands. Footwear ranged from the sandal, a leather or cork sole attached nippon-wise by a thong between the big and second toes, to the high shoe of full leather, or of leather and cloth, usually worn with the toga in synthesis, or full dress. Roman women of the early empire, as seen in frescoes and statuary, and on coins, were much like the women of the United States at the beginning of the twentieth century, except that they were nearly all brunette. Their figures were moderately slender, and their robes gave their carriage a hypnotic grace. They knew the value of sunshine, exercise, and fresh air. Some brandished dumbbells, some swam assiduously, some dieted, others reined in their bosoms with stays. Feminine hair was usually combed back and bound in a knot behind the neck, often enclosed in a net and tied with a band or ribbon over the head. Later fashions demanded a loftier coiffure, supported by wire and elaborated with a wig of blonde hair imported from German maids. A woman of fashion might occupy several slaves for hours in manicuring her nails and dressing her hair. Cosmetics were as varied as today. Juvenal describes beautification as one of the most important technologies of the age. Physicians, queens, and poets wrote volumes on the subject. A Roman lady's boudoir was an arsenal of cosmetic instruments. Tweezers, scissors, razors, files, brushes, combs, strigils, hairnets, wigs, 
and jars or files of perfumes, creams, oils, pastes, pumice stone, soaps. Depilatories were used to remove hair, scented ointments to wave it or fix it. Many women applied to their faces a nocturnal mask of dough and ass's milk in a mixture concocted by Papia, who found it helpful in repairing a bad complexion. Therefore, asses followed her in all her travels. Sometimes she took a whole herd with her and bathed in asses' milk. Faces were whitened or rouged with paint. Brows and eyelashes were dyed black or painted over. Sometimes the veins of the temple were traced with delicate lines of blue. Juvenile complained that a rich woman reeks of poppy and ointments that stick to the lips of her unfortunate husband, who never sees her face. Ovid found these arts disillusioning and advised the ladies to conceal them from their lovers, all but the combing of their hair, which entranced him. Delicate lingerie was now added to the simple feminine garments of pre hannibalic Rome. Scarfs fell over the shoulders, and veils made an alluring mystery of the face. In winter, soft furs caressed affluent forms. Silk was so common that men as well as women wore it. Silk and linen were colored with costly dyes. Romans often paid a thousand denarii for a pound of double-dyed Tyrian wool. Embroideries of gold and silver thread decorated dresses, curtains, carpets, and coverlets. Women's shoes were made of soft leather or cloth, sometimes elaborately cut into an open-work pattern. They might be trimmed with gold and beset with jewelry, and high heels were often added to remedy the shortcomings of nature. Jewelry was an important part of a woman's equipment. Rings, earrings, necklaces, amulets, bracelets, breast chains, brooches were necessities of life. Lalia Paulina once wore a dress covered from head to foot with emeralds and pearls, and carried with her the receipts showing that they cost forty million sesterces. Pliny describes over a hundred varieties of precious stones used in Rome. Expert imitations of these provided a busy industry. Roman emeralds of glass were superior to modern forgeries and were sold as genuine by jewelers as late as the 19th century. Men as well as women were fond of large and conspicuous stones. One senator had in his ring an opal as big as a filbert. Hearing of it, Antony had him proscribed. He escaped, carrying two million sesterces on his finger. Doubtless jewelry was then as often a hedge against inflation or revolution. Silver plate was now common in all but the lower classes. Tiberius and later emperors issued edicts against luxury, but these could not be enforced and were soon ignored. Tiberius yielded and confessed that the extravagance of patricians and parvenus gave employment to the artisans of Rome and the East and allowed provincial tribute to flow back from the capital. Without luxury, he said, how could Rome, how could the provinces, live? Roman dress was not more luxurious than that of modern women and far less gorgeous and costly than the garb of medieval lords. Fashion did not change in Rome as rapidly as in modern cities. A good garment might be worn a lifetime and remain in style. But compared with the standards of the Republic before Lucullus and Pompey had brought in the loot and hedonism of the East, upper-class Rome was now an Epicurean paradise of fine clothing, varied food, elegant furniture, and stately homes. Shorn of political leadership, almost of political power, the aristocracy retired from the Curia to its palaces and abandoned itself, with no morals but philosophy, to the pursuit of pleasure and the art of life. 5. A Roman Day The luxuries of the home far outran the luxuries of dress. Floors of marble and mosaic, columns of polychrome marble, alabaster, onyx, walls painted with brilliant murals or encrusted with costly stones, ceilings sometimes coffered in gold or plate glass, Tables with citrus wood standing on ivory legs. Divans decorated with tortoiseshell, ivory, silver, or gold. Alexandrian brocades or Babylonian coverings, for which common millionaires paid 800,000, Nero, 4 million sesterces. Beds of bronze fitted with mosquito netting, candelabra of bronze, marble, or glass. Statues and paintings and objects of art. Vases of Corinthian bronze or murine glass. These were some of the ornaments that crowded the mansions of Nero's age. In such a home, the master lived as in a museum. Slaves had to be bought to guard this wealth, and others to guard these. Some houses had four hundred of them, engaged in attendance, supervision, or industry. The life of the great man, even in the privacy of his rooms, was spent in the publicity of his slaves. To eat with a servant at each elbow, to undress with a slave at each boot, to relax with a menial at every door, this is not paradise. To assure the misery of wealth, the great man began his day about seven by receiving his clients and parasites and offering his cheeks to their kisses. After two hours of this, he might breakfast. Then he received and returned formal visits of his friends. Etiquette required that one must repay the calls of every friend, help him in his lawsuits and candidacies, attend the betrothal of his daughter, 
the coming of age of his son, the reading of his poems, the signing of his will. These and other social obligations were performed with a grace and courtesy not exceeded in any civilization. Then the great man went to the Senate, or labored on some governmental commission, or attended to his personal affairs. For the man of modest means, life was simpler, but not less arduous. After the social calls of the early morning, he gave himself to his business till noon. Humble folk were at work by sunrise. As there was little night life, the Roman took full advantage of the day. A light luncheon came at noon, dinner at three or four. The higher the class, the later the hour. After luncheon and a siesta, the peasant and the employed proletaire returned to work till nearly sunset. Others sought recreation outdoors or in the public baths. The Romans of the Empire took their bathing more religiously than their gods. Like the Japanese, they could bear public better than private smells, and no ancient people but the Egyptians rivaled them in cleanliness. They carried handkerchiefs, or sudaria, to wipe away their sweat, and brushed their teeth with powders and paste. In the early Republic, a bath every eighth day had sufficed. Now one had to bathe daily or risk a marshal's epigram. Even the rustic says Galen bathed every day. Most homes had bathtubs, rich houses had bathroom suites, sparkling with marble, glass, or silver fixtures and taps. But the majority of free Romans relied on the public baths. Ordinarily, these were privately owned. In 33 BC, there were 170 in Rome. In the 4th century AD, there were 856, besides 1,352 public swimming pools. More popular than such establishments were the great baths built by the state, managed by concessionaires and staffed by hundreds of slaves. These thermi, or hot waters, erected by Agrippa, Nero, Titus, Trajan, Caracalla, Alexander Severus, Diocletian, and Constantine, were monuments of the state's socialistic splendor. The baths of Nero had 1,600 marble seats and accommodated 1,600 bathers at one time. The baths of Caracalla and those of Diocletian accommodated 3,000 each. Admission was open to any citizen for a quadrants, or one and a half cents. The government met the balance of the cost, and apparently oil and service were included in the fee. The baths were open from daybreak to 1 p.m. for women, from 2 to 8 p.m. for men. But mixed bathing was allowed by most of the emperors. Normally, the visitor went first to a dressing room to change his clothes, then to the palestra to box, wrestle, run, jump, hurl the disc or the spear, or play ball. One ball game was like our medicine ball. In another, two opposed groups scrambled for a ball and carried it forward against each other with all the enterprise of a modern university. Sometimes, professional ball players would come to the baths and give exhibitions. Oldsters who preferred to take their exercise by proxy went to massage rooms and had a slave rub away their fat. Passing to the baths proper, the citizen entered the tepidarium, in this case a warm air room, thence he went on to the caladarium or hot air room, if he wished to perspire still more freely, he moved into the laconicum and gasped in superheated steam. Then he took a warm bath and washed himself with a novelty learned from the Gauls, soap, made from tallow and the ashes of the beech or the elm. These warm rooms were the most popular and gave the baths their Greek name. Probably they were Rome's attempt to forestall or mitigate rheumatism and arthritis. The bather progressed to the frigidarium and took a cold bath, he might also dip into the piscina, or swimming pool. Then he had himself rubbed with some oil or ointment, usually made from the olive. This was not washed off, but merely scraped off with a strigil and dried with a towel, so that some oil might be returned to the skin in place of that which the warm baths had removed. The bather seldom left the thermi at this point, for these were clubhouses as well as baths. They provided rooms for games like dice and chess, galleries of painting and statuary, Excedrae, where friends might sit and converse, libraries and reading rooms, and halls where a musician or a poet might give a recital, or a philosopher might explain the world. In these afternoon hours after the bath, Roman society found its chief meeting point. Both sexes mingled freely in gay but polite association, flirtation, or discussion. There, and at the games and in the parks, the Romans could indulge their passion for talk, their fondness for gossip, and learn all the news and scandal of the day. If they wished, they could have dinner in the restaurant at the baths, but most of them dined at home. Perhaps because of the lassitude caused by exercise and warm bathing, the custom was to recline at meals. Once the women had sat apart while the men reclined, now the women reclined beside the men. The triclinium, or dining room, was so named because it usually contained three couches, arranged in square magnet form around a serving table. Each couch normally accommodated three persons. 
the diner rested his head on his left arm and his arm on a cushion while the body extended diagonally away from the serving table. The poorer classes continued to live chiefly on grains, dairy products, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Pliny lists a wide assortment of vegetables in the Roman dietary, from garlic to rape. The well-to-do ate meat, with the usual superabundance of reckless carnivores. Pork was the favorite flesh food. Pliny praises the pig for furnishing fifty different dainties. Pork sausages, or botuli, were hawked through the streets in portable ovens, as on our highways today. When one dined at a banquet, he expected rarer foods. The banquet began at four and lasted till late in the night or till the next day. The tables were strewn with flowers and parsley, the air was scented with exotic perfumes, the couches were soft with cushions, the servants were stiff with livery. Between the appetizer, or gustatio, and the dessert, or secunda mensa, second table, came the luxury dishes on which the host and his chef prided themselves. Rare fish, rare birds, rare fruit appealed to the curiosity as well as the palate. Mullets were bought at a thousand sesterces a pound. Asinius Sealer paid eight thousand for one. Juvenal growled that a fisherman cost less than a fish. As an added delight for the guests, the mullet might be brought in alive and boiled before their eyes, that they might enjoy the varied colors it took in the agony of death. Bedius Pollio raised these sesquipedalian fish in a large tank and fed them with unsatisfactory slaves. Eels and snails were considered dainties, but the law forbade the eating of dormice. The wings of ostriches, the tongues of flamingos, the flesh of songbirds, the livers of geese were favorite dishes. Apicius, a famous epicure under Tiberius, invented the pâté de foie gras by fattening the livers of sows with a diet of figs. Custom allowed the diner to empty his stomach with an emetic after a heavy banquet. Some gluttons performed this operation during the meal and then returned to appease their hunger. Vomunt ut edant, edunt ut vomant, said Seneca. They vomit to eat and eat to vomit. Such behavior was exceptional and no worse than the braggart drunkenness of American conventioneers. Pleasanter was the custom of presenting gifts to the guests or letting flowers or perfumes fall upon them from the ceiling or entertaining them with music, dancing, poetry, or drama. Conversation, loosened with wine and stimulated by the presence of the other sex, would conclude the evening. We must not think of such banquets as the customary end of a Roman day, or as more frequent in a Roman's life than the dinners cum oratory so popular today. History, like the press, misrepresents life because it loves the exceptional and shuns the newsless career of an honest man or the quiet routine of a normal day. Most Romans were like our neighbors and ourselves. They rose reluctantly, ate too much, worked too much, played too little, loved much, seldom hated, quarreled a bit, talked a great deal, dreamed waking dreams, and slept. 6. A Roman Holiday 1. The Stage Having many gods to worship and many provinces to milk, Rome had many holidays, once solemn with religious pageantry, now gay with secular delight. In summer, many of the poor fled from the humid heat to suburban or riverside taverns or groves, drinking, dining, dancing, and loving in the open air. Those who could afford it might go to the bathing resorts that lined the western coast or sport with the rich on Baie's Bay. In winter, it was the ambition of every caste-conscious Roman to go south, if possible to Regium or Tarentum, and return with a coat of tan as a certificate of class. But those who stayed in Rome found entertainment plentiful and cheap. Recitations, lectures, concerts, mimes, plays, athletic contests, prize fights, horse races, chariot races, mortal combats of men with men or beasts, not quite sham naval battles on artificial lakes, never was a city more bountifully amused. In the early empire there were in the Roman year seventy-six festival days on which ludi were performed. Of these, fifty-five were ludi shenici, devoted to plays or mimes. Twenty-two were games in the circus, the stadium, or the amphitheater. The number of ludi increased until by A.D. 354 they were presented on 175 days in the year. This meant no growth in the Roman drama. On the contrary, the drama decayed while the stage prospered. Original dramas were now written to be read rather than played. The theater contented itself with old Roman and Greek tragedies, old Roman comedies, and mimes. Stars dominated the stage and made huge fortunes. Aesopus, the tragedian, after a life of assiduous extravagance, left twenty million sesterces. Rocius, the comic actor, made five hundred thousand sesterces a year and became so rich that for several seasons he acted without pay, a scorn of money that made this ex-slave the lion of aristocratic gatherings. 
The games of the circus and the amphitheater absorbed the interest and coarsened the taste of the public, and the Roman drama died in the arena, another martyr to Roman holidays. Through emphasis on acting and scenery rather than plot or thought, the drama gradually yielded the stage to mimes and pantomimes. The mime contained little dialogue, chose its themes from lowly life, and relied on character sketches presented with skillful mimicry. Freedom of speech, having disappeared from the assemblies and the forum, survived for a moment in these brief farces, when a mime would risk his head to earn applause by a double entendre aimed at an emperor or his favorites. Caligula had an actor burned alive in the amphitheater for such an illusion. On the day when the parsimonious Vespasian was buried, a mime imitated the obsequies. During the procession, the corpse sat up and asked how much this funeral was costing the state. Ten million sesterces was the answer. Give me a hundred thousand, said the imperial cadaver, and throw me into the Tiber. The mime alone admitted women as actors. As these were thereby automatically classed as prostitutes, they had nothing to lose by obscenity. On special occasions, like the Floralia, the audience called upon these performers to remove every garment. Both sexes attended these performances, as in our time. Cicero found brides there, and they found him. By suppressing speech altogether and raising the theme to subjects from classic literature, the pantomime, all mimicry, was evolved out of the mime. There was a profit in foregoing language. The polyglot population of Rome, of which a considerable part could understand only the simplest Latin, followed the action better when unburdened with words. In 21 BC, two actors, Pylades of Cilicia and Bathyllus of Alexandria, came to Rome and introduced the pantomime, already popular in the Hellenistic East, by performing one-act plays composed only of music, action, gesture, and dance. Tired of dramas in ancient and pompous verse, Rome welcomed the new art, thrilled to the grace and skill of the actors, enjoyed the gorgeousness of their costumes, the splendor or humor of their masks, the trained and dieted perfection of their figures, the oriental expressiveness of their hands, their quick and versatile impersonation of diverse characters, their sensuous enactment of erotic scenes, audiences divided into frantic cliques and clacks in support of rival favorites. Women of high station fell in love with the actors and pursued them with gifts and embraces, until one literally lost his head over Domitian's wife. The pantomime gradually drove all rivals but the mime from the Roman stage. The drama succumbed to the ballet. 2. Roman Music such a triumph was made possible by the high development of music and the dance. Under the Republic, dancing had been looked upon as disgraceful. The younger Scipio had compelled the closing of schools that taught music and dancing, and Cicero had remarked that only a lunatic would dance when sober. But the pantomimes made dancing a fashion, then a passion. Nearly every private home, says Seneca, had a dancing platform, echoing to the feet of men and women. Rich households now had a dancing master as well as a chef and a philosopher, as part of their equipment. As practiced in Rome, the dance involved the rhythmical movement of the hands and the upper body even more than of legs and feet. Women cultivated the art not only for its own attractiveness, but because it gave them flexibility and grace. The Romans loved music only less than power, money, women, and blood. Like nearly everything else in Rome's cultural life, her music came from Greece and had to fight its way against a conservatism that identified art with degeneration. In 115 BC, the censors had forbidden the playing of any instrument except the short Italian flute. A century later, the elder Seneca still considered music unmanly. But meanwhile, Varro had devoted a book to De Musica, and this treatise, together with its Greek sources, became the support of many Roman works on musical theory. Finally, the rich and sensuous Greek modes and instruments won the day over Roman awkwardness and simplicity, and music became a regular element in the education of women and frequently of men. By A.D. 50, it had captured all classes and sexes. Men as well as women spent whole days in hearing, composing, or singing airs. At last, even emperors climbed and descended scales, and the philosophic Hadrian, as well as the effeminate Nero, was proud of his skill on the lyre. Lyric poetry was intended to be sung with music, and music was seldom composed except for poetry. Ancient music was subordinated to the verse, whereas with us the music tends to overwhelm the words. Choral music was popular and was frequently heard at weddings, games, religious ceremonies, and funerals. Horace was deeply moved by the sight and sound of youths and maidens singing his Carmen Seculare. In such choruses all the voices sang the same note, though in different octaves, Part singing was apparently unknown. 
The basic instruments were the flute and the lyre. Our wind and string orchestras are still variations of these forms. The most heroic symphony is a judicious combination of puffing, plucking, scraping, and beating. The flute accompanied drama and was supposed to arouse emotion. The lyre attended song and was expected to elevate the soul. The flute was long, had many openings, and a greater range of expression than the modern instrument. The lyre and the kithra were like our harp, but took a greater variety of shapes. Among the Greeks they had been of modest size, but the Romans magnified them until Ammianus described kithras as large as carriages. In general, the Roman instruments, like ours, improved upon earlier ones chiefly in sonorousness and size. The strings of the lyre were made of gut or sinew and numbered up to eighteen. They were plucked with a plectrum or with the fingers, which alone could execute the quicker runs. From Alexandria, early in the first century, came the hydraulic organ with several registers, stops, and orders of pipes. Nero fell in love with it, and the calm Quintilian was impressed by its versatility and power. Formal concerts were given, and musical contests played a part in some public games. Even modest dinners required a bit of music. Marshall promises his guest at least a flute player. As for Trimalchio's feast, the tables are wiped in rhythm with song. Caligula had an orchestra and a chorus on his pleasure boat. At the pantomimes, symphonii were performed. That is, a chorus sang and danced to the accompaniment of an orchestra. Sometimes the actor would sing the solo parts, sometimes a professional singer, or contour, sang the words while the actor gestured or danced. It was not unheard of for a pantomime to be accompanied by three thousand singers and three thousand dancers. The orchestra was led by flutes, aided by lyres, cymbals, pipes, trumpets, syringes, and scabella, boards fastened to the player's feet and capable of producing a pandemonium even more frightful than that of a modern orchestra at the height of its powers. Seneca mentions harmony in the playing of individuals, but there is no sign that ancient orchestras used harmony contrapuntally. The accompaniment was usually on a higher note than the song, but it did not, so far as we know, pursue a distinct sequence. Virtuosi were plentiful and minor performers abounded. Talent converged from all the provinces upon the center of the world's gold, while the institution of slavery permitted the training of choruses and orchestras on a large but inexpensive scale. Many rich establishments had their own musicians and sent the most promising to famous teachers for advanced instruction. Some became kitharidi and gave concerts in which they sang and played the lyre. Some specialized in singing, usually composing their own songs. Some gave concerts on the organ or the flute like Canis, who boasted in the style of Beethoven that his music could alleviate sorrow, increase joy, elevate piety, and fan the flame of love. These professionals went on extended concert tours throughout the empire, earning plaudits, fees, public monuments, and infatuations. Some, says Juvenal, sold their love for an added honorarium. Women fought for the plectra with which famous players had touched the strings and offered sacrifice at the altars for the victory of their musical favorites in the Neronian and Capitoline games. We can faintly picture the imposing scene when musicians and poets from all the realm competed before great throngs, and the breathless winners received the crown of oak leaves from the emperor's hands. We do not know enough of Roman music to describe its quality. Apparently it was louder, fuller, wilder than the Greek. A weird oriental quality had entered it from Egypt, Asia Minor, and Syria. Old men mourned that recent composers were abandoning the restraint and dignity of the classic style, and were disordering the soul and nerves of youth with extravagant airs and noisy instruments. Certainly no people ever loved music more. The songs of the stage were caught up by a lively and volatile populace and rang through the streets and windows of Rome. The complex airs of the pantomimes were so fondly remembered that devotees could tell from the first notes of a strain to what play and scene it belonged. Rome made no real contribution to music, except perhaps through the better organization of performers into larger groups but it honored music with exuberant usage and resilient response. It gathered the musical heritage of the ancient world into its temples, theaters, and homes. And when it passed, it left to the church the instruments and elements of the music that moves and deepens us today. 3. The Games Now that war seemed banished, the great games were the most exciting event of the Roman year. They took place chiefly in celebration of religious festivals, of the Great Mother, of Ceres, of Flora, of Apollo, of Augustus. They might be the plebeian games to appease the plebs, or Roman games in honor of the city and its goddess Roma. 
They might be offered in connection with triumphs, candidacies, elections, or imperial birthdays. They might, like the Ludi Seculares, commemorate some cycle in Roman history. Like the games of Achilles in honor of Patroclus, those of Italy had originally been offered as a sacrifice to dead men. At the funeral of Brutus Pera, in 264 BC, his sons gave a spectacle of three duels. At the funeral of Marcus Lepidus in 216 BC, twenty-two combats were fought, and in 174 BC, Titus Flaminius celebrated his father's death with gladiatorial games in which seventy-four men fought. The simplest public games were athletic contests, usually held in a stadium. The performers, mostly professionals and aliens, ran foot races, threw the discus, wrestled, and boxed. The Roman public, accustomed to sanguinary gladiatorial exhibitions, only mildly favored athletics, but relished the prize fights in which massive Greeks fought almost to the death with gloves reinforced at the knuckles with an iron band three-quarters of an inch thick. The gentle Virgil describes a milder pugilistic feast in almost modern terms. Then the son of Anchises brought out hide gloves of equal weight and bound the hands of the antagonists. Each took his stand, poised on tiptoe and raising one arm. Drawing their heads back from the blows, they spar, hand against hand. They aim many hard blows, wildly pummeling each other's sides and chests, ears and brows and cheeks, making the air resound with their strokes. Entellus puts forth his right. Darius slips aside in a nimble dodge. Entellus furiously drives Darius headlong over the arena, redoubling his blows, now with the right hand, now with the left. Then Aeneas put an end to the fray. Darius' mates led him to the ships with his knees shaking, his head swaying from side to side, his mouth spitting teeth and blood. Still more exciting were the races at the Circus Maximus. On two successive days, forty-four races were run, some of horses and jockeys, some of light two-wheeled chariots drawn by two, three, or four horses abreast. The cost was met by rival stables owned by rich men. The jockeys, drivers, and chariots of each stable were costumed or painted in distinctive colors, white, green, red, or blue. And all Rome, as the time for these contests approached, divided into factions named from these colors, and particularly the red and the green. At home, in school, at lectures, in the forums, half the talk was about favorite jockeys and charioteers. Their pictures were everywhere, their victories were announced in the Acta Diurna. Some of them made great fortunes, some had statues raised to them in public squares. On the appointed day, 180,000 men and women moved in festive colors to the enormous hippodrome. Enthusiasm rose to a mania. Excited partisans smelled the dung of the animals to assure themselves that the horses of their favorite drivers had been properly fed. The spectators passed by the shops and brothels that lined the outer walls. They filed through hundreds of entrances and sorted themselves with the sweat of anxiety into the great horseshoe of seats. Vendors sold them cushions, for the seats were mostly of hard wood, and the program would last all day. Senators and other dignitaries had special seats of marble, ornamented with bronze. Behind the imperial box was a suite of luxurious rooms, where the emperor and his family might eat, drink, rest, bathe, and sleep. Gambling was feverish, and fortunes passed from hand to hand as the day advanced. From openings under the stands emerged the horses, the jockeys and drivers, and the chariots. And each faction shook the stands with applause as its favorite color appeared. The charioteers, mostly slaves, wore bright tunics and shining helmets. In one hand was a whip, and in their belts a knife to cut, in accident, the traces tied to their waists. Along the middle of the elliptical arena ran the spina, thorn or spine, an island a thousand feet long adorned with statues and obelisks. At one end were the metai, or measures, circular pillars that served as goals. The usual length of a chariot race was seven circuits, about five miles. The test of skill lay in making the turns at the goals as swiftly and sharply as safety would allow. Collisions were frequent there, and men, chariots, and animals mingled in fascinating tragedy. As the horses or chariots clattered to the final post, the hypnotized audience rose like a swelling sea, gesticulated, waved handkerchiefs, shouted and prayed, groaned and cursed, or exulted in almost supernatural ecstasy. The applause that greeted the winner could be heard far beyond the limits of the city. The most stupendous of all the spectacles offered at Roman celebrations was the sham naval battle. The first large Naumachia was given by Caesar in a basin excavated for the purpose on the outskirts of the city. Augustus marked the dedication of his temple to Mars the Avenger by presenting 3,000 fighters in a replica of the Battle of Salamis on an artificial lake 1,800 by 1,200 feet. Claudius, as already noted, celebrated the completion of the Fusine Tunnel, 
with a conflict of triremes and quadriremes involving 19,000 men. They fought with a disappointing courtesy, and soldiers had to be sent among them to ensure a proper shedding of blood. At the dedication of the Colosseum, Titus had its arena flooded and reproduced that battle of the Corinthians and Corsairians which had brought on the Peloponnesian War. The combatants in these engagements were war captives or condemned criminals. They butchered one another until one side or the other was killed off. The victors, if they had cut bravely, might be granted freedom. The games reached their climax in the contests of animals and gladiators in the amphitheater, after Vespasian in the Colosseum. The arena was an immense wooden floor strewn with sand. Parts of this floor could be lowered and then quickly raised with a change of scene, and at brief notice the whole floor could be covered with water. Large chambers beneath it held the animals, machines, and men scheduled for the program of the day. Just above the arena's guard wall was a podium or marble terrace, on whose ornate seats sat senators, priests, and high officials. Above this was the suggestum, a high loge where the emperor and empress sat on thrones of ivory and gold, surrounded by their family and retinue. Behind this aristocratic circle sat the equestrian order, in twenty tiers of seats. A lofty intervening wall, decorated with statuary, separated the upper orders from the lower classes in the stands above. Any free person, male or female, could come, and apparently no admission was charged. The crowd took advantage of the emperor's presence, here and at the circus, to shout its wishes to him. For the pardon of a prisoner or a fallen fighter, the emancipation of a courageous slave, the appearance of favorite gladiators, or some minor reform. From the topmost wall, awnings could be unrolled to the arena railing to shade such parts of the assemblage as might suffer from the sun. Here and there, fountains threw up jets of scented water to cool the air. When noon came, most of the spectators hurried below to eat lunch. Concessionaires were on hand to sell them food and sweets and drinks. On occasion, the entire multitude might be fed by the order and bounty of the emperor, or dainties and presents might be scattered among the scrambling crowd. If, as sometimes occurred, contests were presented at night, a circle of lights could be lowered over the arena and the spectators. Bands of musicians performed in the interludes and accompanied the crises of the combats with exciting crescendo strains. The simplest event in the amphitheater was an exhibition of exotic animals. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. The simplest event in the amphitheater was an exhibition of exotic animals. Gathered from all the known world, elephants, lions, tigers, crocodiles, hippopotami, lynxes, apes, panthers, bears, boars, wolves, giraffes, ostriches, stags, leopards, antelopes, and rare birds were kept in the zoological gardens of emperors and rich men and were trained to skillful exploits or merry pranks. Apes were taught to ride dogs, drive chariots, or act in plays. Bulls let boys dance on their backs. Sea lions were conditioned to bark in answer to their individual names. Elephants danced to cymbals struck by other elephants, or walked a rope, or sat down to table, or wrote Greek or Latin letters. Animals might be merely paraded in bright or humorous costumes. Usually, however, they were made to fight one another, or with men, or they were hunted to death with arrows and javelins. In one day, under Nero, four hundred tigers fought with bulls and elephants— on another day, under Caligula, four hundred bears were slain. At the dedication of the Colosseum, five thousand animals died. If the animals wished to compromise, they were stung to combat by lashes, darts, and hot irons. Claudius made a division of the Praetorian Guard fight panthers. Nero made them fight four hundred bears and three hundred lions. Combats of a bull with a man, long popular in Crete and Thessaly, were introduced into Rome by Caesar, and were a frequent spectacle in the amphitheater. Condemned criminals, sometimes dressed in skins to resemble animals, were thrown to beasts made ravenous for the occasion. Death in such cases came with all possible agony, and wounds were so deep that physicians used such men to study internal anatomy. All the world knows the story of Androcles, the runaway slave. Captured, he was flung into the arena with a lion, but this lion, we are told, remembered that Androcles had once drawn a thorn from its paw and refused to injure him. Androcles was pardoned and made a living by exhibiting his civilized lion in taverns. The condemned man was sometimes required to play in no make-believe way some famous tragic role. He might represent Medea's rival and be garbed in a handsome robe that would suddenly burst into flame and consume him. 
He might be burned to death on a pyre as Heracles. He might, if we may believe Tertullian, be publicly castrated as Atus. He might play Mucius Sivola and hold his hand over burning coals until it was shriveled up. He might be Icarus and fall from the sky into no merciful ocean but a crowd of wild beasts. He might be Pacifii and bear the embraces of a bull. One victim was dressed as Orpheus. He was sent with his lyre into an arena set as a pleasant grove of trees and brooks. Suddenly hungry animals emerged from recesses and tore him to pieces. Loreolus, a robber, was crucified in the arena for the amusement of the populace. But as he took too long in dying, a bear was brought in and was persuaded to eat him piece by piece as he hung upon the cross. Marshall describes the spectacle with fascination and approval. The supreme events were the combats of armed men, in duels or en masse. The contestants were war captives, condemned criminals, or disobedient slaves. The right of victors to slaughter their prisoners was generally accepted throughout antiquity, and the Romans thought themselves generous in giving captives a chance for their lives in the arena. Men convicted of capital crimes were brought to Rome from all parts of the empire, were sent to gladiatorial schools, and soon appeared in the games. If they fought with exceptional bravery, they might win immediate freedom. If they merely survived, they had to fight again and again as holidays recurred. If they lasted three years, they were released into slavery. If then they satisfied their masters for two years, they were freed. Crimes entailing condemnation to a gladiatorial career were limited to murder, robbery, arson, sacrilege, and mutiny, but sedulous governors responsive to imperial needs might override these restrictions if the arena ran short of men. Even knights and senators might be sentenced to fight as gladiators, and sometimes a passion for applause led members of the equestrian order to offer themselves as volunteers. Not a few men, under the lure of adventure and danger, enlisted in the gladiatorial schools. Such schools had existed in Rome as early as 105 BC. Under the empire there were four of them there, several more in Italy and one in Alexandria. Rich men in Caesar's day had their own schools for preparing slaves to be gladiators. They used the graduates as bodyguards in peace and as aides in war, hired them out to fight at private banquets, and lent them to the games. On entering a professional gladiatorial school, many a novice took an oath to suffer himself to be whipped with rods, burned with fire, and killed with steel. Training and discipline were rigorous. Diet was supervised by physicians, who prescribed barley to develop muscle. Violation of rules was punished by scourging, branding, and confinement in chains. Not all of these candidates for death were discontented with their lot. Some were elated with victories and thought of their prowess rather than their peril. Some complained that they were not allowed to fight often enough. Such men hated Tiberius for giving so few games. They had the stimulus and consolation of fame. Their names were daubed by admirers upon public walls. Women fell in love with them. Poets sang of them. Painters portrayed them. Sculptors carved for posterity their iron biceps and terrifying frowns. Many, however, were despondent at their imprisonment, their brutalizing routine, and their brief expectation of life. Several committed suicide, one by stuffing his throat with a sponge used to clean privies, another by inserting his head between the spokes of a moving wheel, several by harakiri in the arena. On the eve of their combat they were given a rich banquet. The rougher ones ate and drank heartily, others took sad leave of their wives and children. Those who were Christians joined in a last agape, or supper of love. The next morning they entered the arena in festal dress and paraded from one end of it to the other. They were usually armed with swords or spears or knives, and armored with bronze helmets, shields, shoulder plates, breastplates, and greaves. They were classified according to their weapons. Retiarii, who entangled their opponents with nets and dispatched them with daggers. Secutores, skilled in pursuit with shield and sword. Laqueatores, sling shooters. Dimachi, with a short sword in each hand. Esadarii, who fought in chariots, Bestiarii, who contended with beasts. Besides these enterprises, the gladiators engaged in duels, in pairs or in groups. If a dueler in a single combat was seriously wounded, the provider of the games asked the spectators for their will. They held thumbs up or waved handkerchiefs as signs of mercy, or turned thumbs down, or police verso, to signify that the victor was to kill the defeated forthwith. Any combatant who betrayed a reluctance to die aroused the resentment of the people and was prodded to bravery by hot irons. Richer slaughter was furnished by mass battles in which thousands of men fought with desperate ferocity. In the eight spectacles given by Augustus, ten thousand men took part in such wholesale conflicts. Attendants in the garb of Charon probed the fallen with sharp rods to see if they were feigning death and killed such actors with mallet blows on the head.
Other attendants, dressed like Mercury, dragged the bodies away with hooks, while Moorish slaves gathered up the bloodied ground in shovels and spread fresh sand for the next death. Most Romans defended the gladiatorial games on the ground that the victims had been condemned to death for serious crimes, that the sufferings they endured acted as a deterrent to others, that the courage with which the doomed men were trained to face wounds and death inspired the people to Spartan virtues, and that the frequent sight of blood and battle accustomed Romans to the demands and sacrifices of war. Juvenal, who denounced everything else, left the games unscathed. The younger Pliny, a highly civilized man, praised Trajan for providing spectacles that impel men to noble wounds and the scorn of death. And Tacitus reflected that the blood spilled in the arena was in any case vilis sanguis, the cheap gore of common men. Cicero was revolted by the slaughter. What entertainment, he asks, can possibly arise to a refined and humanized spirit, from seeing a noble beast struck to the heart by its merciless hunter, or one of our own weak species cruelly mangled by an animal of far greater strength? But, he added, when guilty men are compelled to fight, no better discipline against suffering and death can be presented to the eye. Seneca, dropping in at the games during the noon recess, when most of the assemblage had left for luncheon, was shocked to see hundreds of criminals driven into the arena to amuse the remaining audience with their blood. I come home more greedy, more cruel, and inhuman, because I have been among human beings. By chance I attended a midday exhibition, expecting some fun, wit, and relaxation, whereby men's eyes may have respite from the slaughter of their fellow men. But it was quite the contrary. These noon fighters are sent out with no armor of any kind. They are exposed to blows at all points, and no one ever strikes in vain. In the morning they throw men to the lions, at noon they throw them to the spectators. The crowd demands that the victor who has slain his opponent shall face the man who will slay him in turn, and the last conqueror is reserved for another butchering. This sort of thing goes on while the stands are nearly empty. Man, a sacred thing to man, is killed for sport and merriment. 7. The New Faiths Religion accepted the games as proper forms of religious celebration and inaugurated them with solemn processions. The Vestal Virgins and the priests occupied seats of honor in the theaters, at the circus, and before the arena. The emperor who presided was the high priest of the state religion. Augustus and his successors had done everything they could to revitalize the old faith, except to live moral lives. Even the declared atheists among them, like Caligula and Nero, had carried out all the ritual traditionally due the official gods. The Lupersi priests still danced through the streets on their festival day. The Arval brethren still mumbled prayers to Mars in old Latin that no one could understand. Divination and augury were assiduously practiced and widely trusted. All but a few philosophers believed in astrology, and the emperors who banished astrologers consulted them. Magic and sorcery, witchcraft and superstition, charms and incantations, portents, and the interpretation of dreams were deeply woven into the tissue of Roman life. Augustus studied his dreams with the diligence of a modern psychologist. Seneca saw women sitting on the steps of the Capitol, waiting the pleasure of Jupiter, because their dreams had told them they were desired of the god. Every consul celebrated his inauguration by sacrificing steers. Juvenal, who could laugh at everything else, piously slit the throats of two lambs and a young ox in gratitude for the safe voyage of a friend. Temples were rich with gold and silver offerings. Candles burned before the altars. The lips, hands, and feet of divine images were worn by the kisses of the devout. The old religion still seemed vigorous. It created new gods like Anona, gatherer of the world's corn for Rome, put new life into the worship of Fortuna and Roma, and gave powerful support to law, order, and tyranny. If Augustus had returned a year after his death, he might well have claimed that his religious revival had proved a happy success. Despite these appearances, the ancient faith was diseased at the bottom and at the top. The deification of the emperors revealed not how much the upper classes thought of their rulers, but how little they thought of their gods. Among educated men, philosophy was whittling away belief even while patronizing it. Lucretius had not been without effect. Men did not mention him, but merely because it was easier to practice Epicureanism than to study Epicurus or his passionate expositor. The rich youths who went to Athens, Alexandria, and Rhodes for higher education found no sustenance there for the Roman creed. Greek poets made fun of the Roman pantheon, and Roman poets leaped to imitate them. The poems of Ovid assumed that the gods were fables. The epigrams of Martial assumed that they were jokes, and no one seems to have complained. Many of the mimes ridiculed the gods. One whipped Diana off the stage, another showed Jove making his will in expectation of death. 
Juvenal, like Plato five centuries before him and ourselves eighteen centuries after him, noted that the fear of a watchful deity had lost its power to discourage perjury. Even on the tombstones of the poor we note increasing skepticism and some candid sensuality. Non fui, fui, non sum, non curo, reads one. I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. And another, non fueram, non sum, nescio. I had not been, I am not, I know not. And another, what I have eaten and drunk is my own, I have had my life. I believe in nothing beyond the grave, says one tombstone. There is no Hades, no Charon, no Cerberus, asserts another. Now, a harassed soul wrote, I need never fear hunger, need never pay rent, and am at least free from gout. And a somber Lucretian writes of the buried flesh, The elements out of which he was formed take possession of their own again. Life is only lent to man. He cannot keep it forever. By his death he pays his debt to nature. But doubt, however honest, cannot long take the place of belief. Amid all its pleasures, this society had not found happiness. Its refinements wearied it, its debaucheries exhausted it. Rich and poor were still subject to pain and grief and death. Philosophy, least of all so coldly a superior doctrine as Stoicism, could never give the common man a faith to grace his poverty, encourage his decency, solace his sorrows, and inspire his hopes. The old religion had fulfilled the first of these functions, it had failed in the rest. Men wanted revelation, and it gave them ritual. They wanted immortality, and it gave them games. Men who had come enslaved or free from other states felt excluded from this nationalistic worship. Therefore they brought their own gods with them, built their own temples, practiced their own rites. In the very heart of the West they planted the religions of the East. Between the creeds of the conquerors and the faith of the defeated, a war took form in which the weapons of the legions were useless. The needs of the heart would determine the victory. The new deities came with war captives, returning soldiers and merchants. Traders from Asia and Egypt set up temples in Putili, Ostia, and Rome for the cult of their traditional gods. The Roman government treated these alien faiths for the most part with toleration. Since it would not admit foreigners to its own worship, it preferred that they should practice their imported rites rather than have no religion at all. In return, it required that each new faith should exercise a similar tolerance towards other creeds and should include in its ritual some obeisance to the emperor's genius and the goddess Roma as an expression of loyalty to the state. Encouraged by this lenience, the oriental faiths already domiciled in Rome became major religions of the populace. Hoping to civilize the cult, Claudius removed the restrictions that had harassed the worship of the Great Mother. He allowed Romans to become her ministrants and established her feast around the vernal equinox from March 15th to the 27th. Her chief rival in this first Christian century was Isis, the Egyptian goddess of motherhood, fertility, and trade. Again and again the government had forbidden the cult in Rome, but it always returned. The piety of the devotees overcame the power of the state, and Caligula marked the surrender by building with public funds an immense shrine to her in the field of Mars. Otho and Domitian took part in the Isiac festivals. Commodus, with shaven head, walked humbly behind the priests, holding reverently in his arms a statue of Anubis, the Egyptian monkey god. The divine invasion swelled from year to year. From southern Italy came the worship of Pythagoras, vegetarianism and reincarnation. From Hierapolis came Atargatus, known to the Romans as Dea Syria, the Syrian goddess, Aziz, the Zeus of Dalaki, and other strange gods. Their worship was spread by Syrian merchants and slaves, and at last a young priest of Assyrian Baal ascended the throne as Elagabalus, worshipper of the god of the sun. From hostile Parthia came the cult of another sun god, Mithras. Its devotees were enlisted as soldiers in the great cosmic war of light against darkness, of good against evil. It was a virile faith that won men rather than women and pleased the Roman legions stationed on distant frontiers where they could hardly hear the voices of their native gods. From Judea came Yahweh, an uncompromising monotheist who commanded the most difficult life of piety and regulation, but gave his followers a moral code and courage that supported them well in tribulation and clothed with a certain nobility the life of the humblest poor. Among the Roman Jews who prayed to him were some, as yet obscurely distinguished from the rest, who worshipped his incarnate and resurrected Son. Chapter 18 The Roman Law, 146 B.C. to A.D. 192 Please note, this chapter will be of no use to lawyers and of no interest to others. 1. The Great Jurists Law was the most characteristic and lasting expression of the Roman spirit. 
As Greece stands in history for freedom, so Rome stands for order. And as Greece bequeathed democracy and philosophy as the foundations of individual liberty, so Rome has left us its laws and its traditions of administration as the bases of social order. To unite these diverse legacies, to attune their stimulating opposition into harmony, is the elemental task of statesmanship. Since law is the essence of Roman history, it has been impossible to keep them separate, and this chapter can only be a structural and synoptic supplement to preceding and subsequent details. The Roman constitution was like the British, no set of permanently binding rules, but a stream of precedent giving direction without preventing change. As wealth increased and life became more complex, new legislation issued from assemblies, senate, magistrates, and princes. The body of the law grew as rapidly as the empire and reached out to ever new frontiers. The education of lawyers, the guidance of judges, and the protection of the citizen from illegal judgments demanded the organization and formulation of the law into some orderly and accessible form. Amid the turmoil of the Gracchan and Marian revolution, Publius Mucius Sivola, Consul 133 B.C., and his son Quintus, Consul 95 B.C., labored to reduce the laws of Rome to an intelligible system. Cicero, pupil of another Quintus Mucius Sivola, Consul 117 B.C., wrote eloquently on the philosophy of law and constructed an ideal code designed to preserve the fortune that he had gained and the faith that he had lost. The contradictory enactments of Marius and Sulla, the unprecedented powers of Pompey, the revolutionary legislation of Caesar, and the new constitution of Augustus created fresh problems for minds that struggled to make a logic of the law, and the brilliant jurist Antistius Labio confounded confusion by declaring the decrees of Caesar and Augustus void as the expression of usurped and illegal authority. Not till the Principate had established itself, first by the use of force and then by the force of use, could the new legislation win acceptance in the minds of men as well as in the courts of power. To the second and third centuries of our era belongs the honor of giving Roman law its final formulation in the West, an achievement comparable to the formulation of science and philosophy in Greece. Here, too, Caesar had set the goal, but the actual work did not begin till Hadrian in A.D. 117. This best educated of the emperors gathered about him a corps of jurists as his privy council and commissioned them to replace the variable annual edicts of the praetors with a perpetual edict to be observed by all future judges in Italy. The Greeks had produced since Solon no masterpiece of jurisprudence and had never codified a system of law, but the Greek cities of Asia and Italy had developed excellent municipal codes. The much-traveled Hadrian knew these cities well and was perhaps inspired by their constitutions to improve and coordinate the laws of Rome. Under his successors, the Antonines, the work of codification continued, and the half-official repute enjoyed by the Stoic philosophy permitted a profound Greek influence upon Roman law. The Stoics declared that law should accord with morality, and that guilt lay in the intention of the deed, not in the results. Antoninus, a product of the Stoic school, decreed that cases of doubt should be resolved in favor of the accused, and that a man should be held innocent until proved guilty, two supreme principles of civilized law. Favored by imperial patronage, the science of jurisprudence nurtured a succession of geniuses. Salvius Julianus, a Roman of African birth, showed so much learning and industry as Quester Augusti, or legal adviser to the emperor, that the Senate voted him double the usual salary of that office. His responsa were acclaimed for their logic and clarity. His digesta presented a systematic arrangement of civil and praetorian law. It was he who, as the leading member of Hadrian's council, formulated the praetorian perpetual edict. Another jurist is known to us only by his first name, Gaius. His famous Institutiones was discovered by Niebuhr in 1816 on a faded palimpsest overwritten with some essays by St. Jerome. It is now our fullest authority for pre-Justinian Roman law. It was issued in circa A.D. 161, not as a creative work, but as an elemental manual for students. If we find it a masterpiece of orderly exposition, we may imagine the intellectual stature of the men whose lost treatises it summarized. Sixty years later, Papinian, Paulus, and Ulpian brought Roman jurisprudence to its height. While the administration of the law fell a victim to violence and chaos, they gave it a rational formulation and consistency. After them, the great science sank in the general ruin. 2. The Sources of the Law As the terminology of science and philosophy comes mostly from the Greek, betraying their source, so the language of the law comes mostly from the Latin. Law in general was jus, justice or right. Lex meant a specific law. Jurisprudence, wisdom in the law, 
was defined in the Digest of Justinian, A.D. 533, as both a science and an art. The science of the just and the unjust, and the art, that is, administration, of the good and the equitable. Use included unwritten law, or custom, as well as written law. The latter was composed of use civile, the law of Roman citizens, and use gentium, the law of the nations. Civil law was public law when it related to the state or the official worship, and private law when it dealt with the legal interrelations of the citizens. Roman law as a whole flowed from five sources. 1. Under the Republic, the ultimate source of law was the will of the citizens, expressed as leges, in the curial and centurial assemblies, and as plebiscita, decided by the plebs, in the tribal assembly. The Senate acknowledged leges only when they had been proposed to the assemblies with the proper formalities and by a magistrate of senatorial rank. When Senate and Assembly agreed in passing a measure, it was proclaimed in the name of Senatus Populusque Romanus. 2. The Senate itself, in theory, had no lawmaking power under the Republic. Its Senatus Consulta were, formally, recommendations to the magistrates. Gradually they became directives, then imperatives, until in the later Republic and under the Empire they took on the force of laws. Altogether, the laws passed by the assemblies or the Senate were so few in the course of six centuries as to astonish one accustomed to the legislative flux of modern states. 3. The need for minor or more specific laws was met by the edicta of the municipal officials. Each new urban praetor, our chief city magistrate, issued an edictum praetorium, announced by a herald in the forum and inscribed upon a wall, and stating the legal principles on which the praetor proposed to act and judge during his year's term. Similar edicts could be put forth by circuit judges, praetores peregrini, and provincial praetors. Through their power of imperium, or rule, the praetors were allowed not only to interpret existing laws, but to make new ones. In this way, Roman law combined the stability of its basic legislation with the flexibility of praetorian judgments. When a law or clause was carried down from one praetorian edict to the next for many years, it became a definite part of the ius honorarium. By the time of Cicero, this law of the offices had displaced the twelve tables as the main text of legal instruction in Rome. Nevertheless, a praetor often reversed the decisions and sometimes contradicted the principles of a predecessor, so that uncertainties of law and arbitrariness of judgment were added to the abuses natural in every judicial system operated by men. It was to end this uncertainty that Hadrian instructed Julianus to unify all preceding jus honorarium in a perpetual edict alterable only by the emperor. 4. The Constitutiones Principum, or Statutes of the Princes, became themselves in the second century a varied source of law. They took four forms. a. The prince issued a dicta by virtue of his imperium as an official of the city. These were valid for the whole empire, but apparently lapsed after his death. b. His decreta, as a judge, like those of other magistrates, had the force of law. c. Imperial rescripta, were his answers to inquiries. Usually they were epistulae, letters, or subscriptiones, brief replies written under a question or petition. The wise and pithy letters in which Trajan answered the requests of governmental appointees for instruction were incorporated into the laws of the empire and kept their validity long after his death. D. The mandata of the emperors were their directives to officials. In the course of time these came to constitute a detailed code of administrative law. 5. Under certain circumstances law could be created by the responsa prudentium. It must have been a pleasant sight when learned jurists sat in chairs in the open forum, or in later decades in their homes, and gave legal opinions to all who asked, taking their chances on some indirect remuneration. Often their advice was solicited by lawyers or municipal judges. Like the great rabbis of the Jews, they reconciled contradictions, drew subtle distinctions, interpreted and adjusted the ancient law to the needs of life or the exigencies of politics. Their written replies, by unwritten custom, had an authority only less than the laws. Augustus gave such opinions full legal force on two conditions— that the jurist should have received from the emperor the jus respondendi, or right of giving legal opinions, and that the reply should be sent under seal to the judge trying the case in point. By the time of Justinian, these responsa had become a vast school and literature of law, the fountain and foundation of his culminating digest and code. 3. The Law of Persons 
All law, says the precise Gaius, pertains to persons, to property, or to procedure. The word persona had signified an actor's mask. Later it was applied to the part played by a man in life. Finally it came to mean the man himself, as if to say that we can never know a man but only the parts he plays, the mask or masks that he wears. The first person in Roman law was the citizen. He was defined as anyone who had been accepted into a Roman tribe by birth, adoption, emancipation, or governmental grant. Within this franchise were three grades. One, full citizens who enjoyed the fourfold right of voting, or ius suffragii, of holding office, or ius honorum, of marriage with a free-born person, or ius canubii, and of engaging in commercial contracts protected by Roman law, ius commercii. Two, citizens without suffrage, who had the rights of marriage and contract, but not of voting or office, and three, freedmen, who had the rights of voting and contract, but not of marriage or office. The full citizen had, furthermore, certain exclusive rights in private law, the power of the father over his children, or patria potestas, of the husband over his wife, or manus, of an owner over his property, including his slaves, or dominium, and of a freeman over another by contract, or mancipium. A kind of potential citizenship, called latinitas, or ius latii, was conferred by Rome upon the free inhabitants of favored towns and colonies, whereby they acquired the right of contract, but not of intermarriage, with Romans, and their magistrates received full Roman citizenship upon completing their terms of office. Each city of the empire had its own citizens and conditions of citizenship, and by a unique tolerance a man might be a citizen and enjoy the civic rights of several cities at once. The most precious privilege of a Roman citizen was the safeguarding of his person, property, and rights by the law, and his immunity from torture or violence in the trying of his case. It was the glory of Roman law that it protected the individual against the state. The second person in Roman law was the father. The patria potestas had been weakened by the spread of law into areas formerly governed by custom, but we may judge its surviving force from the fact that when Aulus Fulvius set out to join Catiline's army, his father called him back and put him to death. In general, however, the power of the father declined as that of the government rose. Democracy entered the family when it left the state. In the early republic, the fathers had been the state. The family heads formed the curial assembly, and the clan heads probably constituted the senate. Rule through family and clan diminished as population became more abundant and diverse, and life more mobile, commercial, and complex. Kinship, status, and custom were replaced by contract and law. Children won greater freedom from their parents, wives from their husbands, individuals from their groups. Trajan compelled a father to emancipate a son whom he had maltreated. Hadrian took from the father the right of life and death over his household and transferred it to the courts. Antoninus forbade a father to sell his children into slavery. Custom had long since reduced the use of these old powers to rare occurrences. Law tends to lag behind moral development, not because law cannot learn, but because experience has shown the wisdom of testing new ways in practice before congealing them into law. The Roman woman gained new rights as the man lost old ones, but she was clever enough to disguise her freedom under continuing legal disabilities. The law of the Republic assumed that she was never sui juris, of her own right, but always dependent upon some male guardian. According to our ancestors, said Gaius, even women of mature age must be kept in tutelage because of the lightness of their minds. In the later Republic and under the Empire, this legal dependence was largely annulled by feminine charms and willfulness, abetted by male susceptibility and affection. From Cato the Elder to Commodus, Roman society, legally patriarchal, was ruled by women, with all the graceful mastery of Renaissance Italy or Bourbon French salons. The laws of Augustus made some obeisance to the facts by releasing from tutela any woman who had borne three legitimate children. Hadrian decreed that women might dispose of their property as they liked, provided they obtained the consent of their guardians, but actual procedure soon dispensed with this consent. By the end of the second century, all compulsory tutelage was ended in law for free women over twenty-five. The consent of both fathers was still required for legal marriage. Marriage by confariatio was now, in AD 160, confined to a few senatorial families. Marriage by purchase, or coemptio, lingered as a form, the bridegroom paid for the bride by weighing an ass or an ingot of bronze in a scale before five witnesses, her father or her guardian having consented. Most marriages were now by usus, that is, cohabitation. To avoid falling under the manus or proprietary power of her husband, the wife absented herself three nights in each year. 
Thereby, she retained control of her property, accepting her dowry. Indeed, the husband often put his property in his wife's name to avoid suits for damages or the penalties of bankruptcy. Such marriage sine manu could be ended by either party at will. Marriage by other forms could be ended only by the husband. Adultery was still a minor offense in the man. In the woman, it was a major offense against the institutions of property and inheritance. But the husband no longer had the right to kill his wife taken in adultery. This right was now vested technically in her father, actually in the courts, and the penalty was banishment. Concubinage was recognized by the law as a substitute for marriage, but not as an accompaniment to it, and a man could not legally have two concubines at once. Children by a concubine were classed as illegitimate and could not inherit, which made concubinage all the more attractive to men who liked to be courted by hunters of legacies. Vespasian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius lived in concubinage after the death of their wives. The law struggled to encourage parentage among the freeborn, but with negligible results. Infanticide was forbidden except in the case of infants deformed or incurably diseased. The detected procurer of abortion was banished and lost part of his property. If the woman died, he was to be put to death. These laws, of course, were largely evaded then as now. Children of any age remained under the authority of the father except when thrice sold by him into bondage, or when formally emancipated, or when the son held a public office or became a flamendialis, or when a daughter married cumanu or became a vestal virgin. If a son married in the lifetime of his father, the patria potestas over the grandchildren resided in the grandfather. By the legislation of Augustus, the earnings of a son in the army, in public office, in priestly orders, or in the liberal professions, were freed from the old rule that such gains belonged to the father. A son might still be sold into bondage, or mancipium, but this differed from slavery, or servitus, in leaving the bondsman with his former civic rights. The slave had no legal rights whatever. Indeed, Roman law hesitated to apply the term persona to him and compromised by calling him an impersonal man. It is only by a considerate error that Gaius discusses him under the law of persons. Logically, the slave came under the rubric of property or race. He could not own, inherit, or bequeath. He could not make a legal marriage. His children were all classed as illegitimate, and the children of a slave woman were classed as slaves even if the father was free. Slaves, male or female, might be seduced by their master without legal redress. The slave could not bring action in the courts against those who injured him. He could proceed in such a case only through his owner. The latter, under the law of the Republic, could beat him, imprison him, condemn him to fight beasts in the arena, expose him to die of starvation, or kill him with cause or without, and with no other control than a public opinion formed by slave owners. If a slave ran away and was captured, he could be branded or crucified. Augustus boasted that he had recaptured thirty thousand runaway slaves and had crucified all who had not been claimed. If, under these or other provocations, a slave killed his master, law required that all the slaves of the murdered man should be put to death. When Pedanius Secundus, urban prefect, was so slain in A.D. 61, and his four hundred slaves were condemned to die, a minority in the Senate protested, and an angry crowd in the streets demanded mercy. But the Senate ordered the law to be carried out, in the belief that only by such measures could a master be secure. It is to the credit of the empire, or perhaps of the diminishing supply of slaves, that their condition was progressively improved under the emperors. Claudius prohibited the killing of a useless slave and ruled that an abandoned sick slave who recovered should become automatically free. The Lex Petronia, probably under Nero, forbade owners without a magistrate's approval to condemn slaves to fight in the arena. Nero allowed maltreated slaves to use his statue as an asylum and appointed a judge to hear their complaints, a modest advance that seemed revolutionary to Rome since it opened the courts to slaves. Domitian made it a criminal offense to mutilate slaves for sensual purposes. Hadrian ended the right of the owner to kill a slave without magisterial sanction. Antoninus Pius permitted an abused slave to take sanction in any temple and had him sold to another master if he could prove injury. Marcus Aurelius encouraged owners to bring before the courts, rather than themselves punish, damages sustained by them from their slaves. In this way, he hoped law and judgment would gradually replace brutality and private revenge. Finally, a great jurist of the third century, Ulpian, proclaimed what only a few philosophers had dared suggest, that by the law of nature all men are equal. Other jurists laid it down as a maxim that where the freedom or slavery of a man was in question, all doubts should favor liberty. Despite these mitigations, the legal subjection of slaves is the worst blot on Roman law. The last indignity was the tax and restrictions upon emancipation. Many owners evaded the lex fufia canina by informally freeing a slave without official witness or legal ceremony. 
Such liberation, however, conferred not citizenship but only latinitas. The slave, freed by process of law, became a citizen with limited civic rights, but custom required him to pay his respects to his former owner every morning, attend him when needed, vote for him at every opportunity, and in some cases pay him a portion of all money earned. If the freedman died in testate, his property went automatically to his living patron. If he made a will, he was expected to leave him part of his estate. Only when the master was dead, dutifully mourned and safely buried, could the freedman really breathe the air of freedom. To these general divisions of the law of persons must be added the legislation which in modern codes is separately known as criminal law. Roman jurisprudence recognized crimes against the individual, the state, and social or business groups considered as juridical persons. Against the state one might be guilty of maestas, treason by act or word, vis publica, or sedition, sacrilegium, offenses against the state religion, ambitus, or bribery, crimen repetundarum, or extortion or corruption in public administration, peculatus, or embezzlement of state funds, and corruptio judicis, or bribery of a judge or juryman. From this partial list we may see that corruption has an ancient pedigree and a probable future. Against the individual one could commit injuria, or physical injury, falsum, or deception, stuprum, or indecency, and caides, or murder. Cicero mentions a lex scantinia against pederasty. Augustus corrected the error with a fine, martial with epigrams, domitian with death. Personal injury was no longer punished with equivalent retaliation, as in the Twelve Tables, but by a fine. Suicide was no crime. On the contrary, before demission it was in some sense rewarded. A man condemned to death could usually, by suicide, ensure the validation of his will and the unimpeded transmission of his property to his heirs. The law left the last choice free. 4. The Law of Property Problems of ownership, obligation, exchange, contract, and debt took up by far the largest part of Roman law. Material possession was the very life of Rome, and the increase of wealth and the expansion of trade demanded a body of law immeasurably more complex than the simple code of the Decemvirs. Ownership, or dominium, came by inheritance or acquisition. Since the father owned as agent and trustee of the family, the children and grandchildren were potential owners, sui erides in the law's queer phrase, their own heirs. If the father died intestate, they succeeded automatically to the family property, and the oldest father among the sons inherited the dominium. The making of valid wills was hedged about with hundreds of legal restrictions, and their composition required, as now, a gorgeous and sonorous tautology. Every testator was compelled to leave a specified portion of his estate to his children, another part to a wife who had borne him three children, and in some cases, parts to his brothers, sisters, and ascendants. No heir might take any part of an estate without assuming all the debts and other legal obligations of the deceased. Not infrequently, a Roman found himself saddled with a damnosa hereditas, a legacy, so to speak, in the red. Where an owner died without children and without a will, his property and his debts passed automatically to the nearest agnate, or relative descended from a common ancestor exclusively through males. In the later empire this male conceit abated, and by the time of Justinian agnates and cognates, relatives through male or female lines of ascent, inherited with equal right. An old law passed on the urging of Cato, in 169 B.C., had forbidden any Roman who owned 100,000 sesterces, or $15,000 or more, to bequeath any part of his estate to a woman. This lex voconia was still on the statute books in Gaius's time, but love had found a way. The testator left property in trust, or fidei commissum, to a qualified heir, and bound him by a solemn request to transfer the property before a stated date to the woman named. By this and other channels, much of the wealth of Rome passed into the hands of women. Gifts offered another escape from testamentary law, but gifts made in prospect of death were subject to legal scrutiny, and under Justinian they were liable to the same laws as those that harassed legacies. Acquisition came by transfer, or by legal conveyance resulting from a suit at law. Transfer, or mancipatio, taking in hand, was a formal gift or sale before witnesses and with scales struck by a copper ingot as token of a sale. Without this ancient ritual, no exchange had the sanction or protection of the law. An intermediate or potential ownership was recognized under the name of possessio, the right to hold or use property. For example, tenants on state lands were possessores, or sitters, squatters, not domini, but their prescriptive right, usucapio, taking by use, became dominium and could no longer be questioned after two years of unchallenged occupancy. Probably this lenient conception of occupation as so soon generating ownership came from patricians who were in this manner acquiring public lands.
By the same right of usucapio, a woman who lived with a man through a year without three nights' absence became the property, or in manu, of the man. Obligation was any compulsion by law to the performance of an act. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. Obligation was any compulsion by law to the performance of an act. It could arise by delict or by contract. Delicts or torts, non-contractual wrongs committed against a person or his property, were in many cases punished by an obligation to pay the injured person a sum of money in compensation. A contract was an agreement enforceable at law. It did not have to be written. Indeed, until the second century A.D., the verbal agreement made by uttering the word spondeo, I promise, before a witness, was considered more sacred than any written compact. The many witnesses and solemn ceremony once required for legal contract were no longer necessary. Business was quickened by the legal recognition of any clear agreement, usually entries made by the parties in their account books, or tabulae. But the law guarded transactions carefully. It warned the seller with a caveat venditor, as well as the buyer with a caveat emptor, against the myriad forms of cheating natural to civilized life. Any seller of slaves or cattle, for example, was required by law to disclose their physical defects to the purchaser, and was held accountable despite a plea of ignorance. Debt was contracted by loan, mortgage, deposit, or trust. Loans for consumption were usually secured by a mortgage on realty or movable goods. A default in principle entitled the mortgagee to take over the property. In early Republican law, as we have seen, such default permitted the lender to attach the person of the borrower as a bondsman. The Lex Poetalia of 326 B.C. modified this rule by allowing the debtor to work off his obligation while retaining his freedom. After Caesar, defaulted mortgages were usually satisfied by the sale of the debtor's property without jeopardy to his person. But cases of enslavement to a creditor occur as late as Justinian. Commercial defaults were mitigated by a law of bankruptcy, which sold the bankrupt's property to pay his debts, but permitted him to keep as much of his later acquisitions as his subsistence required. The chief crimes against property were damage, theft, and rapine, theft with violence. The Twelve Tables had condemned a detected thief to be flogged and then delivered as a bondsman to his victim. If the thief was a slave, he was to be scourged and flung from the Tarpeian Rock. Increased social security permitted Praetorian law to soften these severities to a twofold, threefold, or fourfold restitution. In its final form, the law of property was the most perfect part of the Roman Code. 5. The Law of Procedure Of all ancient peoples, the Romans were the most prone to litigation, despite the discouraging complexity, technicality, and confusing fictions of their procedural law. Doubtless, our own legal actions would have seemed to them equally devious and prolonged. The older the civilization, the longer the lawsuits. Any man, as noted above, could make himself a prosecutor in a Roman court. In the Patrician Republic, the accuser, the defendant, and the magistrate were required to follow a form called legis actio, or process of law, and the slightest deviation invalidated the action. Thus, says Gaius, a man who sued another for cutting his vines and in his action called them vines, lost his case because he should have called them trees, since the Twelve Tables speak generally of trees and not particularly of vines. Each party deposited with the magistrate a sum of money, or sacramentum, which was forfeited by the losing party to the state religion. The defendant also had to give bail, or vademonium, as security for his subsequent appearances. The magistrate then turned over the dispute to a person on the list of those qualified to act as judges. In some cases, the judges issued an interim interdictum, requiring one or more of the parties in the case to perform or refrain from certain actions. If the defendant lost his property, sometimes his person could be seized by the plaintiff until the judgment was satisfied. About 150 B.C., the Lex Ibutia abolished the necessity of using this ritual legis actio and accepted in its place a procedure per formulam. Specific acts and words were no longer required. The parties shared with the magistrate in determining the form under which the matter was to be submitted to the judge, and the magistrate then wrote to the judge an instruction, or formula, on the factual and legal questions involved. It was partly in this way that the praetor, as magistrate, made praetorian law. In the second century A.D., a third mode of action, 
cognitio extraordinaria, came into use. The magistrate decided the case himself. By the end of the third century, the formulary procedure had disappeared, and the summary judgment of a magistrate responsible only to the emperor, and usually owing his office to him, reflected the coming of absolute monarchy. The litigants could conduct their case, and the praetor or judge decide it, without the help of lawyers, if they wished. But as the eudex was not often a professional trained in the law, and the litigants might at every step stumble over a technicality, all parties to a dispute usually sought the aid of trial lawyers, or advocati, legal technicians, or pragmatici, consultants, or juris consulti, or jurists, or jurisprudentes. There was no lack of legal talent, for every fond parent yearned to see his son an advocate, and the law then as now was the vestibule to public office. A character in Petronius gives his son a collection of red-backed books, or codices, to learn a little law, as it spells money. A law student began by learning the elements from some private instructor. In his second stage, he attended the consultations of eminent jurists. Thereafter, he apprenticed himself to a practicing lawyer. Early in the second century A.D., certain juris consulti set up in various parts of Rome schools, or stationes, at which they gave instruction or advice in the law. Ammianus complains of their high fees, saying that they charged even for their yawns and made matricide venial if the client paid enough. These teachers were called juris civilis professores. Apparently the title of professor came from the fact that they were required by law to declare, or profiteri, their intention of teaching, and to secure a license, therefore, from the public authority. Out of the many lawyers so trained, there were inevitably some who sold their learning to sordid causes, accepted bribes to present their client's case weekly, found loopholes in the law for any crime, fomented disputes among rich men, dragged on suits to any lucrative length, and shook the courts or the forum with their intimidating questioning and their vituperative summations. Forced to compete for cases, some lawyers sought to build a reputation by walking hurriedly through the streets with bundles of documents in their hands, borrowed rings on their fingers, dependents attending them, and hired claqueurs to applaud their speech. So many ways had been found of circumventing the old Cincian law against fees that Claudius legalized them up to ten thousand sesterces per case. Any fee above this figure was to be recoverable by law. This restriction was easily evaded, for we hear of a lawyer in Vespasian's reign amassing a fortune of three hundred million sesterces, or thirty million dollars. As in every generation there were attorneys and judges whose clear and disciplined minds were at the service of truth and justice regardless of fee, and the lowest practitioners were redeemed by the great jurists whose names are the highest in the history of the law. Courts for the trial of offenders varied from the hearings held by individual judges or magistrates to the assemblies, the Senate, and the Emperor. Instead of a single judge, the praetor might choose by lot, subject to a number of challenges by accuser and defendant, a jury of almost any size, usually fifty-one or seventy-five, from the eight hundred fifty senatorial or equestrian names on the jury list. Two special courts were permanently maintained, the decemviri, or ten men to try cases of civil status, and the centumviri, or hundred men to hear suits in property and bequest. The proceedings of these bodies were open to the public, for the younger Pliny describes the great crowd that came to hear him address the larger court. Juvenal and Apuleius complain of judicial procrastination and venality, but their very indignation suggests exceptional cases. Trials were marked by a freedom of speech and action seldom known in modern courts. Several lawyers might appear on each side, some specialized in preparing the evidence, some in presenting it. The proceedings were recorded by various clerks, notarii, actuarii, scribi, and were sometimes taken down in shorthand. Marshall says of certain scribes, however fast the words may run, their hands are quicker still. Plutarch tells how stenographers took down the speeches of Cicero, often to his discomfort. Witnesses were dealt with according to time-honored precedents, says the exemplary Quintilian. In the examination of a witness, the first essential is to know his type. For a timid witness may be terrorized, a fool outwitted, an irascible man provoked, and vanity flattered. The shrewd and self-possessed witness must be dismissed at once as malicious and obstinate, or if his past life admits of criticism, his credit may be overthrown by the scandalous charges that can be brought against him. Almost any kind of argument might be made by the advocate. He could show the court pictures of the alleged crime, painted on wood or canvas. He could hold a child in his arms while arguing a point. 
He could bear the scars of an accused soldier or the wounds of a client. Defenses were contrived against these weapons. Quintilian tells how one attorney, when his opponent illustrated a summation by bringing his client's children into court, threw dice among them. The children scrambled for the tesserae and ruined a peroration. The slaves of either party to a suit might be tortured to elicit evidence, but such evidence was not admissible against their owners. Hadrian decreed that slaves should be tortured for evidence only as a last resort and under the strictest regulations, and he warned the courts that evidence secured by torture could never be trusted. Legal torture nevertheless persisted and was extended in the third century to freemen. The jury voted by depositing marked tablets in an urn. A majority sufficed for a decision. In most cases, the loser might appeal to a higher court, and finally, if he could afford it, to the emperor. Penalties were fixed by law rather than left to the discretion of the judge. They varied with the rank of the offender, being severest for the slave. He might be crucified, the citizen might not. And no Roman citizen, as every reader of the Acts of the Apostles knows, could be scourged, tortured, or put to death over his appeal to the emperor. Different penalties were laid upon honestiores and humiliores for the same crime. They varied also according as the offender was freeborn or freeman, solvent or bankrupt, soldier or civilian. The simplest punishment was a fine. Since the value of currency changed more rapidly than the penalties named in the law, certain anomalies ensued. The Twelve Tables exacted a fine of twenty-five asses, originally twenty-five pounds of copper, for striking a freeman. When rising prices had lowered the ass to six cents, Lucius Veratius went about striking freemen in the face, followed by a slave who counted out twenty-five asses to each victim. Some offenses resulted in infamia, or speechlessness, chiefly the inability to appear or be represented by another in an action at law. A more stringent punishment was loss of civic rights, capitis diminutio, which took the progressive forms of incapacity to inherit, deportation, and enslavement. Deportation was the harshest form of exile. The condemned man was put in chains, confined in some inhospitable place, and deprived of all his property. Exilium was milder in allowing the victim to live in freedom wherever he pleased outside of Italy. Relegatio, as in the case of Ovid, involved no confiscation but compelled the outcast to stay in a specified town, usually far from Rome. Imprisonment was seldom used as a permanent punishment, but men might be condemned to menial labor on public works, or in the mines or in the quarries of the state. Under the Republic, a freeman sentenced to death could escape the penalty by leaving Rome or Italy. Under the Empire, the death penalty was imposed with increasing frequency and ruthlessness. Prisoners of war, and in some cases other condemned men, might be thrown into the carcere tulianum, to die of starvation, rodents, and lice in underground darkness and irremovable filth. There Jugurtha died, and Simon ben Giora, heroic defender of Jerusalem, against Titus. There, said tradition, Peter and Paul had languished before their martyrdom and had written their last addresses to the young Christian world. 6. The Law of the Nations The most difficult problem of Roman law was to adjust itself as an intelligent master to the varied codes and customs of the lands that Roman arms or diplomacy had won. Many of these states were older than Rome. What they had lost in military courage they made up in proud traditions and a jealous fondness for their peculiar ways. Rome met the situation ably. A praetor peregrinus was appointed at first for the foreigners in Rome, then for Italy, then for the provinces, and power was given him to make some viable union between Roman and local law. The annual edicts of this praetor and the provincial governors and aediles gradually created the jus gentium, by which the empire was ruled. This law of the nations was not an international law, not a body of commitments accepted by the generality of states as governing their interrelations. In a sense, not much more tenuous than today, there was in antiquity an international law, insofar as certain common customs were honored in peace and war, the mutual safeguarding of international merchants and diplomats, the granting of truce for the burial of the dead, abstention from the use of poisoned arrows, etc., the jurists of Rome, by a patriotic fiction, described the use gentium as law common to all nations. But they were too modest about Rome's part in it. Actually, it was local law, adopted to Roman sovereignty, and designed to govern the peoples of Italy and the provinces without giving them Roman citizenship and the other rights of the use civile. By a corresponding fiction, the philosophers attempted to identify the law of the nations with the law of nature. The Stoics defined the latter as a moral code implanted in man by natural reason. Nature, they held, 
was a system of reason, a logic and order in all things. This order, spontaneously developing in society and coming to consciousness in man, was natural law. Cicero phrased the fancy in a famous passage. True law is right reason in agreement with nature, worldwide in scope, unchanging, everlasting. We may not oppose or alter that law, we cannot abolish it, we cannot be freed from its obligations by any legislature, and we need not look outside ourselves for an expounder of it. This law does not differ for Rome and for Athens, for the present and for the future. It is and will be valid for all nations and all times. He who disobeys it denies himself and his own nature. It was a perfect statement of an ideal that grew in force as Stoicism reached the throne in the Antonines. Ulpian developed it into the far-reaching principle that class distinctions and privileges are accidental and artificial, and from this it was but a step to the Christian conception of all men as fundamentally equal. But when Gaius defined the use gentium as simply the law which natural reason has established among all mankind, he was mistaking Roman arms for divine providence. Roman law was the logic and economy of force. The great codes of use civile and use gentium were the rules by which a wise conqueror gave order, regularity, and time's sanctity to a sovereignty based upon the legion's strength. They were natural, but only in the sense that it is natural for the strong to use and abuse the weak. Nevertheless, there is something noble in this imposing architecture of government called Roman law. Since the victor must rule, it is a boon that the rules of his mastery should be clearly expressed. In this sense, law is the consistency of power. It was natural that the Romans should create the greatest system of law in history. They loved order and had the means to enforce it. Upon the chaos of a hundred diverse nations they laid an imperfect but sublime authority and peace. Other states had had laws, and legislators like Hammurabi and Solon had issued small bodies of humane legislation. But no people had yet achieved that immense coordination, unification, and codification which occupied the highest legal minds of Rome from the Sivalas to Justinian. The flexibility of the Ius Gentium facilitated the transmission of Roman law to medieval and modern states. It was a happy accident that, while the chaos of barbarian invasion was mutilating the legal heritage in the West, the Code, Digest, and Institutes of Justinian were collected and formulated in Constantinople, in the comparative security and continuity of the Empire in the East. Through these labors and a hundred lesser channels, and the silent tenacity of useful ways, Roman law entered into the canon law of the medieval church, inspired the thinkers of the Renaissance, and became the basic law of Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, Poland, even, within the British Empire, of Scotland, Quebec, Ceylon, and South Africa. English law itself, the only legal edifice of comparable scope, took its rules of equity, admiralty, guardianship, and bequests from Roman canon law. Greek science and philosophy, Judeo-Greek Christianity, Greco-Roman democracy, Roman law. These are our supreme inheritance from the ancient world. Chapter 19 The Philosopher Kings A.D. 96-180 1. Nerva With the assassination of Domitian, the principle of heredity disappeared for a century from Roman monarchy. The Senate had never recognized inheritance as a source of sovereignty. Now, after 123 years of submission, it reasserted its authority. And as in Rome's beginnings it had chosen the king, now it named one of its own members Princeps and Imperator. It was an act of courage intelligible only when we remember that the vigor of the Flavian family was exhausted in that same generation which had seen the vitality of the Senate renewed by Italian and provincial blood. Marcus Coxius Nerva was sixty-six when supremacy surprised him. The colossal Nerva of the Vatican shows a handsome and virile face. No one would suppose that this was a respectable jurist with a bad stomach, a mild and amiable poet who had once been hailed as the Tibullus of our time. Perhaps the Senate had chosen him for his gray harmlessness. He consulted it on all policies and kept his pledge never to be the cause of death to any of its members. He recalled Domitian's exiles, restored their property, and moderated their revenge. He distributed sixty million sesterces worth of lands among the poor, and established the Alimenta, a state fund to encourage and finance parentage among the peasantry. He annulled many taxes, lowered the inheritance dues, and freed the Jews from the tribute that Vespasian had laid upon them. At the same time he repaired the finances of the state by economy in his household and his government. 
With reason, he thought that he had been just to all classes, and remarked that I've done nothing that could prevent me from laying down the imperial office and returning to private life in safety. But a year after his accession, the Praetorian Guard, which had been forestalled in his nomination and resented his economy, besieged his palace, demanded the surrender of Domitian's assassins, and killed several of Nerva's counselors. He offered his throat to the swords of the soldiers, but they spared him. Humiliated, he wished to abdicate, but his friends persuaded him instead to return to Augustus's example and adopt as his son and successor a man acceptable to the Senate and capable of ruling not only the Empire but the Guard as well. The greatest debt that Rome owed Nerva was that he chose Marcus Ulpius Traianus to succeed him. Three months later, after a reign of sixteen months, he passed away in ninety-eight. The principle of adoption thus accidentally restored meant that each emperor, as he felt his powers decline, would associate with himself in rule the ablest and fittest man he could find, so that when death came there would be neither the absurdity of a praetorian elevation, nor the risk of a natural but worthless heir, nor a civil war among competitors for the throne. It was a lucky chance that no son was born to Trajan, Hadrian, or Antoninus Pius, and that each could apply the adoptive plan without slighting his offspring or his own parental love. While the principle was maintained, it gave Rome the finest succession of good and great sovereigns the world has ever had. 2. Trajan Trajan received word of his accession while he was in charge of a Roman army in Cologne. It was characteristic of him that he went on with his work at the frontier and postponed his coming to Rome for nearly two years. He had been born in Spain of an Italian family long settled there. In him and in Hadrian, Roman Spain arrived at political hegemony, as it had reached literary leadership in Seneca, Lucan, and Marshall. He was the first in a long line of generals whose provincial birth and training seemed to give them the will to life that had gone from the native Roman stock. That Rome made no protest against this enthronement of a provincial was in itself an event and omen in Roman history. Trajan never ceased to be a general. His carriage was military, his presence commanding. His features were undistinguished but strong. Tall and robust, he was wont to march on foot with his troops and ford with full armament the hundred rivers they had to cross. His courage showed a stoic impartiality between life and death. Told that Lucinius Sura was plotting against him, he went to Sura's house for dinner, ate without scrutiny whatever food was offered him, and had himself shaved by Sura's barber. He was not in any technical sense a philosopher. He used to take Dio Chrysostom, the golden-mouthed reader, with him in his chariot to discourse to him on philosophy, but he confessed that he could not understand a word of Dio's talk, the worse for philosophy. His mind was clear and direct. He uttered an amazing minimum of nonsense for a man. He was vain, like all human beings, but completely unassuming. He took no advantage of his office, joined his friends at table in the hunt, drank with them copiously, and indulged in occasional pederasty, as if out of deference to the customs of his time. Rome thought it worthy of praise that he never disturbed his wife Plotina by making love to another woman. When, in the forty-second year of his age, Trajan reached Rome, he was at the height of his faculties. His simplicity, geniality, and moderation readily won a people so lately acquainted with tyranny. The younger Pliny was chosen by the Senate to pronounce the panegyric of greeting. About the same time, Dio Chrysostom delivered before the emperor a discourse on the duties of a monarch as viewed by the Stoic philosophy. Both Pliny and Dio distinguished between dominatio and principatus. The prince was not to be lord of the state but its first servant, the executive delegate of the people, chosen through their representatives, the senators. Imperatorus omnibus elegi debit ex omnibus, said Pliny. He who is to command all should be elected by all. The general listened courteously. Such fair beginnings were not new in history. What astonished Rome was that Trajan fulfilled their promise abundantly. He gave to his aides or associates the villas in which his predecessors had stayed for a few weeks in the year. He regarded nothing as his own, said Pliny, unless his friends possessed it. As for himself, he lived as simply as Vespasian. He asked the Senate's opinion on all matters of moment, and discovered that he might wield nearly absolute power if he never used absolute speech. The Senate was willing to let him rule if he would observe the forms that maintained its dignity and prestige. Like the rest of Rome, it now loved security too much to be capable of freedom. Perhaps also it was pleased to find Trajan a conservative who had no intention of mulcting the rich to appease the poor. Trajan was an able and tireless administrator, a sound financier, a just judge. To him the digest of Justinian ascribes the principle 
it is better that the guilty should remain unpunished than that the innocent should be condemned. By careful supervision of expenditures and some lucrative conquests, he was able to complete extensive public works without increasing taxation. On the contrary, he lowered taxes and published a budget to expose the revenues and outlays of the government to examination and criticism. He required from the senators who enjoyed his comradeship an administrative devotion almost as meticulous as his own. The patricians entered the bureaucracy and worked as well as played. Trajan's extant correspondence with them suggests how carefully they labored under his watchful and inspiring leadership. Many of the eastern cities had mismanaged their finances to the point of bankruptcy, and Trajan sent curatores, like the younger Pliny, to help and check them. The procedure weakened municipal independence and institutions, but it was unavoidable. Self-government by extravagance and incompetence had brought its own end. Nurtured on war, the emperor was a frank imperialist who preferred order to liberty and power to peace. Hardly a year after his arrival in Rome, he set out for the conquest of Dacia. Roughly corresponding to the Romania of 1940, Dacia plunged like a fist into the heart of Germany and would therefore be of great military value in the struggle that Trajan foresaw between the Germans and Italy. Its annexation would give Rome control of the road that ran down the Save to the Danube and thence to Byzantium, an invaluable land route to the east. Besides, Dacia had gold mines. In a campaign brilliantly planned and swiftly executed, Trajan led his legions through all obstacles and resistance to the Dacian capital, Sarmas Egetusa, and forced its surrender. A Roman sculptor has left us an impressive portrait of the Dacian king, Decebalus, a face noble with strength and character. Trajan reinstated him as a client king and returned to Rome in 102. But Decebalus soon broke his agreements and resumed his independent sway. Trajan marched his army back into Dacia in 105, bridged the Danube with a structure that was one of the engineering marvels of the century, and again stormed the Dacian capital. Decebalus was killed, a strong garrison was left to hold Sarmas Egetusa, and Trajan went back to Rome to celebrate his victory with 10,000 gladiators, probably war captives, in 123 days of public games. Dacia became a Roman province, received Roman colonists, married them, and corrupted the Latin language in its own Romanian way. The gold mines of Transylvania were put under the direction of an imperial procurator, and soon paid for the material cost of the war. To reimburse himself for his labors, Trajan took out of Dacia a million pounds of silver and half a million pounds of gold, the last substantial booty that the legions would win for Roman sloth. With these spoils, the emperor distributed 650 denarii, or $260, to all such citizens as applied for the gift, probably some 300,000, and enough remained to remedy the unemployment of demobilization with the greatest program of public works, governmental aid, and architectural adornment that Italy had seen since Augustus. Trajan improved the older aqueducts and built a new one which is still in operation. At Ostia, he constructed a spacious harbor connected by canals with the Tiber and the harbor of Claudius, and decorated it with warehouses that were models of beauty as well as of use. His engineers repaired old roads, carried a new one across the Pontine marshes, and laid the Via Traiana from Beneventum to Brundisium. They reopened the Claudian tunnel that had drained the Fusine Lake, dredged harbors at Centumcelli and Ancona, gave Ravenna an aqueduct, and Verona an amphitheater. Trajan supplied the funds for new roads, bridges, and buildings throughout the empire, but he discouraged the architectural rivalry of the cities and urged them to spend their surplus on improving the condition and environment of the poor. He was always ready to help any city that had suffered from earthquake, fire, or storm. He tried to promote agriculture in Italy by requiring senators to invest a third of their capital in Italian land. And when he saw that this was extending the latifundia, he encouraged small proprietors by advancing them state funds at low interest for the purchase and improvement of their lands and homes. To raise the birth rate, he enlarged the alimenta, or feeding fund. The state made mortgage loans at 5%, half the usual rate, to Italian peasants, and allowed local charity boards to distribute the interest to poor parents at 16 sesterces, or $1.60 monthly, for each boy raised by them, and 12 for each girl. The sums seem small, but contemporary testimony indicates that from 16 to 20 sesterces sufficed for a month's care of a child on a first-century Italian farm. With a similar hope, Trajan allowed the children of Rome to receive the corn dole in addition to that given to their parents. The system of Alimenta was enlarged by Hadrian and the Antonines, was extended to several parts of the empire, and was supplemented by private philanthropy. So the younger Pliny gave 30,000 sesterces a year as Alimenta to the children of Comum, 
and Celia Macrina left a million to like purpose for the children of Terracina in Spain. Trajan, like Augustus, favored Italy over the provinces and Rome over Italy. He used to the full the architectural genius of Apollodorus, a Damascene Greek who had designed the new roads and aqueduct, and the Danube Bridge. The emperor now commissioned him to clear away large blocks of houses, cut 130 feet from the base of the Quirinal Hill, lay out in this and the adjoining space a new forum equal in area to all preceding forums combined, and surround it with buildings of a majesty fit for a world capital that had reached the height of its power and opulence. The Forum Trianum was entered through the triumphal arch of Trajan. The interior, 370 by 354 feet, was paved with smooth stone and surrounded by a high wall and portico. East and west walls were indented with hemicycle excedrae formed of Doric columns. In the center rose the Basilica Ulpia, named after Trajan's clan and intended as an office building for commerce and finance. Its exterior was adorned with fifty monolithic columns, its floor was of marble, its immense nave was enclosed by granite colonnades, its roof of massive beams was covered with bronze. Near the northern end of the new forum two libraries were built, one for Latin works, the other for Greek. Between them rose the column, behind them the temple, of Trajan. When the forum was complete, it was accounted one of the architectural wonders of the world. The column, still standing, was first of all an achievement in transportation. It was cut from eighteen cubes of marble, each weighing some fifty tons. The blocks were brought by ship from the island of Peros, were transferred to barges at Ostia, were drawn against the current up the river, and were moved on rollers up the bank and through the streets to their site. The cubes were recut into thirty-two blocks. Eight formed the pedestal. Three sides of this were decorated with sculptures. The fourth opened into a spiral stairway of 185 marble steps. The shaft, twelve feet in diameter at the bottom and ninety-seven feet high, was composed of twenty-one blocks and was topped by a statue of Trajan holding a globe of the world. Before being raised into position, the blocks were carved with reliefs picturing the campaigns in Dacia. These reliefs are the culmination of Flavian realism and of ancient historical sculpture. They do not aim at the calm beauty or idealized types of Greek sculpture. They seek rather to convey a vivid impression of living individuals in the actual scenes and turmoil of war. They are Balzac and Zola after Corneille and Racine. In the two thousand figures of these one hundred twenty-four spiral panels, we follow the conquest of Dacia step by step, the Roman cohorts issuing from their stations in full armor, the crossing of the Danube on the pontoon bridge, the pitching of a Roman camp in the enemy's land the confused conflict of spears, arrows, sickles, and stones, a Dacian village set to the torch with women and children begging Trajan for mercy, Dacian women torturing Roman prisoners, soldiers displaying before the emperor the heads of slain enemies, surgeons treating the wounded, the Dacian princes drinking one after another the cup of poison, the head of Decebalus brought as a trophy to Trajan, the long file of captive men, women, and children snatched from their homes into foreign settlement or Roman slavery. This and more the dark column tells in the most masterly narrative relief in sculptural history. These artists and their employers were not chauvinists. They showed Trajan's acts of clemency, but also they revealed the heroic aspects of a nation's struggle for freedom. And the finest figure in the scroll is the Dacian king. It is a strange document, too crowded for full effectiveness, some figures so crude that one wonders if a Dacian warrior carved them, superposition primitively substituted for perspective, and the whole observable like Phidias's frieze only by some skylark scorner of the ground. But it was an interesting deviation from a classic style whose placidity had never expressed the overwhelming energy of the Roman character. Its method of continuity, making each scene melt into the next, carried on the suggestions of Titus's arch and prepared for medieval reliefs. Despite its defects, the spiral story was imitated again and again, from the column of Aurelius in Rome and that of Arcadius in Constantinople, to the Napoleonic shaft in the Place Vendôme in Paris. Trajan completed his building program by finishing in the grand manner the baths begun by Domitian. Meanwhile, six years of peace had wearied him. Administration was a task that did not awaken his reserve energies as war did. He did not feel alive in a palace. Why not take up Caesar's plans where Antony had failed, settle the Parthian question once and for all, establish a more strategic frontier in the east, and capture control of the trade routes across Armenia and Parthia to Central Asia, the Persian Gulf, and India. After careful preparation, he set out again with his legions in 113. A year later, he had taken Armenia. 
Yet another year and he had marched down through Mesopotamia, captured Tessaphon, and reached the Indian Ocean, the first and last Roman general to stand before that sea. The population at home learned geography by following his victories. The Senate was amused to be informed almost weekly of another nation conquered or hastily submitting. The Bosporus, Caucasus, Asiatic Iberia, Asiatic Albania, Osrawini, Messenia, Media, Assyria, Arabia Petria, at last even Parthia. Parthia, Armenia, Assyria, and Mesopotamia were constituted provinces, and the new Alexander had the glory of naming and crowning a client king over the ancient enemies of Rome. Standing on the shores of the Red Sea, Trajan mourned that he was too old to repeat the Macedonians' advance to the Indus. He contented himself with building a Red Sea fleet to control the passage and commerce to India, left garrisons at all strategic points, and turned back reluctantly toward Rome. Like Antony, he had gone too fast and too far, and had neglected to consolidate his victories and his lines. On reaching Antioch, he was informed that the Parthian king Osroes, whom he had deposed, had gathered another army and had reconquered central Mesopotamia, that rebellion had broken out in all the new provinces, that the Jews of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Cyrene were in revolt, and that disaffection was flaring up in Libya, Mauritania, and Britain. The old warrior wished to take the field again, but his flesh refused. He had worn himself out by living as actively in the hot east as in the west. Dropsy set in, and a paralytic stroke left the great will helpless in a broken frame. Sadly, he commissioned Lucius Quietus to put down the uprisings in Mesopotamia, sent Martius Turba to suppress the Jews in Africa, and left his nephew Hadrian in command of the main Roman army in Syria. He had himself carried down to the Cilician coast, hoping to sail thence to Rome, where the Senate was preparing for him the greatest triumph since Augustus. He died at Salinas on the way in 117, aged 64, after a reign of nineteen years. His ashes were taken to the capital and were buried under the great column that he had chosen as his tomb. 3. Hadrian 1. The Ruler Probably we shall never know whether the most brilliant of the Roman emperors won his throne by amorous connivance or by Trajan's conviction of his worth. His appointment, says Dio Cassius, was due to the fact that when Trajan died without an heir, his widow, Plotina, who was in love with Hadrian, conspired to secure him the succession. Spartianus repeats the story. Plotina and Hadrian denied the rumor, which nevertheless persisted to the end of his reign. He settled the matter by distributing a generous donative among the troops. Publius Aelius Hadrianus traced his cognomen and his family to the town of Adria, on the Adriatic coast. Thence, said his autobiography, his ancestors had migrated to Spain. The same Spanish town, Italica, that had seen the birth of Trajan in 52, saw that of his nephew Hadrian in 76. When the boy's father died in 86, he was placed under the guardianship of Trajan and Celius Atianus. The latter tutored him and instilled in him so warm a fondness for Greek literature that the youth was nicknamed Greekulus. He studied also singing, music, medicine, mathematics, painting, and sculpture, and later dabbled in half a dozen arts. Trajan called him to Rome in 91 and gave him his niece in marriage, this in 100. Vivia Sabina, as preserved in portrait busts that may have idealized her, was a woman of distinguished and conscious beauty, in whom Hadrian found no lasting happiness. Possibly he loved dogs and horses too keenly, and spent too much time hunting with them and building tombs for them when they died. Perhaps he was unfaithful, or seemed so. In any case, she bore him no children, and though she accompanied him on many of his travels, they lived in lifelong estrangement. He showed her every favor and courtesy, and gave her every kindness but affection. When Suetonius, one of his secretaries, spoke disrespectfully of her, he dismissed him. Hadrian's first decision as emperor was to revise the imperialistic policy of his uncle. He had counseled Trajan against the Parthian expedition as too great an expenditure of men and means so soon after the Dacian wars, and as promising, at best, gains difficult to hold. And Trajan's generals, eager for glory, had never pardoned his opposition. Now he withdrew the legions from Armenia, Assyria, Mesopotamia, and Parthia, made Armenia a client kingdom instead of a province, and accepted the Euphrates as the eastern boundary of the empire. He played Augustus to Trajan's Caesar, and consolidated with peaceful administration as much as he could of the unprecedented realm that reckless arms had won. The generals who had led Trajan's forces, 
Palma, Celsus, Quietus, Negrinus, thought this policy cowardly and unwise. To cease to attack, they felt, was merely to defend, and merely to defend was to begin to die. While Hadrian was with his legions on the Danube, the Senate announced that the four generals had been detected in a conspiracy to overthrow the government and had been executed by the Senate's orders. Rome was shocked to find that the men had received no trial, and though Hadrian, returning hurriedly to Rome, protested that he had had nothing to do with the matter, no one believed him. He vowed to put no senator to death except at the Senate's bidding, distributed a gift of money among the people, amused them with abundant games, cancelled tax arrears to the amount of nine hundred million sesterces, publicly burned the tax records in a fiscal auto da fe, and for twenty years governed with wisdom, justice, and peace. But his unpopularity remained complete. His ancient biographer describes him as tall and elegant, with hair curled, and the full beard to hide the natural blemishes of his face. Thenceforth all Rome wore beards. He was strongly built and kept himself in vigor by frequent exercise, above all by hunting. On several occasions he killed a lion with his own hands. So many elements were mingled in him that description is baffled. We are told that he was stern and cheerful, humorous and grave, sensual and cautious, hard and liberal, severe and merciful, deceptively simple, and always in all things various. He had a quick, impartial, skeptical, and penetrating mind, but he respected tradition as the connective tissue of generations. He read and admired the Stoic Epictetus, but he sought pleasure with shamelessness and taste. He was irreligious and superstitious, laughed at oracles, played with magic and astrology, encouraged the national faith, and sedulously performed the duties of Pontifex Maximus. He was courteous and obstinate, sometimes cruel, usually kind. Perhaps his contradictions were merely adaptations to circumstance. He visited the sick, helped the unfortunate, extended existing charities to orphans and widows, and was a generous patron to artists, writers, and philosophers. He was a good singer, dancer, and harpist, a competent painter, a middling sculptor. He wrote several volumes, a grammar, an autobiography, poems, decent and indecent, in Latin and Greek. He preferred Greek to Latin literature and old Cato's simple Latin to Cicero's smooth eloquence. Under his example, many authors now affected an archaic style. He organized the state-paid professors into a university, paid them well, and built for them a magnificent Athenaeum to rival the Museum of Alexandria. It delighted him to gather scholars and thinkers about him, to puzzle them with questions and laugh at their contradictions and disputes. Favorinus of Gaul was the wisest of this philosophic court. When his friends rallied him for yielding to Hadrian in argument, he answered that any man with thirty legions behind him must be right. Along with these multiple intellectual interests went an unerring sense for the practical. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 2. Along with these multiple intellectual interests went an unerring sense for the practical. Following Domitian's lead, Hadrian reduced his freedmen to subordinate functions, chose businessmen of tried ability to administer the government, and formed from them and senators and jurists a concilium to meet in regular sessions for the consideration of policies. He appointed an advocatus fisci, or attorney for the treasury, to detect corruption or deceit in the payment of taxes, with the illuminating result that while taxes remained as before, revenues were decidedly increased. He himself kept watch on each department and, like Napoleon, astonished its heads by detailed knowledge of their field. His memory was vast, says Spartianus. He wrote, dictated, listened, and conversed with his friends all at the same time, though the frequency of this tale invites suspicion. Under his care and with the help of an extended civil service, the empire was probably better governed than ever before or afterward. The price of this zealous order was a swelling bureaucracy, and a mania of regulation that moved the Principate still closer to absolute monarchy. Hadrian observed all the forms of cooperation with the Senate. Nevertheless, his appointees and their executive orders encroached more and more upon the functions of what had once seemed an assembly of kings. He was too close to his problems to foresee that his efficient but proliferating bureaucracy might become in time an unbearable burden upon the taxpayers. On the contrary, 
He believed that within the framework of law and ordinance which his government had established, every person in the empire would find career open to talent, and any man could rise rapidly from class to class. His clear and logical mind resented the chaos of accumulated, obscure, and contradictory laws. He commissioned Julianus to coordinate the enactments of past praetors into a perpetual edict, and encouraged further codifications that paved the way for Justinian. He acted as a supreme court, both in Rome and on his journeys, and earned the reputation of a fair and learned judge, always as lenient as the reign of law would permit. He issued innumerable decrees, usually in favor of the weak against the strong, the slave against the master, the small farmer against the large estate, the tenant against the landlord, the consumer against the deception of retailers, and the multiplication of middlemen. He rejected accusations for maestas, refused bequests from parents or persons unknown to him, and ordered a tolerant application of the laws against Christians. By his own example on state lands, he encouraged the practice of emphatusis, or implanting, by which owners rented rough acres to tenants to be planted with orchards and remain rent-free till fruit grew. He was not a radical reformer. He was only a superlative administrator, seeking, within the limits and inequalities of human nature, the greatest good of the whole. He preserved old forms, but he quietly poured new content into them according to the needs of the time. Once when his passion for administration flagged, he refused audience to a petitioning woman with the plea, I have in time. Don't be emperor then, she cried. He granted her a hearing. 2. The Wanderer Unlike his predecessors, Hadrian was as interested in the empire as in the capital. Following the wholesome precedent of Augustus, he decided to visit every province, examining its conditions and needs, and alleviating them with the expedition and resources available to an emperor. He was curious, too, about the ways and arts, dress and beliefs of the diverse peoples in his realm. He wished to see the famous places of Greek history, to steep himself in that Hellenic culture which was the background and adornment of his mind. He loved, says Fronto, not only to govern but to perambulate the world. In 121 he set out from Rome, accompanied not by the pomp and trappings of royalty, but by experts, architects, builders, engineers, and artists. He went first to Gaul and came to the relief of all the communities with various acts of generosity. He passed into Germany and astonished everyone by the thoroughness with which he inspected the defenses of the empire against its future destroyers. He reorganized, extended, and improved the limes between the Rhine and the Danube. A man of peace, he knew the arts of war and was resolved that his pacific temper should neither weaken his armies nor misguide his enemies. He issued severe regulations to maintain military discipline and obeyed these rules while visiting the camps. There he lived the life of the soldiers, eating their fare, never using a vehicle, walking with full equipment twenty miles on a march, and showing such endurance that no one could have guessed that he was at heart a scholar and a philosopher. At the same time, he rewarded excellence, raised the legal and economic status of the legionaries, gave them better weapons and ample supplies, and relaxed the discipline of their free hours, merely insisting that their amusements should not unfit them for their tasks. The Roman army was never in better condition than in his reign. He now traveled down the Rhine to its mouth and sailed across to Britain, this in 122. We are not informed of his activities there, except that he ordered a wall built from the Solway Firth to the mouth of the Tyne to divide the barbarians from the Romans. Returning to Gaul, he passed leisurely through Avignon, Nîmes, and other towns of the Provincia, and settled down for the winter at Tarragona in northern Spain. While he was strolling alone in the gardens of his host, a slave rushed upon him with drawn sword and tried to kill him. Hadrian overpowered him and quietly handed him over to the servants, who found that he was insane. In the spring of 123 he led some legions against the Moors of northwest Africa, who had been raiding the Roman towns of Mauritania. Having defeated them and driven them back into their hills, he took ship for Ephesus. After wintering there, he visited the cities of Asia Minor, listening to petitions and complaints, punishing malfeasance, rewarding competence, and providing money, designs, and workmen for municipal temples, baths, and theaters. Sisychus, Nicaea, and Nicomedia had suffered a severe earthquake. Hadrian had the damage made good by imperial funds and built at Sisychus a temple that was at once ranked among the seven wonders of the world. He pushed eastward along the Euxine to Trapezus, ordered the governor of Cappadocia, the historian Arian, to examine and report to him the condition of all the ports on the Black Sea, 
moved southwest through Paphlagonia, and spent a winter at Pergamum. In the fall of 125 he sailed to Rhodes and thence to Athens. He passed a happy winter there and then turned homeward. Still curious, at fifty he stopped in Sicily and climbed Mount Etna to see the sunrise from a perch eleven thousand feet above the sea. It is worthy of note that he could leave his capital for five years and trust to his subordinates to carry on. Like a good manager, he had organized and trained an almost automatic government. He stayed in Rome something more than a year. But the lust for travel was in his blood, and so much of the world remained to rebuild. In 128 he set out again, this time to Utica, Carthage, and the flourishing new cities of northern Africa. Returning to Rome in the fall, he left soon afterward and spent another winter in Athens, from 128 to 129. He was made archon, presided happily at games and festivals, and enjoyed being called liberator, Helios, Zeus, and savior of the world. He mingled with philosophers and artists, imitating the graces without the follies of Nero and Antony. Distressed by the free chaos of Athens's laws, he commissioned a corps of jurists to codify them. Always skeptically interested in religion, he had himself initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries. Finding Athens beset with unemployment and resolved to restore the city to the splendor of Periclean days, he summoned architects, engineers, and skilled artisans, and began a building program more extensive than his public works in Rome. In a square enclosed by an extensive colonnade, his workmen raised a library with marble walls, 120 columns, a gilded roof, and spacious rooms sparkling with alabaster paintings and statuary. They built a gymnasium, an aqueduct, a temple to Hera, and another to Zeus Panhellenikos, god of all the Greeks. The most ambitious of these architectural undertakings was the completion in 131 of the Olympium, that lordly temple to Zeus the Olympian which Pisistratus had begun six centuries before and Antiochus Epiphanes had failed to finish. When Hadrian left Athens it was a cleaner, more prosperous, and more beautiful city than ever before in its history. In the spring of 129 he sailed to Ephesus and traveled again in Asia Minor, spawning buildings and cities as he went. He sallied into Cappadocia and reviewed the garrisons there. At Antioch he provided funds for an aqueduct, a temple, a theater, and public baths. In the fall he visited Palmyra and Arabia, and in 130 he journeyed to Jerusalem. The holy city was still in ruins, almost as Titus had left it sixty years before. A handful of destitute Jews lived in lairs and hovels amid the rocks. Hadrian's heart was touched by the desolation, and his imagination was moved by the empty sight. He had hoped by his restoration of Greece and the Hellenistic East to raise higher than before the barriers between Greco-Roman civilization and the Oriental world. Now he dreamed of transforming Zion itself into a pagan citadel. He ordered that Jerusalem should be rebuilt as a Roman colony and renamed Elia Capitolina in memory of Hadrian's gents and Jupiter's capital in Rome. It was an astonishing error of psychology and statesmanship in one of the wisest statesmen in history. He passed on to Alexandria in 130, smiled tolerantly at its disputatious populace, enriched the museum, rebuilt Pompey's tomb, and then, surpassing Caesar, abandoned himself to a leisurely sail up the Nile with his wife Sabina and his beloved Antinous. He had come upon the young Greek some years before in Bithynia. He had been stirred by the youth's rounded beauty, soft eyes, and curly head. He had made him his favored page and had formed for him a tender and passionate attachment. Sabina made no protest that has come down to us, but the gossip of the cities assumed that the boy played Ganymede to the new Zeus. Possibly, however, the childless emperor loved him as a heaven-sent son. Now, at the height of Hadrian's happiness, Antinous, still but eighteen, died, apparently by drowning in the Nile. The monarch of the world wept like a woman, says Spartianus. He ordered a temple to be raised on the shore, buried the lad there, and offered him to the world as a god. Around the shrine he built a city, and Tinoopolis, destined to be a Byzantine capital. While Hadrian returned sadly to Rome, legend began to remold the story. The emperor, it said, had learned by magic divination that his greatest plans would succeed only if that which he loved most should die. Antinous had heard of the prophecy and had gone voluntarily to his death. Perhaps the legend formed soon enough to embitter Hadrian's declining years. Back in Rome in 131 he could feel that he had made the empire better than he had found it. Never before, not even under Augustus, had it been so prosperous, and never has the Mediterranean world reached that fullness of life again. Never has it again been the home of so advanced a civilization, so widely spread, and so deeply shared. 
and no man had so beneficently ruled it as Hadrian. Augustus had thought of the provinces as a lucrative appendage to Italy, to be husbanded for Italy's sake. Now for the first time the ideas of Caesar and Claudius reached fulfillment, and Rome became not a tax collector for Italy, but the responsible administrator of a realm in which all parts alike received the care of the government, and in which the Greek spirit ruled the East and the mind as openly as the Roman spirit ruled the state and the West. Hadrian had seen it all and had made it one. He had promised that he would manage the commonwealth as conscious that it was the people's property, not his own. And he had kept his promise. 3. The Builder Only one thing remained, to make Rome too more beautiful than before. The artist in Hadrian was ever competing with the governor. He rebuilt the Pantheon while reorganizing Roman law. No other man ever built so plentifully, no other ruler so directly. The structures erected for him were sometimes designed by him, and were always subject to his expert inspection as they progressed. He had a hundred edifices, repaired or restored, and inscribed his name on none of them. Rome in all quarters benefited from his rare union of wisdom with power. Si jeunesse savait et vieillesse pouvait, if youth knew and old age could, was in him a riddle solved. His most famous reconstruction was the Pantheon the best-preserved building of the ancient world. The rectangular temple reared by Agrippa had been destroyed by fire. Apparently only the frontal Corinthian portico remained. North of this remnant, Hadrian had his architects and engineers raise a circular temple in the most indigenous of Roman styles. His Hellenic tastes inclined him to prefer Greek to Roman forms in the architecture of his capital. The new temple did not form with the portico a harmonious whole, but the interior, a circle 132 feet in diameter with no impeding supports, gave a sense of space and freedom equaled only by the Gothic cathedrals. The walls were twenty feet thick, of brick externally faced in the lower section with marble, in the rest with stucco relieved by pilasters. The ceiling of the portico was of bronze plates, so thick that when they were removed by Pope Urban VIII they sufficed to cast 110 cannon and to form the baldachin over the high altar in St. Peter's. The massive bronze doors were originally covered with gold. Seven niches were cut into the lower section of the windowless interior wall and were adorned with lofty marble columns and entablatures. Once these niches served as alcoves for statuary, now they are modest chapels in a magnificent church. A higher section of the wall was plated with panels of costly stone, separated by pillars of porphyry. The coffered dome, rising inward from the top of the walls, was the supreme triumph of Roman engineering. It was erected by pouring concrete into ribbed sections and letting the whole congeal into one solid mass. Its monolithic character did away with lateral thrust, but to make security doubly sure, the architect built buttresses into the walls. At the top of the dome, an opening, the oculus, or eye, twenty-six feet in diameter, gave the interior its sole and sufficient illumination. From this majestic dome, the largest in history, an architectural lineage descends through Byzantine and Romanesque variations to the Dome of St. Peter's, and to that of the capital in Washington. Probably Hadrian himself designed the double-apsed temple to Venus and Roma, which rose opposite the Colosseum, for legend tells how he sent his plans for it to Apollodorus and had the old architect put to death for returning a scornful comment. The temple was notable in several particulars. It was the largest in Rome. It had two cellars, one for each of its gods, who sat back to back on incommunicative thrones, and its vaulted roof of gold-plated bronze tiles was among the most brilliant sights of the city. For himself the emperor built a yet ampler home, the villa whose remains still draw visitors to the pleasant suburb known to him as Tiber, to us as Tivoli. There, in an estate seven miles in circumference, rose a palace with every variety of room, and gardens so crowded with famous works of art that every major museum in Europe has enriched itself from the ruins. The designer showed here the usual Roman indifference to symmetry. He added building to building as need or fancy prompted, and made no greater attempt at harmony than we find in the architectural chaos of the Forum. Perhaps the Romans, like the Japanese, were tired of symmetry, and pleased with the surprises of irregularity. Besides porticos, libraries, temples, a theatre, a music hall, and a hippodrome, the profuse architect added small replicas of Plato's Academy, Aristotle's Lyceum, and Zeno's Stoa, as if the emperor, amid all this vain wealth, would make some amends to philosophy. The villa was finished in the last years of Hadrian's life. We do not know that he found happiness there. The revolt of the Jews in 135 embittered him. He put it down without mercy and fretted that he could not end his reign without war. 
In that same year, still only fifty-nine, he was stricken with a painful and wasting illness, akin to tuberculosis and dropsy, which slowly crushed his body, his spirit, and his mind. His temper became sharper, his manner querulous. He suspected his oldest friends of conspiring to kill and replace him. At last, perhaps in an elusive interval, and how justly we cannot say, he ordered that several of them should be put to death. To end the war of succession that was forming in his court, he adopted as heir his friend Lucius Verus. When, soon after, Lucius died, Hadrian called to his bedside at Tiber a man with an unblemished reputation for integrity and wisdom, Titus Aurelius Antoninus, and adopted him as his son and successor. Looking far ahead, he advised Antoninus to adopt in turn and educate for government two youths then growing up at the court, Marcus Annius Verus, then seventeen, and Lucius Elius Verus, then eleven, respectively the nephew of Antoninus and the son of Lucius Verus. The title of Caesar, heretofore borne by the emperors and their agnatic descendants, was conferred by Hadrian upon Antoninus, and thereafter, while the emperors kept for themselves the title of Augustus, they granted the name Caesar to each heir presumptive to the throne. Hadrian's sickness and sufferings had now increased. Blood often gushed from his nostrils, and in his distress he began to long for death. He had already prepared his own tomb beyond the Tiber, that huge mausoleum whose gloomy remains are today the Castel Sant'Angelo, still reached by the Pons Ilius that Hadrian built. He was impressed by the example of the Stoic philosopher Euphrates, then in Rome, who, weary with illness and old age, asked Hadrian's permission to kill himself, and, receiving it, drank hemlock. The emperor begged for poison or a sword, but no attendant would accommodate him. He bade a Danubian slave stab him, but the slave fled. He commanded his physician to poison him, but the physician committed suicide. He found a dagger and was about to kill himself when it was taken from him. He mourned that he who had the power to put anyone to death was not himself permitted to die. Dismissing his doctors, he withdrew to Bailly and deliberately fed on foods and drinks that would hasten his end. At last, exhausted and maddened with pain, he died in 138 after sixty-two years of life and twenty-one of rule. He left behind him a little poem that expressed like Dante the sadness of recalling in grief the days of our happiness. Soul of mine, pretty one, flitting one, guest and partner of my clay, whither wilt thou hie away? Pallid one, rigid one, naked one, never to play again, never to play. 4. Antoninus Pius. Of Antoninus there is no history, for he had almost no faults and committed no crimes. His ancestors had come from Nîmes two generations before, and his family was one of the wealthiest in Rome. Reaching the throne at fifty-one, he gave the empire the most equitable and not the least efficient government it would ever have. He was the most fortunate man that ever wore a crown. We are told that he was tall and handsome, healthy and serene, gentle and resolute, modest and omnipotent, eloquent, and a despiser of rhetoric, popular and immune to flattery. If we are to believe his adopted son Marcus, we should have to reject him as that faultless monster whom the world ne'er knew. The Senate called him pious as a model of the milder Roman virtues, and Optimus Princeps as the best of princes. He had no enemies and hundreds of friends, but he was not unacquainted with grief. His elder daughter died as he was setting out as proconsul to Asia, his younger daughter proved a dubious wife to Aurelius, and scandal accused his own wife of being as faithless as she was beautiful. Antoninus bore these rumors silently, and after Faustina's death he established in her name and honor a fund for the support and education of girls, and raised to her memory one of the loveliest temples in the Forum. He did not marry again, lest he mar the happiness and inheritance of his children, but contented himself with a concubine. He was not a man of intellect in the narrower sense of that term. He had no learning and looked with an aristocrat's indulgence upon men of letters, philosophy, or art. Nevertheless, he helped such men richly and invited them often to his home. He preferred religion to philosophy, worshipped the old gods with apparent sincerity, and gave his adopted sons an example of piety that Marcus never forgot. Do everything as a disciple of Antoninus, Marcus bade himself. Remember his constancy in every reasonable act, his evenness in all things, his piety, and the serenity of his countenance, and his disregard of empty fame. With how little he was satisfied, how laborious and patient, how religious without superstition. Yet he was tolerant of non-Roman creeds, moderated Hadrian's measures against the Jews, and continued his predecessor's lenience toward the Christians. He was no killjoy, he loved a jest and made many a good one, he played, fished, and hunted with his friends, and from his behavior none could have guessed that he was emperor. 
He preferred the quiet of his villa at Lanuvium to the luxury of his official palace, and nearly always spent the evenings in the intimacy of his family. When he inherited the throne he put aside all thought of that careless ease to which he had looked forward as the consolation of old age. Perceiving that his wife anticipated increased splendor, he reproved her. Do you not understand that we have now lost what we had before? He knew that he had succeeded to the cares of the world. He began his reign by pouring his immense personal fortune into the imperial treasury. He canceled arrears of taxes, made gifts of money to the citizens, paid for many festival games, and relieved scarcities of wine, oil, and wheat by buying these and distributing them free. He carried on, but with moderation, the building program of Hadrian in Italy and the provinces. Yet he managed the national finances so ably that at his death the combined treasuries of the state had two billion seven hundred million sesterces. He gave a public accounting of all his receipts and expenditures. He behaved toward the Senate as merely one of it and never took important measures without consulting its leaders. He devoted himself to the chores of administration as well as to the problems of policy. He cared for all men and all things as his own. He continued Hadrian's liberalization of the law, equalized the penalties of adultery for men and women, deprived ruthless masters of their slaves, restricted the torture of slaves in trials, and decreed severe punishment for any owner who killed a slave. He encouraged education with state funds, provided for the education of poor children, and extended to recognized teachers and philosophers many privileges of the senatorial class. He ruled the provinces as well as he could without traveling. In all his long reign he was never absent for a day from Rome or its environs. He was content to appoint to provincial governorships men of tried competence and honor. He was anxious to keep the empire safe without war. He was continually quoting the saying of Scipio that he would rather save a single citizen than slay a thousand foes. He had to wage some minor wars in order to suppress revolts in Dacia, Achaea, and Egypt, but he left these tasks to subordinates and was satisfied with Hadrian's cautious frontiers. Some tribes in Germany interpreted his mildness as weakness and perhaps were encouraged by it to prepare those invasions which rocked the empire after his death. This is the one flaw in his statesmanship. For the rest of the provinces were happy under him and accepted the empire as the only alternative to chaos and strife. They showered him with petitions, which he almost always granted, and they could rely upon him to repair the ravages of any public calamity. Provincial authors, Strabo, Philo, Plutarch, Appian, Epictetus, Elias Aristides, sang the praises of the Pax Romana. And Appian assures us that he had seen at Rome the envoys of foreign states vainly asking admission for their countries to the boons of the Roman yoke. Never had monarchy left men so free or so respected the rights of its subjects. The world's ideal seemed to have been attained. Wisdom reigned, and for twenty-three years the world was governed by a father. It only remained for Antoninus to crown a good life with a peaceful death. In his seventy-fourth year he fell sick of a stomach disturbance and was seized with a high fever. He called Marcus Aurelius to his bedside and committed to him the care of the state. He instructed his servants to transfer to Marcus's room the golden statue of Fortuna that had for many years stood in the bedchamber of the prince. To the officer of the day he gave as watchword equinimitas. Soon afterward he turned as if to sleep and died, this in 161. All classes and cities vied with one another in honoring his memory. 5. The Philosopher as Emperor Antoninus, said Renan, would have been without competition for the reputation of being the best of sovereigns had he not designated Marcus Aurelius as his heir. If, said Gibbon, a man were called upon to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would without hesitation name that which elapsed from the accession of Nerva to the death of Aurelius. Their united reigns are possibly the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government. Marcus Annius Verus was born in Rome in 121. The Annii had come a century before from Succubo, near Cordova. There, it seems, their honesty had won them the cognomen Verus. True. Three months after the boy's birth his father died, and he was taken into the home of his rich grandfather, then consul. Hadrian was a frequent visitor there. He took a fancy to the boy and saw in him the stuff of kings. Seldom has any lad had so propitious a youth or so keenly appreciated his good fortune. To the gods, he wrote fifty years later, I am indebted for having good grandparents, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good kinsmen and friends, nearly everything good. 
Time struck a balance by giving him a questionable wife and a worthless son. His meditations list the virtues these people had, and the lessons he received from them in modesty, patience, manliness, abstemiousness, piety, benevolence, and a simplicity of life far removed from the habits of the rich, though wealth surrounded him on every side. Never was a boy so persistently educated. He was attached in boyhood to the service of temples and priests. He committed to memory every word of the ancient and unintelligible liturgy. And though philosophy later shook his faith, it never diminished his sedulous performance of the old exacting ritual. Marcus liked games and sports, even bird-snaring and hunting, and some efforts were made to train his body as well as his mind and character. But seventeen tutors in childhood are a heavy handicap. Four grammarians, four readers, one jurist, and eight philosophers divided his soul among them. The most famous of these teachers was M. Cornelius Fronto, who taught him rhetoric. Though Marcus loved him, lavished upon him all the kindnesses of an affectionate and royal pupil, and exchanged with him letters of intimate charm, the youth turned his back upon oratory as a vain and dishonest art, and abandoned himself to philosophy. He thanks his instructors for sparing him logic and astrology, thanks Diognetus the Stoic for freeing him from superstition, Junius Rusticus for acquainting him with Epictetus, and Sextus of Chironia for teaching him to live in conformity with nature. He is grateful to his brother Severus for telling him about Brutus, Cato of Utica, Thracia, and Helvidius. From him I received the idea of a state in which there is the same law for all, a polity of equal rights and freedom of speech, and the idea of a kingly government that most of all respects the freedom of the governed. Here the Stoic ideal of monarchy takes possession of the throne. He thanks Maximus for teaching him self-government, and not to be led aside by anything, cheerfulness in all circumstances, and a just admixture of gentleness and dignity, and to do appointed tasks without complaining. It is clear that the leading philosophers of the time were priests without religion, rather than metaphysicians without life. Marcus took them so seriously that for a time he almost ruined a naturally weak constitution with ascetic devotions. At the age of twelve he took on the rude cloak of a philosopher, slept on a little straw strewn over the floor, and long resisted the entreaties of his mother to use a couch. He was a Stoic before he became a man. He offers thanks that I preserved the flower of my youth, that I took not upon me to be a man before my time, but rather put it off longer than I needed, that I never had to do with Benedicta, and afterwards when I fell into some fits of love I was soon cured. Two influences diverted him from professional philosophy and sanctity. One was the succession of minor political offices to which he was appointed. The realism of an administrator was crossed with the idealism of a meditative youth. The other was his close association with Antoninus Pius. He did not fret at Antoninus's longevity, but continued his life of Stoic simplicity, philosophical study, and official duties, while living in the palace and serving his protracted apprenticeship. And the example of his adoptive father's devotion and honesty in government became a powerful influence in his development. The name by which we know him, Aurelius, was the clan name of Antoninus, which both Marcus and Lucius on their adoption had taken as their own. Lucius became a gay man of the world, a graceful adept in the pleasures of life. When in 146 Pius desired a colleague to share the government with him, he named Marcus only and left to Lucius the empire of love. On the death of Antoninus, Marcus became sole emperor, but remembering Hadrian's wish, he at once made Lucius Verus his full colleague and gave him his daughter Lucilla in marriage. At the outset of his reign, as at the end, the philosopher erred through kindness. The division of rule was a bad precedent, which in the heirs of Diocletian and Constantine would divide and weaken the realm. Marcus asked the Senate to vote pious divine honors, completed with perfect taste the temple that Pius had raised to his wife, and rededicated it to Antoninus and Faustina both. He paid the state every courtesy and rejoiced to see that many of his philosopher friends had found their way into its membership. All Italy and the provinces claimed him as Plato's dream come true. The philosopher was king but he had no thought of attempting a utopia. Like Antoninus, he was a conservative. Radicals do not grow up in palaces. He was a philosopher king in the Stoic rather than the Platonic sense. Never hope, he admonished himself, to realize Plato's Republic. Let it be sufficient that you have in some degree ameliorated mankind, and do not think such improvement a matter of small importance. Who can change the opinions of men? And without a change of sentiments, what can you make but reluctant slaves and hypocrites? He had discovered that not all men wished to be saints, 
and he sadly reconciled himself to a world of corruption and wickedness. The immortal gods consent for countless ages to endure without anger, and even to surround with blessings so many and such evil men. But thou, who hast so short a time to live, art thou already weary? He decided to rely on example rather than law. He made himself, in fact, a public servant. He carried all the burdens of administration and judgment, even that part which Lucius had agreed to take but was neglecting. He allowed himself no luxury, treated all men with simple fellowship, and wore himself out by being easy of access. He was not a great statesman. He spent too much of the public funds in cash gifts to the people and the army, gave each member of the Praetorian Guard twenty thousand sesterces, increased the number of those who could apply for free corn, provided frequent and costly games, and remitted large sums in unpaid taxes and tribute. It was generosity with many precedents, but unwise at a time when rebellion or war visibly threatened, or was breaking out, in several provinces and on far-spread frontiers. Marcus continued sedulously that reform of law which Hadrian had begun. He increased the number of court days and reduced the length of trials. He himself often sat as judge, inflexible against grave offences, but usually merciful. He devised legal protection for wards against dishonest guardians, for debtors against creditors, for provinces against governors. He connived at the rejuvenation of the forbidden collegia, legalized those associations which were chiefly burial societies, made them legal persons eligible for bequests, and established a fund for the interment of poor citizens. He gave the Alimenta the widest extension in their history. After the death of his wife, he created an endowment for the aid of young women. A pretty bas-relief shows us such girls crowding around the younger Faustina, who pours wheat into their laps. He abolished mixed bathing, forbade extravagant remuneration to actors and gladiators, restricted according to their wealth the expenditures of the cities on games, required the use of foiled weapons in gladiatorial contests, and did all that sanguinary custom would allow to banish death from the arena. The people loved him, but not his laws. When he enlisted gladiators from his army for the Marcomannic Wars, the populace cried out in good-humored anger, He is taking our amusement from us. He wants to force us to be philosophers. Rome was preparing, but not quite ready, to be Puritan. It was his misfortune that his fame as a philosopher, and the long peace under Hadrian and Antoninus, encouraged rebels within and barbarians without. In 162, revolt broke out in Britain, the Chatti invaded Roman Germany, and the Parthian king, Volagaces III, declared war upon Rome. Marcus chose able generals to put down the revolt in the north, but he delegated to Lucius Verus the major task of fighting Parthia. Lucius got no farther than Antioch, for there lived Panthea, so beautiful and accomplished that Lucian thought all the perfections of all sculptural masterpieces had come together in her, to which were added a voice of intoxicating melody, fingers skilled on the lyre, and a mind enriched with literature and philosophy. Lucius saw her, and like Gilgamesh, forgot when he was born. He abandoned himself to pleasure, to hunting, at last to debauchery, while the Parthians rode into terror-stricken Syria. Marcus made no comment on Lucius, but sent to Avidius Cassius, second in charge in Lucius's army, a plan of campaign whose military excellence helped the general's own ability not only to drive the Parthians back across Mesopotamia, but to plant the Roman standards once more in Seleucia and Tisiphon. This time the two cities were burned to the ground, lest they serve again as bases for Parthian campaigns. Lucius returned from Antioch to Rome and was awarded a triumph, which he magnanimously insisted that Marcus should share. Lucius brought with him the invisible victor of the war, Pestilence. It had appeared first among the troops of Avidius in captured Seleucia. It spread so rapidly that he withdrew his army into Mesopotamia, while the Parthians rejoiced at the vengeance of their gods. The retreating legions carried the plague with them to Syria. Lucius took some of these soldiers to Rome to march in his triumph. They infected every city through which they passed, and every region of the empire to which they were later assigned. The ancient historians tell us more of its ravages than of its nature. Their descriptions suggest exanthematous typhus, or possibly bubonic plague. Galen thought it similar to the disease that had wasted the Athenians under Pericles. In both cases, black pustules almost covered the body, the victim was racked with a hoarse cough, and his breath stank. Rapidly it swept through Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, Italy, and Gaul. Within a year, from 166 to 167, it had killed more men than had been lost in the war. In Rome, two thousand died of it in one day, including many of the aristocracy. Corpses were carried out of the city in heaps. Marcus, helpless before this intangible enemy, did all he could to mitigate the evil. 
but the medical science of his day could offer him no guidance, and the epidemic ran its course until it had established an immunity or had killed all its carriers. The effects were endless. Many localities were so despoiled of population that they reverted to jungle or desert. Food production fell, transport was disorganized, floods destroyed great quantities of grain, and famine succeeded plague. The happy hilaritas that had marked the beginning of Marcus's reign vanished. Men yielded to a bewildered pessimism, flocked to soothsayers and oracles, clouded the altars with incense and sacrifice, and sought consolation where alone it was offered them, in the new religions of personal immortality and heavenly peace. Amid these domestic difficulties came news in 167 that the tribes along the Danube, Chatai, Quadai, Marcomanni, Yazyges, had crossed the river, overwhelmed a Roman garrison of twenty thousand men, and were pouring unhindered into Dacia, Rhaetia, Pannonia, Noricum, that some had made their way over the Alps, had defeated every army sent against them, were besieging Aquileia, near Venice, were threatening Verona, and were laying waste the rich fields of northern Italy. Never before had the German tribes moved with such unity or so closely threatened Rome. Marcus acted with surprising decisiveness. He put away the pleasures of philosophy and determined to take the field in what he foresaw would be the most momentous of Roman wars since Hannibal. He shocked Italy by enrolling policemen, gladiators, slaves, brigands, and barbarous mercenaries into legions depleted by war and pestilence. Even the gods were conscripted to his purpose. He bade the priests of alien faiths to offer sacrifice for Rome according to their various rites. And he himself burned such hecatombs at the altars that a wit circulated a message sent him by white oxen, begging him not to be too victorious. If thou shouldst conquer, we are lost. To raise war funds without levying special taxes, he auctioned off in the forum the wardrobes, art objects, and jewels of the imperial palaces. He took careful measures of defense, fortified the border towns from Gaul to the Aegean, blocked the passes into Italy, and bribed German and Scythian tribes to attack the invaders in the rear. With energy and courage, all the more admirable in a man who hated war, he trained his army into disciplined strength, led them through a hard campaign mapped out with strategic skill, drove the besiegers from Aquileia, routed them even to the Danube until nearly all were captured or dead. He understood that this action had not ended the German danger, but thinking the situation safe for a time, he returned with his colleague to Rome. On the way, Lucius died of an apoplectic stroke, and gossip, which like politics has no bowels of mercy, whispered that Marcus had poisoned him. From January to September 169, the emperor rested at home from efforts that had strained his frail body close to the breaking point. He suffered from a stomach ailment that often left him too weak to talk. He controlled it by eating sparingly, one light meal a day. Those who knew his condition and his diet marveled at his labors in the palace and the field and could only say that he made up in resolution what he lacked in strength. On several occasions he called in the most famous physician of the age, Galen of Pergamum, and praised him for the unpretentious remedies he prescribed. Perhaps a succession of domestic disappointments cooperated with political and military crises to aggravate his illness and make him old at forty-eight. His wife, Faustina, whose pretty face has come down to us in many a sculptured portrait, may not have relished sharing bed and board with incarnate philosophy. She was a lively creature who longed for a gayer life than his sober nature could give her. The talk of the town assumed her infidelity. The mimes satirized him as a cuckold and even named his rivals. Like Antoninus with Faustina the mother, Marcus said nothing. Instead, he promoted the supposed paramours to high office, gave Faustina every sign of tenderness and respect, had her deified when she died in 175, and thanked the gods in his meditations for so obedient and affectionate a wife. No evidence exists upon which to condemn her. Of the four children that she gave him, and whom he loved with a passion still warm in his letters to Fronto. One girl died in childhood. The surviving daughter was saddened by Lucius's life and widowed by his death. Twin sons came in 161. One died at birth. The other was Commodus. Scandalmongers called him a gladiator's gift to Faustina, and he strove all his life long to confirm the tale. But he was a handsome and vigorous lad. Marcus forgivably doted on him, presented him to the legions in a manner symbolic of naming a successor, and engaged the best teachers in Rome to fit him for rule. The youth preferred to model cups, dance, sing, hunt, and fence. He developed an understandable aversion to books, scholars, and philosophers, but enjoyed the company of gladiators and athletes. Soon he surpassed all comrades in lying, cruelty, and coarse speech. Marcus was too good to be great enough to discipline him or renounce him, 
He kept on hoping that education and responsibility would sober him and make him grow into a king. The lonely emperor, emaciated, beard untended, eyes weary with anxiety and sleeplessness, turned back from his wife and son to the tasks of government and war. The assaults of the Central European tribes against the frontier had stopped only for a breathing spell. In this struggle to destroy an empire and make barbarism free, peace was but an armistice. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1.